Special thanks to my Patreons and confidants over on my Patreon page. Shout out to Maya Amano from Persona 2 Original Sin PSP and Tyler Yanez for supporting this channel and making long form videos like mine possible. If you'd like to do the same and have early access to these sorts of videos, head on over to patreon.com slash Now, with all that being said, PERSONA! <laughs> if somebody once told me that I would become so fascinated and inspired by the story of Persona 5 Royal spin on the classic Cinderella fairy tale that mixes itself with a few dashes of severe depression and existential Lovecraftian horror thrown in there for good measure, I would know exactly what to say. Hey guys, Badger here. Welcome back to Season 2 of Dichotomy of a Character, a video essay series in which I take an exhaustive examination of some of my favorite characters in media to explore and to explain why those same characters are some of the greatest of all time. After spending last season discussing the characters of Mass Effect, Star Wars, and Avatar The Last Airbender, this time around we're continuing our coverage of Persona 5's characters. In the previous episodes of the series, we covered Persona 5's on Takamaki, Ryuji Sakamoto, and Makoto Nijima, with the goal of not only discussing why they're great characters, but to also see why and how the writers of Persona 5 use all those latter characters as a vehicle to criticize Japanese sociological issues. A link to our previous three episodes, as well as both seasons of Dichotomy of a Character, will be in the description down below. Though we are nearing the end of Season 2 here, we're not quite done yet. We still have two more characters to cover as part of the season, being Akechi and Kasumi, and I have no intention of stopping. It's only going to get better from here, so smash that like button, drop a comment down below, and I'll attack the subscribe button to stay posted on all the future episodes within the series. This time around, instead of defaulting to my original release order, I did something different. I decided to put it all to a vote. With the help of my patrons, we decided to go ahead and cover Sumi Yoshizawa instead of our coverage of Goro Akechi for last to serve as the season finale for this very series. Going forward, I think that's going to be the norm as well. Out of a handful of ideas for videos that I have, I'll ask for y'all to vote on the Patreon page for which kinds of videos you want to see first. I've always wanted to involve the audience a bit more in the production of the series, and for now, I think voting on my Patreon page is a satisfactory method of getting those watching involved. By the way, special thanks to my Patreons and confidants over on my Patreon page. Shout out to Maya Amano from Persona 2 Original Sin PSP and Tyler Yanez for supporting this channel and making long form videos like mine possible. Of course, by choosing to support the channel, all my patrons will not only be able to influence what content I produce and in what order, but you'll also receive early access to my content, such as our future coverage of Gordo Akechi, weeks or often months before I ever release it anywhere else. There's a few extras in there, such as full access to my scripts, commissioned art reviews for my videos, and other behind the scenes goodies included in there as well. If any of that interests you, if you want to support the channel and drive it in a specific direction, head on over to patreon.com slash xbadgenightx. Anyway, I digress for now. In this episode of Season 2 of Dichotomy of a Character, we're finally covering... <laughs> Shall we? Yoshizawa, a controversial character to some due to how the plot treats her, Kasumi occupies a strange niche in the overall story of Persona 5. We're going to touch upon this a bit more in Akechi's own video in the future, but I personally find it strange that Yoshizawa is treated more as a plot device or even a MacGuffin rather than an actual character at times within the game. If anything, I'd say that it's less about her being something of a Mary Sue or the writer's pet, and more about how strangely the third semester's content seems to be less concerned with Yoshizawa's impact on the overall plot and more about Akechi's relationship with Joker. You'd think that her relationship to the Final Palace rule of the game and Yoshizawa herself being credited solely for the royal version of Persona 5, she'd get more airtime in the game, but of course, we'll talk about all this in due time. However, despite all my grievances about her inclusion into the plot and how she's mishandled, I still think Yoshizawa's story is worth remembering and cherishing. After finally getting around to playing a complete Persona 5 Royal, Tsumi Yoshizawa has become one of my favorite characters both in Persona 5 and within gaming history, which is kind of odd in retrospect. It's funny, for the hours upon hours it took explaining away the Japanese sociological issues on Ryuji, Makoto, and when we eventually get around to covering him, a catchy tan to grapple with as a form of criticism of Japanese society, Yoshizawa doesn't really offer the same level of critique. Instead, what we find is a very personally driven story as Yoshizawa grapples with grief, guilt, and what is most definitely undiagnosed clinical depression. depression in of itself in Japanese society carries with it a certain stigma to such a degree that it's often referred to as the cold of the soul. Of course, comparing Yoshizawa's condition to something like a pesky cold is an incredibly ignorant sentiment to hold. Combine this smarmy ignorance with someone who must perform and place well in competitions as an athlete, we find where the initial conflict for Yoshizawa lies. This is the key to her struggles within the plot of the game, and within that, perhaps, lies a critique about how collective societies, such as Japan's, choose to treat or rather do not effectively treat chronic mental health issues. This also makes Dr. Maruki's position within the plot and his relevance to Yoshizawa's character arc rather unique as her acting mental health counselor as well, but ah, we're getting ahead of ourselves. One aspect of Yoshizawa and her character writing that has always stuck with me is how despite being severely traumatized and racked with guilt, despite being manipulated and lied to at every single turn, she finds the power to overcome that tragedy and rises above even herself. 
I say this because, as we find out, unlike the rest of the Phantom Thieves, Yoshizawa's Spirit Rebellion doesn't have any general beef with society. As a matter of fact, in Yoshizawa's case, it's not society or any powerful untouchable like Kamoshida or Shido that's oppressing Yoshizawa in particular, but actually, she herself is her own greatest oppressor and the only obstacle to her own personal sense of rebellion. That is to say that Yoshizawa is a rebel without a cause, and in order to continue to grow as a person, she must continue rebelling against herself. She must continue to resist the call of the void by rebuilding a positive self-image of herself self once more. Rebelling against yourself, to be locked within an eternal constant conflict with yourself seems like a tall order, but considering the message that Atlas is trying to deliver with Yoshizawa's character, concerning suicidal idolation and depression intertwining with a slothful society that Persona 5 presents us with, it makes the manner in which Sumi decides to rebel all the more worthwhile. Joker says it best, Sumi is one tough lady, and this surprises those who thought that she would never be capable of leveraging that pain to improve herself. You know, I would love for that to be the truth. But people can't maintain their strength forever. Oh, we'll see about that, Mr. Lovecraftian Fairy Godfather. Holy shit, and do I think the Persona community is way too kind to you as a villain. But we'll talk about that in due time. As we continue on, we'll begin to see this aspect of Sumi's character thrice over. The ability for her to tough things out as she discovers how to be herself in more ways than one. This want of individuality defines Sumi's character, and thus, it's from this perspective that we'll be asking and answering the following questions within this rather lengthy video essay, as we thoroughly analyze the character arc and ethos of Persona 5's Sumi Yoshizawa. Before we continue, we need to establish some ground rules. Firstly, because of how the plot is structured, we'll be omitting things about the plot that Kasumi would not reasonably know about until it's literally explained to her. When these events do occur, we'll have to recontextualize these events and work backwards in order to explain them, so brace yourselves. Secondly, while this video might have Kasumi's name attached to it, we are going to be covering aspects of Marcus' confidant arc as well, with respect to his plot relevance to Yoshizawa. Thirdly, also due to how the plot is structured, we're going to hold off on explaining the Japanese sociological context about Yoshizawa suffering from depression and survivor's guilt until later in the heist. Instead, we're first going to start with the first five parts of Yoshizawa's confidant arc and then work our way around to the rest. Following that notion, the first five instances of Kasumi's confidant arc are particularly strange in the manner in which they are delivered to the player. We only have five instances to hang out with her, but in order to level it up, you have to wait for specific days in June and July to advance it. This content is also supplemented with plot growth for Kasumi that occurs between these specific days, where we just hang out with her and Akechi. As such, we're going to have to mix in our confidant with these events to track the first half of her growth. Fourthly, we are of course going to discuss the subtextual significance of Kasumi being assigned to the new Faith Arcana, her various personas, her choice of firearms, and her Fan of These outfit, not once, but twice over. Tying to that notion of repetition, there are areas of Yoshizawa's character arc that leave me and many others fairly perplexed. While the overall message and narrative intent for Yoshizawa is well loved, the manner in which the narrative mishandles her story and delivers it to the audience nearly sours the whole experience and I'm going to explain why. So, in order to answer all these questions, let's wake up, get up, and get out there to address the former points. <laughs> to the coarsely slothful and wishy-washy writers of Persona 5, Sirs and Madams, for numerous years, your storytelling efforts have aimed to emphasize the significance of pursuing independence and self-betterment, eradicating sloth and laziness from one's own character, a pursuit that ranks among the most utmost of priorities for any individual. After creating one story, you then decided to expand upon it in the most royal of methods. Within this retelling of a classic tale, you elected to include a young girl split in two, who instead of criticizing all society or any of its slothful aspects, it was to be a more personal story about grief, loss, and the cold of the soul. Generally, this young lady has struck a chord with those who lent their ear to her plight, but lo, it was sorely mishandled. Like many others, I was excited to see how she would play her part, only to be snubbed by the aspects of thine own tale that you refused to change your right over. With this failure to fully commit by adding this young lady to your retelling of such a classic tale, you appear wishy-washy, making it truly difficult to ascertain the strengths of her character and the strengths of this tale in particular. While your intent for this young lady remains intact, we are very much disappointed to see such potential greatness be squandered. Thus, we have decided to steal away those desires, and we will do so without fail. From The Phantom Thieves of Hearts. You know, I'm not gonna lie guys, I thought this heist wasn't gonna require a calling card this time around. Despite what the calling card itself said, I don't really hate anything about Yoshizawa's character. I don't have any beef with either forms of her either, or with any parts of her writing. 
I don't hate her for what her character represents within the overall arc of the game, especially as someone who's also struggled with some major depressive episodes throughout his life. In fact, I can appreciate the maturity in which Atlas handled Sumi's guilt and grief, exacerbating all the physical symptoms of her depression. Instead of detailing Yoshizawa's story as one of blood, guts, and gore, Sumi's arc is centered around the idea of dancing around trauma, but never fully confronting it. It's less about the anguish of her Marky states of mind, but rather, the third semester seems to be about the absence or woeful ignorance of suffering. It's about living in a picturesque fantasy land where everything is dreamlike and perfect, set during the frigid cold months of the new year as Tokyo experiences some light snowfall. There's no blizzards or freezing rain occurring, but it's just enough snow to make Shibuya in wintertime seem like a fairy tale setting. Maraki's palace also echoes this too, as if it was just an immaculate clean white room. Again, no blood or guts here, just a general feeling of uneasiness, as everything seems to be a little bit too perfect. Persona 5 Royal isn't Silent Hill 2 or 4, and it certainly isn't a game like, say, Cry of Fear. While those are without a doubt good games that I do enjoy from time to time when the mood does strike me in that way, I do take issue with how in certain forms of media, people with mental health issues, such as depression, are depicted as some kind of crazed lunatics with some fairly obtuse horror metaphors that depict their anguish. It's a cliche that rubs me the wrong way as someone who has suffered in that capacity before. I found myself nodding along with Sumiri as she explained herself throughout the plot of Persona 5. It's very good and imagine that it took a lot of restraint not to create anything lesser than what made it into the final product of the game. This is also why I can appreciate Shinji Yamamoto, the writer for Persona 5 Royal's new content, for actually tackling the subject matter directly and bluntly instead of writing Yoshizawa's character arc to be something derivative of getting the robot Shinji. However, for all the highlights of Yoshizawa's character arc, the problems with the character often align with the way that she's implemented in the first, well, 90% of Persona 5 Royal. You get the impression that Yoshizawa is indeed important to the overall plot, or even unique, as she shows up in Sai's palace to help Joker escape in the beginning of the game, alluding to some kind of promise or another along the way. Playing through her confident arc as well, you also notice that she only has five ranks as part of the Faith Arcana, which at first seems like a boon. Less time to spend with her and less points of her confidant to rank up means that you can get to the bottom of what she's about if you run through her confidant as quickly as you can. However, if you do that, Kasumi basically disappears from the plot of the game until it decides to shove her back into the plot. Despite her being a major character focus in Royal, her character always has this side character feeling for me, which makes it even more jarring where the game suddenly decides to shove her back into the plot to try and make her relevant again. The plot either has her ignore crucial parts of the game, like say, for example, Yoshizawa not showing any outward concern as to why one of Shujin's star athletes, Shiho Suzui, attempted suicide by jumping off the roof of the school. A school that Yoshizawa just transferred to on scholarship. The game never has Kasumi question just what the hell she walked into. In other instances, the new content ends up just feeling crammed and uninspired involving her, Maruki, and Akechi in the least effective ways possible. This is not only incredibly contrived within the game itself, but it also poses a challenge for me as well. As we continue our infiltration in order to understand Yoshizawa's character arc, I cannot contextualize her character to the actions of the Phantom Thieves or the various palace rulers that they might take down. Sure, this might be a boon to the overall video length and make for a shorter heist here, but again, all the other party members' confident arcs are contextualized after their Persona Awakenings. For Yoshizawa, this does not happen until the final weeks of the game. After making one of effectively small cameos throughout the game, she suddenly awakens to her Persona near the climax of the game, as if that wasn't bad enough, the worst example of this in my opinion happens, as she and Maruki and Joker are given a Madama Mono character development on October 11th, which is also the same day that President Sakuma dies and the Phantom Thieves are framed for murder. And I complained last time about Makoto and Haru's Showtime attack being overshadowed by the heist where we take down Sai and then backstab Akechi. Even even after waking to her persona, Kasumi doesn't join the party either. This is even more frustrating when the game spends the entirety of its runtime teasing you about the possibility of Yoshizawa joining the team. They literally invoke the put on a bus trope as the plot constantly needs to keep her in the pocket of plot relevance, but out of the way of what's already been written in Vanilla Persona 5. Looking over abilities as well, I got excited to see that Kasumi was a crit and bless skill specialist with her persona's incredible trait, Veil of Midnight. This increases Ali's chances of not being down by critical strikes. In other words, there'll be less one mores going up by enemies and less overall outgoing damage just by the virtue of Kasumi being in your party with her persona. The Okuma boss fight would have been made so much easier by her merely being in the party due to that passive skill and a set of technical attacks with Heat Wave. <laughs> Wow, dude. 
What the fuck is this boss fight? The plot still keeps her from infiltrating palaces at her side until 95% of the game is complete. Morgana dissuades her from joining forces to take down Shido, and by that time she just joined the party for real, she immediately becomes obsolete in combat. You know, it's really funny how this happens as well. Haru suffering most from the final party syndrome became a meme in the Persona community when Vanilla Persona 5 was a thing, but comparatively, Sumi has it way worse. At least with Haru, she has some use during a boss fight with her father, and if you really wanted to, you can build her in like three different ways. Haru can specialize in purely Psy or gun skills, or you can even build her to become a hybrid of both as she protects the party with Lightfall and Cool Customer. By the time Sumi fully joins the party at the end of the game, I could basically demolish any shadow with Ana Ryuji boosting Joker's physical and magical skills with her spells and persona traits, with a catchy filling in for the fourth party member. <laughs> Moreover, no matter how high you pump your crit chances with App Pupil or Brave Step with Sumi, Persona 5 World doesn't lock critical attacks or any instant kill abilities to work on bosses and mini-bosses. It will always miss or be nullified. This is understandable due to balancing reasons, but the result of this gameplay quirk ends up neutering half of Sumi's spells, leaving her only able to spend blessed skills, which, of course, Joker can fill that in with ease. She is literally borderline redundant and useless compared to the prowess of her other party members, which is so ironic given Sumi's whole character arc that's been revealed by this point in the game. All the other Phantom Thieves are literally better than her at everything they do. It's a shame too, because they think Sumeru's Persona Awakening is one of the best in the game. I even think in some circumstances it's better than odds, which for me saying something like that is downright heretical. I think the keyword here for Sumi is shoehorned, as it would seem that Atlas did not want to make any drastic changes to the overall plot of Vanilla Persona 5, which again, sucks shit. Dude, imagine how awesome it would be for Kasumi to witness Akechi's reveal as the Black Mask aboard Shido's ship, only for Akechi to be revealed to then be alive in the third semester? Bunch of missed opportunities here and there. You know, it's kind of strange to think how poorly Sumi is handled in Persona 5 Royal when compared to all the other times that Alice had made an expansion or a definitive version of one of their other games. Think of Catherine Full Body, Persona 3 Fez, The Answer, and Persona 3 Portable. All the content and changes they made were valuable additions to the vanilla game and handled fairly well. Even Persona 4 Golden's edition of Marie was handled better than Kasumi's edition of Royal, or so I would like to believe. As you work with Marie to help regain her memories, she not only interacts with Narukami, but she also touches base with the other members of the investigation team as well. It's a little hamstrung and forced at times, but it works well enough to establish Marie as someone who at least feels close to the party and, at most, a friend to everybody else within it. It also makes Marie's boss fight so much more emotionally impactful than, say, the rest of the Phantom Thieves just randomly showing up in Maruki's palace and then immediately fighting Sumi. Because plot bottom text, they're not allowed to ask any important questions about the situation, only fight her. I feel as though Alice should have pulled more from Marie when implementing Sumi and Royal's plot here. I understand that Sumeria has some disagreements with the ideology of the Phantom Thieves, but for someone stuck in a slump and later finding out that she's been brainwashed and being something that she's literally not, perhaps there could have been some moments here where Sumi could have learned something from the Phantom Thieves. They are by now girls of veterans of stealing hearts and are indeed experts in understanding how trauma could arrest someone's growth. Perhaps there could have been a few scenes with onboarding the importance of self-confidence to Sumire, a lesson that she's learned throughout the entirety of the game. Considering what an has been through with the near death of Shiho, and considering that An herself seems to be most in touch with her emotions out of all of her teammates, that conversation would have been extremely valuable to both An and Sumi's character growth and development. I would also say the same thing about a potential scene with Ryuji and Makoto. Perhaps with Ryuji, we could have had a scene at the gym on Central Street where Ryuji and Sumire do some cardio together. Maybe the plot, for once, can actually allow Ryuji to tutor Nua's Greenhorn and impart a lesson to her about perseverance to Sumire given his leg injury. Ryuji won't ever be the same athlete he once was, thanks to Kamoshida breaking his fucking leg, and gymnastics won't ever come as naturally as they did to Samire as they did to Kasumi. The point of such a lesson would be to never give up, and it's especially poignant coming from Ryuji. For Makoto, she could easily relate to Samira's experiences of living under her sister's shadow. That would be a natural conversation for Makoto and Samira to have. Unfortunately, these are all hypotheticals, of course, but it is indicative of just how well shoehorned, Sumi is to 90% of the game. The game wants us to treat her like one character and then immediately asks us, after the point is reached, to completely rethink everything about her character in a new setting with new stakes as she literally becomes a completely different character. However questionable her implementation was in the plot, the latter I can mostly forgive. I say mostly because the writing pulls a cheap trick with Kasumi's name with respect to how the plot has to preserve Kasumi's true identity from Joker for the twist. I'm not even sure if I want to call this a stroke of genius or incredibly fucking contrived. As Maruki will eventually mention, whenever Sumire would hear anyone refer to her by her name, Sumire, her altered and delusional cognition, would interpret that as people calling her Kasumi. The only exception to this rule is Joker, as he was convinced Sumire was Kasumi due to a mix-up with her wallet and school ID. 
This is where the big old fucking fast one happens. There are scenes in the game where Kasumi tags along with some of our party members to take the train to school. During these sequences, everyone, every single member of the Fantasies, including Akechi, mind you, refers to Kasumi not by her first name, but as Yoshizawa-san. Now, as I've discussed in the previous episodes of the series, but and more specifically within Makoto's own episode, rather than everyone referring to her as Kasumi or Sumira Yoshizawa, you will refer to her in Japanese as Yoshizawa Kasumi or Yoshizawa Sumire due to everyone except Joker only knowing her as a classmate or a potential co-worker. They aren't quite close enough to warrant a more affectionate or informal way to refer to Sumi by her first name, and thus are obliged to, rather politely, refer to her as Yoshizawa-san or in English, Miss Yoshizawa. This thereby sidesteps the need for the rest of the Phantom Thieves, Maruki, Akechi, or literally anybody else to refer to Kasumi and or Sumire by her first name, thus exposing her delusional state of mind to the world and to the rest of the thieves. Ooh, it's so spicy and swarmy. It's such contrived nonsense that does actually make sense when considering that Kasumi is an extremely polite, respectful, and former person. But fucking hell, is it ever indicative of the problems that have with how she's handled in the game? The plot positions her in such a manner where she literally can't become overly familiar with anyone but Joker, lest Maruki's fuckery become blatantly obvious. One last thing before we start our infiltration proper. I really, really, really hate the clingy anime girl trope who wants Senpai to notice her. It's part of the reason why I find Persona 5's Risa Kujikawa and Persona 5's Makoto Nijima so abrasive and cringeworthy. Consequently, this is also why I prefer the likes of Naruto and On over everyone else. They may make mistakes to show a bit of naivety from time to time, which I do find endearing, but they seem to be intelligent or emotionally intelligent enough to synthesize the conclusions from their own mishaps to then learn and work to rectify them. For the Kasumi partition of her Confine arc, it feels less about her growing as a person and more about her developing an attachment to Joker. It contrasts against each other of the confidence where Joker is more of a viewer than a participant. This notion about Sumi's character also gets kind of annoying when you're forced to spend time with her, and, well, perhaps I'm reading a bit too much into this, but there are some romantic undertones here. As Kasumi, it practically feels like you're just on dates with her all the time, rather than just regular hangouts with your other confidence that you do hang out with throughout the game. For example, if you take her to Ikonoshira Park, she is the only confidant where hanging out with her is being on those boats, instead of on that trail overlooking the river. Come on, you expect me to think that the two totally platonic friends taking a tranquil boat ride out there are only there to talk about gymnastics and being better people? You're telling me that the new character included with a new version of Persona 5 who constantly dotes upon you, calls you senpai, and is too cute and wholesome for the world, wasn't designed to crush the protagonist in such a manner? Her entire existence just seems like fan service and waifu bait. Ignoring the fact that Joker only gets a showtime attack with Akechi and Sumire, but nobody else, Sumire's showtime is just over the fact flirtatious as she clings to Joker as he swings around, acting elated as she jumps from his arms to tangle with him. There is no platonic explanation for that smile. That is just an expression of pure bliss. How is he so fucking hot? And respectful! There's something wrong with him! Think about that though, you'd think given Makoto's popularity, they would have made one for the Queen and the Gentleman Thief for Royal, but nah. The way Kasumi has given so much importance over the rest of our squad also has levied some accusations of her being a Mary Sue, which you could argue is kind of the point of her character in some respects. However, there is one part of the game where the clumsiness in which Kasumi is handled gets outright malicious. When Joker and the rest of the Fantasies are executing the plan to get Joker captured within Sai's palace in order to turn the tables on Shido and Akechi, the game has Kasumi show up in order to save Joker and to further tease us about her involvement later in the game. Never mind the fact that at this point in the game, Joker could easily take out any number of shadows at this point, Sumi shows up and shows off a little bit. It's a cool sequence, but given how she even knew we would be in Sai's palace at this most dangerous and crucial time is kind of crazy. Let alone how she managed to sneak around the place during a raid by the feds, it's all hand waved away. After the fact, Sumi tells us that she's been following us the entire time. Now, to be clear, the game doesn't specify if Sumi was telling us throughout all of her infiltration in Sai's palace, or as we near the date to send the calling card, but the details hardly matter here. She did follow us. This diminishes the agency incompetence of both the Phantom Thieves and Akechi. Turns out, the plan to pairing repulse Akechi through cognitive fuckery wasn't that bulletproof after all if someone like Yoshizawa could easily tail us. It also paints Akechi as being a bit of an idiot for not suspecting that there was a third party involved. You'd think that the seasoned Metaverse assassin would tend to notice these things, or the navigator for the Fantasies would be able to understand that there's another persona using the palace within close proximity to the leader. But nah, hand wave it away. Doesn't matter. 
but Tava deems her to be a weird reading and doesn't ask questions. Oracle is genuinely confused as to how quickly this random anomaly obliterated all the shadows with Joker. The game later tries to crack a joke about how Makoto is comparatively inept at telling us, but it doesn't land, because the angle of the joke is on Makoto and not on Sumire. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what a Mary Sue does to her narrative, and it kind of sucks. At the end of all things here, I find myself blindly annoyed at Yoshizawa, and perhaps you feel the same way too. Make no mistake though, despite all my differences and disagreements with how the plot treats her, the tale of the Yoshizawa sisters is still one for the history books. So, let's jump right into the heist to explain why Persona 5's allegory for their own version of the Cinderella tale is a story that must be recounted and chronicled for all to appreciate it. Let the phantom thievery begin! Before we begin, I would like to reiterate two things. Firstly, Persona 5 is a Japanese game made by a Japanese entertainment company for a Japanese audience. Persona 5's writing and characters are quite obviously going to be contextualized within Japanese cultural and sociological norms. To that end, Persona 5 is heavily critical of those various Japanese cultural norms, as the game is a form of critical commentary to criticize society and its various norms. In our previous episodes where we covered Persona 5's Anzakamaki, Ryuji Sakamoto, and Makoto Nijima, we were counting how these characters are utilized as vehicles to do just that. If you'd like to find out what sociological issues the likes of On, Ryoji, Makoto intended to critique as part of the game, check out the description for a link to those particular videos if you want a more holistic examination. I say this because we're not going to build upon what we've already mentioned in those previous episodes. For all the commentary these characters provided as part of their arcs, I want to focus on the differing degrees of isolation and loneliness On, Makoto, and Ryuji all felt before awakening to the various personas and joining our party. While most of them deviated to different resolutions to their own character arcs as they all took heed from their own rebellious hearts, they all generally comment upon personal isolation the inability to connect with others, or more specifically, society being blind and tone deaf to the suffering. Still sticks out. Hasn't changed a bit. For On, we went over how Japan, being one of the most laddish and patriarchal societies on the planet, maliciously interacted with On by virtue of On simply being an attractive person. Conventional misogynistic wisdom would hold that because On is an attractive woman, the rumor mill held that On seduced Kamashita in fact, omitting the clear difference in both age and power dynamics there. Her looks to her peers lent them the incorrect understanding that On actually enjoyed garnering the attention of various men, when really, On wanted no part in any supposed relationship with Kamashita or anyone else for that matter. This and the fact that On, due to her blonde hair and blue eyes, was perceived as some kind of slutty foreigner Carlos appears to isolate her and deem her as an outcast. Despite On making efforts to fit in, such as dyeing her hair black or wearing baggy oversized clothes to hide her curves as it were, her mere presence and her being different was grounds for her peers to talk behind her back and for Kamashita to pursue and blackmail her. Worse still, On lost her own confidence in both herself and within her own beauty due to the sexual harassment she endured at Kamashita's behest. She became afraid of her beauty, attracting the wrong kind of attention, and began treating this core aspect of herself as a gangrenous limb, something to be removed or amputated to fit in with greater society. While On was doing her best to endure this harassment for the sake of her best friend by attempting to placate and appease Kamashita, Ryuji had no interest in doing so. However, with Ryuji's inherent desire to protect his friends from abuse and his bullshit detector being well attuned to Kamashita's own bullshit, Ryuji, in a moment of righteous fury, decided to take a swing at Kamashita, a move that then allow Kamashita to retaliate, break Ryuji's leg, claim self-defense, and dissolve the track team. This immediately restricted Ryuji from society as everyone from his peers to the staff of the school treated him as a pain in the ass. Kamashita's word and reputation was king at Shujin, so why would they listen to some violent punk kid who tried to punch him? I bet Kawakami already told you stuff like, don't get involved with him, huh? Ryuji's heart was in the right place there, as he, of course, wouldn't swing for no reason. Kamashita would taunt Ryuji for being the son of an abusive drunkard, who would physically abuse both Ryuji and his own mother. The sins of the father were being visited upon his son, and as Kamashita implied that Ryuji was too weak and pathetic to compete on the track team, this would also imply that Kamashita stated that Ryuji was too weak to defend his own mother from harm. This would obviously cause Ryuji to snap, and of course, it cost him his reputation as the track star, which Ryuji desperately wanted to reclaim from Kamashita. Ryuji would eventually learn that there was no way to reclaim what Kamashita took from him, and he should instead take strength from him embodying the troublemaker that everyone thought he already was. Stop looking down on me with that stupid smile on your face! Ryuji was dealt the worst kind of injustice, and he had to bear everlasting consequences for seeking restitution, to be the only one at Shujin Academy to know the painful and agonizing truth about the matter. It was Ryuji against the world, as Kamashita basically gaslit everyone into compliance with his lies, a theme that was then elaborated upon with Makoto. Makoto perfectly captures what being lonely and isolated from everyone else feels like. She's constantly gaslit and taking on more and more responsibilities due to a sense of social propriety that is inherent to her position as student council president and due to her feeling as though she's just a straight up burden to her older sister. The adults who are supposed to mentor Makoto continue to stab her in the back and invalidate her own emotions. On and Ryuji are also guilty of, rather ironically, using the same room mill that once placed them in various precarious positions, which they too also weaponized to demean Makoto as incompetent and useless. 
However, instead of becoming all dejected, willowy, and lonely, Makoto's true feelings began to surface. Beneath all that passive-aggressive, calm, and collected demeanor lay a tempest of rage and anger. Anger that we saw surface when everyone was getting on her case. Makoto was once of the belief that she needs to ride the coattails of others in order to achieve success, and that to some degree, she owed people favors for enabling her to climb the ladder of success. Instead, Makoto found a way to live independently, free of those same obligations, and free of living in the shadow of a more accomplished older sibling. As Shuja is presented to us in Persona 5, the school itself serves as a small microcosm of wider society, as it does foreshadow the people and entities that the fan of these will eventually do battle with. Those who are deemed to be lost causes like Ryuji, On, Makoto, and Joker are fleeced by those inside its hierarchy who only look out for themselves, as everybody within this trashy prep school seems to be entirely selfish. There's no sympathy for a ragtag group of delinquents, as we're all deemed to be beyond saving, as the likes of Kamashita and Kobayakawa only see us as a means to advance their own goals, as they then relentlessly sandbag us all the while. Why didn't you allow a student like him to transfer here? He's already started associating with Sakamoto. A student with a criminal record and the culprit of an assault case? At this rate, it'd be pointless how much I contribute to the school. Shujin Academy is a place where those with aspirations come to learn. Unworthy students like yourselves don't have any right to be here. Get with the program. We are the trash of society, and we have to find our own means of dealing with its rather derogatory labels. However, for Yoshizawa, this isn't the case whatsoever. Her reputation as an honor student and as a skilled athlete precede her and her arrival to Shujin. Look, isn't that her? You mean that one with the red ribbon? Uh, I guess so. She's so thin. It's not fair. I've got my hair in a ponytail, too. Her talent has already rendered her much renowned prestige, the opposite of what's happened to Joker on his first day. This juxtaposition of Joker's treatment to Yoshizawa's by Shujin students is particularly interesting as it all stems from her reputation. Specifically, the students see Yoshizawa as a productive member of society. She's polite, curt, and extremely respectful with others, which also gets some students to start to crush on her as well. It's because of these behavioral tendencies, she's then seen as an attractive and desirable person to be around and for other students to model. However fake and facetious this notion is, given that most of the people here are in fact toothpaste rumor mongering snakes. While Yoshizawa comes to Shujin largely unaware of what's going on behind closed doors and in the PE faculty office to girls like her, she is also unaware that she's being used as a tool by the Leviathan that is Shujin as well. Instead of this microcosm of society looking upon Yoshizawa with direct malice, they will instead disguise their malevolence as benevolence. All to say that Shujin Academy, as a learning institution, isn't really interested in mentoring its students to lead successful lives. As we see with the reason why Shujin allows Joker to attend despite his criminal record, the athletes and those the school chooses to rehabilitate are just used as means for prestige and bragging rights for the school. It's only interested in pumping out alumni who are able to meet its absurd standards that would often change at the drop of a hat. Despite the talent being something that the students will bring to the school, Shujin takes all the credit for their accomplishments despite trying to hamstring their success at every turn. The institution's constant need for clout and the need to preserve its own reputation is objectively harmful for the students who attend. It may also explain why Makoto was so susceptible to gaslighting and manipulation by the staff of the school. Despite holding the position of student council president and having the brains to match, Makoto doesn't have the power and authority that comes with the position. She's merely an extension of the authority of her adult betters as the lord of her future over her expecting Makoto to toe the line on pain of taking away the future she's invested so hard into. The students at the school even prey upon compassion and interpersonal relationships as well through blackmail. As soon as Joker and Ryuji start hanging out together, everyone sort of rolls their eyes, saying, of course the two violent psychos would start hanging out with each other. Everyone from the teachers to the students takes everything in face value, which is more apparent with An in her relationship with Shiho. As another student athlete, Shiho's on the starting lineup for the volleyball team. She's on the cusp of greatness and will reach great heights so long as she and An are able to endure Kamashita's torment. Kamashita specifically targets An due to her close relationship with Shiho and exploits her compassion to her best friend. This then brings us to Yoshizawa and in the manner in which Joker meets her. She's a seemingly kind and respectful girl, which puts her in stark contrast to literally everyone else that Joker interacts with. From Sojiro to Kabayakawa to Kawakami to Ryuji and then to An, it would seem that everybody fucking hates us based on our reputation. The only one not to do this is Yoshizawa, out of respect for our seniority as her senpai, her senior classmate. You're a second year at Shujin Academy, correct? I'm a first year there myself. Thinking you totally slipped my mind back on the train, and I didn't want to be rude to my senpai. Please excuse me. While it's easier to explain her overly polite personality by saying Japan bottom text, it's less about how Japanese society calls for someone like Kasumi to be curtly towards her seniors, and more about the qualities and wholesome strengths of a Kasumi's character. In the first act of the game, these qualities are rare and never expressed by anyone other than Yoshizawa. Even when those wholesome moments are present, they are often soured by Kamashita's influence as he seeks to damage our reputation to our impressionable young Kohai. On the 18th of April, we run to Yoshizawa and Kamashita outside the guidance office where he says the following in an attempt to sway Yoshizawa to his side. Thank you again. Oh, you know this guy, Yoshizawa? 
Yes, he lent me a helping hand earlier. I recommend you steer clear of the likes of him if you have any consideration for your future. Remember the discussion we just had? There are a number of students in this school you shouldn't get involved with. This one's at the top of the list. Oh, the delinquent transfer student? Sorry to interrupt, but I need to use the guidance office. Oh, pardon me. We should be going too. Don't want to get in the way of guiding this delinquent and all. Eat a dick, Kamoshida. Please excuse us. It would seem that Yoshizawa, unlike the rest of our peers, doesn't buy all the rumors about her criminal record or Kamoshida's past progressive gossiping. Being employed in such a manner would be simply out of pocket for her. Even when she gave up her seat on the train on the 12th of April to let the elder lady sit, only to have it stolen by a tired salaryman, she stops herself by saying something ever so slightly impolite and then says to Joker that she can empathize with his own position. Oh, wow, what speed. I mean, excuse me, that seat was for this lady. Oh. It's all right. I can understand his position as well. I'm sorry I couldn't be any help. It's all right. Please allow me to carry your luggage at least. Thank you. Ain't it heavy though? Not at all. I train plenty. Back to standing outside the school guidance office, she mentions how Joker spoke up on her behalf, and despite Kamashita trying to dissuade her from showing any kindness towards Joker, she still bows and excuses herself after the fact. She still remains kind and caring, showing Joker the most respect out of literally everyone. There's something to be said about her manners and the effort she puts into being polite within a microcosm of society that is not at all interested in the welfare of others beyond the superficial. Perhaps due to Yoshizawa's kind and caring nature, the school's rumor begins to fix it on her after she hosts suicide attempt. Of course, Yoshizawa's sudden rise in popularity has to be due to Kamoshida's influence upon the school. Her popularity was likely means to bury Shio's on life attempt, which again, really fucking sucks that someone as kind as Yoshizawa is being used as a tool to obfuscate how shitty Shujin is. As we learned from all three of her previous videos covering Makoto, Ryuji, and An, Shiho being assaulted and driven to suicide was, at best, treated like some kind of weird spectacle. Just another day of melodrama at Shujin. At worst, her death was treated like a personal inconvenience to the entirety of the student body. Most importantly, it seriously sucks that our school is going to be known for stuff like this. I wonder if it'll affect our college entrance. Can you guys get a grip? She used to be the best that Shujin has to offer, the gold standard of talent that this trashy prep school can produce. A line of thought that would be true if Yoshizawa wasn't above all the mudsling and the targeted Joker. In a world that forces his students to toe the line, Kasumi manages to stay polite yet simultaneously hold her own opinions about things. She doesn't cage to the rumor mill and tries to actually empathize with other people. This attitude is certainly unique. Empathy is an ability that most of this academy don't possess. And while Yoshizawa is somewhat swayed by Kamoshida in trying to assassinate Joker's character, she stays steadfast in her own beliefs that Joker possesses a high sensitivity to injustice. Not that her beliefs need to be vindicated in the first place, but nevertheless, Joker sticks up for her again when some random dude tries to harass her in Shibuya. Come on, there's no need to be shy. Like I said... If you're busy, I'll put my number in your phone so you can call me later. Sound like a plan? Shibuya is supposed to be the busiest street in all of Tokyo, and when slimy middle-aged dude grabs Yoshizawa, everyone around her just looks on as passive bystanders refusing to take any action to help someone who obviously needs it. Everyone except Joker, of course. Protect Kun steps in and resolves the situation, to which Yoshizawa will be incredibly grateful for. What do you want? Don't get worked up. I'm just being friendly here. Uh, what the? What are you getting so jumpy about? Like you're anything special. Uh. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for the trouble. It is rather strange how Yoshizawa frames her own issues and needs as nothing more than a hassle to Joker, which, in turn, means that Joker's gratitude must be repaid somehow. This is just how the formal and polite Yoshizawa rolls, as this kindness towards Joker will carry through the rest of the day to the cleanup event at Ikonoshiro Park. When everyone seemingly dishes us because of our reputation, Yoshizawa comes over to greet us and eat Maruki's overly salted miso soup for lunch. She expresses her gratitude to us yet again, to the point of it being a little excessive. Even as Joker tries to say it was no sweat, Yoshizawa still insists on continuing to be genuine with Joker. Sorry, but I'm not even finished. There's one more issue I need to address. 
I'm also so sorry for what happened the other day. The run-in we had outside of the guidance office. Remember the discussion we just had? There are a number of students in this school you shouldn't get involved with. This one's at the top of the list. Oh, 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 oh. the delinquent transfer student? Mr. Kamoshida had just told me about you a moment prior, so I sort of spoke without thinking there. I heard some of my classmates gossiping about you, too. Yes, people are discussing all sorts of things about you behind your back. I don't like gossip or rumors and the like. And I know this will sound strange since I just met you, but you don't seem like the kind of person they describe. She apologizes to Joker about nearly buying into whatever baseless rumors Kamoshida tried to drag her into, and for nearly believing in it as well. We also learn that Yoshizawa puts no stock in the rumor mill, and prefers to judge, or not to judge in this case, people based on their actions. A foreign constant to most Shujin students, especially given the absurdity of the crimes Joker's absolutely positively most certainly committed. It'd be a different story if all those rumors were actually true, though. What were all the crimes I'd heard? Burglary, murder, and elephant tusk trafficking, was it? <laughs> I drive with a license too. <laughs> Even I can tell you're joking. She says all this as we sit down together in the park after a cleanup event, another means of Shujin trying to recover and improve its reputation after one of its students nearly died on campus due to its apathetic indifference. Yoshizawa is unique and one of a kind within the War Persona 5 has presented to us thus far with both Kamoshida and Madarame. As a strong in the affluent aimed to punch down upon those who seem to have no choice but to bow down to the power and control, Yoshizawa has managed to stay above it all. Even her first four party members aren't capable of this until after Makoto joins the team. Only after she joins her team do the fan and thieves truly not judge people by their place within society as someone who may or may not have enabled their targets to store desires. She's also unique in the fact that, unlike the rest of her peers, she seems generally compassionate and doesn't think about how helping other people would firstly benefit her. I believe you already learned from our meeting at school that my What the hell just happened? It's a cheesy moment, but I can't imagine anyone else acting purely on reflex there. Acting without any hesitation whatsoever to recover that balloon for that kid. In her haste, though, she dropped her wallet and school ID on the bench. As Joker sneaks a peek, we find out how and why someone with a name such as Kasuma Yoshizawa is too pure for the society that she exists within, and above being sucked in the petty drama of her peers, as her name would otherwise indicate when written into kanji. Digging into the etymology of her name, the kanji for Ka means flower or blossom, and the kanji for Sumi means to be clear or pure. For her surname, Yoshizawa, Yoshi would mean perfume, fragrance, virtuous, favorable, or even beautiful, with Zawa, or Sawa in this case, meaning a swampy marshland, or more directly, shallow wetlands. Extrapolating all that, Kasumi Yoshizawa is a fragrant, clear, and pure flower that finds itself within some kind of smelly marshland. However, where any lesser flower would wilt or dirty itself, Kasumi Yoshizawa seems to pride herself on being virtuous. She prides herself on being clean, above the common rabble of her peers. <laughs> I guess you sleuthed me out before I got to tell you. Well, you've cracked the case. I'm Kasumi Yoshizawa, a first year. You mean that back there? Oh, it was just some basic gymnastics. It's not that difficult once you get the hang of it. Just a hop, skip, and a jump. She's entirely too perfect. Everything seems to come naturally to Kasumi. Even the gymnastics moves she just did, she plays off for a joke as if it was just a trivial thing to do. Her virtuous nature and her position as our Kohai puts her in a rather unique place relative to the rest of her future party members and the rest of her confidants as well. As Joker forms relationships with his confidants throughout the game, we often see both parties striking mutually beneficial deals with said party members and confidants having some kind of sketchy past as was the case with, say, Takemi and EY. For party members like Ryuji, Ana, and Makoto, all look to experience new things and fundamentally change parts themselves. Instead of any of that, with Kasumi being an upstanding and compassionate person, with an athletic reputation to back her unusually sunny disposition, she merely just wants someone to confide in about her shortcomings and her sport of choice. Lately, I haven't been getting the results I want from my performances, and I'm worried that I'm overthinking things. So it would be wonderful if you could give me some advice whenever you have the time. Of course I am. I'm not looking for technical coaching, so much as just lending me an ear from time to time. As we agree to lend her an ear once in a while in exchange for some training in gymnastics, we learn that Kasumi is assigned to a particularly strange and rather unique arcana. I am thou. Thou art I. Thou hast acquired a new vow. 
It shall become the wings of rebellion that breaketh thy chains of captivity. With the birth of the Faith Persona, I have obtained the winds of blessing that shall lead to freedom and new power. Enter the Faith Arcana. This Arcana makes its first debut within Persona history, and much like Kasumi, its origins and thematic elements are both equally obscure and incredibly unique. Within previous Persona games, Atlas often had to pull from obscure tarot card decks in order to then tie some thematic elements to a particular character. For example, the Aeon and Hunger Arcanas aren't considered to be part of the main standard decks, but nevertheless, they are for similar or yet additive alternative meanings to existing cards. For Kasumi, she actually follows none of these specific rules, as the Arcana that I previously mentioned are evolutions upon other Arcanas that already exist within the standard deck. Instead, the Faith Tarot Card Arcana comes from the Visconti's Forza Tarot Card deck, and information about this deck, and the card in particular, is indeed very sparse, as it was created in the middle of the 15th century. The Visconti's Forza Tarot Card deck was arguably the first Tarot Card deck ever to be created, and due to its age, this deck does not include the Devil in the Tower Arcana, nor did the deck include any numerical values assigned to the 21 major Tarot Card Arcana cards. I know, I know, we won't get to hear Nick say the line, but what we do lose out on, we gain elsewhere. The Faith Arcana not being numbered within Persona 5 is depicted in the game as such. It remains numberless, which is certainly odd compared to the other, other Arcana within the game as well. The art for the Faith Arcana is also particularly strange as well, as the art itself is depicted on every single time we level Kasumi's Confidant, the card itself has a black border instead of a white one, as is the case for the other Confidants within the game. Also, strangely enough, the card itself appears to be ripped and torn. As if to alarm us further, the design of this ripped card depicts a skeletonized version of a Maronite religious leader sitting upon a throne. This is an incredibly unique feature of this card, as all the other Arcana cards are strictly based on Roman Catholic imagery. We are able to recognize this difference because of the kind of staff that the skeleton can no longer wield. The cross upon the staff is known as the Maronite Patriarchal Cross, and while the Maronites are in full communion with the Catholic Church, this is one aspect of their differences in worship compared to the Roman Catholic sect. The Maronites place heavy emphasis upon communal prayer and participation in pious action. In other words, they place a heavy emphasis upon faith itself. This unique cross reflects this notion as its symmetrical and triangular design is symbolically representative of their faith in the Holy Trinity, the nature of God, the one God in all three persons of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Coming back to the card itself, the priest being pretty dead 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 dead, dead is unable to wield the staff and therefore commune with God. As if that was enough, his corpse is also being towed around on a leash by two satyr-like demons with a rather particular mischievous look within their eyes. There is some weird stuff going on with this arcana, and all of it does not bode well for Kasumi. This arcana in particular, as the Faith Arcana, it's supposed to represent the intense belief in others, and oneself in particular. When such a card is reversed in tarot readings, it can represent blind faith misplaced in something that does not deserve trust. It can also mean that one is placing too much hope in false idols, or is generally overconfident. However, while the card does appear to be damaged, it is not reversed. While Kasumi does tell us that she seems to have lost her edge as an athlete as of late, she is aware that she needs to broaden her horizons and examine her problems from a different perspective in order to solve them. So, what gives with the card? Kasumi is not following or believing in any false idols like, say, Kamoshida, and she certainly isn't overconfident. This leaves us with the impression that whatever issues are playing Kasumi are deeply personal and, perhaps, she has lost faith in herself somewhat. As to what exactly that is, we'll have to find out as we continue to lend her an ear. However, before I do that, I would also mention that Kasuma's Confident Art is structured in a very strange way as well. There are only 5 ranks, and of those ranks, they are only unlocked on specific days rather than just advancing through them like normal. As we saw, rank 1 is unlocked and automatically ranks us up to 1 on May 30th. The 2nd and 3rd ranks are unlocked on June 8th and 29th, with rank 4 and 5 becoming available on July 7th and July 28th. In between these events, however, there's going to be days where we won't be hanging out with Kasumi as part of her confident arc, but nonetheless, these events are part of Kasumi's personal growth and details Joker's role to her as a mentor. As such, we'll be bobbing and weaving outside of Kasumi's confident arc and during every other single date that we hang out with her within the game before we go in advance to the ending of her confident arc. So now that we've established who and what Kasumi tentatively is within the slothful society, that is Shujin Academy, let's jump into Kasumi's quasi-confident arc beginning with her outing with her on June 6th in the classic rom-com cliche trope of escorting her home in the rain. Let's see how Kasumi manages to keep her faith all the while and see where she's otherwise lacking. Today is June 6th, and after going 2 for 2 on Heart Stolen, with Joker putting up with a certain nosy Seito Kaicho doing a poor job of tailing us, we run into Kasumi outside school. It's raining, and she doesn't have an umbrella, but Morgana's got her back this once. I thought something like this would happen, so I snuck a collapsible umbrella into your bag. Oh, are you offering to share your umbrella? That'd be wonderful! Thank you so much!
As we walk with Kasumi down to the train station, we find out a bit more about her as an athlete and how dedicated she is to her sport of gymnastics. She has two major competitions coming up, and in order to qualify for them all, she has to place well in the following prelim competition and get her own club to sponsor her as its leader. She also has to watch her health and maintain a strict regimen with her coach, hence why she was worried about catching cold from the rain. However, as Kasumi tells us, she's not doing all this for a letter of recommendation from the principal or to get into a choice university on an athletic scholarship. Her goals are actually much more ambitious than that. It's my dream to compete in gymnastics on the global level. So, I plan on maintaining a strict training regimen with my coach. She wants to be a world-renowned gymnast that competes across the globe. It's quite the goal for a first-year student, but if any of the events involve somersaulting to save a balloon from flying away, Kasuma's got this down pat. All jokes aside though, it's gotta be a rigorous path for someone her age to travel. And while she seems dedicated to her dream, as we make it down to the station and drop her off, there are people who are less enthused with their status as an honor student. I can't thank you enough for today. I swear, I'll return the favor some- Hey, isn't that Yoshizawa? You mean the honors gymnast? She gets the VIP treatment at school, and a boyfriend to escort her around. Miss Special Snowflake sure is living on Easy Street. I'm sorry, you shouldn't have to deal with a misunderstanding like that. It would seem that after two months of being a Chujin and being its darling for the most part, the gossip, jealousy, and slander has finally caught up with Yoshizawa. Still, she tries to remain polite as she all excuses herself for roping Joker into more gossip. It would also appear that she wasn't as loved as she once thought. People, rather needlessly I might add, dislike Yoshizawa out of pure jealousy, and perhaps we might be able to describe her as somewhat lonely as well. You'd think given her popularity, more people would be defending her honor or at least wanting to hang out with her. As of now, the only person who filled the role of something similar to a friend to her has been Joker, but they're not avoiding us and Kasumi by extension because she chooses to hang out with a delinquent criminal. Instead, people are talking behind her back and being disingenuous out of pure jealousy. Even though Kasumi says that she doesn't like getting special treatment, her dislike of such things doesn't change how others perceive her. No, if anything, it's my the same thing happens in class, too. People are often wary of me because I'm an honor student. The school's expecting me to attain strong results in the upcoming competitions, too. They even told me I didn't have to participate in the cleanup event. But I just don't like getting special treatment. Perhaps we had more common with Kasumi than we originally thought, and due to her rapidly getting the ire of her peers, Joker might be the only person she can literally hang out with. As we leave the station, she thanks for taking her along with a positive attitude of hers. Though she might try to shrug it off and stay positive, the next time we meet her at Ikonoshita Park, she would tell us that life hasn't exactly been easy for her these past few months. So let's jump right into that. All right. The day is the 8th of June, and after class, Kasumi contacts us over text. As part of our deal, we lend her an ear from time to time, and in return, she teaches us how to be a bit more flexible. We head over to Ikonoshita Park to train with her, and whatever basics Kasumi teaches us about stretching has Joker just plain exhausted already. We should expect Kasumi not to be winning from all these basics, as she has both the physicality and the correct headspace to perform as she waxes on about how gymnastics is about the harmony between her oblique muscles, the muscles in her waist, which she has to stretch to ensure she stays somewhat flexible during her routines. As we continue hanging out with Kasumi, the dialogue option she has the most affinity with, and the ones that recruit the most social points with her, is when Joker remains persistent and confident in his own abilities, and that of Kasumi's, which we could probably guess also inspired Kasumi to do the same. However, as we sit down on the park's bench, Kasumi lets us in on a little bit of a secret. She loves to continue training with us, but has decided to cut it short on her coach's orders. Turns out, Kasumi's feeling a bit melancholic recently, but she cannot place where these feelings are coming from. It seems that she's tried to keep to herself, but it's gotten to a point where it's affecting her performance, and her coaches have taken notice. It's gotten so bad that her coaches want her to take a break and reevaluate things. Her coach told Kasumi that she needs to really think about who she really is, which is some strange philosophical advice for someone who seems to be a bit of a slump. It's gotten to the point where no matter how hard she practices or trains or stretches, she can't make any tangible improvements within her own routines. She's feeling kind of lost. Previously, there wasn't anything that Kasumi couldn't sort out through just practicing. She recalls her coach's praise. Kasumi's greatest weapon has always been her boldness. The way that Kasumi interprets her coach's advice is to breathe sharp in herself, that the bad and melancholy she's experiencing is merely part of her losing some of her grit that she's demonstrated during practice and during her own performances. She used to be fearless and confident, thinking gymnastics be nothing but a simple and fun challenge. However, since starting high school, this slump has affected her in a negative way. She's gotten taller for one, which I'm sure would have messed up her hand-eye coordination and sense of space when performing routines as well. Kasumi says that she can't move like she used to, nor can she command her own body to be as flexible as it wants to. There's some other complications as well, with Kasumi outright saying there's a period of time where 
where she was terribly depressed. This is where Joker comes in. Kasumi wants someone to remind her of her boldness and teach her how to learn to be confident once again. Based on how we generally stepped up to defend Kasumi twice over now, she believes that we can help her fix herself. We sense Kasumi's appreciation and part ways for the day. When we get back to the blonde, she gives us another call to thank us again for lending us an ear in classic Kasumi fashion. She tells us that she got super hungry during practice with the coach, but we're eating before a strenuous activity would make most people feel sick and want to vomit. This seems to have the opposite effect on Kasumi. This gives her another idea as she'll reclaim her boldness and return Joker's favor and help with the next part of her confident arc. All right. Running through Kasumi's confident arc has her text us again, saying that she could practice in the gym, but as to not distract Joker and herself with her stomach loudly grumbling as her practice and tumble together, she likes to eat lunch first. As it so happens, this is where Sumi also gets to show off something else that she's been working on that's not squarely focused on gymnastics. We find out that she has an interest in cooking, and more specifically, making bentos to take to practice. Her spurt choice also requires her to regulate her own diet, which might seem strange given the size of the one that she brought with her to lunch today. However, as Kasumi explains, all this food is necessary for her to compete, and while it might seem like a lot, she immediately burns off whatever calories she gains by eating what looks like a small feast. Stepping outside of Persona 5 for a second, what Kasumi is doing here is actually very common, and her placing importance in her high-calorie, high-protein, low-fat diet was actually the result of some controversy within the sport of gymnastics. Kasumi mentions that weight control over sport of choice is very important, but statistically speaking, there are some elite gymnasts out there who take this to the point of it affecting their own health. Kasumi's hearty diet was the result of the size expectations for young women that were preferred for competitors within gymnastics. The start of this disturbing trend was first noticed in 1976, where the average size of the US Olympic female team was 5'3 and 105 pounds, and in 1992, the team had shrunk to an average of 4'9 and 88 pounds. There is an absurd amount of pressure placed upon these athletes to such an extent that some thought that in order to stay competitive, they had to maintain a girlish and a somewhat prepubescent figure. This would mean starving themselves and stunting their growth in order to developing hips or breasts that could negatively impact their performance. After all, the judging parts of gymnastics are highly subjective, and within that, one's appearance would be critical to getting those high scores. Even though this particular bout of controversy has passed, if you watch any kind of professional gymnastics competition, you'll notice that all the girls competing have specific body types. This could also be why Kasumi is also absurdly thin, and why the sport comes so naturally to her. Kasumi is either 15 or 16 years old, and is 5'4", but compared to all the other characters in the game, it says a lot that Kasumi only beats out Haru by an inch and her favorite 4'11 gremlin, Futaba, whose growth has been stunted to her being abused and by being a shut in these past few years. The idea is to keep each athlete in limbo, both in height and body, which given that most start competing when they're very young, they rather ironically have a high chance of developing amenorrhea, a disorder where young girls aged 15 to 16 have issues menstruating due to starving themselves so they don't have to throw on a lot of weight during competitions. This, in addition to eating disorders such as bulimia and anorexia, making each athlete lethargic, compounding underlying issues that would eventually lead to early onset osteoporosis and a high risk of cardiovascular disease, we can see why Kasumi's coach has recommended that she eat a ton. Luckily, Kasumi doesn't seem to suffer from any of those previous issues, and we can thank her coach for letting the sport not consume her life. Whoever Kasumi's coach is, she probably stopped Kasumi's bout of depression and angst about being a little sluggish recently in competitions, consume her like the sport has done to so many young girls her age. Her coach is a good egg for encouraging Kasumi not to only take a break, but to also to encourage her to essentially try new things and new hobbies outside of gymnastics. This brings us back to Kasumi's big ass bento, as she tries to stop relating this bento itself back to gymnastics. She cuts herself short and encourages Joker to dig in. However, when Joker takes a bite, his eyes sort of glaze over. Everything about the dish seems to be a bit bland and mismatched. Kasumi made this bento out of consideration for Joker, but then, oddly enough, she immediately becomes all confused and panicked as she starts to catastrophize everything about using the wrong kind of seasoning for Joker's bento. She wanted to go for maximum appeal by using some of the flavors, but in the end, she ended up mixing everything together, making the dish seem rather confused and unfocused. She made it entirely bland. After Joker manages to calm her down so we can finish lunch together, Kasumi, strangely enough, apologizes for the bento quote, not being perfect. A strange thing for Kasumi to say, given that this is the first time she's ever tried to cook for someone else. Joker assures her that everything was fine and that, well, it's a learning experience for everybody, especially for first timers. We should not expect perfection constantly and Kasumi is thankful for Joker's counsel here. She says that if Joker wasn't here, she let her fears get to her and ended up some big pessimistic spiral once again. While the ending of this part of Kasumi's compound arc ends on a comfy note, we've actually learned quite a lot about Kasumi here. In one sense, she's a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to mostly everything she likes doing and this notion isn't without reason. She was good at most things she put her mind to up until very recently, or so it would seem. As Joker helps her find herself once again, we're left to ponder how this drive to perfection and how Kasumi's loss of luster has affected and kind of paralyzed her ability to make her own decisions as well. All right.
Rank 4 of Kasumi's Confident Arc has us venturing to Kichijoji for a bit of a shopping trip with Kasumi. It's not really for a gymnastics thing, but she needs help picking out a pair of glasses. We learn that she's not picking out a pair for herself, but for her dad. Where to be her model is to cycle through some of the glasses she's already picked out, but she remains completely indecisive about which ones to take home. She thinks that all the options were good and unique pairs, but she just can't decide on which one to buy. This echoes the last part of her confidant, where when pressed with any kind of difficult decision, Kasumi seems to immediately catastrophize about what would happen if she made a poor choice or otherwise failed or embarrassed herself. We can tell her to trust her instincts, and while she still manages to choose a nice red pair of glasses, she tells us after the fact that the mere act of having to choose was setting off her anxiety. She remembers how she failed her gymnastics and failed to impress us with her cooking. Messing up here would be unacceptable for her. She mentions something to the effect of how cracking under pressure in these specific instances reminds her of how unlike herself she's been recently and how she's been unable to make any kind of major decision lately. This has kind of led Kasumi to be reliant upon Joker as he makes some of the important decisions for her. She just feels kind of empty, but she can't place why she feels so melancholic all the time. Joker then reminds her that everyone feels a little down sometimes, which picks Kasumi up a little bit and reminds her of why she's all doing this. Extrapolating the advice her own coach gave her, she now believes that finding out who she truly is is about finding more depth about herself. It's not necessarily about reclaiming her boldness as much as it is about getting her self-confidence back. We feel a strong sense of trust from Kasumi as she thanks us for her help before we head off to the blonde for the day. Kasumi calls us as we're about to head inside to tell us that her dad loves the glasses we helped her pick out. The lesson that she's taken away is that she needs to take less time worrying about the what ifs and just take the shot instead for the intent to do well. She knows that actions speak louder than words, but it seems we've finally crested the hill for Yoshizawa as she never to prove that she's not all talk. She bids us farewell as we turn in for the day and prepare for her next meeting on July 11th with a certain prince detective. Today is the 11th of July, and as of now, the fate of these have made quite an impact upon society. The reputation for taking down evil shitbags precedes them with marks that include Kamoshida and Madarame. Their most recent target, Junior Kaneshiro, has caused some buzz too, as he was a crime boss that was operating out in broad daylight in the busiest part of the city, where part of his criminal enterprise was specifically targeting young high schoolers, turn the males into mules to run drugs, and tenure forces female victims into prostitution. After what happened to Madarame, the fate of these going after a legit criminal has gotten people to believe in the brand of justice. Likewise, it has also caused some people to dawn down on the fact that there are indeed vigilantes with good intentions, sure, but this still makes them criminals. I can't just this is the best. The fate of these are outlaws, and while we know he's been a harsh critic of our methods since the Kamoshida incident, nevertheless, this sets the table for our next conversation with Yoshizawa. We run into both the catching Yoshizawa and Shibuya after school, who seem to know each other based on the fact that Yoshizawa's father was a director for Go Morning Japan, the same show that we went to go see as part of a school field trip, and the same trip where we got acquainted with Akechi. Yoshi's always been equally as grateful for her input, and before we sit down together, she shares with us that she's been chosen as her club representative for the next competition. While we do not know how the selection process occurs, but regardless, the school must have both faith in Yoshizawa's abilities and high expectations for her to succeed. As we sit down in a nearby cafe to chat over some coffee with Akechi and Yoshizawa for a minor celebration, she's adamant about not consuming certain beverages and messing up her metabolism. It's do or die now for Kasumi as she prepares for the next bout. She's gotten plenty of advice and coaching thus far, but when she gets down to brass tacks, it's ultimately up to her to succeed and her alone. With this perspective in mind, with the pressure ever mounting upon her to succeed, Akechi can't help himself but ask her she's all about the fan of these and their various reforms that they're invoking within society. What do you think of the Phantom Thieves, Yoshizawa-san? The Phantom Thieves? You mean in the case that they do in fact exist, yes? I admit that the assistance of others in need is a truly great act. But, I simply can't agree with their methods. I see. Care to explain why? I suspect the Phantom Thieves' existence isn't going to be beneficial to society in the long run. How so? Well, for example, when someone's faced with a problem to overcome, I believe they need to do it themselves. Getting help from others is totally fine, but in the end, it takes a person's initiative to truly create lasting change. Yoshizawa's perspective on the Phantom Thieves is a bit uninformed and naive, but as she explains, due in part to Joker's influence upon her life thus far, she believes that in order to change the world, change must be brought about on an individual level first, and then brought up to the collective next. Unbeknownst to Yoshizawa, this ironically is exactly how the Phantom Thieves were formed. Individuals breaking free of their oppressors and then coming together to invoke change within the world. But she does make an excellent point that the Phantom Thieves are a temporary and ineffectual solution. If society relied upon a safety net like the Phantom Thieves, I worry that people would stop making a conscious effort. Granted, this depends on how severe the problem is, and it's inaccurate to apply generalizations to an entire population. 
But I believe a society where everyone simply leaves matters to the Phantom Thieves wouldn't last for very long. It's quite a unique and intelligent perspective into the matter to say that we're actually siphoning the growth of society by getting everyone to rely upon a brand of justice. A third perspective that neither Joker or Ketchy seen or considered before. I see. So in the sense of a person's growth, their actions actually hinder it. It's a decent thought, and as an athlete, it would behoove your Shazawa to think like this. You can't exactly, as an athlete, blame society for all your woes, when really, when it comes down to it, your own personal performance will determine if you're successful or not. Akechi apologizes for bringing up such a touchy subject, and before we can discuss something a bit less controversial, in this meeting with Akechi and Kasumi, we've gained some insight into her way of thinking that has been influenced by Joker. She seems to be aware that making choices requires some kind of willfulness and initiative in order to change oneself. This is what Joker's taught her thus far, and it's this notion that she will express in the last and final part of her confident arc on July 28th. Today is July 28th, and Kasumi's got something for us to do. She's managed to figure out something fun for the both of us to do that relates back to our original goal of regaining her determination and the ability to stop catastrophizing about the possibility of failure. This time, instead of making events for Joker to advise her on or doing something directly related to gymnastics, Kasumi takes us to the batting cage in Young and Jai to show us how far she's come. Initially, she wants to tie her first visit here to gymnastics, but she lets it all slip that she just wanted to come here to show off a little bit. In order to prove to Joker that she's not all talk and that she's learned something from him, she wants Joker to watch her crush her home run. She explains that her father used to take her to the batting cage when she was little, where she proved that she had some excellent hand-eye coordination as she crushed homer after homer. While the other kids were scared of the pitching machine, pitching the balls too fast, Kasumi was there in the box thinking how hard she could crush the next ball. That, and she just kind of liked swinging the bat around too. Now Kasumi is back here a few months later in a minor state of melancholy, hoping to recapture some of that innate feeling of determination and grit she had when she was younger. As she first steps in the cage, she announces her name and prepares herself for the first ball. Only for the first pitch to completely surprise her. And the next one. And the next one. And the next one. And you get the idea. She missed all of them. Not a single ball made contact with the bat as she strikes out. She stands in the batter's box disquieted and disappointed in herself for not being able to do something here as she's once again paralyzed by indecision. Every time the ball would come screaming from the pitching machine, she found herself flinching and her hand-eye coordination lacking. The baseballs were moving faster than she could remember and her inability to act under pressure is getting to her once again. Her slump is seriously affecting her for the worst, but as was the case before, she really needs someone to push her to keep trying. Joker tells her that there's no crying in baseball, and sure enough, Sumi gets back in the box and still misses the first few pitches, but makes contact with the third. My turn. We don't know if she managed to hit a homer with it, but she seems to be pleased that she's even been able to hit it. It's here where we learn a bit more about Kasumi too, and how she rationalizes her own decision-making process as well. She says that, thus far, she's been striving to make a good impression upon everyone she comes across, and as far as she is concerned, she has failed to do so effectively. She now thinks that this desperation to impress others has led her to become overconfident, which is contributing to her slump somewhat. However, since she started hanging out with Joker, she's managed to fix that problem by working hard on someone else's behalf. While there's something to be said about the manner in which Kasumi's putting Joker on a pedestal here, it seems to be working for her. She says that her grades and energy levels are slowly coming back to her, not to the point of feeling normal, but it's a marked improvement on where she was before before she started seeking Joker's input. This is a good thing, and likewise, she's grateful for the advice and encouragement, to the point where Joker feels an intense trust for emanating from Kasumi, a strength that only can be explained by the re-strengthening of another's heart. I am thou. Thou art I. Thou hast birthed a bond clad in the heart's strength. This union, born and embraced by will unyielding, shall become the balefire that lights thy path. Thou hast gained a glimpse of the faith's truth, granting thee further power to tread the abyss. With that, we reach rank 5 with the Faith Arcana, and if you didn't notice, there is indeed another strange thing going on with the way Kasumi's Confidant concludes here. Yes, there's only 5 ranks, but usually the completion of the Confidant arc involves Joker forming a Blood Oath with his Confidant of choice, and the ending text being something that it goes like this. I am thou, thou art I, thou hast turned a vow into a Blood Oath. Thy bond shall become the wings of rebellion and break the yoke of thy heart. Thou hast awakened to the ultimate secret of death, granting thee infinite power. 
there are many differences here between the faith arcana and any other confidant within the game the formation of a blood oath implies an unbreakable bond between joker and any particular confidant not only that but our bond signifies the final bit of personal growth for each confidant themselves as joker helped them break the yoke of their hearts their own personal grievances that was holding them back from reaching their fullest potential this then rewards joker with the ultimate power of their arcana in particular allowing him to fuse an incredibly powerful personas of that particular type of arcana as well as unlocking exclusive personas such as say alice for the death arcana all right this is not the case for Kasumi's confident arc whatsoever. We do get the XP bonus for fusing more of the faith personas, but any potential gains are stifled due to our confident only having 5 ranks as opposed to 10. We also do not unlock any unique faith personas either. It's certainly strange, but all the latter information isn't the weirdest thing about the faith arcana thus far. In all the other instances of finishing each confident, Lavenza narrates a Tercet, but for Kasumi's confident arc, instead of Lavenza narrating the leveling of the faith arcana, Kasumi does it instead. I am thou. Thou art I. Thou hast birthed a bond clad in the heart's strength. This union, born and embraced by will unyielding, shall become the balefire that lights thy path. Thou hast gained a glimpse of the faith's truth, granting thee further power to tread the abyss. Granted, it is a bit difficult to tell the difference, so I'll put the turret set that's recited when Joker forms a confidant with Takemi as part of the Death Arcana at rank 1, so we can hear the difference in delivery between Lavenza and Kasumi. I am thou. Thou art I. Thou hast acquired a new vow. It shall become the wings of rebellion that breaketh thy chains of captivity. With the birth of the Death Persona, I have obtained the winds of blessing that shall lead to freedom and new power. This is just bizarre, and as a turret set Kasumi recites as we finish the fifth rank of her faith arcana, what we've seen so far is only part of Kasumi's growth, and it might not be the whole story. The text that is read aloud as a result of finishing the fifth part of the faith arcana mentions that our interactions with Kasumi has only served as a glimpse into the truth of the faith arcana's true nature that would grant us power to tread the abyss. Though we've created a balefire, a light, an anchor within the darkness of understanding Kasumi's character, given everything we've already discussed about the foreboding nature of how the Faith Arcana card is designed, this does not bode well for the future of Kasumi whatsoever. Despite its foreboding nature, we have to make peace with this for the time being and be satisfied that Kasumi will endeavor to solve her own problems on her own. But then again, she's shown she needs constant encouragement to drive her convictions and decision-making processes. As we separate for now, and as Kasumi trains out for this year's competitions, we have to hope that the inspiration she draws from us is enough to drive her to success. As we part ways amicably enough, and though Kasumi might seem chipper now, every subtextual element we've examined about her indicates that there's something fundamentally wrong with her, or that there's a secret that she's not letting us in on. As to what exactly the secret is, well, it's revealed just a few days later. The day is July 16th, and we're stuck in the middle of exams. Well, most of us are. As we leave school for the day, we find out that the jealousy and spite towards Yoshizawa's position as a school's honor student has only gotten worse. Probably could have managed if I had an extra week, too. An extra week, huh? The only people who get that kind of cushy treatment are the honor students. Oh, you mean like Yoshizawa-san? I heard the school moved her exam period. Must be nice getting perks like that. This is nothing out of the ordinary for Shujin, but it has gotten to the point where Maruki, the school's recently hired therapist, has gotten concerned with the school's atmosphere and the way it's now targeting Yoshizawa. Though Maruki is supposed to stay impartial within these matters, but given Shujin's history and school culture, I would say it's actually good he's becoming concerned for the mental health and safety of one of its students. Though, I would be remiss to omit the fact that he was Yoshizawa's personal therapist before coming to Shujin. We learn as much on May 15th, as Yoshizawa is seen at the entrance of the counseling office with Maruki, talking about how everything's been going since she's enrolled to Shujin, with Kasumi recommending to protect Kun to take Maruki's counseling. He does have a more personal stake in her well-being than others, but he can't help himself but be concerned for her well-being. Regardless of how Maruki feels in the situation, it's up to Kasumi to start plugging away here. It's do or die for her, and, well, we'll have to see if she can hack it. Today is July 17th, and summer vacation is finally here. Ryuji and Yusuke hear about a festival that's happening in Odaiba, and of course, they want us to come along for a cringe-filled day out with the boys. After Ryuji embarrasses himself on live TV, and Yusuke says the funny, That was truly cringeworthy. <laughs> but are you certain that they won't air any of it? Sure she thought there was the festival comes to a close, and we part ways with the homies. However, we see Yoshizawa off in the distance, and she doesn't look like her usual trip herself. Senpai? Yes, 
uh, did you come to see the stadium, too? Same here. I needed to give myself a pep talk. Sometimes, when things get me down, I come here. Although, that doesn't really answer your question, does it? I know this may get in the way of your plans, but would you be willing to join me for lunch? We say hello, and while she tries to be her polite self, Jerko notices that her eyes are all red and puffy. It's probably not the heat. This location has some significance to Kasumi, and just like before, she's getting increasingly isolated from her jealous peers. So we'd probably step in to alleviate her concerns, just like we did with Ah not so long ago. Whew, that was delicious. I'm always like this after a meet. In all honesty, I'd like to keep going, but any more will end up harming my performance. Once again, Kasumi proves that she's a walking singularity when it comes to food, as she's basically inhaled several plates worth of diner food. She, of course, would like to have seconds and thirds, but again, weight control is important, especially as it tells us about the results of her meat. Simply put, it was a disaster. I've been feeling like I'm getting back into the natural flow of things, thanks to you, Senpai. But when the moment of truth arrived, my body still wouldn't move the way that I wanted it to. Despite all the things Kasumi did to try and get a new perspective on her own shortcomings, her performance was still terribly catastrophic. Joker asks her if it's some kind of mental thing going on with her, and, well, Kasumi acknowledges that might be part of it, but that's not the whole story here. I think that's a big factor. Something similar happened to me in middle school, but back then, I had someone by my side that kept me going. I have a younger sister. We promised each other that we'd win international gymnastics competitions together. But this spring, she died in an accident. I promised her we'd take the gold for our routines across the world. But I can't stop worrying about my lack of improvement lately. I've really been throwing myself into practice. But I wonder if even that won't be enough. Grief is one hell of a thing, and while tragedy strikes somebody who has to meet some lofty expectations as an athlete, it wouldn't be unreasonable for her to waver under all that pressure. She also likely never has time to process these emotions either, as she did mention in rank 1 of her confidant arc that she fell into a deep depression. We can easily guess that the death of Kasumi's sibling was probably the cause here. The passing of a loved one, especially a sibling, and one that had to be nearly Kasumi's age, must have been heartbreaking, especially since they both had a dream of competing internationally together. The trauma of her passing and the weight of a dream that's now left to be unfulfilled had to start showing up within her own performances, making Kasumi seem a bit sluggish. What's worse here is that both Yoshizawa sisters were each other's support structures, and based on what we've seen with the validation she needs from Joker, they were likely very close as sisters as well. Now, Kasumi not only needs to balance out the pressure of carrying out her sister's dream, as she effectively competes not just to take the gold for two people, but to also deal with the fact that she's losing her edge a little bit, failing miserably to come with even spinning distance to the podium as all her peers are starting to get on her case. She's deathly afraid of failure and disappointing her sister, and it's becoming evident that she just can't hack it. To save of Kasumi spiraling into further despair, Joker says that this was just one performance, and that she shouldn't shell herself so short. It's not over yet. Senpai. You're right. It's just getting started. You just keep on rescuing me, don't you? Okay, no more brooding. There are still more meets left this year. I'm going to start from scratch and train as hard as I can. Thank you so much for listening to all that. Now I feel like I've been recharged, mind, body, and spirit. <laughs> well, at least my mind and spirit are recharged. The best way to stave off hunger is with some vigorous activity. I'm going to jog home. Take care. Now that we've learned about Kasumi's dream and the fact that she has to carry the torch for two due to her sister's passing, this will be the last we hear for Kasumi for several months. In order to regain her convictions and honor the memory of her sister, Kasumi will have to dig deeper and put in an exponential amount of effort in order to achieve her dream. She disappears off the face of the earth for a while, but on September 11th, the last day of the Hawaii trip, we're met with an incredibly adorable surprise. Konnichi. Yeah. 
Oh, come on. The heist required to put the Japanese version in there. Sue me. This is just objectively better. <laughs> anyway, aloha indeed, Kasumi. Yusuke appearing out of nowhere was weird enough considering that he went to a totally different school on track to a flight to LA, but Kasumi appearing here is almost as strange. At least until she explains herself. Ah, sorry to be a bother. I'm Yoshizawa, a first year. It's nice meeting you all. Oh, you're that gymnast. Yes, that's right. Our club's here at a training camp to get ready for the next big meet, and I just happened to find him. The last meet was only a short while ago, though. You're already training for the next one? You seem to be making quite the effort. Well, I absolutely have to get the results I'm looking for at the next competition. The team's been training with a famous coach who lives here on the island. She's working us especially hard. We end up in tears almost every day. In the spirit of working hard to achieve her goals, Kasumi's team is to be training with a specialist here. She has flown her and her team internationally just to train with this one person in Hawaii. While it is concerning that the school is in league with another professional athlete that runs his student athlete's ragged to the point of tears, it's clear that Kasumi's in no position to argue here. She is attending Shujin on scholarship after all, and she needs those good scores. Nevertheless here, that's not the point. And if Joker's friends are in any indication, they can appreciate just how hard she's working to get the results she needs. They do, after all, understand how hard it is to change oneself after a series of tragedies. Not that they all know the specifics of Kasumi's in particular. In fact, this is the first time the fan of these actually meet and become acquainted with Yoshizawa. Of course, as always, her reputation as an athlete proceeds her. But despite all the gambore Yoshizawa's that these could give her, it's clear that underneath the surface, she's still very upset. Thank you. Your kind words may be what keeps me from crying today. After everyone leaves to go pay for the souvenirs that they intend to bring back home to Japan, we also find that Yoshizawa's attitude has changed a little bit from when we last saw her. Well, I know I'm going to win for sure this time. I'll prove to everyone what I'm made of. Instead of improving for her own sake and pulling on her own lessons with Joker to find herself, Yoshizawa's outlook on competitions is now directly correlated with her own self-worth. She's got a bit of a chip on her shoulder now behind all that politeness, and with everyone expecting so much from her as everyone continues to gossip behind her back, it's do or die now for Kasumi. She still holds out hope that she can place well and has gone as far as going to a shrine to get a good luck charm as she once did with her sister. But there's still some turtles going on here if she's now leaning on her own superstitions to succeed. We bid her farewell and good luck as she disappears off the face of the earth for another few weeks. The day is October 3rd. And instead of cutting to Joker in class, we instead cut to Kasumi sitting in some kind of meeting with a teacher and Dr. Maruki. However, despite Maruki doing his best to look out for Yoshizawa, it's clear that the staff of the school are still keen to undermine her yet again. But at the rate that things are going, Yoshizawa-san's honor status could possibly be revoked. Something so serious should, of course, be brought to the attention of both her parents and yourself. I've been told that her results at the latest meet were quite laudable. Isn't revoking her status as an honor student a bit of an overreaction on the school's part? I understand how you feel, but, well, third place doesn't really cut it in this case. She needs to attain first place results for her exceptional status to be worthwhile. Don't get me wrong here. Uh, personally, I think her results are impressive, but... I suppose the argument could be made that if she's going to represent Shujin and receive special treatment, it's not enough. Kasumi has worked so hard these past few weeks to improve herself and get within the right headspace to compete, but to these assholes, third place just isn't enough. She scored bronze, a podium position after her last showing was a complete disaster, only for Shujin to then threaten to revoke her honor student status in the end of all things. The insulting bit here and the word that probably burns Yoshizawa to her very core is the word try. Another meet's coming soon. Please try for the results the school wants to see. It's as if she hasn't been trying hard enough already. That one word diminishes all of her accomplishments thus far. She's went from scraping at the bottom of the barrel to actually a respectable position within a competition. It's absurd that she's being threatened here. And it sucks even more that this teacher's trying to absolve himself of all responsibility here instead of giving it straight to Yoshizawa like she should deserve. Please don't shoot the messenger here, okay? Uh, this is necessary to guarantee fairness across the entire student body. It would seem that even though the likes of Kamashita and Kabayakawa are gone, the school's culture hasn't changed one bit. Maruki was right to be both concerned about Yoshizawa's future here at Shujin and to ask Sorka for advice on how to persist within this microcosm of society as everyone here seems fit to undermine those who have been objectively successful for their own wants and desires. At Shujin, Kasumi isn't considered a person, but rather, she is considered to be nothing more than a vain token of Shujin's athletic prowess. 
Given how much blood, sweat, and tears Kasumi shed in order to improve herself for the sake of the school and herself, her results in the latest competition should be met with nothing but praise. She has shown a marked improvement from her last meet, but these assholes at Shujin don't seem to know what the term positive reinforcement means. Of course, Joker knows the value of such a thing. It's literally how it got Kasumi to be motivated during her confident arc. She reacts best to positive reinforcement and cherishes those who gives her the confidence to succeed. Maruki, who was once Kasumi's own personal therapist, knows that Kasumi appreciates a few kind words here and there. But of course, the school doesn't value Maruki for his therapeutic advice. As was always the case, he was hired as a friendly face to repair Shujin's reputation. Nothing more, nothing less. That was the role he served then, and it's the same role that he serves now, as this new threat towards Yoshizawa's dreams hangs over her head. Sir, putting excessive expectations on Yoshizawa-san will only be to her detriment. Yeah, listen, listen to the therapist. Listen to Maruki. Oh, that wasn't at all my intention. I just wanted to give her a little encouragement. You should have, you should have had Maruki have this conversation. Dr. Maruki, please continue serving the student body as counselor and providing support to Yoshizawa-san. This meeting was merely meant to express how the entire faculty will be supporting her. That's the reason I had you sit in today, Dr. Maruki. The goal was to light a fire under Kazumi's ass and hope she springs into action. This is Shujin's kind of encouragement. Their idea of a pep talk is hypothetical threats unless Yoshizawa delivers. However, as they wrap up the meeting and Yoshizawa leaves, her head hangs low, causing her to drop the good luck charm she bought in Hawaii and for Joker to then pick it up. Thinking to have left it in the guidance office, Kasumi retraces her steps and overhears some more word salad garbage emanating from behind the door, as the staff freely lets Maruki know what they intended for Kasumi. Hmm. Maybe I left it in here. Huh? How did Yoshizawa's son handle the news? She seemed pretty downcast. I think it was quite the shock to her. I truly hope this is what finally drives her to succeed. She needs to push herself beyond third place and bring home some stronger results. And soon. Vice Principal, I know I've already told you this, but your approach here is going to affect her adversely. Trying to motivate her with harsh words is only going to give her more anxiety. Uh, Dr. Maruki, we aren't running a charity. If she's going to receive special treatment, she needs to provide adequate results. Praising her until her head swells may be your idea of therapy, but we can't afford to just butter her up forever. This vice principal has not one empathetic bone in his body. He arrogantly weighs away, even scoffs at Marky's advice to be less harsh to Kasumi as charity. The mere idea of being compassionate is so foreign to these absolute tools. Being merely kind and not threatening student star honor student is the equivalent of swallowing Kasumi up and babying her like a helpless infant. To nobody's surprise, they still think of Kasumi to be something that the school can use for demon's reputation given everything that's happened thus far, including the death of Kobayakawa. Seeing her as a tool is no surprise as they've done the same to Ryuji in the past. But what they insinuate about Kasumi's deceased sibling is especially disgusting. We took in those sisters to improve Shujin's standing, but at this rate, we're only going to end up suffering for it. Not only have we lost one of them, but the other one's not doing us any good. Huh. Talk about a waste of effort. They too also saw Kasumi's sister as just another thing they could use to enhance the school's prestige and hide away all the times where its malice has directly harmed the student body. Now with certainty, we can confirm that the Yoshizawa sisters were granted a mission in the Shujin Academy as a way to stymie its malicious reputation from spreading out into the world. Kasumi and her sister were here to hide Kamoshida's crimes from the public. Thinking about that some more, through stressing her out and giving her these insane feelings of anxiety, Yoshizawa is effectively footing the bill for the entirety of Shujin's sins all by her lonesome. All these months later, after Kamoshida has been arrested and Kobayakawa has died, the adults of the school still don't want to take responsibility. She has no real support structures, only selfish vanity-stricken adults who are keen to squeeze and wring her out of all of her value like a damp rag. As such, they never saw Kasumi or her sister as people or athletes they could train and cultivate and tutor into becoming the best versions of themselves. This was never their function at the school. They only saw Kasumi's sister's death as a loss for the school as well, ignoring the impact it's likely having on Kasumi's life and overall performance as an athlete. Instead, they just want her to try harder. Maruki, of course, tries to tell them off, but it's obvious that these selfish bastards are willing to continually break and discourage Kasumi until she's no longer useful to them. Sir. Oh, uh, pardon me, but there's no denying. First with Mr. Kamashita, now the principal's death. We've got our backs to the wall here. Huh, 
If this school doesn't bounce back soon, even my own ass will be on the line. That'll be all. Excuse me. As Kasumi runs away, now knowing the full truth of the matter, Joker goes about his day like normal, but we get a call for Kasumi after school. She tells us to go to the stadium in Odaiba, the place where she goes to give herself a bit of a pep talk, and the place where we met her before. Though she can't hear us because her phone's acting up, Joker being the good mentor that he is, goes to try and cheer her up. No connection. We should have gotten this thing replaced already. I'm so useless. I do nothing but cause trouble for Senpai, and even Dr. Maruki. I'm supposed to be THE Kasumi Yoshizawa. This is clearly the lowest Kasumi has ever been. That meaning really got to her, as she now deems herself to be useless, and nothing but a burden upon Maruki and Joker. However, as we near what turns out to be a stadium, something totally unexpected happens. You gotta do something. Kasumi? <sighs> What? What the fuck is going on? Hey, is that? <gasps> Dude, what the hell? Atmosphere. Is this a palace? But we never activated the nav. Wait, do you think it was Yoshizawa? Why was it Yoshizawa? Kasumi has the nav. It's a possibility. She wasn't anywhere near us when we slipped into this palace. She can't fight like we do. We have to find her. Is really fucking bad. Kasumi unwittingly activated the nav somehow and entered what looks to be a palace. Whose palace this is remains unknown, but what little we can gather from the environment gives us the impression that its owner is knowledgeable of cognitive science. This makes this palace especially dangerous for only two fan of these, an exponentially so for a melancholic personalist gymnast. Putting all of Kasumi's lessons into action here, we scale the palace's structures until we hear her cry out. Who's there? We pick up the pace and slide down the rafters to see Kasumi and someone else who looks nearly identical to her. Why? How are you here? Who's that? Is she a cognitive being? I... It's my fault. What? Come on! You must... Kasumi... Yoshizawa's in trouble! Heresy! You dare to spurn our Lord's mercy! Are you alright, Yoshizawa? As we're coming to know so far through all of our heists, every hostile enemy shadow that we fought throughout the game are a reflection of their own rulers and her cognition. This shadow in particular calls Yoshizawa a heretic for rejecting their master's kindness. They seem to be keen to remind Yoshizawa of the anguish she feels about her recent efforts not being enough. It's clear that this palace also deals with the psychological, and who's ever in charge of the place is keen to inflict pain on Yoshizawa for rejecting their distorted kindness. While we don't know much about that cognitive being, we can safely assume that this palace is targeting a sore point within Kasumi's cognition. This has to be some kind of image of her deceased sister, as Kasumi herself does seem to be very confused, or even angry, that a living image of her dead sister has been conjured up just to spite her. Somehow, the rule of this palace has specifically targeted this memory in particular as it means to taunt Kasumi, to tell her that she's not good enough to pursue her sister's dream. Accept yourself. Our lord laments the foolishness birthed from your pain. 
Striking down the cognitive being of her sister was step one, and the headaches were second. As for the last, the shadows of this place are also keen to remind Kasumi about how everyone around her merely just hates her guts because of her place within society. Her whole I'm not bothered routine really pisses me off sometimes. Getting special treatment is like, like whatever if it's deserved. But do you think she's earned it? I understand how you feel, but my third place doesn't really cut it in this case. She needs to attain first place results for her exceptional status to be worthwhile. Not only have we lost one of them, but the other one is not doing us any good. Either. <laughs> Talk about a waste of effort. The ruler of this palace's goal is to get Yoshizawa to pity herself to death and get her to stop trying. She's tried to act all dignified and suffer in silence all along, but acting virtuous only got the ire of her peers as they kept moving the goalposts. She's done her best to play by the rules, however impossible that might have been. But thus far, they've only merely succeeded in annoying Kasumi. It wasn't enough for anyone to try to dissuade her from pursuing her goals as she competes for two. As she lies upon the clean white floor of this palace, thinking about those who sought to undermine her, yet demand so much of her as well, to control her until she breaks, Something stirs inside the polite heart of Kasumi Yoshizawa. Why should she be beholden to the opinions of the jealous and the vain when she has acted with dignity and grace since she first came into the lives? She's better than them, more compassionate than anybody within wider society by an order of magnitude. Why should she listen and conform to the ways they want her to act and behave? Why anyone with no as a goal as Yoshizawa's of standing upon the podium in the memory of her deceased sister lower herself to be swayed by the opinions of those who maliciously gossip behind her back? They will never understand the determination it would take to carry the torch in the manner in which Kasumi has endeavored to do thus far. And it is this spark that ignites something truly special within her own heart. I've had enough of this. Yoshizawa? You're telling me I'm not cutting it? As if I don't know that better than anyone! Still, I don't care what anyone says about me. I will not tolerate anyone speaking ill of our dream! It's all in your best interest. <sighs> Filling my life with this pressure? Demanding the results that you want? Yoshizawa? Could she be? And now you're all branding me a failure? Let me remind you who you're talking to. I am... I am... Kasumi Yoshizawa! So adamant. <laughs> now we're gonna accept away from cinders. You strive towards splendor. You know the risk. Well, if those really are the shoes you've chosen, then we'll dance to the end. This has got to be. This contract, the spell cast upon you. I request we have a rematch. This time, I'm going all in with Sandrion! Enter the persona of Kasume Yoshizawa, Sandrion. Though the spelling of her name might prevent some from being reminded of her place as a figure of classic fairy tale legend, her story goes something like this. Once upon a time in a faraway land, there was a tiny kingdom, peaceful, prosperous, and rich in romance and tradition. Here in his stately chateau lived the little Cinderella. As time went by, the chateau fell into disrepair, for the family fortunes were squandered upon the vain and selfish, while Cinderella was abused, humiliated, and finally forced to become a servant within her own house. And yet, through it all, Cinderella remained ever gentle and kind, for with each dawn, she found new hope that someday, her dreams of happiness would come true. Sandron is the French spelling for Cinderella, which makes it both incredibly appropriate for Kasumi to hold such an image of piety and virtue within her own heart. 
Kasumi's persona and Kasumi herself are spitting images of each other. And as far as persona lore is concerned, that is exactly how it should go. As we've gotten to know Kasumi, much like Cinderella, she has always been kind and curt to everyone around her beyond all reason. She even excuses the behavior of those who would seek to put her down. In the fairy tale itself, Cinderella's stepfamily does her great harm and treats her terribly. But at the end of most of the tales, Cinderella doesn't use her royal position and power to exact vengeance upon them. Instead, she is mostly merciful and even offers them places like court and plays matchmakers for them as well. To see just how benevolent, forgiving, and gracious Cinderella is within the tale itself, we know only to quote part of the Charles Perrault version of the tale, which takes place as Cinderella comes home from the ball, where her evil stepsisters actually have no idea that she was the same woman they became so enamored with as they danced the night away. I quote from the story, If you had been at the ball and said one of the sisters, you would not have been tired from it. The finest princess was there, the most beautiful the mortal eyes have ever seen. She showed us a thousand civilities and gave us oranges and citrons. Despite being there under false pretenses and assuming a false identity, Sandron doesn't take this moment to spite her stepsisters. She still treats everyone with fairness and kindness, including her own stepsisters. This was all that a Cinderella wanting her stepsisters to love her as she always had. The moral story of Cinderella is all about perseverance, faith, and benevolence. It's about graciousness itself. It prizes virtue given the role that Persona 5 presents the likes of Kasumi, as it constantly demands that she caves to all of its trappings. Kasumi is a kind soul through and through, and this kindness enables her to behave like a queen to the point of it taking people off as she refuses to stoop to their level. Young women like Kasumi and Sandron, in winning one's heart, graciousness is more important than a beautiful dress, a fancy persona, or a gold medal at times. Kasumi dares to dream of something more noble, and while the world has stifled her success, she's going to continue daring to dream of something better. This moral motif exists all across all versions of the Cinderella tale, wherein Cinderella's faith in herself and within her own dreams enables her to be selfless in a selfish society. The original story dates far as back as ancient Greece, involving a courtesan instead of a princess. However, several of the tropes that will be iterated upon in future stories were seen in this version too. Over time, a pharaoh became a prince and a sano eventually became a glass slipper, with all the common beats that we're all familiar with being added to later as the story was adapted by the brothers Grimm and Charles Perrault which Walt Disney then based his own motion picture adaptation upon as well. While I hate to break the pace here, this is likely why Atlas had to use the French spelling of Cinderella's name, Sandrion, rather than straight up calling Kasumi's persona Cinderella. However, the differences don't really matter here to Kasumi's Awakening. Despite 345 versions of the stories existing across both Europe and Asia, we need not narrow down each reference to each individual story within Kasumi's own persona Awakening, as it incorporates all the story beats from all versions of each story. This time, instead of Cinderella leaving behind a glass slipper, Kasumi left behind her good luck charm for Joker to retrieve. It's a very clever illusion, but of course, we're not quite done yet. The death of the loved one is a key part of most adaptations for the Cinderella tale, and within the Brothers Grimm version, Sandron's mother passes away when Cinderella was very young. In this version of the tale, she's buried beneath a hazelnut tree, an allusion to Celtic folklore wherein such trees represent both wisdom and inspiration. Sandron will then visit this grave three times a day, praying and watering it with her own tears. While we never know the status of Kasumi's own mother, as only her father seems to be around these days, we do know that Kasumi comes to the stadium in Odaiba, often in tears herself to honor the memory of her sister. The illusion is there, and it's pretty awesome, but there's something else that I want to hit on real quick, if you'll allow me to get ahead of myself for just a second. One thing that most miss, and what Walt Disney certainly missed in his own adaptations of the tale, is that Cinderella, or Sandra in this case, is a snarky nickname given to her by her evil stepsisters within the tale. Her real name is Ella, with well, the reason for the cinder being added to her name was that she was forced by her stepsisters to sleep on the floor next to the fire, which she had to attend to daily. As the passage from the Brothers Grimm version of the fairy tale goes, there is no bed for her. Instead, she had to sleep by the hearth by the ashes. And because she always looked dusty and dirty, they called her Cinderella. Having endured the heat of Shujin's dirty hearth and the constant abuse of all those around her, who refused to recognize how hard she worked on their behalf, becoming a servant to their own whims, all the while as they backsassed her, Kasumi's rebellious heart stirs as her persona says the following. Rather than accept the life from cinders, you strive towards splendor. You know the risk. Kasumi knows the risk of being bold and aiming to remind others of just who the hell they're talking to. Society wants her to live a life in cinders, and rebelling against the same people is a risky move, but Kasumi will do anything to accomplish her dream. So says the voice of her heart. Within the Brothers Grimm version of the tale, there are also instances of the evil stepmother assigning impossible tasks to Sandrion, such as scattering lentils into ashes as a means of delaying her arrival to the ball. Sandrion accomplishes these petty tasks easily enough, but her stepmother keeps stopping her at the last second because she has no nice clothes to wear. All of them are completely covered with soot and ash. Oh gee, I wonder whose fault that is. Like Sandrion, Kasumi refuses to live within such horror conditions, and as has always been the case, she chooses to instead strive towards grandeur, a goal more noble and befitting of someone of her patient temperament and honor. Sandrion is able to go to the ball, and Kasumi is able to wake into her persona due to their diligence. Her heart was in the right place all along, and it's due to this that she manages some of the courage and willpower to conjure up her own fancy dress born of her own heart. And boy is it awesome to behold. 
Some common imagery from the fairy tale is shared here within her Persona Awakening as well, like how Sandra and herself, as in Kasumi's Persona, seems to be made of blue crystalline glass, a reference to the glass slipper Sandra left behind as midnight drew near. While the absence of a pumpkin carriage and a fairy godmother is to be noted here, the transformation from an average tame girl to something more splendid is shared too. When Kasumi first transforms into her fan of the outfit, you might be getting those fuzzy feelings that Atlas was referencing magical girl anime like Sailor Moon. Of course, Kasumi being an actual magical girl would track for her as she is an extremely kind and gracious girl. You might be right to think of this, but of course, it's a triple entente reference. It's referencing Cinderella's transformation from a soot covered dress into something more spectacular. Atlas decided to mask this particular transformation with a Neon no Beam on the Genji. It's utterly brilliant and one of my favorite things about this game. That is, until we get to Kasumi's outfit and her choice of firearms. Please allow me to play my live reaction to that latter bit of information. She has a lever action rifle. I'm done. I'm done. This is so cool. Oh, and she flips it too. Oh, God. Oh, it's so cool. Come. <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty cool, but it gets even more cool when we consider why Kasumi's heart had her wield such a weapon, spin cocking him in one hand like Arnie did all the way back when. We know Kasumi to be a remnant gymnast, and while her routines and within her all out attack finishers have her use a ribbon as a prop, there are parts of remnant gymnastics that call for the use of batons and the like. This would explain Kasumi's affinity and attraction to such a type of weapon as well. As shown in the opening of the game, where we technically do meet Kasumi for the first time, trolling a baton and spin cocking a rifle are analogous to each other as Kasumi spins, backflips, and tumbles, and best of swans her way over and around each shadow's head. It's a joy to watch, but as much as I would love to continue geeking out about her lever action rifle, we now have to shift our attention over to her outfit. Kusuma's outfit is one of my favorites in the game, as it combines the practical with the flair of the style the fan of these are known for within their own outfits. As we discussed in the previous episode of the series, each outfit each thief wears exists on a spectrum, as a reflection of how society perceives them, along with how they rationalize what rebellion is, as such notions may manifest with their own unique outfits. These outfits are sourced from what the thieves perceive to be cool, and are often lifted from other sources that inspire them within their youth. The palace rulers that each thief is related to also seem to have some kind of influence upon each outfit as well. This is best demonstrated with Yusuke's outfit, as he is quite literally a rogue samurai, a ronin, rebelling against his sensei and master, who in this case is Madarame, whose shadow is depicted as some kind of shogun in bullshit clothes. For An and Haru, their outfits were inspired by TV shows and anime they watched as kids. Haru's musketeer outfit is one such example of this, but the unique thing about Haru's outfit is that it's something that French men would have worn during that time period. Women like Haru would be expected to wear elaborate and bulky dresses, which would then leave us with the impression that Haru's spirits of rebellion desires her to break free from the traditional gender norms of her society. This brings especially true when we consider Haru's life has already been predetermined by her father because of an arranged marriage. It would seem that Haru wants to be something a bit more loud and boisterous rather than a willowy and submissive girl. For On, she was inspired by a certain villainous femme fatale from an anime, taking inspiration from how commanding, confident, and persistent she was, even though she will lose every so often at the end of every episode. This notion will then carry into An's outfit. She wanted to be cool, confident, and as sexy as this character in particular was. On then began to equate all these notions into sincere power to embolden her own self-esteem, as she strove to become a woman who can confidently do and say as she pleased. For On, it was how society saw her and her body as something to be lusted after, with On's own heart conjuring up her infamous cat suit as a means to reclaim some of the power and agency over her own sexuality for herself. For Ryuji, it was a bit more simple. Society saw him as a mere violent punk thug, with Ryuji deciding to lean into that notion while he's on heists. For Makoto, it's a mixture of her desire to be free riding around on her steel horse in the desert, mixed in with her love of shonen manga. For Joker, society deemed him to be a criminal, and his outfit reflects that with a gentleman thief archetype. A certain kind of thief that blends in with high society, fraternizes with all of them, and then pillages their belongings shortly thereafter. Joker's taking the law into his own hands, with his hands being the key part of his outfit as he dons a pair of blood red gloves. Like I said, Joker is a criminal per society's rules, and this indicates that he has a record, that the blood cannot be scrubbed from the ledger while he's on probation. Interestingly enough though, Kasumi's PT outfit is strikingly similar to that of Joker's. In the metaverse, Kasumi wears a black mask with silver highlights and has a black ribbon tied to her ponytail. Her main outfit consists of a strapless black leotard with a sweetheart neckline, a chain belt with two silver rolls motifs, a scabbard for her rapier, a black choker, and red gloves. Her black bolero jacket has gold buttons, ruffle flared sleeves, and three floor length coattails. She wears thigh high hose and slender lace up pumps that kind of resemble ballet shoes on the top. Society has indeed consumed to be a criminal like Joker has. She's merely been deemed useless or lackluster, which then leaves us with the impression that Kasumi's own spirit and image of rebellion was almost entirely influenced by Joker's. She saw Joker once in his fan of Thief outfit and literally went, wow, and literally ripped off 90% of his outfit. The only parts that stand out here are the more elegant and feminine parts of her outfit that are influenced by her interest in gymnastics. 
the elegant for the leotard and the belly like heels are kind of a dead giveaway for that after all thinking about this some more we never catch Kasumi complaining about her outfit like say Anna and Makoto do she doesn't utterly hate her own outfit and it does not seem that society has any bearing upon influencing Kasumi's thief outfit or how she rationalizes what true rebellion is this then leaves us with the impression that Kasumi is not only comfortable within her own outfit but the way that Kasumi rationalizes what rebellion would look like is actually just influenced by her simply doing this board that she's dedicated her life to as she intends to honor her sister by making it all the way to the international stage her working on the behalf of others is Kasumi's rebellion and it's reflected well enough within her own outfit what we are left with for Kasumi is one key word unique Instead of her own spirit of rebellion being influenced by the ruler of any particular palace, Joker's kindness and encouragement seems to have the most influence upon her heart. It's fair to say that Joker is the prince from the classic Cinderella tale of old. It wouldn't be too far off to say that Joker occupies the role of the prince within this retelling of the tale, especially considering how it came upon the Omomori charm as she fled from the castle. We have given her the means to succeed and rise above herself after much trial and tribulation. Now with the yoke of her heart broken, Kasumi strives to be stronger not just for her sister, but out of pure righteous indignation. Society has tried to sully her ability to persevere, but Kasumi now knows better than to give in so easily. Hey, are you alright? I can't be weak anymore. Whoa, I'm quite impressed, considering how you just awakened to your persona and all. The cat who's on a cat is correct. It is seriously impressive for Kasumi to power through the exhaustion that usually comes after awakening to one's persona. All the other thieves have an immediately exfiltrate upon awakening to theirs, but she manages to push through. Yoshizawa is one tough lady. It's only because Kasumi doesn't have any knowledge in the metaverse that we decide to call it quits for here and exfiltrate back to reality. As we transport ourselves back to Odaiba, we fill in Kasumi about the ins and outs in the metaverse, or more specifically, Morgana does. Well, since you seem to know a lot more about this than I do, maybe I should call you Morgana Senpai. She still doesn't seem to understand most of it, but underneath it all, she seems to have regained her polite and sunny attitude, all thanks to awakening to Sandrion. Joker also takes the opportunity to give Kasumi back her good luck charm she lost, which causes her to remember why she came here in the first place. As we learn, it's not that Kasumi was frustrated that nobody saw her improving from an utter disaster of a gymnast to a podium position in competitions. In fact, she's frustrated that she got third place because she knows she could do better. I didn't get a chance to tell you yet, but I got third place in the last meet. Of course, I'm not happy about it, but it looks like the school is even more displeased. She even thinks that losing her status as an honor student isn't an unfair consequence, but does acknowledge that the staff's motivations behind threatening her were uncouth and completely uncalled for. It would be due to my own inability to succeed in gymnastics, so... I have to say it's not an unfair consequence, but I also overheard the vice principal talking about how I'm a useless waste of effort. And I dragged Dr. Maruki into this mess too, since he was with me when I got the news. That's what really got to me. That's a tough break. Despair and frustration truly gripped her when her own lackluster efforts then dragged Maruki at Joker into her own problems. In other words, it would seem that Kasumi got mad on our behalf as Shujin's staff insinuating that she was nothing more than a waste of effort was not only an insult to her own abilities, but that of Maruki and Joker's. How very Yoshizawa like to go to bat for someone else's honor as she works to reestablish herself. And as it so happens, she's feeling a lot better after hearing the voice of her own heart. I feel like whatever happened in there helped me to get over it. I'm going to realize my dream for sure. Seems like you really are on the up and up now. It's all well and good for her to be better, but as we're gonna ask Yoshizawa for her phone so we can check whose palace it is that we just exited, Yoshizawa manages to connect two and two and figures that we're part of the Phantom Thieves. Okay, I've been meaning to ask. Are you two part of the Phantom Thieves? Um, well, uh, we're... You are, aren't you? I knew it. With that, Joker has a bit of a choice here. We can ask Yoshizawa to join us as part of our team to get back in society, but to our surprise, Kasumi is gonna take and apply the lessons she learned from her Persona Awakening a little bit differently than the rest of her squad. She has stated her differences of opinion to us before she knew that we were actively stealing the hearts of others, and her stance on her methods of social reform remains largely the same as it did two months ago. Kasumi believes that groups like the Phantom Thieves are only a temporary solution, and if left unchecked, people will become over-reliant upon them to repair society. 
As far as Kasumi is concerned, it shouldn't be left to a single person or group to reform the world. Instead, personal growth should be paramount to societal reform. One has to first strive to improve themselves in order to make the world a better place. This is the perspective that has driven Kasumi's decision making all the way from the point where we first met her all the way up until now. She's always strove to be a good person, as she does her best to follow the golden rule in hopes of inspiring others to do the same. As for joining our party, we could probably guess her answer to Joker's request based on that bit of information. Thank you, but... I'm sorry, I have to turn down your offer. Cool, so we'll head home for now and... Wait, what? When I awakened to my... Uh, persona, was it? I also realized something. I can't keep obsessing over my shortcomings in gymnastics like this. So that's why I can't join you at the moment. Because you need to focus on your gymnastics. Truly sorry to say no after all you've done for me. Thank you. But I think I'd only cause you all more trouble if I were to join up without being totally invested in it. Kasumi has turned us down and decided to go her own separate way. After all, her bone to pick isn't with society or those who seek to dissuade her. As weird as it might sound, her beef is actually with herself. Though this time she feels like she's finally got a firm grasp on her situation. Her dream is to compete in her chosen sport internationally, living a triple life, juggling all these responsibilities as a fan of thief, honor student athlete, and carrying the torch for those who have passed on will be quite the feat in of itself. She is wise to refuse and instead choose to follow her dream, to grow in the only way Kasumi would deem to be both necessary and possible to do after her persona awakening. Kasumi being Kasumi, of course, does feel the urgent need to pay us back for saving her yet again but it'll be some time before either of us can make good on that promise. So, with all that being said and done, we split ways and head back to LeBlanc for the night, with Kasumi promising to work even harder than ever before. Today is October 11th, and after hearing nothing from Yoshisawa for a while since the 3rd, she invites us to eat lunch with her at school. As usual, her bento is utterly massive, which freaks out Maruki, who also has decided to join us for lunch. That doesn't really... <laughs> to eat this much to stay active. I always burn through everything I eat. Yeah, Marky. Duh. We mix a small talk about the nutritional level of our lunches with Kasumi until Marky notices that she seems different somehow. More lively, even. You know, you seem to be giving off a different vibe lately. Yes, I was able to put my problems in the past and move on. Ah, so that's what it is. You don't seem to be overexerting yourself either. I'm sorry I'd worried you. Oh, not at all. It's wonderful to hear how you've been. I must admit, I'm a bit surprised. If you don't mind my asking, was there some kind of reason for this breakthrough? Well, it's all thanks to him and his acquaintances. I suppose you could say they gave me a reason to rethink things. Or, more like, a reason to stand up to my problems. Breaking the yoke of Kasumi's heart has gotten rid of her melancholy almost entirely or so it would seem. After waking to her persona, she now knows that the only thing holding her back is indeed herself. With that pressure relieved, Kasumi cannot stand up to her problems without caving to despair. Previously, Maruki, being Kasumi's therapist and all, who we can now guess helped her work through the grief her sister's death brought about to her, has commented upon how the negative reinforcement and pressure from Shujin Academy was only making her more anxious and thus harming her performance within gymnastics meets. Now though, she doesn't really seem to be concerned or even bothered with the opinions of others. Though Kasumi credits Joker with helping her out, it's such a bizarre change of temperament that Marky can only make a half joke about the fan of these changing her heart. I have to say, this drastic change has really knocked me for a loop. Perhaps the Phantom Thieves changed her heart? Speaking of changing hearts, while it is good that Kasumi has managed to sort herself out, we can't really say the same about the Phantom Thieves as of late. We made more and more of an impact upon society with our social reform since we first met Kasumi. We've gone from taking down mob bosses to Medjen, a group of black hat hackers, to going after President Okumura, a boss of a foodstuffs mega corporation. The temperament of Tokyo has also changed over the past two months, which in some ways has vindicated Kasumi's thoughts on how we dispense justice. They've gone from seeing us as good hearted outlaws, grateful for bringing justice to the untouchables of the world, to becoming something derivative of a rabid angry mob. They now see us selecting a target to go after as some kind of blood sport. Kasumi was right. They become entirely too reliant upon us to fix society's woes rather than directly helping the individuals that desperately need our assistance. With well, the most recent mark, the targeting change in the heart of President Okumura, the temperatures also reached an uneasy boiling point, and, well, let's just say that was a good thing that Kasumi didn't end up joining us when we were in the middle of pursuing Mr. CEO. I. Whoa, 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 whoa! Oh! Oh, 
Kumaro-san? The fan and thieves find themselves in a tough spot as they're now being framed for murder by an unforeseen enemy. This forces our hand to make an uneasy alliance with another surprise persona user being Gordo Akechi as it promises to help us prove our innocence but the catch being that we have to disband after triggering a change of heart inside Nijima who has also been charged with spearheading our prosecution. While things are indeed dire for us, for Kasumi it would only seem that she's been on the up and up. With the school festival in full swing and the atmosphere being pretty jolly for those not in the know, Kasumi pulls us aside to participate in the post festival. Let's get in there senpai! Oh, what? And now, it's time for your favorite shooting tradition, the student sharing special. The triple S. <sighs> but before that, we've decided to change things up this year. We've got a huge surprise for you all. <laughs> Members of the dance club, come on down. The dance club? Oh no. As the MC in the dance club tries to get everyone moving, Kasumi encourages us to dance as well. And as it turns out, Joker's got some moves. Very impressive, senpai. <laughs> oh my god, look at her reaction. <laughs> it's just gold. Before Joker burns down the house, the MC pulls Kasumi aside and asks her to improvise a quick routine for the festival. Come to think of it, we've never actually seen Kasumi perform outside the metaverse. Though she did showcase silver moves as we fought together, it is here where we finally witness firsthand just how hard she's worked and how talented of a gymnast she actually is as Kasumi burns up the entire dance floor, proving all her greatest critics wrong about her being an utter waste of effort. <laughs> and they want to kick her the fuck out of the school. Wow. Petronite from the past is right. There's no way that the school wasn't impressed with its own Cinderella dancing at the castle's ball. Indeed, all the criticism towards Yoshizawa, if we even want to call it that in the first place, stem from vain and jealous people. As Shoko Kasumi step outside the gym to cool off, we can see that this notion is true. Wow, that dance was amazing. I know, right? I was totally blown away. <laughs> Kazuma's got some moves, and in retrospect, she was supposed to let the peanut gallery try to sully her sunny disposition. Anyone who's actually seen Kasumi perform is instantaneously impressed by her. However, the good times are cut short as Kasumi's dad wants her to come home before it gets too late. In classic Kasumi fashion, she bows before leaving campus. Well, we did witness just how far Kasumi has come since we first met her and had some fun in the process. However unfortunate it is, we can't ignore more pressing issues. As we continue to work with Akechi to evoke a change of heart within Sai Nijima, per Akechi's recommendations, we have to wait until the 18th to send Sai the calling card. However, the day beforehand, on the 17th, a very worried Kasumi Yoshizawa flags us down and takes us to the school roof. Sorry to bring you here. This is something I oughtn't really bring up around other people. Senpai, are you still planning to continue on as the Phantom Thieves? 
Lately, I haven't been hearing any positive gossip about the Phantom Thieves. Despite how much people cheered on your cause, even though they knew nothing about you or your friends, all they do now is speak ill of the Phantom Thieves. I know it's not my place to say this, considering I turned down your offer to join and all, but this change in attitude is simply awful. They're doing the exact same thing to you all that they did to me. It's ironic, though we've helped Kasumi sort through her own personal issues, helped her regain some of her popularity, and even helped her awaken to her own persona, the fan of these are now suffering from the same issues Yoshizawa did at the start of the year. To Kasumi, it isn't fair for all of society to suddenly render judgment onto the fan of these, rather than think more critically about the circumstances of Kobayakawa and Okuma's murders. For all the good work we've done, from Kamoshida to Medjed, we're now considered trash by society. Kasumi, feeling guilty for not joining up with us when we first offered the position to her, feels cool in allowing this kind of gossip to proliferate. Seeing all the parallels to her own experiences, she asks why we even managed to keep going despite suddenly becoming public enemy number one. Yet, you're still going to keep at it? Why, senpai? Unfinished business. So, there's something left you have to do. Yeah. But don't worry about us. There isn't even a one in a million chance that my Phantom Thieves could ever lose. I see. Well, I won't stop you. However, could I ask a favor? Or rather, could you promise me something? Once things settle down, I'd like you to join me somewhere so we can go have some fun together. For all the growth of- Wait a second, did Kasumi just hit on Joker? Hmm... Regardless, it's the same lesson. Much like Kasumi came around realizing that she was selling herself short, as society dictated her value to her, Joker and the rest of the fan of these know that it should be the other way around. Though the odds are stacked up against us, Joker is one less than you do to even the odds. A daring plan that the Fantasies will execute in order to expose the true culprits. As for ambush and size palace, Joker plays Daredevil to distract Pubsec on the way out. To make matters worse, Futaba detects what she calls a weird reading, making a beeline for Joker as we make our escape. Before long, we find ourselves surrounded by shadows until we get a surprise visit from someone very familiar. Even you can't take on this many. Huh? Joker, that weird reading from earlier is closing in on you too. I'll end this right now. Joker, it's her! She's the weird reading I've been getting! My weak self relied on you so much. That ends today. Let's do this, Senpai! The enemy readings have decreased? That's... It's been a while since we last fought side by side, but this time, it's my turn to come to your aid, senpai. Now let's win this! Somehow, Yoshizawa returned, and found us in the middle of escaping the clutches of Sai's goons. This is Yoshizawa making good upon her own promises, as she sees this as a way to pay back Joker for all his kindness. She thinks she owes him as much, but this is the one heist that she needs to stay out of. Luckily, Yoshizawa hasn't forgotten how to fight here. We make quick and very stylish work of the remaining shadows, as Kasumi explains why she's here. Please go. I'm going to make it harder for them to track you down. You still have something you need to do as a phantom thief, right? Then I won't stop you. Since I'm not a member of the Phantom Thieves, I'm in no position to interfere. However, please don't forget the promise we made, okay? We'll see her again someday, but first Joker has to survive getting shot in the head by Akechi before he can get Kasumi up to speed. <laughs> Case closed. This is how your justice ends. Oh my.
my god! Brilliant! Brilliant! Absolutely brilliant! And Joker is completely fine! Huh. <laughs> this is all a daring plan to expose Goro Kechi and the political cabal he works for, headed by the politician Messiah Ishido. Shido's goal was to frame us in order to rise to power, to sow discord and chaos throughout society by sending the fan of these were crimes they didn't commit until they made him prime minister, as he made promises to soothe all of society's woes as its leader. Akechi was Shido's agent within this case, and the one responsible for causing all the mental shutdowns, including Kabayakawa's and Okumura's. Of course, to celebrate their victory, they've announced Joker's death as a suicide, but seeing as he survived, it makes your next conversation with Kasumi all the more heartwarming and bittersweet. Welcome. Uh -huh. Kasumi! What did I just say? Nah, still fine. Senpai? You, you're not like a stunt double or something, right? I don't know what's happening, but I really hope this isn't a dream. Well, are you pleased? I'm the one who set this up. A little surprise from me to you. I asked Futaba to do me a favor. And I asked Ryuji to pass the message along to Kasumi. I knew you'd be wiped out for a while, so I made sure to give you time to recover first. Oh, thank goodness. I'm just so happy. Kasumi is, of course, relieved to see her mentor alive and well. As we take a seat with Futaba and Morgana with one of the boosts in the blonde, we find out how Kasumi managed to locate us within Sai's palace. I got the feeling that something big was going to take place that day, so... I'm so sorry. I was actually following you the entire time. <laughs> oh, good. Wait, we were tailed there? We definitely had no idea about that. It's like night and day compared to when Makoto was following us. As Futaba and Morgana begin to contemplate what operational security actually means, Kasumi, now fully aware of the stakes and who the fan of these are up against now, offers her help out of guilt once again. I've been considering for a while now. Perhaps I should be fighting alongside you if I have special powers like your senpai. I wondered if an outsider like myself should even get involved, but I couldn't just stand back and do nothing. <laughs> it was nothing compared to how much you've done for me in the past. Hmm. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're not done here yet, are you? Then perhaps I ought to lend you a hand. Well, we could definitely use the additional firepower, but... Senpai? Well, you say that, but... Honestly, we have no idea what risks you would face. Our enemy this time is more dangerous than anyone else so far. Also, we pretty much brought this entire mess down upon ourselves, so... This is on us. We're delighted by the offer, but we really can't drag you into this any further. Morgana's probably right here. Shido's dangerous as all hell, and while Kasumi can handle herself in battle, she's still a bit green. While we appreciate the help, we can't let anything bad happen to her due to how petty Shido can be. As you know, he callously ruined Joker's life after Joker essentially humiliated him while he was drunk off his ass. Lord knows what to do to Kasumi's dream and potential future career as a professional gymnast, as he might attempt to kill her while it's in its infancy, both literally and figuratively here. Though Yoshizawa wants to press on with us, she eventually relents. As unfortunate it is to not have a crit blast specialist within the party here, we do have to keep her out of the loop as we take down Shido. And as we find out, we were right to do so. Representative of the Dai building itself, it's a luxury cruise liner with Shido serving as its captain. All the passengers aboard are also influential members of society that both funded Shido's rise to power and benefit from all the mental shutdowns that he ordered. Shido is absolutely ruthless and is willing to discard anyone who shows the slightest hint of betrayal. Even as Akechi, who uses power to murder all the shadows he came across throughout the game on Shido's orders, is seen as a mere tool for him to use and then discard. As we find out, blood ties don't even mean anything to Shido either. Akechi is Shido's illegitimate son. A living scandal that would ruin him. Shido abandoned Akechi and his mother, and never acknowledged Akechi as his own. Instead, he left them to their own devices to bear the shame of birthing an out-of-wedlock bastard child, with Akechi having to bear the stigma and shame for the rest of his life. As Akechi worked alongside Shido, he planned to backstab him all the while and humiliate him via changing his heart. Unfortunately, Shido has always seen Akechi as nothing more than a child who can easily be manipulated by affection. And while Akechi is able to prove to Shido's apathetic homicidal doppelganger that he can make his own decisions, Akechi still perishes here. We do manage to change Shido's heart, but this only leads to more problems, as Yoshizawa is once again proven correct about society being overly reliant upon any kind of strongman figure to solve their problems. 
Be it the fate of these Rashido, something's not quite right in Tokyo as they pine for a leader. We're going to reasons that the answer to these problems lies at the bottom of Mementos. As we delve deep within its depths, what we find there only proves Yoshizawa even more correct. All along, the fan of these weren't truly enacting social form, but rather, they were contributing to the same problems they sought out to fix. Changing the hearts of the palace rulers merely made them another apathetic member of society, as whatever entity rules over Mementos seeks to imprison all their shadows within it. Worst of all, it seems that they all want to be here. They want the palace ruler to liberate them from the freedom to think and change on their own volition. As we delve deeper into Mementos, we encounter Yaldabao, the false god of control, the demiurge humanity collectively created to rule over them. This false god has been pulling the strings behind the scenes since Joker first came to Tokyo, and perhaps even longer than that, given how Akechi awakened to his own personas. As much as this false entity tries his best to keep changing the rules of the game so the fan of these will always lose, Joker manages to come out on top by simply trusting his own sense of rebellion. Joker's always had faith that they were doing the right thing, and as they got the masses to believe in themselves once again, Joker harnesses their power and defeats Yaldabaoth with a single well-placed shot. Be gone. Preposterous! You dare all the people's wishes! With the god of control defeated, Joker is faced with yet another dilemma. He has to turn himself into the police and stand trial in order to prove Shido's guilt. However, before Joker can say anything, Akechi decides to place himself in custody in Joker's stead. We once thought him to be dead, but it would seem that Akechi is more resourceful than even Shido could have imagined. As Akechi walks off with Sai, Joker ponders if this was really how things were supposed to turn out. We did vanquish the big bad after all, and with nothing left to do, we head back to LeBlanc and spend Christmas Eve with Sojiro and Futaba because Kasumi doesn't have a Christmas date in Persona 5 Royal. <sighs> Anyway, when we lose out on a potential x state with Yoshizawa, we gain by celebrating New Year's Eve with her and the rest of the fan of these. Yoshizawa tries to be all polite and stuff as per usual, as they're all still impressed with his stomach being a literal black hole and all. Seconds, please. How fast do you eat? You eat a lot more than I'd assumed you do, Yoshizawa-san. Seriously? while being that thin? Senpai, don't kid them so much. Repeat gags aside, it's a good day to celebrate as we learn all of our efforts to prosecute Shido had not fallen upon deaf ears. He is going down, and with all that, Joker's criminal record will likely be erased as well. It's great news that we're able to close the cases around Shido, but it's odd that Sai and Akechi, for that matter, have managed to do it in less than a week. What's even more strange is that, well, yes, the future's looking brighter than ever, everyone seems to be positively beaming, elated even, as they all share the same feeling of happiness together. This is incredible! It's an actual, real-life good ending! Ugh, so much has happened over the past 12 months. But in the end, we got to spend it together like this. I want to believe that this was a great year for us. Yeah. I don't have any proof, but I feel like next year is going to be even better for us. I feel the exact same way. How strange. Well, that's only natural, considering how pleased we are with our end-of-year celebration. It's certainly odd, but we think nothing of it as we celebrate late into the night, and as we turn into bed, we have the strangest dream. We wake up in a prison attire that we only don while in the velvet room, and stranger still, we aren't in the velvet room either. Class will be dismissed momentarily. Instead of waking up in our cell to do business with Lavenza and Igor, we are instead at Shujin Academy. Though, something seems up with the atmosphere. As Joker waddles around this liminal space, we hear the voices of our party members. Get awesome results all track meets alongside everyone else on the team, and eventually I'd get a hold of some scholarships for college to make things easier for my mom. If that never happened, I would have gotten to enjoy my time in high school with Shiho. My sister's been supporting the family. It's unrealistic to demand any more of her. Oddly enough, as we wander around, we don't hear Yoshizawa at all, only the disembodied voices of the Phantom Thieves. As Joker attempts to leave campus to go home to LeBlanc, a voice comes over the intercom, asking why he will leave the place where he belongs. This gets especially more eerie as the voice alludes to Joker choosing not to accept something, but also refusing to force him into a specific decision. As we leave, we wake up in LeBlanc's attic on New Year's Day. As we gather himself, deeming what we just experienced to be nothing more than a weird dream, we remember we made a promise with Yoshizawa on December 20th to go to the Meiji Shrine with her to ring in the New Year. Not once to leave her hanging, we accept her offer, but as we head downstairs, we find an oddly handsome dude going by the name Morgana sitting at the bar, and Futaba mentioning that she wants to show off her kimono to her mother. Not that there shouldn't be any cross-pollination between the two, or that we should stop Futaba from going to a Shinto Shrine to honor the memory of mother as it means to touch base with the new year, but as we remember from Sojo's confident arc, Wakaba was Christian. Before we left to ask any more questions, Futaba runs off as the one's customers constantly going along, but stop themselves as they say that there's no more wishes to grant. 
The start of this year is getting more and more uncanny, with such things only getting worse as we meet Yoshizawa at the shrine. Senpai! <laughs> Do I look weird? While well, Kasumi does look utterly fantastic in her own kimono, it is super weird that such a popular attraction is so empty on the first day of the new year. This place is normally swamped. I wonder why. There aren't many people here at all. It's really unexpected. I'd almost prefer the usual crowd. Yeah, and the end of the year was just a few hours ago. Mm -hmm. Believe it or don't, only 364 <laughs> days until the next one. That is true, but... I know I'm going to use the wrong year for a while. Well, I have an idea. New Year's party tonight to help switch gears? <laughs> huh? Didn't expect you two here. <laughs> Turns out, all the other things are here as well, which may be a bit of a coincidence, but much like Futaba, they're saying things that don't make a lick of sense. If we've got the time for it, why don't we grab something to eat together? I'm sorry, I'll be heading out with my family once we're finished here. Me too. I'll be dining with my father somewhere. I'm gonna hit up some New Year's sales with my mom. Everyone with dad or missing parents or loved ones, on Makoto, Futaba, and Haru, all say that they have plans to go spend the day with them later. I'll get in touch with Shiho and find out if she has any plans yet. While it might be reasonable for Shiho to visit Tokyo during the holidays, the rest shouldn't be possible because Wakaba, President Tokumura, and Makoto's father are all dead and gone. As if that wasn't strange enough, Ryuji also makes mention of wanting to go hang out with the track team later, which shouldn't be possible because they still hate his guts. Well, looks like you're all busy. And maybe I should hit up the track team and see what they're up to. None of this makes any goddamn sense, and comparatively, Yoshizawa and Joker seem like the only sane people here who seem to be aware that something's out of the ordinary. As they all part ways for the day, Kasumi tells us that she has to leave, but as always, Joker offers to escort her to the station where her dad awaits to pick her up. We do actually get a chance to meet her father for once, who goes by Shinichi Yoshizawa, and as any dad would do, he chooses to embarrass his daughter. Or does Kasumi get embarrassed despite what he says? This is my senpai. The one I told you about before? My senpai who's done so much for me. Oh, so you're her senpai. My daughter talks about you all the time. D Dad, not all the time. <laughs> Is that not so? It's a sweet moment and shows how much Joker means to Kasumi as we've been mentoring her all this time. Yoshizawa's father also thanks Joker for the fancy new glasses he helped to start to pick out. This is one aspect of the past year that has remained intact, and it does ground us somewhat with all the eerily weirdness that's going on with her own friends. However, whatever feelings this levity this moment provides is quickly thrown out as things get exponentially more chilling. Shall we get going? What? Hmm? Something wrong? Uh, no. Nothing. Well then, Senpai, please excuse us. Kasumi shrugs us off, but it clearly bothered her. Thinking nothing more of it, we both set off the day to celebrate the new year. As we wake up the next day, though, things get even more strange. Hmm. <sighs> What's up? As we head down to eat breakfast with Soldier and Futaba, we find Wakaba just sitting in the booth cracking jokes as if she hasn't been dead for the past three years. I can't remember the last time I actually got to relax and enjoy myself on a New Year's like this. As Joker stands flabbergasted at this recent turn of events, someone unexpected walks through the door. <sighs> Sorry, we haven't opened for the day yet. My apologies. I merely wish to speak with him for a moment. Akechi's made his way to the blonde, and much like Joker, he noticed that something's wrong here. How he even managed to do so is unknown because, well, Akechi should be in custody for being the culprit of all the mental shutdowns. You know, don't you? We have to discuss this. That's right. Just like you seem to be. As we step outside, both Akechi and Joker reaccount the events from his alleged death in Shido's palace, and after admonishing Joker for believing that Akechi did in fact die within Shido's palace, Akechi tells us that he was immediately released from custody. Yes, I was acquitted of all charges. It's absolutely preposterous. More than that, it should be impossible for them to release a confessing suspect after only a brief interrogation. 
His confession meant nothing, and thinking back on it, due to almost all of Akechi's marks, including Wakaba and President Okumura suddenly being alive, they probably couldn't pin any crime to him. Ironically, it wouldn't make sense. Even if Akechi's confession was authentic and genuine, we come to the conclusion that we've been living inside a kind of false reality since the new year, where all previous tragedies of the past year have been overwritten or erased from unpleasant and happy events. The speed at which Sai and the public prosecutors found Shido guilty was one such instance of these anomalies, and given that, this would also explain why the Meiji Shrine was so empty. People now believe within this reality, there's no more wishes to be granted. As for all the other anomalies we experienced with Yoshizawa's father, before we're able to inquire further about that particular matter, Kasumi gives us a call from Odaiba, which she was likely visiting to honor her sister for the new year. But what she finds there instead is disturbing. Um, I don't really understand what I'm seeing, but I'm just going to describe it to you. It's that building. It's really faint, but I can see that palace thing that Morgana Senpai mentioned a while ago. Senpai, I know this is sudden, but could you come to Odaiba right away? I understand. I'll see you soon. That was Yoshizawa-san's voice, wasn't it? I believe I heard her say the word palace. Despite not being in the metaverse. That palace Kasumi fell into was partly visible within reality now, and only visible to us three in particular. We decided to join forces to figure out what the rule has done to the world, and how they managed to change the reality somewhat for the better. As we retrace our steps, this time with a catchy in tow, as was the case before, this palace ruler seems to hold some kind of animosity towards Kasumi in particular. As we delve deeper into this palace, we come upon a TV screen displaying a harrowing scene of Kasumi's father with what we can only assume to be Kasumi's older sister, now deceased. No way. Everyone will be arriving soon. Mom, Grandma. Yes, she'll be here too. I'm sure she'll be here once she's able to calm down. Oh. Why? Why? <laughs> Dad? It's a funeral scene, and it does pull on the heartstrings to see Shinichi so devastated by the passing of his daughter, as was Kasumi at the time. It's here where we finally learn her full name as well. That was your father in the video just now, wasn't it, Yoshizawa-san? And the one he was speaking to. Mm. Sumire. My younger sister, Sumire Yoshizawa. As was the case when we met Kasumi's father at the shrine, reality itself seemed to bend around Kasumi when her mind broached certain topics. We see the same thing happen here, but this time, it's about reality itself preventing Yoshizawa from remembering something, with that something having to relate to her sister's passing. But how was this video? <sighs> I'm sorry. I don't know what's been wrong with me lately. I've been getting this feeling like... Like, I need to remember something, but at the same time, I oughtn't remember it. Hmm. Although, to avoid getting caught up in the emotion in this particular moment, we need to ask how the palace ruler was able to get hold of such personal memory of Kasumi's and use it to cause her great anxiety and pain. Nevertheless, Akechi encourages her to trudge on as we get to the bottom of this. As Kasumi gets ever closer to the truth, the headaches keep coming as the video of her sister's funeral won't leave her mind, as won't the anxiety. Uh. You seem to be in pain again. Are you all right? Ah, uh, I'm fine. It's just that... I can't stop thinking about that video we saw earlier. You mean the one about Sumire-san? Yes. Let's keep pushing. I need to find out why that was shown to me. As was the case in her actual infiltration in this palace back in October of last year, the shadows once again try to shoo away Kasumi. Though, instead of taking a more malicious tone, the shadows instead seem to be more benevolent this time, but still have the same aim of discouraging her from proceeding. You are misguided. Do not search for pain. Only tragedy awaits you beyond here. Huh. A newcomer. All these warnings of pain and tragedy. Who is your ruler? Why do you all think you know so much about me? If 
you won't give me an answer, then I'll just force my way through. into things. Just calm down. Oh, I'm sorry. This is it. Time your attacks with mine. Uh, right. She's clearly losing it. Something about this place is deeply bothering her. Worse still, as we've seen, she can't land any attacks. Whatever this palace ruler is shooing is consuming away from remembering, it's affecting her spirit of rebellion as well. She also seems to be getting more and more tired as we inch ever closer, which has never been the case before. We've seen her get discouraged, but never overtly tired. As Kasumi hunches over to catch her breath, the shadow speaks to us, causing Kasumi's insight meter to go up. Such a fool, rejecting our Lord's mercy. In that case, witness it for yourself. Now what? more and more strange by the minute. Though, once we consider how Kasumi acted in our first infiltration in this palace back in October 3rd, we've actually seen her have these sorts of headaches before, especially when she's reminded of her sister's supposed demise. Stop! Stop it! Stop. Let's make it come true, Sumire! Together! Stop it! The first time we infiltrated this palace back in October, one of the shadows called Yoshizawa a heretic for rejecting the ruler's mercy, as he spent what we assumed at the time to be a cognitive projection of Sumira Yoshizawa. What followed, we now understand to be more taunts directed at Yoshizawa. Those voices we heard recounting everyone belittling and doubting her were not in fact the voices of her own rebellious heart being vocalized, but yet another trapping of the palace made to ward her away from reaching its inner sanctum. Her whole I'm not bothered bother routine really pisses me off sometimes. Getting a special treatment is like, like, like whatever if it's deserved. But do you think she's earned it? I understand how you feel, but well, third place doesn't really cut it in this case. She needs to attain first place results for her exceptional status to be worthwhile. Now, a similar yet entirely different cognitive projection is referring to whatever Yoshizawa is in her company now as Sumire. One of the Yoshizawa sisters is both simultaneously alive and yet dead. With this palace ruler creating a gymnastics standing within this palace as if to remind Yoshizawa of this conflicting bit of painful information. As Kasumi is still reeling from the rally bending headaches she's receiving from this palace's ruler, a voice comes over the intercom. I really hope this helped you understand. A man's voice. If you keep pushing on like this, you're going to find nothing but heartache. Please, won't you stop fighting this and just return to the current reality? Nothing but heartache, huh? I don't understand what you're saying, but I have no intention of leaving now. We are in agreement there. We also refuse to do as you say. Now why don't you drop the big voice behind the curtain act and face us directly? As you wish. 
head on down. I'll meet you there. He agreed to that much more readily than I expected. Perhaps the palace's ruler really will make his appearance. Thanks for your concern. But I'm fine, really. Let's go. Kudos to Kasumi for trying to remain gracious and put on a brave face despite of everything that we've seen so far. But she's clearly disturbed by something lurking within the depths of her mind. As we head down to meet the palace's ruler, we find out that it's someone very familiar. Is he this palace's? It's been quite a while, hasn't it? Dr. Maruki! Maruki is the ruler of this palace. This would easily explain how he knows so much about Yoshizawa's condition and her bond between her sister, with Maruki being able to visually express part of Yoshizawa's cognition within his own palace. Boring how Kasumi's therapist aims to inflict more pain upon a former patient of his, something else is going on here. This doesn't appear to be Maruki's own shadow. He's missing the trademark yellow eyes after all. For all intents and purposes, this is the real man in the flesh, which begs the question how someone like him can create a palace without a shadow. Regardless, a very shocked and discouraged Kasumi gets Maruki to confirm that he is indeed the ruler of this palace. Dr. Maruki, you're the ruler of this palace? Palace? A place where distorted desires manifest. We're asking if you're the source of the desires here. Ah, uh, I see. Well, to use your own words, yes, I am this palace's ruler, but in my case, it seems a tad different from the ones you've seen. Would we also be correct in believing that you're involved in the abnormalities outside the palace as well? Yes, you would. And it's all the confusion she's witnessed thus far, this must be particularly heartbreaking to see someone she's known for a while be the center of disordered desires. As Moriki says, his palace is, well, rather different compared to all the other rulers we've encountered thus far. We've never known any palace ruler's own disordered desires to manifest or affect the world outside of the palace itself, with the exceptions of Futaba's own anguish over her mother's death. However, in that case, it only seemed to solely affect Futaba. Conversely, Moriki's distortions are entirely unique. He is not only able to access the memories preserved within Kasuma's cognition to cause her pain, but per Maruki's words, he's also capable of altering reality and creating entirely new ones. Do you like the reality I created for you? You created it? That's right. I have gained the power to alter reality, to make it whatever the people wish for. Every single anomaly that we've seen that is incompatible with last year's events. Maruki is responsible for all of them. As review Maruki yaws sideways and goes Dutch, he explains why he decided to create this reality, one that he tailor-made just for us, the rest of the fan of these, and most importantly, to preserve Yoshizawa from the pain of remembering something. The old reality was cruel and unfair. The truth is, Yoshizawa-san suffers immense pain each and every time she taps into her forgotten past. My... past? Dr. Maruki, what do you mean? What's happened to me? Alright, I had honestly hoped that all those warnings you were given would change your minds. But if it's your true desire, then I want you to recall who you really are. And I want you two to learn as well. Once you have, you'll need to choose between the two realities. The merciless one, or the one I've formed. That's... Today was brutal, huh? Feeling okay? It's not that. <sighs> Why am I doing so bad? I keep messing up my routine. Your growth spurts just changed your eye level. You'll get used to it. Look, you're as tall as I am now. <laughs> we practice the same amount. Uh, but you are the one who always gets first place. I can't catch up to you, Kasumi. You know why? Because it's my right as the elder sister. We're in the same grade, though. Oh, don't be so down. We'll reach the top of the world together. That's our dream, right? You don't get it. Huh? 
You'll never understand how I feel. What? <laughs> Kasumi, if I were like you, things would be so much better. Hey! Wait up! Kasumi's the one that people want. Look where you're going! The light's red! Hey! Yeah! The talented one who can reach the top of the world. Sumire, stop! Listen to me! Sumire! Seems you remembered. That's right. I'm... Kasumi? No. That's not right. I'm... I'm not Kasumi. The girl named Kasumi Yoshizawa is currently deceased. It was last spring, before I started at Shujin. We were walking home from practice. It happened right there, on that street in the video. I wasn't looking where I was going. And Kasumi, she protected me from the car. I was saved by Kasumi. I robbed her of her dreams, and even her life. I'm her younger sister. Sumira Yoshizawa. I'll take over from here. After all, I do play a part in this story. Her real name is Sumire Yoshizawa. She's Kasumi-san's younger sister, but for months now, she's only seen herself as being Kasumi Yoshizawa, her deceased elder sister. Of course, it was only her cognition of herself that changed, so to the people around her, she was still Sumire-san. For some reason, though, there were a few rare exceptions to this. Did something happen to make you believe she was Kasumi-san? It appears you were clueless, but she was Sumire Yoshizawa from the start. However, when we watched that other video, she gave her name as Kasumi Yoshizawa. Considering such an odd claim, I'd actually suspected for a moment that she was the palace ruler. After Kasumi died, but before I started at Shujin, I received counseling from Dr. Maruki. That was when I told him. If Kasumi is gone, and can't make her dream come true, then I want to become Kasumi so I can turn her dream into reality for her. Throughout all this time and throughout all these many months of Persona 5 Royal, we've had the wool pulled over our eyes, but it's not like it was out of good reason. We've been teaching and mentioning Sumire Yoshizawa all this time, with the cognition being deluded by Margie and believing that she was Kasumi, all done of a want to preserve herself from the pain, guilt, and shame of her sister's death and the length Kasumi went to save Sumire. She died in an accident Sumire believes to be her fault, seemingly born with a toxic and jealous mindset, did Kasumi easily outperforming her baby sister in gymnastics with ease. Over the course of time, Sumire began to think that nobody wanted her around, and much like Shujin's used to student council president, Sumire's self-confidence began to tank, and an inferiority complex began to take hold within her. Compared to Kasumi, she was useless and talentless. Thoughts only reinforced that Sumire seemed due to perpetually see her sister take the gold, and make all those who supported her proud of her achievements. 
After some time, it eventually became clear that despite Kasumi's insistence, Sumiri would never be able to catch up to her more talented sibling. Their dream of staying together on the podium would never come to fruition because Sumiri got to thinking that she couldn't hack it, and well, now more than ever, that holds more true. Kasumi sacrificed herself to save the middling talent who wasn't worth the effort she put in to show her up. As you see in the video Mark he shows us, it's all filmed from Sumiri's first person perspective. It's ripped right from her memories and displayed for all of us to see. As we watch, we see that there's always some kind of distance between Sumiri and Kasumi. Sumiri is always watching from the sidelines during Kasumi Kasumi's routines, and as she slays it, we see Kasumi blushing as she receives praise from her coach, and seeing everybody who's come to see her perform, put her name up in lights, and create signs to cheer her on for taking a rightful place on the podium in first place. Nary a mention of her with a wee sister all the while. The video itself is filmed from Samaria's perspective, of course, and we can see how she suddenly watches from the sidelines as her sister beams with joy. To Samiri, Kasumi deserved to live and succeed, while Samiri herself was nothing more than a burden who robbed her sister of not only her future, her dreams, but also her life. Samiri has deemed herself unworthy of even living. These negative thoughts persisted after the accident and got to the point where Samiri sought Maruki's help and by the sounds of it, things were pretty dire. It wouldn't be too far off the mark to interpret Sumeri's wishes to become someone else as something derivative of suicidal ideation. Taking a step back here for a second, Sumeri hates herself so much, her guilt so consuming, that she's essentially wishing for herself to cease existing and the identity of her sister live on in her stead. Though it's not clear how Maruki accomplished this with whatever power he's able to wield, it is clear that while Sumeri was living a lie and had some initial trouble adopting a new identity after killing the sister that deserved to die, she was arguably better off for it. The pain she feels is so immense now that her spirit rebellion is immediately quashed upon remembering who she is and what she's done. Mark has helped Samiri, and to another, he wants to extend this kindness to everyone in this world. Hence all the pleasant anomalies we've encountered up until this point. While Akechi might be blunt and cynical about Marky's intent, his goals are genuine here, as Marky intends to literally create a world where all the tragedy of the past can no longer be recalled or even exist in the first place. Marky thinks it's up to be the world's saver, coming back to offer the world's salvation of a perfect world. As he pines for answers from Joker, Akechi, and Sumire, while Joker vows to find his own happiness, and Akechi does and says, Akechi things, Sumire cannot bring herself to refuse Marky's offer when given the choice. If you so desire, you can return to your life as Sumire. But if you'd rather continue your life as Kasumi, I can grant that wish for you as well. Dr. Maruki... <laughs> I... <laughs> it's impossible. I'm sorry, Senpai. I... I can't go back to being her. I can't be the one who led her sister to her death. Please don't judge her. This is just evidence of how painful life is for her. You two sense doubts forming in the reality I manifested. That's what brought you here. But please, remember this as well. You two aren't excluded from the people that I wish to save. Come now. Won't you accept my reality for your own happiness? No deal so far, huh? you're doing with her I won't harm her it's in her best interest that you turn back you've made clear that you reject the reality she desires the reality where she lives as Kasumi Yoshizawa <sighs> it saddens me when you speak that way don't you understand? You deny her wishes when you say such things. Her wishes, huh? This isn't just for her. I'm doing all of this for yourselves as well. I honestly do want to come to terms with you. We should talk. Think about it. You both have dreams, no? I have the power to make them come true. My reality can become just the way you like. Total waste of my time. A shame, but I understand. Well then, we just have to resort to force now, don't we? 
Violence is not my thing. Agree, though. It seems we're out of options here. <sighs> Time to fight. Are you ready? Keep up and don't embarrass me. Bullshit. With Samira and Marcus grasp and vowing not to raise a finger against Joker and Akechi, earnestly believing that they'll eventually come around, we're left to improvise and fight our way out with Akechi taking the lead. This just won't go down. <laughs> we're about to lose a lot of. Accept his mercy. Give yourselves over to him. Would you just quit running your mouth already? Thing up. Give me a hand. Move. Let's go. Out of my way. Crawl. You little shit. Bad for an improvised technique. Shall we continue this? I'm fairly certain any further negotiating is pointless. That seems to be the case, unfortunately. But first, I have an idea. Rather than explain it with words, I'd like you to actually see this new reality with your own eyes. I know that your friends are already enjoying it. I cannot do. As I said before, she wishes to live in the reality where she is Kasumi. There's no way I can hand her over to you with matters as they currently are. I already told you that I won't harm her, and I'll swear by it. Don't worry about her. Go. Look at the reality I've created for you all. Once you've seen the results, I know you'll realize which future is best. You think we'll just obey your orders? I apologize, but you really are going through with this, even if it's by force. We'll meet again one week from today, January 9th. I genuinely pray that you'll change your mind by then. <sighs> he got away. We shouldn't chase him too far. Let's say we head back for now. I had spent all that time investigating the people around you so I could set you up. To think, Takuto Maruki of all people would be the mastermind behind this absurd situation. And he happens to be warping the very fabric of reality while ranting about making everyone's dreams come true. Talk about incomprehensible motives. I can't even wrap my head around such intentions. We've come to a bit of an impasse, and with Marky effectively holding Sumeria hostage, 
Mark expels us from his palace and implores us to go out and experience his creations for ourselves rather than continue fighting. Found to keep Samira safe until we return a week from now on January 9th, we exfiltrate back to what amounts to reality and continue with our investigation. As we roam around Tokyo for the week that Marky has allowed us to do so, we find that Marky has indeed granted the wishes of all of our teammates. Morgana's wish to become a human has been fully fulfilled. Ahn's desire to enjoy her remaining time in high school with her best friend, Shiho Suzui, has been granted as well. Additionally, Marky has made it so that Shiho never suffered under Kamoshida, and more specifically, Sienna has gone as far as to make it so Kamoshida never existed within this reality, allowing Shiho to become a star volleyball player like she deserved to be. This also rings true for Ryuji. Though some things stay consistent, such as his leg injury still being a problem for Ryuji, Marky's reality explains this away as a minor injury that he had during practice. Due to Kamoshida no longer existing within this reality, Ryuji never had to suffer the hit to his reputation as the star of the track team and as such the team still considers ryuji a friend and not the traitor he's considered to be within the old reality the events with honor ryuji are enough to make anyone consider mark his reality but given how amicable makoto and sai's relationship is within this reality holds to be fairly persuasive as well makoto's wish was for her father to be alive once more so that he receives the hero's welcome he deserves and so sai doesn't work herself to death as a sole breadwinner of the house the two girls are more sisterly than ever with sai going as far as to tease makoto by the dish she pestered her father to make for her birthday it's heartwarming as makoto and sai are able to place all their trust and their faith in the protection of someone else instead of having to pull out all the stops to compete in such a harsh world but this itself pales in comparison to what we see from yusuke and haru we find yusuke at the art museum where his mother's masterpiece the sayori finally gets the recognition it deserves but that's not truly what yusuke's wish was in truth he still pines for Madarami to be a good and decent person the sensei that supports and provides yusuke with patronage indeed in spite of choosing not to include the likes of kamashita and kanashira within this reality he has changed events so that yusuke's mother still died but Madarami never becomes abusive towards yusuke further still Madarami doesn't pass off kitago-san's work as his own but has made it his life's work to promote her tragedy instead of directly profiting from it however he doesn't do it for charity but instead uses his money to actually feed yusuke instead of being stingy and hiding it from his students leaving Yusuke and his other students to essentially starve. It would appear that Marky also has the power to change the hearts of her previous palace roles as well, so long as someone can benefit from it. The same happens with Haru and her father as well. Instead of her father being a heartless waste of space, President Okuma is remarkably protective of his daughter when he thinks that Joker and Haru are more than just friends. As we get back to the blonde, we call it catchy, and as we find out, Tokyo has directly become an extension of Marky's own cognition. However impossible, all those who are dead before are not just alive, but are actual flesh and blood, confirmed to be living people within this world now. While the fate of these have still existed within this reality, we have only appeared to have taken down Shido and Jinomarki filling in the blanks, and Kechi and Joker haven't committed any crimes. If we do decide to take Marky's offer, this will remain the case, and all those who have died will become alive once more to live out their days in Marky's reality in blissful ignorance. With the rest of the thieves remaining seduced by Marky's reality, Akechi and Joker head back into the palace's auditorium to confront Marky and to check on Sumire. As he intends to delude her and become a consuming once again, Akechi, thoroughly disgusted by what he's discovered in the past week, makes a stinging accusation towards Marky, one that's not entirely wrong either. She's only sleeping. I've never had any intention of hurting her. Once her inner turmoil begins to settle, I'll have her remember her life as she wishes to live it. The life that she wishes for, huh? Call it what you like. You're merely brainwashing people for your own satisfaction. Akechi is right. Marky intending to become Morelli's new benevolent overlord is an entirely selfish desire to have, even if there are those who will benefit from it all. We now have a decision to make. For the sake of Yoshizawa-san and the rest of your friends, I ask you to give me your answer. No. Huh? Negotiations seem to have broken down. While ours might be an easy enough to make, Samira cannot come to grips with the old reality she's been disconnected from these past few months. No. You're not serious, right? Please, I'm begging you, Senpai. Please, let me live as Kasumi. But why? This pain is too much! Why can't I just leave it behind me? Kasumi is gone forever, and, and it's all my... All Sumire's fault! I can't live that kind of life! Please, don't try to stop me! If you do, then I'll... How stubborn. No matter what you say to her, I doubt she'll understand. I don't think we have a choice in the matter here. 
I could take care of it for you right now. But you'd prefer her to leave here alive, right? Just hurry up and end this. Please, don't make me do this. I can't stop this. I refuse to live as Kasumi's killer. Just as we're willing to fight for our own happiness, so is Sumire. This is a desperate attempt from a girl that believes that she doesn't have the right to even exist anymore because the pain is so great. She is so desperate for Margie to delude her again that she somehow manages to summon her world of rebellion once more. This small detail actually informs us much about Sumire's spirits of rebellion as well. Even while in this desperate and highly emotional state, refusing to acknowledge herself as Sumire at all, we can ascertain that Sumire's rebellion comes from something a lot darker than we originally thought. It wasn't society, Marky, or anything else that was oppressing her, as was the case with the other the thieves. From Joker, to Ryuji, to An, to Haru, and to Akechi, and to everyone in between, through Persona Awakenings happened when rebelling was the last resort as they struck back at the ones oppressing them. Conversely, sumeri has been hopped along by nearly everyone she's interacted with thus far. Joker, her mentor, gave Kasumi's outfit its form and style. And sure, while Marky may have met up with her cognition a little bit too hard, we can easily say that it was a benevolent act at the time despite the consequences we're witnessing right now. Extrapolating all of that, we have to say that the source of Kasumi Sumi's rebellion and the one who's oppressing her is herself. It sounds paradoxical, but it is true. She hates herself and what she's done so terribly that her own heart wishes to fight to become another person, thus rebelling against a selfish person that erroneously caused the death of an innocent life. There's no two ways around it. Regardless of how you frame it, Sumeri was fully responsible for Kasumi's death and stealing her dream. Her spirit's rebellion had to be this way because otherwise, it would be considerably hard for her to awaken her persona in the first place since she might initially reject her shadow self who would surely remind her of what she has done. Even while living as Kasumi, the catalyst of her initial false awakening was done on behalf of fulfilling Kasumi's dream. Due to people clowning on her lackluster performance as an athlete, Sumire both doubled down on her own false identity as Kasumi and informed us that, above all, Kasumi's wish to become a professional athlete was the most worthy to see it fulfilled, not Sumire's. Put yourself in Sumire's shoes for just a second. As she draws a rapier, she sees Joker and Akechi as the oppressors for now refusing Moroki's offer. They are standing in the way of the very thing that Sumire seeks to rebel against, and as we end up having to fight her, we hear the desperation in her voice as she summons Sandra to strike Joker. Don't do this to me! Sandrion! It gets even more somber when Joker brings her down to half health. Ah. Why are you doing this to me? Please, just leave me alone! And again when Joker finally brings down Sumire and exhausts her. Looks like you lost. Why? Senpai. No. I can't go back to being Sumire. You saw it all for yourself, Senpai. It's my own fault that my sisters... Why don't you understand? The thing is though, we understand more than she realizes. We want to help Samiri overcome what's plaguing her heart, with the first step being to just put the weapons down and come with us to talk it out. Unfortunately, Mark has different ideas on how to help his patient, and his treatment is a little extreme. I can give you strength, so you don't have to suffer. Doctor. Tell me, if you want your pain to end, and desire to live as Kasumi. I'll actualize it! Did he? Sadly, she has lost sight of herself. She's in pain. Now, be her guide, and together, Escape from the nightmare! <sighs>
Finding Sumeria's own persona lacking, Moroki chooses to use his own powers to augment Sumeria's, but as to how he accomplished this is incredibly disturbing. Not sure about you guys, but before Moroki sees Sumeria once again, it felt like we were on the cusp of some kind of breakthrough for her. She got her bottle up anguish out for a second, and everything seemed to be completely chill. Only for Moroki to undercut this by directly co-opting Sumeria's own persona and driving Sandra on utterly insane. No, I... I can't! I don't want to go back to my life in Cinders ever again! What the hell? This so-called kindness of his disgusts me. Let's do this quick. I refuse to go back! I'm happy here. This is where I belong! <laughs> As the clock ticks ever closer to midnight, and as the spell casts upon the princess wanes with each passing minute, Sanjuron, which is also to say Kasumi, refuses to leave the ball and all of its splendor behind to go back to sleeping in the ashes of a fire once more, to be looked upon with disdain and to feel utter sorrow again. I refuse to return. I will never go back to being such pathetic, soot-coated garbage! Even as the rest of the party eventually comes to realize that they've been seduced by Marky's false reality and joins us to fight, the princess doesn't want to leave the ball. None will stand in my way. Not bad, Mona. Even when she's literally knocked off her feet, she laments the fact that midnight draws near, as a spell that once allowed her to be something more splendid, allowed her to become someone who's worth the time of day, loses its potency. It can't end yet. Samira's mind was once the case in the role of the magic because her life was tragic, but of course, it was all a trick, and as the clock strikes 12, the reality of the situation finally hit Samira's heart. I can hear them. The bells of midnight tolling. Now, my dream won't be. The clock strikes midnight. As Samira loses her spirit of rebellion once more and collapses to the ground, Maruki, unable to believe that Joker's managed to awaken the rest of the thieves, gives us an ultimatum. So, you all intend to deny the reality I've created for you. If you want to fight me, then so be it. If you plan on changing my heart, that's fine too. But before that, I think there's still room for discussion here. Also, I believe taking care of Yoshizawa-san is more important than settling this issue right now. Planning to run again. We can get back to fighting if that's what you really want. But I think you're rather exhausted at the moment. <sighs> Yoshizawa-san! There's still time. February 3rd. I'll hear your final decision on the 3rd. If your views can't align with mine by then, We'll have no other choice but a physical altercation. As much as I would loathe that, I still can't give up what I've started. What I swore I'd do. On the day I lost everything that mattered to me. I've lost his reading! I want to pursue him, but I doubt that's even possible right now. Let's get out of here. Yoshizawa's gotta rest anyway. We next will trip back to reality for Sumeria's sake, and while we're on a bit of a time limit here, we decided to take it easy for the time being and weigh our options. While the fan of Thieves and Akechi are united in our decision to fight Maruki, we really can say the same about Sumire. On our way to school, we do run into her. By the looks and sounds of it, Sumire isn't doing so well. Um, uh... Good morning. To say that Sumeri is distressed by the resurfacing of her previous memories would be a bit of an understatement. Depressed would be the more applicable word here, and this reflects well enough with her new appearance and mannerisms. What her own heart stated about her true self, the one that she deems to be worthless to cover garbage, was true. Sumeri has lost her striking red coat she wore as Kasumi, which at the time gave her an air of bold confidence. At the time as well, she didn't wear a scarf or mittens either, leading to this notion of generally being unbothered by the cold weather. Now since she's lost her boldness, she looks and sounds more meek and disheveled than ever before. This also would help by the fact that she wears black glasses and leaves her hair loose, as opposed to tying it up in a cute ponytail or wearing her contacts. Speaking of Samira's eyes, we can easily compare two aspects about her different Buster portraits that indicate just how deeply Kasumi's death has affected her. If we look at her when Samira was living at Kasumi, she's always drawn with a slight glint within her eyes. 
indicative of her sunny disposition. Even when Kasumi is sad, that glint in her eyes is still there. This version of Yoshizawa is happy and thrilled to be alive. Nothing's gonna stop or discourage her, which can't be said about Sumi right now. Her eyes are utterly dead, dull, and soulless. As the saying goes, the eyes are the windows of the soul, and right now, Sumire is not all there. I will say that they almost remind us of a certain cognitive projection of Akechi. And as was the case with that version of Akechi, Sumire also speaks differently too. Even her tone of voice is some registers lower than how she spoke as Kasumi. Physically, I'm fine, but mentally, to be entirely honest, I'm all mixed up. We'll go into more depth about why Sumeria's appearance and mannerisms have changed so drastically, along with the significance behind them a bit later, as now, despite her being utterly confused and oppressed beyond measure, Sumeria now has to grapple with reality. Now that Kasumi is gone forevermore, and the spell I cast upon Sumeria has lost all its power, the princess now must take some time alone to make a decision here. Does she once more resist the fan of these wishes to fight for the old painful reality where they still have the free will to choose to improve themselves? Or does Sumeria still wish for her fairy godfather, Dr. Tato Maruki, to cast a spell to make reality all the more splendid, not just for her, but for the rest of the world? The fan of these and Akechi choose the former and resolve to fight for what they believe in. But seeing how this decision also implicates Yoshizawa, and that the fan of these never go after a target without a unanimous decision, they give Sumire time to mull it over more. I just... Guess we might as well close up for the night. Hey, once you're done washing that, you can go ahead and call it a... Welcome. Um... Yoshizawa? Have a seat. She's here to see you, right? Now, don't worry about finishing up. I'll take care of it later. Sorry for coming over so late. And thank you for the coffee. It's delicious. Mm. Would you mind if I got something off my chest? Thank you. So, to tell the truth, I saw you all go into the nurse's office today, and, um, I sort of eavesdropped on your conversation. You've all found the paths you want to take, and are following them with such confidence. Whereas, I'm simply... Like Dr. Maruki said before, I ran from the truth. I couldn't handle the fact that Kasumi died because of my actions. My memories are still a bit hazy, but even when I remembered that I'm really Sumire, I didn't want to accept it. I was still running from reality. Where Kasumi is gone. Where I had to live for Kasumi instead of as her. Her cognition now free from Arki's grasp and her mind a bit more clear now, she remembers back to when Kasumi died and even longer before that. Sumira realizes that she never had the conviction nor confidence to stand on her own before did how she believed Kasumi to be the only one worthy of anyone's time. At some point in time, as they grew up together and as Kasumi was violently cut down, Sumira got to thinking that she had to live for Kasumi's sake as something akin to an accessory to her sister. She's lived her entire life without having any agency as her only goal was to provoke Kasumi to stardom, even if it meant becoming her doppelganger. Now that she's gone, the sole person and reason Kasumi had to live for suddenly vanished. Now faced with what is possibly the first major decision she's ever had to make within her life and a rather daunting one at that, with imaginable stakes no less, Samiri finds herself on the blind seeking Joker's advice. She knows what she has to do, but isn't sure she has the strength to persevere and see it through. She isn't sure that she can make such a choice, a choice that came so natural to the fan of these and to Akechi. So what does she do now? No. Like I said earlier, I realized something when I saw you all striving to push onward. I can't keep running like this, but... Now that Kasumi's gone, I have no idea what to do with myself. Senpai, what should I do? <sighs> you can be awfully firm sometimes, Senpai, but you're absolutely correct. 
After being called by Maruki and given some rather obtuse treatment to hide her own guilt for herself, the thing that actually drives Samira to improve herself isn't a persona, a nice cup of coffee, or denying her own actions and abilities. Rather, it's the opposite of the latter. Joker affirms to Samira that she has to decide how to proceed, that she has the power to finally make a choice, and now's a great time to not just begin to choose, but to live as well. Kasumi is gone, and while her loss is tragic and deeply felt, especially by Samira, she can't get hung up on her death in perpetuity. She, much like the rest of the fan of Thieves have already decided to do, has to decide how she herself, Sumira Yoshizawa, wants to live as her own individual person. I must thank you for allowing me to unload all of this onto you. I'm still not completely sure what I should do, but I plan to think more on it. I've got to figure out what to do with my life now. Still remaining as gracious as ever, Sumire bows in her way out, and we see that summer life has returned to her eyes as she smiles. We can only hope that she's on the up and up here, as we hear nothing all day from her during school the next day. With less than three weeks to complete our infiltration in Maruki's palace, we can't afford to waste time on Samire as she mulls things over. Poor Morgana's suggestions, we choose to leave her out of the loop and out of our first foray into Maruki's palace. However, on our first infiltration in the place, it seems like Samire is still full of surprises after finding her footing once more. Hello, everyone. You're going to fight Dr. Maruki, yes? Please, take me with you. Uh, but you can't go in dressed like that. Please, I'm done running away. I can't keep relying on people like Senpai. I want to live life as Sumire. Joker's advice has always had a stark impact on Sumire herself, and with a simple phrase, some harsh but realistic encouragement, she has come away with a lesson that she can't keep living in the shadows of other people, be it Joker or Kasumi. She's brought herself here to force herself to exert some of her own agency over her own life. She has to live as Sumire and nobody else. It also seemed that her rebellious resolve is returned once more if she's willing to summon her spirit of rebellion so easily and readily. It even impresses the likes of Morgana. <laughs> Color me impressed. Looks like she'll do just fine here. With Sumire now seemingly fully on board, and after nearly 100 hours of gameplay, Sumire is finally ready to steal some hearts with us. One thing remains though, she's been given a code name, and who better to christen her with an English allusion to her Japanese name than On? Oh, that's right. Sumire in English is Violet. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Violet, yes, let's go with that. Excellent. Now remember everyone, Violet, not Violent. Violet. Yes, thank you for clarifying. I am surrounded by absolute fools. <laughs> <laughs> All the catchy as cynicism aside, we can finally begin our infiltration proper, but immediately after exiting the elevator and entering where the third semester trio were before, Sumeria loses it briefly. Yes! Looks like Sumiri's spirit of rebellion isn't fully stable yet. Though on the outside she has stated she wants to live life as Sumiri, there still remains some inner conflict within her own heart. Remember, Sumiri's spirit of rebellion is different from the rest of the Phantom Thieves. Instead of somebody else, a third party oppressing her, she is instead her greatest oppressor herself. And the basis of Sumiri's rebellion has always been directed towards those who would seek to stifle her own dreams. You're telling me I'm not cutting it? As if I don't know that better than anyone! Still, I don't care what anyone says about me. I will not tolerate anyone speaking ill of our dream! Regardless of who and what she was before, with her own spirit rebellion now being somewhat obstinate, we can safely say that the angle of her rebellion has shifted somewhat towards herself again. In what direction, that remains to be seen. But in desiring to live life as Sumire and not as Kasumi, her heart may think that she's once again oppressing herself, however paradoxical that might sound once again. While Sumire is able to pass it off as a temporary moment of weakness, She's clearly still struggling here. Before we continue with our infiltration of Maruki's palace, we can see this inner turmoil itself if we open up the confidant menu, where we can still see that under the fifth arcana, it still reads as Kasumi Yoshizawa, with the portrait itself still reflecting that of Kasumi and not Samire. While this could be a pure coincidence and an aspect of the game that Alice forgot to flesh out, it is super interesting to think about, especially considering what happens next to Samire. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> Violet! Sandrion! What? Uh, her personas! Not on my watch! Please, stay back! I appreciate it, but allow me. I chose to stand on my own and fight. It's time I stopped being helpless. I hung my head low, 
and took your hand. But I knew all along, deep down, pretending to be Kasumi was not the right way. <laughs> The weak, insecure Sumeri <laughs> dies today! Violet... You were the one. The only one who stayed true to yourself. Come, Sandrion! If you don't answer my call now... How else can we make our dream come true? Such tenacity... It seems to fit you better than ever before. The glass slippers are the icon of glory. Not just for you, but the other girl within you as well. I am thou. Thou art I. Are you prepared for your debut? The ball awaits. Certainly. That's it. I'm done running from myself. Yeah, you tell him! Go Violet! Give him hell! Yes! Let's do this, Sandrion! Enter the persona of Sumire Yoshizawa, Sandrion. Though this particular spelling of her name might prevent some from being reminded of her place as a figure of classic fairy tale legend, the story of Sandrion climaxes like this. The prince came to the manor upon his horse and asked Sandrion's father, have you no other daughter? No, said the man. Only my dead wife left behind her a little stunted Cinderella. It is impossible that she can be the bride, but the king's son ordered her to be sent for. But the mother said, oh no, she is much too dirty. I could not let her be seen, but he would have her fetched. And so Cinderella had to appear. First, she washed her face and hands quite clean and went in and curtsied to the prince who held out to her the golden shoe. She then sat down on a stool, drew her foot out of the heavy wooden shoe and slipped it into the golden one, which fit perfectly. And when she stood up, the prince looked at her face and he knew again the beautiful man that danced with him. And he cried, this is the right bride. The stepmother and the two sisters were thunderstruck and grew pale with anger. But he put Cinderella before him on his horse and rode off. And as they passed the hazel bush, the two white pigeons cried. There they go, there they go. No blood in her shoe. The shoe's not too small. The right bride she is after all. This is Samira's true persona awakening. And oh boy, is it awesome. Once forgotten the taste and smell of a world that Samira once left behind, thing was all about the exposure of the lens. And when she both looked at herself and consuming through, however magical her delusions were, there was some part of Samira's heart that always knew that they weren't real. Even though her real life was tragic, Samira once thought that she had no faith in herself to carry on Kasumi's dream. But now she realizes that she cannot do so as a cheap delusional copy of her sister, but has to do so as Sumire herself. Just as Sumire is Sandron and Sandron is Sumire, both girls remain as gracious as they always have been, but instead of Sumire getting angry at others for speaking ill of her dream, Sumire instead gets mad, rebels even against herself. The very idea of being too weak or unworthy to carry that torch for her sister pisses her off to no end. Instead of blaming the world for kneecapping herself, it is here where Sumire realizes that she is her own greatest enemy. This was an incredibly difficult conclusion for Sumire to draw for herself, and we can see how much this decision weighs upon her. Generally speaking, all the other members of her party had an easy time tearing off their masks, but Sumire seems to have the most difficult time tearing it off her own face. This difficult Sumire has in tearing off her mask warrants some further discussion about wider persona lore that, when taken into account, makes this so much more of a profound victory for Sumire. So, let's get stuck right into it. Persona, as a game series, utilizes three key terms that social psychologist Carl Jung coined when parsing his own theories about how the subconscious mind influences the conscious mind, deeming these parts of one's psyche to be that of the persona, the shadow, and the true self. To define what the shadow means within Jungian psychological theory, the shadow archetype represents the size of oneself that an individual would rather keep hidden from both himself and from the world. Oftentimes, it includes all the things about oneself that an individual has otherwise repressed or downplayed about themselves, often including things that an individual would rather not acknowledge about themselves. Though they remain hidden to the outside world, this part of the subconscious is will influence the conscious mind, and in Samira's case, causes her great angst and turmoil when she refuses to acknowledge this part of herself. One shadow may be composed of repressed ideas, weaknesses, desires, instincts, and personal shortcomings. Something that definitely rings true for Samira here. The shadow forms out of our attempts to adapt to cultural norms and the expectations of others. Or, in other words, this part of the human psyche contains all the things that are unacceptable not only to society, but also to one's own personal morals and values. 
The shadow does not have to be inherently negative or evil. This part of your psyche is merely an expression of wants and desires that would be deemed unacceptable by society or to yourself personally. Within each Wiccan and cutscene we see in Persona 5, there's often a mention of another stuff that gets brought up during these sequences, which is implied to be that person's shadow, which in Persona 5 is begging their conscious selves to release their darkest and rebellious inhibitions. The most unacceptable parts of the subconscious that has been sealed away in some vain attempt to conform to society. This brings us nicely to the second Jungian archetype, the Persona. Persona 5 takes this concept of Jungian psychology and the concept of acceptance first introduced in Persona 4 even further by taking the etymological definition of the word Persona and recontextualizing it to the Phantom Thieves, and then to Samire. The word Persona in Latin literally translates to mask. And in Jungian psychology, the term persona is defined as a representation of all the social masks that we wear among various groups and individuals. Over the course of childhood socialization and development, children learn that they must behave in certain ways in order to fit in with society's expectations and norms. Behavior that we absolutely see in Samira engaged within her relationship to her own sister. In other words, these false masks or false personas develop to keep her own shadows locked away, hidden from the world. In Sumira's case, in order to fit in with what she thought Kasumi expected of her and what Sumira felt it necessary to do in order to elevate Kasumi to stardom as the inferior sibling, Sumira thought it best to keep quiet and follow her sister to the bitter end. Sumira developed a toxic mindset when she thought that Kasumi was the only person worthy of happiness and success, to the point where Sumira ended up killing her own dreams and stifling her own independent thoughts just to keep Kasumi happy. Sumire's shadow desperately wanted her to rebel against her sister and show her just how competent or even better she was at gymnastics than Kasumi was. However, this grew and changed as every single time Kasumi made it to the podium, Sumire would get more and more discouraged, thus adopting a false persona that would suppress these rebellious desires to best her more competent sister. All these behaviors, the creation of Sumire's false personas made to seal these latent desires away from her, and her initial desire of desiring to become Kasumi are a result of Sumire developing a toxic mindset of being worthless. In this context, Persona 5 firmly positions Sumire's shadow not as something of oneself that's lost and needs to be recovered, but instead recontextualizes it as something that already exists as part of one's psyche that's being actively suppressed at the behest of, well, Sumire herself. In this case, Sumire is oppressing herself, and thus is suppressing her own true wants and desires to be her own person, despite all the difficulties she's encountered in doing so thus far. All that to say, Sumire doesn't want to tear down society, but rather, she wants to tear herself down and rebuild. All these Persona Awakening cutscenes we've seen with previous members of the Phantom Thieves culminate with each shadow employing each thief to free themselves from the sense of social propriety to become fully self-actualized again, which involves literally ripping off their masks, their false personas, their social programming in order to give a big ol' fuck you to the people who've been dragging them through the mud, which in Samira's case, again, is just basically her arguing with herself as she becomes self-actualized once more. During these Awakening cutscenes, we often hear each Persona speak to the Wilder as they're awakening, and it's no accident that they often share the same voice actors as well. As the saying goes, I am thou, thou art I. All these personas tell each thief exactly what the problem is and how their shadow is essentially screaming at them to rebel. They tell each thief how to go about to rectify these issues and, in my opinion, Otto Ryuji's awakenings are the best examples of this particular phenomenon. Since your name has been disgraced already, why not hoist the flag and wreak havoc? The other you who exists within desires it thus. I. it's taken far too long. <laughs> tell me, who is going to avenge her if you don't? Forgiving him was never the option. Such is the scream of the other you that dwells with you. However, given that Samiri's spirit of rebellion stems from a mixture of proving to herself that she's worthy enough to carry on Kasumi's dream as she squarely rebels against herself, this makes how she awakens to Sandron twice over rather unique. In her false awakening, Sandron, being the power of Samiri's heart, knowing exactly what she is lacking, doesn't seem to be totally invested in Kasumi's awakening to her powers. But due to how her heart was set on proving all her detractors wrong for spurning her own dreams, and Kasumi seeming to know on some level or another that she wasn't hacking it in gymnastics, that notion seemed to be enough for Sandron to just roll with the false awakening. In other words, while Samiri was still living as Kasumi, Sanjuron went, she's a little confused, but she got the spirit. However, before we get to the real meat and potatoes of this awakening, I want to back it up just a second. I would be doing Sumire and all of you a great disservice, but not mentioning that Sanjuron actually does try Kasumi during a false awakening, and that there are hints that allude to Kasumi being nothing more than another false persona that Sumire must shed in more ways than one. Before I say anything else, we have to shout out a rather poor attempt to localize in this false awakening to the English subs and subs of Persona 5 Royal. In the Japanese dub of the game, Sanjuron, instead of calling Kasumi adamant, she calls Kasumi a useless girl, with the rest of the dialogue being completely different as well.
Sandra makes a direct allusion to Samira preferring to live in a lie rather than accept her soot covered self. The translation of her desires being someone that's either transient or transformative is more clear as well. When witnessing this false awakening for the first time, you might try to recontextualize it to her own heart knowing that she's not hacking into gymnastics, and instead, much like the Cinderella tale, Sandra gives Kasumi the means to prove her detractors wrong. However, now that the spell is worn off, we know that Sandra knows full well that Samira's mind is a meddle with, and decides to stick with her regardless, as this awakening technically is still in line with Samira's wants for rebelling against her weaknesses and inadequacies. Only this time, it's under false pretenses. It's a small detail, but it impacts the scene greatly. It hints at the true nature of Samira's heart, as she still believes herself to be useless, even as her cognition remains somewhat diluted. Everything else, though, is fairly comparable, and retains an acceptable level of parody from dub to dub. For all Sandra's misgivings, Samira's own heart still decides to go along with her for now. Within the False Awakening, the allusions to the Cinderella tale itself still remain, as Sumire, still thinking herself to be Kasumi, has since accepted both the contract and Maruki's cognitive spell. Sumire has chosen to wear a certain pair of splendid shoes to the ball, but as we've seen, she refuses to leave such splendid behind and pursue her own shoes to covered self. In insisting that she's actually someone else, the kind and gracious Kasumi Yoshizawa, and not the soot covered irrelevant Sumire Yoshizawa, the spell becomes somewhat permanent as she then undergoes a transformation to remain spectacular, and remains so until the clock strikes 12. Eagle eyed viewers of the part of Sumire's false awakening would have noticed that when she initially rips off her mess, she does it with graceful ease and that there is a stark absence of blood as well. This all hints that this was not a true awakening, but interestingly enough, Sumeri does experience the headaches and pain as her shadow self reunites with her conscious self. Sumeri was also able to power through the post-awakening exhaustion that is so common here as well. We could make the argument that because Sumeri already partially awakened her persona, she need not go through all that again. Though, considering that Haru is exhausted after her own true awakening, the more accurate assessment here is that Sumeri is refusing to see anyone, including herself, sweat. In keeping in line with her own renewed sense of rebellion, she also proves to herself that she's not weak anymore. All these things were absent from her true awakening in contrast, though Samiri has a markedly more difficult time ripping off her mask to reveal the nightmare slash her face underneath. Though Samiri finds it difficult not just to discard the false persona of Kasumi Yoshizawa, but to also resolve to be stronger and more secure within herself, she eventually does manage. She's finally able to be herself on a Bachelor League, weaknesses and all. Instead of being adamant, Sandra praises Samiri's newfound tenacity, and now more than ever before, the Cinderella allegory fits her better than ever. Such tenacity. It seems to fit you better than ever before. When living as Kasumi, we skipped out on the parts of the fairy tale where she was inherently mistreated, thought of as second rank compared to the more prestigious stepsisters of her own house. I'm not saying that Kasumi directly occupies the evil stepsis role from the fairy tale itself, but Kasumi is somewhat analogous to it as she is seemingly favored over Sumire, or Sandra and herself. All of Kasumi's haters at Shujin Academy were just plainly jealous of her. They weren't actively trying to punch down on Kasumi, like as was the case with Makoto, Ryuji, and On. Kasumi already held much prestige at Shujin, but had her haters trying to dissuade her. Initially, we thought of Kasumi as being an inherently gracious person, with that characteristic giving her the power to persevere and the power to awaken to her persona. Now though, we see that in a re-debut as Sumire, Sandra positions Sumire as someone who's just recently transformed into something more fantastical. Yet with that, Sumire acknowledges that she is someone who can't afford to keep running from her soot-covered self. At this point in the tale, Sandra is about to depart from the ball, but hasn't quite left yet and what she does with all this power and newfound grandeur, not by someone whose name already carries with it the reputation of the very essence of confidence itself. In addition, and according to the original Cinderella tale, the glass slippers the fairy godmother gave Sandra and kept her from being recognized by her family, which, as we can guess now, is not the case anymore. Sumiri is now the true version of Cinderella in all senses of the word. While Sandra was originally a manifestation of Sumiri's desire to truly be Kasumi, wanting her own pair of glass slippers so the world will only see her as the more popular sibling, the slip cover girl finally understands that graciousness itself requires one not to be adamant about such a characteristic, but instead, it requires someone to be tenacious enough to persevere through all manner of hardship and to have a certain understanding of one's own weaknesses. In understanding this and being prepared to overcome herself, Sumire is finally ready to wield Sandra on herself as she dares to dream to be worthy of Kasumi's dream and having the tenacity to see it through to the end. It's not all just talk though, as we can see market improvements within Sumire's new convictions being displayed here. Not only does Sandra and Kasumi descend from the heavens as some sort of cognitive angel to greet Sumire, but Kasumi even seems to speak Sumire's name as it means to finally give peace and closer to Samiri, and she's finally able to take her hand and awaken to her true power. Not just for you, but the other girl within you as well. 
While this is all obviously a projection of Samira's heart, it is no less impactful here. It's a simultaneous passing of the torch from sister to sister and an affirmation of confidence from Samira's own heart that she is fully capable of making both her dreams come true all by her lonesome, however grim that might be. With that, everything we said during a false awakening still holds true for Samira. Her outfit, her choice of melee weapons, firearms, and the style in which she fights are also indicative of her entrance and competence in gymnastics. Even as a supposed soot covered inferior Yoshizawa sibling, Sumiri is still able to fight in pirouette and combat just as well as she was deluded into thinking that she was someone else. Moreover, Sumiri's costume hasn't changed one bit, and while it still holds true that she was almost entirely inspired by Joga's own outfit, with Sumiri adding her own feminine twist to it, there is another aspect to her outfit now that we know that Sumiri is truly Sumire. I may mention in passing that Joker's red gloves mark him as a criminal with an erroneous background. Society sees Joker not as a person, but as a criminal with blood on his hands, even though he never killed anyone, and is thus, as a criminal, a threat against society societal order. This was Kana Yaldabaoth's general beef with Joker after all. However, when we consider that Sumire also has those same red gloves, and now that we know that she directly caused the death of her sister, the red gloves themselves literally become more associated with blood itself rather than being an obtuse solution to a particular criminal past. To Samiri, she does have blood on her hands, and more specifically, her sister's blood. Even through both versions of herself, this aspect of her outfit remains constant. Kasumi's death has deeply affected Samiri to the point where it's even expressed upon a projection of what Samiri believes to be rebellious power and graciousness itself. So, you may ask, how is championing the death of her sister gracious at all? Well, just as we see Joker often adjusting or tightening his gloves after performing an all-out attack, or even when he decides to steal loot from a palace, we can say that this is merely means for Joker to affirm his status as an outlaw criminal. Consequently, we can also say with certainty that these gloves on Samira's costume are Samira herself acknowledging that, yes, the death of her sister happened, and that, yes, she's able to move on from it of her own volition. I must say that it's no accident that during Samira's own true awakening, the projection of Kasumi and Samira reaching out for each other, touching hand to bloody red glove is no accident. This aspect of Samira's outfit is all about acceptance, as she realizes that in order to succeed, she must be in a state of constant uprising, a state of constant rebellion within herself, in to both stay true to herself and make her own dreams come true. Well, that sentiment lies a running theme with the other fan of these outfits, too. As I stated before, they're all expressions of how society deems them to be social deviants, with their own spirit of rebellion co opting this notion to make their outfits a sort of twisted parody of how they're all perceived by the world. As Joker revels in his role as a gentleman thief, weaving in and out of high society for the sole purpose of stealing shit, so does Sumire's outfit allude to how she steals Kasumi's identity in order to gain some semblance of self confidence and self esteem. After she remembers who she truly is, Sumire's spirit of rebellion recontextualizes her outfit to become a mockery of her deceased twin in the process, something very fitting at being the representation of a doppelganger. When this trope is depicted in classical fiction, it is often said that one sees their own doppelganger and is soon due to kill you and take your place. As Sumire's own rebellion is all about proving to herself that she is worthy, this would then make the most sense for Samira to kind of throw shit at Kasumi in this way too. Samira once felt like people wanted Kasumi to succeed over her, and well, she's gonna try and strike it out on her own now. As we finish wiping out the rest of the shadows, Joker senses a renewed resolve from Samira, as her new awakening coincides with a significant change within her own faith itself. I am thou. Thou art I. My vow stands renewed in pursuit of the truth. In breaking free of doubt, the chain that impedes thee is thy strength of heart made manifest. With the rebirth of the faith persona, thou hast obtained the winds of blessing that shall guide thee to the furthest depths. Coinciding with Samiri undergoing a fundamental change to herself, so has the true nature of the fifth arcana finally revealed itself to us. As it transforms before her eyes, Samiri's faith in herself is renewed as she makes it clear to us that the only thing holding her down was doubt itself. Since overcoming that, we can see that the suspicious nature of the design of the Faith Arcana was false all along. All of our suspicions we raised earlier were indeed true, from the ripped and torn corners of the card itself to the demon seemingly puppeteering a dead man. This card indicates that there was something fundamentally wrong about Kasumi, and as it turns out, we were right. Kasumi was but a fake, and as the true design of the card reveals itself, we're left with totally different implications for the old card and new implications to examine. To recap, the old card depicts a skeleton with a noose around its neck as it's being towed along by two demons. We can now say with conviction that the skeleton, the Marnite Priest, is in fact Kasumi's corpse being paraded about by the false versions of Samire. The side of her that utilized the identity of her dead sister to wrongly and selfishly boost her near zero confidence and self esteem. The other is representative of her desire to accept Maraki's offer, to literally continue to live in a lie. It's quite the dastardly card, but the good news is that, well, Samira's literally got her two demons under control now. The demons, instead of snarkily tugging at the priest, are now two slaves charged with the duty of lugging around the priest on his throne. However, despite the priest indicating that Sumeria's faith has been restored, as he is finally able to grip the staff and do the flesh returning to his body, he can now do this gesture with his right hand. 
I have conflicting sources on this, but nevertheless, it's either a Roman orator's gesture to indicate authority that was then caught up by Christians to use as a sign of recognition and benediction. Of course, when Christianity became popular during the Roman Empire, this hand gesture then became a part of worship, with some suggesting that this positioning of the finger spelled the Greek abbreviation of Jesus' name. I would also wager that you've seen any number of religious paintings that depict Jesus or any other number of religious figures, such as St. Nicholas, making this gesture. Almost always, they are designed not to be facing away from the onlookers, but rather the opposite, as it means to bless them. Tying this back to Samiri, this gesture literally just means faith itself this is all well and good and indicative of some amount of restoration of faith within Sumeria's own heart but given that the skeleton is like representative of Kasumi we can likely guess that the devils turned slaves represent Sumeria's own erroneous desires sure she has brought them to all the heal but she's now charged with dragging around all the trauma memory and guilt of her sister's death as it still seeks to crush her at any moment Despite finding the means to trudge on, she will forever be doomed to having to deal with the impossible expectations of actualizing Kasumi's dream all by herself, and dealing with the immense pressures such a dream puts solely upon herself. While it seems certainly paradoxical to suggest that Sumiri isn't the priest, considering her true reckoning is about her rebelling against her biggest oppressor, herself, this changing of the card is all about Samira realizing that her awakening means that she must realize that she's better than what she thinks that she is. Despite all the challenges and temptations of running away, Samira's got to stick to the grind in order to stay true to herself. Of course, that doesn't mean Samira shouldn't ask for help or become some kind of lone wolf in pursuit of her goals. As of now, she's merely taken a step, and a rather big one at that, towards achieving her and Kasumi's dreams. However, the latter, as her new fancy Arcana card would imply, Kasumi's still got a few things to come to terms with. Now that Kasumi's gone and Samira's no longer interested in living a lie, she'll have to bank on Joker once more to sort through her own feelings of guilt concerning Kasumi's death and how exactly Samira will live her own life outside the shadow of her sister. So let's delve right into the second part of Samira's cover arc to discern how she feels now that the spell's magic has completely worn off. After Samira's true awakening, she mentions his Joker on the 13th of January and take him up to the school's room. She feels as though it's appropriate for Joker and her to go somewhere a bit more private where she could tell him more about, well, recent events. Something's clearly bothering Samiri, and we'd be a good friend to indulge her. In normal Yoshi's out of fashion, she immediately apologizes for troubling her beloved senpai, but at the same time, Samiri also accidentally incurred some fridge horror. She brings up all the seemingly prior innocuous details about her living as Kasumi, which, as she contemplates them further, carries more disturbing undertones regarding how the rest of the student body treated her. Knowing what we know about how Maruki changed Samiri's cognition by implementing a cognitive overlay over her own mind, it only affected her cognition and those like Joker, who believe that she was instead Kasumi. However, if we step outside that bubble, Marky made for Samiri and everyone else who believed in her, we then have some major problems. If Samiri was directly copying the mannerisms of her dead sister, she must have looked and sounded absolutely insane. Later, we're going to meet her gymnastic toast in her confident arc as well. But could you imagine for a second Samiri being utterly broken and depressed as she grieves over Kasumi's death, only to suddenly show up to practice a couple months later as a dead ringer for Kasumi, copying her routines as well? That must have been jarring, and part of the reason why her coach ordered her some time off to find herself. Turns out, her coach was also being quite literal. As for Samiri's peers, it's a small Small wonder the students at Shujin just shoot her as some special snowflake, and at worst, gossip behind her back. All of Yoshizawa's haters probably aren't that jealous of her, as they likely just treated her as mentally unstable and unworthy of the scholarship. If anything, they all just put up with the weirdness because the rumor eventually got out that she had a sister who died in a tragic accident. This might also be true of the staff that was trying their best to, well, use negative reinforcement to motivate Yoshizawa into success. While their methods were indeed dubious, from the outside looking in, them waxing on about special treatment while Maruki protested against the very idea of coddling her, we can now see that the faculty of Shujin Academy was actually kind of more reasonable than we originally thought. Following that, there's simply no way that Samira herself can accept having received a lofty scholarship treatment as an honor student and having that taken away simply because the school's faculty and the students treated her as a loon. We'll talk more about this a bit later, but it serves as a good starting point to where this conversation with Samiri is going. Even after all she's been through and resolved to kill the weaker parts of herself, Samiri still seems to be struggling with the shame of selfishly adopting Kasumi's identity and mannerisms. Even through some way or another, we know Maruki to be responsible for managing Samiri's cognition, and even though that is unequivocally true, Samira can help herself but feel guilt and shame as, from her point of view, she didn't care enough that Kasumi was gone. Joker tries to ease her conscience, but Samiri still insists on reflecting upon everything that she's done wrong. It's also here where we learn a few more things about Samiri and Kasumi's relationship. Per Samiri's recollection, ever since since they were kids, Kasumi was always the one making the major decisions. She would decide what Samiri did, what she chose to do during the day, and where Kasumi would go, along with her sister, of course. Now, this sounds kind of awful for Kasumi to making these decisions for Samiri, as she stifles her sister's own identity and agency, 
But reading between the lines here, it would seem that even before Samiri developed the pseudo inferiority complex toward Kasumi, Samiri seemed to have difficulty making decisions upon her own. To quote Samiri, I couldn't do anything without her. And by all means, this isn't her saying it in a cutesy, I'm inseparable from my sister sort of way. There has to be some spite and loathing here, but it's not directed toward Kasumi herself, but Sumire. In fact, while living as an imperfect copy of Kasumi, we see some vestiges of her true personality shining through. We see in Sumire defer to Joker's own judgment about making any kind of major decision, with the best example being when she asked Joker to pick out those glasses for her father. She is literally paralyzed by indecision most of the time, with Joker having to push her into making one. Also, as we've seen when Samira tried to make a bento for Joker, when she gets something wrong, she immediately panics and catastrophizes over her failures. In retrospect, it now feels like she was never on her sister's level to begin with. She was never somebody with the ability to make any kind of independent decision for herself. Her grades and prowess of gymnastics paled in comparison to Kasumi, with Samira calling herself pretentious for entertaining her own anguish. In Samira's mind, this is what led to Kasumi's death, as when she exerted a little bit of her own agency and will, well, you know. Samiri deems herself to be too self-absorbed to do anything about the situation as she just falls along in Kasumi's own shadow, suffering in silence all the while. As Joker tries to calm her down once again, which does work, Samiri has to sit down as she tries to recall some of the more happier moments of her time with Kasumi. We can tell that when recalling these rather silly and childish memories, we see Samiri's expression change from something rather gloomy to something resembling a near smile. As she recalls how she and Kasumi got in gymnastics, she again followed Kasumi into the sport. Being the younger sister who obviously loves her elder sister at such a young age, I would say that it's a fairly common phenomenon for siblings to get into the same sports at a young age as well. Samiri seems to be aware of this too, as she even admits that from a young age, she copied Kasumi in almost everything. However, being too young to understand the rules of gymnastics, like a toddler perfectly dribbling a ball down to the opposite side of the football pitch, to then proceed to kick it into the wrong goal, Samiri wasn't really there to try to compete like Kasumi was. As is always the case with sports involving little kids, you're really there for the snacks and Gatorade your coach distributes after the game is over. In the Yoshizawa sister's case, it was ice cream. Samira recalls another happy memory when we find out that the crux of both of their dreams to reach the top of the world in gymnastics was motivated by a very young and naive Kasumi, thinking that when reaching such a lofty and prestigious place, it would mean infinite amounts of ice cream for both of them. A silly childish memory, but what I want to highlight here is that Samira still defers to Kasumi here and even refers to her as a super genius. While Kasumi and Samiri both enjoy the rewards of practice, based on what Samiri says here, she is more extrinsically motivated by direct rewards and praise than her sister, who seems to just love the sport for the sake of it. Samiri states that besides hanging out with her sister, she really, really enjoyed the praise she received from her coaches from doing well. Above all, she seemed to like the validation from all the work she put in, but of course, interest in that waned as they grew older together, along with other things. Everything came natural to the bold and fearless Kasumi, while the gloomy Samiri would be doomed to eat her constellation ice cream no matter how hard she tried. However, Kasumi never basked in her victory alone. She always felt it right to include Samiri, even when she did often make it to the podium position. Despite Samiri's lackluster attempts as a gymnast, Kasumi would go out of her way to try and inspire some confidence in her sister, and tell her that one day she'll be up there in the podium with her. Previously, we have seen Samiri need some encouragement as well. All I have to do is think back to the batting cages where she got easily discouraged and needed Joker to motivate her to step back in the batter's box to try again. This was also the case for Samiri, as when they were kids, too, Kasumi would often come to assist Samiri with her own routines and practices for several hours after finishing her own. When Joker suggests that she must have really loved her baby sister, Samiri gives a rather strange response. She says that Kasumi was the perfect older sister, kind and strong, but unreasonably benevolent. However, before we have a chance to digest that, Samiri, after hesitating somewhat, says that she finds Kasumi's kindness infuriating. A strange response from someone who received so much love from her sister, but as Sumira explains herself, she got to thinking that all the effort Kasumi put into helping her sister was all pointless. She never showed any marked improvements. Meanwhile, her sister was always on the podium, surrounded by flashing cameras and adoring fans. When Sumira says that she's not Kasumi, and that she'll never be like her, it's not her way to return to being and living as Kasumi. It's an objective recollection of all the failures Sumira had to endure as she watched her sister succeed. The key phrase here is, I'll never be like her. As Sumira shakes her head, her eyes cast to the ground, she says that if Kasumi wanted to just given up on her, her repeated triumphs over her sister, and the way that people would compare them, and even her death wouldn't have hurt her so much. It's here where we finally realize that Samiri directly tells us that she experienced a significant amount of suicidal ideation. While Samiri doesn't explicitly say that she wanted to die, she does express a specific desire not to exist. She thinks that the world would be better off without her, while deeming her own existence as pointless and inconsequential, thinking that nobody would care if she would just suddenly die. Of course, Samiri then had to contend with this line of thinking after the more worthwhile sibling died protecting her idiot sister. Her words, not mine, which of course made these thoughts worse. There are a few things that are going on here, and now that we're allowed to peer more into the relationship between Kasumi and Samire, we can dig into the Japanese sociological context behind why Samire found Kasumi's kindness so aggravating. More importantly, we can finally ask why Kasumi, despite all, felt an obligation to help her sister succeed, and why Samire, despite all, felt it appropriate to just follow Kasumi around. Throughout the series, we touch upon how, within Japanese society, there seems to be this compulsion responsibility, this angle towards oneself and the group. 
where the desires and needs of the individual are deemed to be less important to that of the overall group. Last time when we went over Makoto's character arc, we went over the concept of Gaman, the Zen Buddhist term which means endure the seemingly unbearable with patience and dignity. Or more directly and relevant to Persona 5, it's when one is encouraged to have a high tolerance and capacity for stoic endurance. We drew this concept back to Makoto during her best to deal with all the adults in her life, including Sai, gaslighting her into all oblivion. Sai, having historically grind away in a man's world, also had to sit in silence as she was not valued or appreciated within Japanese society as a woman. This makes him in the prescriptive behavioral tendency that figure of piety encouraged Makoto to engage within rapidly rolled her way to Makoto's own self-esteem and her fraternal relationship with Sai. Due to how Sai had to play the feeling role of the big sister and Makoto's paternal guardian, the Nijima sisters experienced a more dysfunctional relationship compared to the Yoshizawas. Sumiri and Kasumi experienced Gaman warping their own relationship to a similar degree, although it was much more one-sided, with Sumiri experiencing much more anguish due to Gaman itself. We know that Sumiri developed a toxic mindset around her own sister succeeding, and we can also make a good guess that this happened for years as Kasumi relentlessly tried to help her sister get somewhere near her level. We spoke at length about how feel piety is characterized as a hierarchy within Japanese society as well. A benevolent authoritarian-like social structure where parents or even older siblings of a particular group or family are expected to protect and nurture their juniors. This is the best highlight with how the Chinese character that represents filial piety, translated to Zhao, is written as so. The character is a combination of the character Lao, meaning old, above the character Zi, meaning son. In essence, this character depicts an elder being carried by a son. So to tie this all back into Confucian ideals, this indicates that the older generation should be supported by the younger generation, with the youngins of society doing so as an unconditional obligation, having no choice but to unconditionally support the parents as far as Confucian ethics is concerned. Filial piety also places older members of the family upon a pedestal in such a manner where they are also positioned to be the wisest and where everyone below their station are directed to obey them unquestionably. Due to their age, this gives them the moral authority to direct and command respect, loyalty, and gratitude from their juniors or siblings. Conventional wisdom says that because they're older, they are wiser, and said youngins must demonstrate reverence and gratitude to that moral fact. Due to Sai Makoto's relationship being a nearly strict guardian ward relationship, we see only this aspect of filial piety being demonstrated by both Nijima's sisters. However, there is another aspect of filial relationship that Sumire and Kasumi clearly comment upon. As Sumire has stated and demonstrated while living as Kasumi, Kasumi shows an unbelievable amount of patience and benevolence towards Sumire as she consistently faltered. Within a filial context, Kasumi, as the older sibling, was demonstrating something called on. This term expresses a deep sense of obligation and gratitude, but it's not quite as simple as owing somebody an IOU. It defines a debt that one can truly not repay. A social obligation or gratitude that's so great one can never truly repay them. On includes all the kinds of combined obligations and gratitudes that we owe to our parents, grandparents, and older siblings for all the care and kindness they have given us as the benevolent authoritarian figures in our lives as they use their position authority to teach and nurture their junior relatives. To contextualize this further, imagine for a second you got accepted into a prestigious prep school on scholarship due to one of the staff putting in a good word to the principal. In a filial context, this staff member, your future sensei, has hereby laid an on-depth obligation upon you, with such a favor being repaid by being a good student. You will be expected to perform actions like showing respect towards your seniors, practicing hard, paying attention in class, attending the school regularly, and not dishonoring the school in word or action. This is behavior that Kasumi engaged within, and by all rights, she was very good at being the perfect bigger sister in this context, an expert in the field of gymnastics, who then used her knowledge and field position relative to Samiri to mentor her baby sister. Of course, as we know, Samiri finds Kasumi's benevolence infuriating, but doesn't place the blame at Kasumi's feet for doing what society expected of her as the older and wiser sibling. If anything, Samiri consequently feels as though she's spurning or even failing Kasumi's adherence to benevolence, authority, and her role within society as her older sister as she perpetually tries to mentor Samire, with the baby sister continually failing to learn or improve. This is why Samire finds Kasumi demonstrating on as a personal value so infuriating. She's not mad at Kasumi as much as Samire is mad at herself for being so useless and internalizing and applying Kasumi's advice as her younger sister. Within that, Samira thinks herself to be a bad sister on a societal level, which opens up another layer to this as well. Just as we know that filial piety is a transactional relationship between a particular family authority figure and their juniors, Samira, as the younger sibling, is morally obligated to respect the concept of giri when her sister attempts to guide and mentor her. This concept of giri, when translated to English, loosely means something that corresponds to a sense of duty or obligation, but a more correct interpretation of this concept and its relationship to on will be something like the burden of obligation. In practice, Sumire, as the younger sister, would be obligated to receive Kasumi's affections, favor, and mentorship with a certain degree of self-sacrificing devotion. This explains two things for Sumire. It tells us that Sumire felt a great moral debt that she had never fully repaid to her sister, and for another, it explains why Sumire's wish wasn't for Maraki to strand up resurrect Kasumi, but for her to essentially die so that the weak disappointment would no longer be interfering with Kasumi's dream. It is only through this reciprocation of Kasumi displaying the ultimate act of benevolence, sacrificing herself in order to save her baby sister's life from a deadly accident, can Sumire finally start to make good in a lifetime's worth of kindness. This is why, during the time she's still living as Kasumi, Sumire mentioned that she doesn't like receiving special treatment as an honor student. People are often wary of me because I'm an honor student. 
The school's expecting me to attain strong results in the upcoming competitions, too. They even told me I didn't have to participate in the cleanup event. But I just don't like getting special treatment. While I have said that Sumeri Spirit's Rebellion is wholly her own, and is something that she defines for herself, this subtle concept seems to weigh the heaviest upon Sumeri more than any other character in Persona 5. Even more than Ryuji's relationship to both the track team and his mother. Even more than On's relationship with Shiho. Even more than Yusuke's relationship with Madarame. And Makoto's relationship to Sai and her father as well. It gave Sumeri a very toxic view of the world and of herself. But now things are going to change from here on out. As our conversation nears its natural end, Sumeri wants to develop a more healthy view of herself and of the world. Now that she's done running from herself, she wants to keep doing gymnastics as Sumire found to do so or straying from her one true self would mean that she's therefore unable to face her sister and make good on all the on she showed her. Kasumi's dead and gone. Just as Sumire seems to be accepting the fact, she's unsure that she'll be able to stay the course without Joker's help. Of course we agree to help her. Why wouldn't we? Sumeri takes a dig at herself and calls herself lame, which just shows how low her self-esteem is once again. We'll talk about that more in depth in just a second, but nevertheless, her entire worldview is defined by working on the behalf of someone else. While that might need to change soon, Sumeri gives us a deep bow and reintroduces herself as Sumeri Yoshizawa, someone who's glad to meet us again. Joker senses a bond of deep trust from Sumeri, and it would seem that merely talking about her feelings was a great relief to her. Sumeri is kind of used to bottling up her feelings of anguish at her sister's behest. Now she feels markedly better and wants to move forward as herself, Sumire Yoshizawa. Of course, it comes with her own set of baggage as well. As Joker returns home, the consequences of Marcus' cognitive overlay being peeled from Sumire's own cognition means that her gymnastic skills have suffered as a result. As much as it sucks, this is the real Sumire. However, before she hangs up on us, she wants to consider where the bold and confident Kasumi got her strengths from and where Sumire herself can differentiate and find her own strengths independently from her sister. This becomes true in more ways than one in the next part of her confident arc. So let's jump right into it. All right. Rank 7 of Sumire's confident arc has us meet up with Sumire for a special boxer sizing training she signed up for with her coach, Hiraguchi san. We will also be meeting this coach, who, as it so happens, has been training the Oshizawa since they were little. Sumire seems to hold her in high esteem and smiles upon the mentioning of her name. It's always good to see a smile upon her face when recalling the past, but as we head over to the gym, we gain some more insight about Sumire herself. While we're waiting for Hiroguchi san to show up, Sumire recalls how whenever they would do this exercise before, she would get tired absurdly quickly compared to Kasumi. Furthermore, Sumire also says that she always felt miserable during these exercises, and when seeing that Kasumi wasn't getting winded at all, it made her even more miserable. Sumire is no stranger to catastrophizing when confronted with the possibility of failure, but the physical exhaustion combined with the loss or lack of motivation indicates that along with suicidal ideation that Sumire admitted that she was experiencing before, she may also be severely depressed. Now, I am no psychiatrist, but given that while on her Maruki spell, Sumeri mentions that she fell into a deep depression that got really bad. As more and more details about how exactly Maruki meddled with Sumeri's cognition becomes more and more clear, some aspects of Sumeri's personality remained under the thin veneer of Kasumi Yoshizawa. In rank 2 of her confident arc, Sumire mentioning that she felt sluggish and felt like she wasn't moving in her own body had a double meaning all along. She was literally someone else, but for all of Maruki's efforts, he couldn't give Sumire the same energy levels that Kasumi had. Given that bit of information, her suicidal ideation, the way that Sumire constantly puts herself down, and her depressive episode still sticking around after Maruki halfway changed her cognition, it wouldn't be crazy to assume that Sumire had anything less than major depressive disorder or clinical depression. If that's the case, that would mean that a lot of Sumire's struggles, behaviors, and appearance can be attributed to the latter. A huge smart of someone who is inflicted with MDD is someone who remains severely and constantly depressed for a period beyond two weeks. Due to his clinical nature, this would also mean that Sumire has been suffering from this condition for a majority of her life. As to how Sumire became depressed, it could have started at any particular age. There could be biological, genetic, environmental, psychosocial factors that could have led to her developing this condition. However, there are a few key moments in Sumire's life that could have led to her developing this condition. It would seem that both her and Kasumi were already susceptible to develop this condition with them being twins and all. Research has shown that monozygotic twins are genetically predisposed to having MDD. That would be strike one for Sumire, with strike two stemming from the traumatic events or lifelong stress having the possibility of making someone severely depressed as well, which would track twofold for Sumire. First, she had to endure seeing her sister completely destroy the competition and incidentally ruin Sumire's own self-esteem in the process, as Sumire herself put constant pressure on herself to improve. Next, she rather obviously had to see her sister perish before her eyes and had to deal with the survivor's guilt after the fact. Coming back to Sumire's sixth rank of her confident arc, she directly says that everyone would be better off if she just plainly didn't exist. Sumire feels so worthless after all these events and rationalizes her own existence as utterly pointless when compared to that of Kasumi's or really anyone else's. 
We also know Samira to be someone introverted when compared to Kasumi, but immediately after she remembers who she truly is, we can notice an immediate change in Samira's body language. While living as Kasumi, she emanates confidence and elegance. Her arms are always at her side with a fist clenched as she positions her legs slightly off center while putting all her weight on her right leg, something that she probably picked up from gymnastics. Kasumi also freely twists her body when she needs to speak to somebody and doesn't directly face them, but for Samira, her own confidence has seemingly evaporated. She completely squares herself off when speaking to other people like Joker and clasps her hands together, holding her in front of her abdomen. Compared to Kasumi, she looks remarkably insecure. Clasping her hands in such a manner is a gesture that indicates a defensive posture and implies some amount of social insecurity. It directly implies messages of submissiveness, shyness, and innocence as well. Samira's stance suggests that she's defending against possible judgments of those watching. So if Samira is truly depressed, then she might, as someone who has MDD, experience something called psychomotor retardation. Pardon the term, but this is a major symptom of those suffering from clinical depression and would easily explain why Sumeru's more gloomy disposition and Sumeru's more disheveled appearance when compared to that of Kasumi's. Generally speaking, psychomotor retardation is categorized by a slowing down of thought and a reduction of physical movements within a particular individual. When compared to a neurotypical person, psychomotor retardation causes a visible slowing of physical and emotional reactions, including speech and affect. For the clinically depressed, their physicality, cognitive abilities, and emotional capacity for expressing emotions are all stunted and blunted, with these symptoms for someone like Samira being persistent and constant for her. If Samira does indeed suffer from major depressive disorder, then there's a litany of symptoms that come with those who are affected by it, with Samira unfortunately experiencing most, if not all of the particular symptoms. Generally speaking, there are three distinct categories of fatigue that commonly occur within the population of MDD patients. Purely speaking of the physical symptoms for now, they include general fatigue, reduced activity, low energy, tiredness, decreased physical endurance, increased effort to do physical tasks, general weakness, heaviness, slowness, or general sluggishness of one's limbs. This is something that we can easily slot Samira into. She actually comments upon this and demonstrates these symptoms at multiple points throughout the game, even at the points in the narrative where she's still living as Kasumi. Sumire, in rank 2 of her confident arc, mentions that she cannot move like she used to. It's as if she's occupying another's body, which she technically is. Because she believes herself to be Kasumi, the more energetic sibling, she interprets the symptom of her depression as a slump. We can see this again in the fifth rank of her confident arc, as, well, it would seem that Kasumi cannot make contact with the baseball screwing at her from the machine. She has poor reflexes and her reaction time is blunted. Further still, in Maruki's palace, after she enters ever closer to rediscovering herself, Sumire ends up getting more and more exhausted. As you know, her attacks all evolve complex gymnastics routines, and while the metaverse does allow for some leeway from acrobatic skills, the exhaustion Sumire feels here cannot be ignored. <sighs> now what? If Samira's suppression affects her ability to fight in the metaverse, then it would also be completely reasonable to assume that her condition imparts her fatigue great enough to then impair her performance in gymnastics as well. Within that, we would have a rational explanation as to why Samira paled the comparison of Kasumi within the sport. As per rank 7 of her confident arc, Samira mentions that when she would go to practice with her sister, Samira would get exponentially more tired than Kasumi would in such a short matter of time. While it's easy to write off this exercise in particular as being difficult, which Samira does, or Kasumi having more stamina than Samira, or some of the third thing, like Samira's toxic inferiority complex distorting her own perceptions of her performance against her sister, the quick onset of Samira's fatigue cannot be denied here. She's always too tired to perform at Kasumi's level, and to come within a hair's breadth of for greatness, Samira has to work exponentially harder despite being constantly tired and unmotivated all the goddamn time. Coming back to rank 6 of her confident arc once again, we also find out that Samira's own academic performance compared to Kasumi's has always been aggressively average, and once again, Samira's depression is to blame here. The cognitive symptoms of her experiencing psychomotor retardation include decreased concentration, decreased attention, decreased mental endurance, and slowed thinking. All that to say, it is literally harder for Samira to just focus in general, which impacts her academic abilities, energy gymnastics performances as well. The general sluggishness that she feels within her body, along with her own ability to recall or memorize things, has made everything exponentially more difficult for her. She has mentioned that she keeps messing up her gymnastics routines, with such problems being present before and after Kasumi's death. Why am I doing so bad? I keep messing up my routine. Your growth spurts just changed your eye level. You'll get used to it. Look, you're as tall as I am now. <laughs> we practice the same amount. Uh, but you are the one who always gets first place. I can't catch up to you, Kasumi. With that being said, we can say with certainty, be it the cognitive or physical symptoms or some intersection of both of them, it is no wonder that Samira felt both an innate discouragement as a result of her condition and from her failing to match up to her sister. This leads us nicely into the emotional effects of Samira's depression as well. The emotional or affective symptoms of her condition would include apathy, decreased motivation, or Samira herself lacking initiative. Samira would also experience decreased interest in certain things, be overwhelmed very easily, and have an overall aversion to effort. All these symptoms would 
would easily explain how Samira developed her inferiority complex in relation to her sister, and how those negative thoughts proliferated within her own mind. As for the evidence of Samira experiencing the dulling of her own emotions, we merely need to look at the video Mark you showed her, which, if you recall, features her own inner monologue and her own perspective relative to that of Kasumi's. If her own memories were anything to go by, she's always spoken with a monotonous voice and has been a little gloomy when compared to Kasumi. While living as her sister, when Kasumi would get really sad, her tone of voice never really changed that much. I have a younger sister. We promised each other that we'd win international gymnastics competitions together. But this spring, she died in an accident. I promised her we'd take the gold for our routines across the world. But I can't stop worrying about my lack of improvement lately. I've really been throwing myself into practice. But I wonder if even that won't be enough. Her voice would drop and register just a little bit, but for Sumire, her speaking several registers lower than her sister is just how she normally talks. Like I said earlier, I realized something when I saw you all striving to push onward. I can't keep running like this. But now that Kasumi's gone, I have no idea what to do with myself. Senpai, what should I do? You can be awfully firm sometimes, Senpai. Even in the scene where Marky rips off her cognitive overlay and we hear her speak, this isn't her feeling sad just because she remembers who she is. Her own condition just stymies her own ability to express emotion itself to the point of it affecting her affect of her speech and its patterns as well. We can see Sumiri expressing these things when she's just matter-of-factly speaking about how Kasumi died and when she expresses deep sorrow for seemingly robbing Kasumi of her dream. No, that's not right. I'm... I'm not Kasumi. I wasn't looking where I was going. And Kasumi, she protected me from the car. I was saved by Kasumi. I robbed her of her dreams and even her life. For the depressed person like Sumire, the amount of effort in merely talking or having the ability to express one's own emotions takes great effort, which is why Sumire has this certain doom and gloom about her. It is very difficult for her to express anything other than monotonous sadness. Even when Sumire is generally happy or pleased with something, she still maintains the mostly blunted way of speaking. Violet. Yes, let's go with that. Excellent. Now remember everyone, Violet, not Violent, Violet. Yes, thank you for clarifying. That's it. I'm done running from myself. Yeah, you tell him. Go Violet, give him hell. Yes. Let's do this, Sandrion. Thanks to you, I feel like I finally found the answer I've been searching for, as well as discovering what's most important to me while performing. Do I really have to spell it out? Poor Sumire, man. Even when she's thoroughly happy about something, she can't even express how happy she is in the rare instances that she does feel that way because of her condition. Within the manner in which Sumire speaks lies another clue as to how her depression affects her life. Apart from affecting her cognitive abilities and her physical endurance, her depression may also explain her loose and disheveled appearance when compared to Kasumi's. Of course, one of the many symptoms of depression that I'm sure most people are familiar with is the tendency for the depressed person to have sudden and or unaccountable difficulty in carrying out what are usually considered automatic or mundane self-care tasks. During routine things like bathing or taking showers, dressing or grooming oneself are suddenly impossible for the likes of Samira to do, due to lack of motivation and energy. Of course, we can see as much with Samira. While living as Kasumi and with Marky's mental block still being applied to her, Sumire was easily able to get out of bed in the morning, put her contact lenses in, and tie her hair up in a cute ponytail. It's a small amount of work, but the results are astounding for her. If we remember back to when we first ran into Yoshizawa, her appearance, and more specifically her ponytail, got even some of her peers jealous. Look, isn't that her? You mean that one with the red ribbon? Uh, I guess so. She's so thin. It's not fair. I've got my hair in a ponytail too. In contrast, we see Samira not partaking in any of the self-care routines before she starts her day. She doesn't do anything with her hair, and it would seem that she can't even muster up the energy to take the time to put her context in either. The result is striking for all the wrong reasons for Samira. Given that, there is also additional evidence to suggest that Samira experiences great difficulty in accomplishing tasks that require nominal physical effort. To be clear, I'm not referring to her struggles with gymnastics, but when Joker goes to hang out with her in a room on February 2nd. At the risk of getting ahead of ourselves here, Samira alludes to the fact that her room was somewhat messy before Joker came over, saying that a messy room means a messy heart. It's a nice platitude and all, but the interesting thing here to note is that when Joker notices that the place seems to be tidy and clean, Samira is strangely elated by the fact that he's noticed. Everything about this sequence indicates that her room and Samira's own appearance being somewhat unkempt and messy is a normal thing for her, often requiring some kind of outside motivation 
motivation to motivate Samiri into action. Now, we'll talk about Samiri's outfit a little bit more later, but given everything we talked about thus far, about Samiri experiencing the physical, cognitive, and emotional fallout of psychomotor retardation as a result of her depression, there is one remaining angle that we failed to explore. Given Samiri's ideation towards the non-existence and being generally too tired to do much of anything, already making her condition especially debilitating, we finally need to talk about her relationship with Kasumi and how every single time that Samiri found herself in a situation where a comparison to her sister would and could be made, it would make Samiri experience feelings of perpetual worthlessness. These feelings of inferiority and her overall depressed mood would then give way to toxic thought cycles and then eventually force Samiri to somewhat disconnect with reality or have an incorrect or misunderstood interpretation of reality or certain events because because of her depression. To be more specific, there are a few theories out there that state that depression itself can result from one's own cognitive distortions. In a pure psychological sense, cognitive distortions are one's own mental filters or biases about oneself, which many argue, when they become toxic enough, can create negative perpetual thought cycles that lead to severe depression. For example, if you, like Samiri, think that you're a total waste of space and have no value as a human being, you may have inadvertently contributed to fueling and elongating your own depression. These distortions lead to irrational thought patterns and in practice for Samiri, may lead to her catastrophizing and personalizing her own failures. We've already seen her do these things before, but this part of her confident arc squarely focuses on how her depression forces her to engage with other negative cognitive behaviors like mind reading, assuming that Samiri knows exactly what the other person is thinking. Samiri also engages in labeling in the sense that she constantly puts herself down and elevates Kasumi for no real reason. However, the aspect of these kinds of distortions and the thing that I want to focus on here is that of mental filtering and how Samiri often discounts the positives. Both negative mental filters create biases in one's own mind and for someone like Samiri, she would interpret all of her own shortcomings with inherent negativity as she she would discount, dismiss, or ignore objectively positive events. For Samiri, the latter part here is the most debilitating parts of these kinds of cognitive distortions. She truly believes that she has no control over her own circumstances, or more accurately, she cannot overcome them. Quite literally, she has taught herself how to be helpless. We see all these behaviors constantly from Samiri. These cognitive distortions are so awful and affect Samira to such a large degree that it's gotten her in this perpetual rut where she cannot recognize her own victories. Luckily, her coach is here to point out something that Samira failed to consider before her mind became filled with such toxicity. While attempting to show off her new outlook to Hiroguchi-sensei, she's not impressed. Samira has failed to heed her advice to find herself, as what she just did was a sloppy replication of her sister's own gymnastics routine. Even after all this time, Samira is still living in Kasumi's shadow. Samira has failed to replicate her own sister's boldness, with her coach making it clear that that's not something that Samira could steal or appropriate for her Herself. This energy that Kasumi always displayed is what made her a great gymnast, but Samiri can't quite match it. Before Samiri becomes more crestfallen, Hidaguchi sensei lets us in on an angle that even Samiri failed to consider before. Kasumi, at the end of all things, considered her own sister a rival. Her coach never wanted to draw attention to it, but Kasumi seemed to have a bit of a competitive streak to her. She hated to lose. More shockingly, this competitive spirit was directed squarely at an errant one-sided sibling rivalry with Samiri. Kasumi, the perfect ideal little sister, was actually jealous of her own little sister's unique and delicate graceful style. It's ironic. While one sibling wanted this other to succeed where she faltered, the other never wanted to lose to her baby sister. You are the one who always gets first place. I can't catch up to you, Kasumi. You know why? Because it's my right as the elder sister. Sumire, reflecting on this, realizes just how wrong she's been about Kasumi. Her own sister never hated her or disliked her. She merely went out of her way to try and help Sumire because, at the heart of all things, Kasumi wanted a rivalry with her sister where they could both push each other towards success. Quite literally, Kasumi's supposed ire towards Sumire was all in her sister's head. All of that negative talk that Sumire ingrained into her own mind was all just a result of her own cognitive distortions as Sumire herself forced herself into thinking toxic negative thoughts. Sumire's depression is so damaging to her that it affected the very way that she engaged with reality and with her sister. As she finished her workout, she still couldn't comprehend that Kasumi actually admired something about her, to the point of jealousy even, and that Samira herself possessed a quality that Kasumi could never have dreamed of having. After years of telling herself that she's worthless and has no inherent value, little did Samira know that she actually had a unique trait all along. Samira even recalls in passing that her coaches used to praise her gracefulness when she was little, but that alone doesn't vindicate or free her from her own thoughts of worthlessness. This is how bad her depression is, where she couldn't recognize that she was by no means bad at gymnastics either. She just couldn't keep up with a little prodigy, and due to that inherent sense of worthlessness, Samiri never took time to develop her own style enough to truly succeed in her own right. It's good that Joker is able to motivate her so that Samiri now kind of understands what her coach and Kasumi wanted to push her to do. It's not that Kasumi wanted to show off to Samiri as much as she wanted to use her boldness to goad Samiri into pushing herself harder to compete in order to form that sibling rivalry that Kasumi definitely wanted with Samiri. Upon thinking back to how she showed off in the batting cages to Joker, Samiri realizes that in wanting to show off to him, she was able to make contact with a ball. Thinking about applying that level of determination to her own gymnastics routines and mixing it with 
their own delicate style, Samira realizes that she'll not only be able to come up with something totally unique, but it'll almost be like dancing a duet with her sister. Having finally seen past her own carnage distortions and seemingly escaped her own toxic mindset, at least somewhat, Samira now has a more tangible goal this time around. As we head back to the blonde, Samira gives us a call and apologizes for how hard her coach work Joker. When asked where Joker gets his energy from, we simply say that we enjoy the challenge and let the struggle fuel us. This then inspires Samira to further find her own energy to draw from during her own performances, and the best thing about this is that we no longer need to push her to make these decisions. Per Samira's own words, she's the only one that can find out what does and doesn't drive her. Now more than ever before, Samira's going to put in all that effort she has in a harness that energy via making her own decisions, with a lighter notion being showcased in the next rank of her confident arc. So let's jump right into it. All right. In rank 8 of Sumeria's confident arc, we find her in Kichijoji once again, but she doesn't plan on hanging out there for too long. Instead, Sumeria runs off to the underground mall and tells us to catch up. It's good that she's finally the one telling us where to go this time of her own volition, but as we meet up with Sumire, we find that she's not totally committed to the bit just yet. We find her in one of the shops dressed to the nines in leopard pattern clothing of all things at the shopkeeper's behest. She must be seen more and yeah, I guess we can say that Ricardo is being satisfied here. All that to say, she looks absolutely atrocious and after a while, she realizes how foolish she looks and takes it all off. She berates herself for even trying something new while referencing the time she needed Joker's help to pick out those glasses for her dad. With more self-deprecation, Sumeria says that she's not even sure she's worth showing off, which actually tracks back to her depressive episodes as well. As we've already established, Sumeria relied heavily on Joker and Kasumi for all of her major decisions. What we originally deemed to be a slump or a lack of confidence that was then repaired by Joker's encouragement now provides extra insight into how often and extensively Kasumi made Sumeria's decisions for her. We talked about the physical symptoms of Sumeria's depression affecting her performance as an athlete, but in relation to all the behaviors that involve Sumeria's unaccountable difficulty in performing certain tasks, there's evidence to suggest that Sumeria does suffer from this, but it's muted partly due to Kasumi's own efforts. Samira tells us that she was always bad at fashion, dressing herself, and, well, making decisions in general. Thinking Kasumi to be basically infallible from her own point of view, Samira would simply defer to her sister's judgment about basically everything. This included everything from Samira's wardrobe to Samira's own bedroom, as her own condition would have discouraged her from really coming into her own. Sure, for a while as sisters, it might have been natural for them to emulate each other, but that should have stopped as they grew up. When the accident happened, they are about to enter high school, and yet Samira mentions on February 2nd, they still have the same matching bedrooms, albeit with different color palettes. Part of me wants to say that Kasumi, albeit incidentally, alleviated the anguish her sister felt by making some of what Samiri would deem to be hard decisions on her behalf. Similar things like picking out outfits for Samiri would have been a great relief to her as she wouldn't know better or would not have possessed the energy or confidence in herself to create her own style. On the other hand, if I were to be a bit more dramatic, robbing people of their individuality and ability to think for themselves is literally what Yaldabaoth desires for humanity as its malevolent overlord. Good news though, it's clear that Samiri always wanted to differentiate herself from her sister, but be it out of love for her sister or fear of disappointing her, Samiri went along with it until she realized that she was merely mimicking the better sister. She had no agency in her life, and therefore, no ways to validate her own decisions as Kasumi made all of them for her. Now that Kasumi is gone, we see that Samiri puts on the minimal amount of effort to be presentable because she cannot muster up the courage or energy to do anything different. While Kasumi did her hair and put her contacts in, Samiri chooses not to, or rather, the correct assumption to make here is that she couldn't summon the energy or willpower to complete these self-care acts that require comparatively little effort for a neurotypical person. However, here in Shibuya's underground mall is where it all changes, with more encouragement from Joker. Samiri wants Joker to see something that loudly obviously grabs her attention. He wants to see Samiri and only Samiri. As we encourage Samiri to try and stay positive, she looks around the shop and remains stumped by the amount of choices and combinations of outfits that she could possibly throw together. She says something about wanting her beloved senpai to see her in a certain light, which causes her to get all flustered. <laughs> Um, she, I wonder why. All foreshadowing and jokes aside, she realizes that if she wants attention and people to see her as she truly is, that attention needs to be multifaceted and reciprocal in nature. Dispensing with the leopard pants, this realization hits Samiri like a ton of bricks as she puts together an outfit that truly suits herself. Sorry to have kept you waiting. Samira manages to put together quite the cute ensemble outfit. Black high-heeled shoes and gray stockings all go nicely with a violet-covered dress that not only matches her namesake, but her personality to a T. Samira thanks us for letting us show a part of herself to Joker and decides to buy the whole thing. Before we leave, she's happy that she bought it, but she's more happy that she's finally made a decision on her own. For once, she didn't catastrophize a potential failure. She followed her gut instincts and made a blind choice, being pleased with herself after the fact. She's making progress, and the fact that she now has at least one new way to show herself off to the world is indicative of that progress. She recalls how Kasumi, who know her sister all too well, would often do these things for her, but in her absence, Samiri now knows how liberating and validating making her own decisions is. It's a new feeling for her, and for somebody with such a negative opinion about herself, the very idea of feeling confidence has to be so cathartic and alien to her. Best of all, Samiri says that her own choice of outfit was something that she personally liked, and even if Joker didn't like it, it wouldn't change how she would have personally felt about it. 
out of everything in Simon and Samira thus far, from vowing to stop running from herself and her awakening to her own persona once more, this is the biggest W that she's managed to pull away from this entire ordeal. Samira thinks about her relationship with Kasumi. She finally understands that creating her own personal style and her own unique gymnastics routine would be what her competitive sister wanted. She wanted her sister to tap once more on her graceful side and fully embrace it. Fully content with her decisions, Samira and Joker part ways for the day, but she still gets this ring on side of the blonde. She says that she's happy that we were with her, that she had someone to show herself off to, which has some interesting implications for Samira that will be elaborated upon in the next part of her confident arc. All right. Rank 9 has us once again finding Samiri and Kichijochi. However, something seems to be on her mind. It is not unlike Samiri to stumble over her words, but this time there's a fierce determination present within the air. She wants to go somewhere to have a quiet discussion with Joker, just the two of them. We agree to take her back home, which inexplicably gets her all flustered about it being too early for that sort of thing. Samira catches herself, and as she does, she realizes that she's jumped the gun somewhat. It would seem that Samira's got a few things in her mind, but for now, she's content to let Joker pour her a nice cup of coffee. As Samira takes a sip, she tells us that she's finally perfected her routine and plans to show it off not just to her coach, but to Joker as well. We're invited to see just how far Samira has come since the start of this whole ordeal, and by all means, we're in for a show. Before that happens though, Samiri takes more time to tell us about how she's treating Kasumi's death now. Given the new perspective her coach gave her, she now realizes that there was a disparity between how they wanted the author to succeed. Kasumi, with her own competitive streak, lived for the struggle and desperately wanted to elevate Samiri's own athletic abilities to create that sibling rivalry that she desperately craved. For Samiri, it's this notion that caused her to think that Kasumi wasn't just going around dunking her sister and everyone else for her own sake. It was Kasumi trying to inspire Samiri all along. Samiri has finally figured out that this was the one thing that they had in common. The twins wanted someone specific to recognize their efforts and all the work they put in into gymnastics. Little did Samiri know that all along, Kasumi held a very specific image of her sister within her own heart. This image drove Kasumi to be the bold, award-winning gymnast she was, and until now, Samiri hadn't considered that she was the direct inspiration for that boldness. Despite realizing this, Samiri does more self-deprecation. She still thinks herself to be a worthless idiot for not noticing this sooner, but within that miserable self-deprecation, Samiri is still able to hope that she was a big enough inspiration for her own sister to succeed. And by all means, Samiri absolutely was. Though the melancholy returns briefly, it spoke him with something truly fantastic. Samira finally knows that apologizing to Kasumi won't do her sister or herself any good now. Running from those events or desiring to rid herself from that pain would be doing Kasumi and Sumire a great disservice. Now though, she's ready to stand on her own two feet. She's ready to live for herself and for Kasumi. Not by desiring to become someone else entirely, but by desiring to grow stronger because of that pain. Samira resolves to achieve both her and Kasumi's dreams of becoming star gymnasts. Even if Samira ends up in tears from failing at a meet or collapsing from all the pressure, she will never again become melancholic. Now understanding Kasumi's boldness and the social grace her own sister recognized within Samira, she's going to keep moving forward and stop running away from her own true feelings. With that, we reach rank 9 of Samira's confident arc, where she learns the protect ability. But what comes after that is infinitely more interesting. After stammering and trying to regain her composure, now that Samira's committed to no longer running away from her own true feelings, it's time for her to muster up the courage to tell Jork about the real reason she wanted to go to a place for some quiet conversation. She remembered what she said to us back in Kichijochi and to herself as she was picking out the dress in Shibuya's underground mall earlier. Samira was wondering to herself about how she wanted Joker to see her in a particular light, but it wasn't just about showing off to us. She wanted Joker, her beloved senpai, to only have eyes for her. As Samira stammers over her words again, she finally gets it all out. I... I love you. This is a love confession from Samira to Joker. Who would have guessed that it would turn out this way? Samira has had a massive crush on Joker this whole time. Wow, I totally never saw that coming whatsoever. Oh, so you're her senpai. My daughter talks about you all the time. D Dad, not all the time. <laughs> is that not so? All jokes aside here, after Samira finds out that Senpai has indeed noticed her, she immediately starts catastrophizing about the implications of that very concept. This time, however, it's not a bad thing as Samira's face turns beet red as she starts blubbing about how she has a boyfriend now, but that's not what I want to discuss here. Within the entirety of Persona 5 Royal, Samira is literally the only one who seems to be crushing on Joker throughout its entire runtime, and she is also the only confident in the entire game to confess to Joker rather than the other way around. What an incredible change of events. Samira started as an incredibly gloomy and depressed girl who was convinced that she would never be able to exert her own agency over her own life to such an extent that she wanted to be literally someone else. Now though, here she is. Samira is full of life, energy, and courage now. So much so that she's managed to find the courage to confess to the dude that she's fallen head over heels for. It's a massive victory for Samira, but despite being calm enough to do so, that doesn't mean that Samira's knack for being easily flustered is completely gone either. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. 
As Durga leans in towards Samira, her face turns beet red and embarrassing, and oh my god, it's so cute. Durga refuses to budge, which gives Samira the space to relax a bit and gather herself. Her crush is inches from her face, and yet Samira has no desire to go anywhere. She's not going to run anymore, and in fact, she wants to get even closer to Joker to tell him that she loves him. As she leans in slightly more, it also seems that despite being severely depressed behind her gloomy, melancholy outlook and homely appearance, Samira has some fucking game. Um, I think if we get any closer, we'll bump our glasses together, but we can always take them off. <laughs> That, if I dare say, was fucking smooth. The girl straight up flirts with Joker without missing a beat. Give this girl the W's you can imagine. This is some incredible growth from Samire. She went from someone who believed that she was totally worthless as unable to exert her own agency over her own choices to bagging her beloved senpai. Bravo, Samire. But of course, her crushing on and her infatuation with Joker begs another line of questioning. What happens if Joker doesn't return her affections and desires to stay just as friends? Sorry, honest, still best girl. Thank you so much. Joker has done so much for Samira over the course of the game, and you would think that she wouldn't take Joker's refusal very well. Turns out she does. And all the more better, she doesn't braid herself or self-deprecate in any manner whatsoever. She recognizes that her crush on Joker will forever remain one-sided, but as is the case for her sister, she'll hold on to both her feelings for Joker within her own heart to propel herself forwards. She loves and admires Joker as a friend, and for someone that values the kinds of reciprocal relationships within Japanese society, sometimes to her own detriment, this is the best kind of compliment we can receive from Samire. While we will continue with the romance subplot for Sumi, we can easily talk about another W here for a soot cover princess. We know not what Joker and Samira do together in an empty coffee shop in a frigid January afternoon, but Joker being a gentleman thief that he is, does drop off Samira at the train station to go home. Samira, no longer interested in missing a beat either, calls Joker after she gets home too. She stammers over the phone to her new boyfriend, but this is by no means a bad thing. She's embarrassed for appearing clingy, but so far, Joker's been the only person who's been able to help her sort through her feelings. Samira says that for the first time in a while, she actually feels somewhat elated. She quite literally feels a roller coaster of emotion. This is fantastic news for Samira and for her condition. She's managed to rebuild her self image, and for once, she doesn't feel the empty yet crushing weight of her own depression. Samira even makes a comment about these strange new feelings and is actually genuinely confused as to how to process or even cope with them, which is kind of funny in an ironic way, with Samira then asking Joker how he handles his own emotions in such circumstances. Samira wants to talk more to Joker, but she decides to save her for next time. After all, she has someone else to show off to now. All right. The last ring of Samira's convent arc finds us in Kichijochi for the last time here, but something's different. Of course, we're due to see Samira perform a routine, but before we do, we see that she's undergone a slight change in wardrobe. She's wearing a bright red overcoat that she would originally wear as Kasumi as she tries to appropriate her identity and her boldness. Samira's also lost her scarf and mittens as well, perhaps indicating to us that she's managed to finally find her own confidence. We'll see that and much more as we have to watch her performance for her coach. Sorry to keep you waiting. It looks like... My coach is yet to arrive. I'm usually so nervous when Coach Hiraguchi watches my performance, partially because she's worked with me for so long. That's why I don't want to let her down. But today, today I'm excited about this. <laughs> it's probably thanks to you feeling so nervous that I'm able to keep my composure. Ah. Thank you for making time to observe me today. I really wanted to get an unbiased evaluation from you. You got a good look on your face today, Sumire. Yes, ma'am. I'm confident in the routine I'm about to perform. Well, at first glance, I'd say you look like you've got it all figured out. But I'm here to gauge your performance, not just let you brag about it. Now, begin. Ma'am. Even her starting form's changed. Could this be your doing? You two are cute together. All right, let's start. Thank you for watching. Hmm. <sighs> You've grown so much, Sumire. I'm sure this is no surprise to you, but the path to international success will be harsh and relentless. Are you ready? Absolutely. I will be number one in the world of gymnastics. I will make our dream a reality. Glad to hear you're so sure. 
With your natural grace and dedication to reach the gauntlet, no matter how far it is from your grasp, your dream is no longer impossible. And you're the one who decided that, not me. Huh? You didn't even realize it, did you? Today's the first time you've told me you will win on an international level. Until today, you'd only tell me, I hope I win. Oh! Perhaps you even have someone special. The person who makes you want to dance just for them? Well, that's... um... I... uh... My, it seems you haven't quite made a total transformation. It's good to hear you have someone who really understands you in your corner. Your performance today truly was impressive. I'm looking forward to your next lesson already. Coach... Me too! Coach Hiraguchi liked my routine. <sighs> Me too. It's like I finally found my footing. At least, that's how I feel. Thanks to you, I feel like I finally found the answer I've been searching for, as well as discovering what's most important to me while performing. Do I really have to spell it out? I've learned all sorts of things from my time with you. Now, I can show everyone how I really feel, and the two of us can take the crown of the gymnastics world. Thou hast turned a vow into a blood oath. Thy bond shall become the wings of rebellion and break the yoke of thy heart. Thou hast awakened to the ultimate secret of faith, granting the infinite power. All right. All right. The new me! I finally found it! Alright. And with that, Samira's persona has transformed from Sandron into Venidus. Not many will be able to use Samira's new persona in combat for very long, as the second awakening happens two weeks before the ending of the game. This is a total shame, as Venidus, and who she actually is within Norse mythology, is a very clever addition to Persona 5 Royal, especially as you ascribe her to Samira. There are several facets and dimensions of Venidus that are relevant to Samira's character arc within Persona 5 Royal, but to begin, Venidus isn't actually the persona's true name, or the name of the mythological figure in particular. Already we see a few allusions to Samira's character arc in Persona 5 through this one aspect of Vanidis alone, but to get back on topic here, Vanidis is a self-explanatory pseudonym that means the Dis of the Vanir. The Dis in her name is referencing a ghost, spirit, or deity that's associated with fate. The Vanir refers to a clan of magic using gods. This part of the Nordic pantheon includes figures such as Njord, Freya, and Freyr. Generally speaking, these particular gods and goddesses are much more focused on diplomacy, growth, and fertility, which, of course, is in direct opposite to the world like Aesir gods of Norse mythology, the proud warrior Norse race that includes figures like Odin, Thor, Tyr, and Loki. We can already draw a few allusions back to Samiri being treated as a second class to her sister, but that's not really the point here. The story of Vanidis and the oppositional dichotomy it calls into question is actually referencing the backstory of the Aesir god Freya, and how the Aesir Vanir war began, and how the conclusion of the war ended a stalemate that ultimately resulted in the unification of the Aesir and the Vanir into a single pantheon. Draw your conclusions to Samira's own arc here as she vows to dance for two, but regardless, the story of Venidus, or really Freya, itself is told from a third person perspective and is recounted by a Volva, a seeress or witch. This is especially odd as it both has implications upon Freya, being a Volva herself as she is likely the one recounting the war itself. This also has implications about how Persona 5 doesn't directly reference the fact that Vanidis is Freya herself. It's very clever, but anyway, I digress. As the story goes, Freya came to Asgard one day, under a false name, to offer her services to the Aesir, as she was a practicer in Sidir, old Norse magic that dealt with discerning the course of fate itself and working within a structure to bring about change. This was done by magically weaving new events into being. Sidir, after all, in Old Norse, means cord, string, or snare. The Aesir used her power to perform miracles, which Freya would dutifully entertain. However, as time 
time passed, they did not realize that Seethier, as a form of magic, did not only deal with creating miracles, clairvoyance, and was used for bringing about good luck, but also dealt with curses as well. That is to say, using Freya's magic was kind of like using the monkey's paw. Sure, grant your wishes, but sometimes people and other gods would have to suffer to make those events occur. As you can imagine, the Aesir became enamored with Freya's power, and while the requests were initially benevolent, they soon blackened as the Aesir aimed to inflict misfortune upon each other. Instead of directing their ire back at each other, the Aesir decided to put Freya at the top of her shit list, giving her the name Gulvig. This new smarmy nickname is a compound word composed of the word Gul, meaning gold, and Vig, meaning alcoholic drink, intoxication, or even power or strength. In practice, the Aesir were blaming Freya for all their misfortunes and being a corrupting influence upon society, when in fact, they themselves ordered her to sow these events in the fairy fabric of reality for their own selfish gain. For Freya's punishment, she was tied to logs instead of blaze, as for standard practice for witchers of old within the era. Odin tries to kill her three times using this method, but it would seem that she cannot be killed. And after the third time, the gods give up, with Freya eventually revealing that she's in fact a god herself. As the original two standards within the work go, the war I remember, the first in the world, when the gods with spears had smitten Gjolvig, and in the hall of horror had burned her, three times burned and three times born, often again, yet she ever lives. This war goes on for a while, but eventually both sides tire of fighting and pay tribute to each other to ensure the preservation of society. As was the case for the times these stories were told, peace between both factions was ensured by sending hostages to live with the other tribe. Freya, Freyr, and Njord of the Vanir went to the Aesir, and Hynir and Mimir went to the Vanir. This leads to the unification of the Norse pantheon as two distinct halves becoming whole once more. Coming back to this tale's relevance to Samiri, we have a distinct theme here. There's a general notion here of two separate and distinct parts of the Norse pantheon holding fundamentally different values and worldviews finally coming together, settling matters after much pain and strife. After obeying the wishes of her betters, Vanidus was then paradoxically accepted in a higher society and then was treated very well due to her magical skill set. All of her past slides against the Aesir, ranging from her false names to her supposed crimes and manipulating fate itself, were forgiven as well, all for the sake of preventing another war. It could be said that Samiri also endured the same thing. Vanidus and and by extension, Sumire endured an unjust trial by fire and was persecuted under a false name. It was only after she endured death three times over did she reveal who she truly was to the gods. However, those who are familiar with Norse mythology and for its position within the Norse pantheon are very likely familiar with another strikingly similar figure to Freya going by the name of Frigg. There's been much scholarly debate about even if or how Freya and Frigg could or even could not be the same goddess given how many characteristics they have in common. For one, Frigg is Odin's wife and queen of Asgard, and so is Freya. But the key difference here is that Freya is actually a title rather than a name. It literally just means Lady in Old Norse, which would point to her being a noble woman with station and power in society, namely being Odin's wife. Upon the ending of the war, Freya and Thor Frigg would become an honorary Aesir and become Odin's wife developing a reputation for her becoming quite the party girl in Seeker of Thrills. She and Frigg kept her reputation as being absurdly competent in Old Norse magic as Asgard's seer, but, but as Odin's wife, she became synonymous with love, fertility, beauty, and fine material possessions. Despite all of these similarities, there is one part of Norse lore that scholars have argued distinctly makes Frigg and Freya separate and distinct goddesses. In the narrative of the Grimmisjall, Freya makes a daring bet with Odin about fostering and raising two shipwreck princes in order to help them reclaim the rightful place upon the throne. Odin tries to pull his usual trickery, but Freya, being in charge of the winds of fate itself, manages to deceive the Allfather in accidentally making her foster son the new king. It was quite the bold plan, and perhaps we can attribute this facet of her audacity and boldness to Kasumi, and conversely, Frigg to Sumire. Or can we? The difference between the true names and stations of these particular goddesses are a matter of perspective, and that's kind of the point as well. Freya and or Frigg are simultaneously married and not married to Odin or someone named Uthor, who not only wanders the nine realms like Odin does, but also shares a near identical spelling of his Norse name. If we were really determined the truth about Freya and or Frigg here, I would go on a tirade about Freya likely being a bastardization of another proto-Germanic goddess that found its way into the North Pantheon somehow, but that's not the point, nor the illusion that Persona 5 is trying to make with Vanadis as Samaria's new fancy Persona. It's the fact that both were versions of this goddess exist, but the knowledge and significance of the other has been lost to time, with the other version becoming more prominent in living memory, despite sharing much in common with the other twinish doppelganger version of herself. While I would regale you with a tale about how Frigg boldly tricked Odin into accidentally fostering and restoring a prince to his rightful place in the throne, or talk about how Freya would miss her husband so terribly that she become so depressed as to cry tears of gold, both goddesses ultimately bear the same names and characteristics, yet are slightly different. This notion perfectly mirrors Sumiri's new goals within Persona 5, as she literally transforms from a soot-covered princess into someone who can literally manipulate fate itself. She's not Freya, nor is she Frigg. She is a clever allusion not to a particular name, but to a title that indirectly tells us who and what she is. In her heart of hearts, Sumiri is someone who is able to manipulate fate itself, and despite being unjustly persecuted for it, she has the burden of inadvertently carrying out the name, visage, and legacy of her dead self. No longer will Sumiri think that she's the version of herself that weeps under pressure. 
Instead, she would carry herself as one of the most celebrated gods in Norse mythology, gradually building a positive self-image of herself as she continually recognizes her own merits, continuing her rebellion against herself all the while, against the one who believes that she's nothing without wholly becoming Kasumi. Of course, Samira isn't about to go out this alone. She has the fan of these, and more specifically, Joker, with this new fan belief being expressed within Vanadis' own design. We've talked at length about how Samira basically ripped off Joker's own thief outfit for herself and added her own personal feminine touches to it to make it truly hers. However, in this particular way getting to Vanadis, Samira has simply done the same thing. This truly does feed into the whole notion of Samira dealing ramifications of being everyone's doppelganger here. From Kasumi to Joker, it seems we have a bit of a running theme here. Of course, this is supposed to be an evolution of Samira's heart, as some aspects of Sanjuron still remain. But by all means, her heart literally just straight up ripped off Arsene's stylish look and made it into some kind of dark demonic princess that seemed to be some kind of ballerina with her pointed feet. Besides stealing the red and black color palettes, she's also appropriated Arsene's black and demon wings and made them into a stylish and elegant dress. While well, Vanus does take inspiration from Jorkin or Sen, I have to mention Sumeria's persona might also be inspired by Ketch's persona being Loki. There's no other members of the party that inherently possess or reckon to personas that find their home within the Norse pantheon. It's just a coincidence that I can't really call a coincidence. Though that might be a bit of fun to speculate about, the real truth of the matter that upon forming this blood oath with Sumeri is an affirmation of her own confidence and willingness to reach for the stars. Instead of trying to manipulate reality or fate itself in the most roundabout of ways, Samira finally realizes that she is the mistress of her own destiny. Finally, after a little lifetime of feeling worthless, Samira can finally bask in the victory she created with her own two hands. As for what that feels like, well, Samira is more than willing to share what this triumph feels like. I know it's a bit late, but I can feel my body start to shake. I think it's finally hitting me. I managed to really give it my best. Really? Then, I'm glad I pushed myself hard enough for you to see my best. Senpai, I have a favor to ask. Um, will you hold me tight, like before? <sighs> oh no, I thought this would stop my shaking, but now it feels like my heart's about to burst. I can just hang on to this warm place in my mind. I feel like I can push myself further than I've ever gone before. I love you, Senpai. Now and forever. Sumeria calls us when we're about to head back home. She thanks us for all her help, and due to it, she states that she's finally moved past the trauma of Kasumi's death. She's fully prepared to be an international champion, and by mixing her own graceful routines without a Kasumi's, she will, in a way, be performing right there with her sister. Sumeria even goes as far as to say that she wants to tie her hair back up like Kasumi once did, as proof of her resolve to do right by her sister. As a matter of fact, we can literally see this notion expressed after we max out her confinement. Of course, all of these have their own short-time attacks with each of the party members that unlock after certain events or dates are reached. However, because Kasumi never shares any screen time or any special relationship with any other thief except for Joker, he is the only person she has a short-time attack with. I feel like this move would allow me to honor Kasumi properly. Let's do this! Let's dance! Come on! Would you? Finish this! With grace! This is... Come on <laughs> Don't forget the <laughs> pose! We see as Sumiri descends upon her target, within her mind's eye, she imagines her and Kasumi performing a gymnastics routine together. The two embrace each other, indicating that both Sumiri and Kasumi never truly hated each other to begin with, and that, all the while, it was just a mix between Sumiri's own delusional thoughts and selfishness, blinding Sumiri's disdain for Kasumi. With Sumiri Yoshizawa vowing to do her best to contend with reality, all in all, it's a fantastic way to end her confident arc. However, there remains the issue of contending with the benevolent overlord of the new false reality and ascertaining how and why he created it. As you're stowing countless hearts to then be placed within such a fantasy setting, the fan of these that come to understand that in order to steal one's heart, first you have to understand it. Thus, it's only appropriate that, alongside infiltrating Maraki's palace, we must also look back at why Maraki decides to fight for the reality he created for the sake of everyone else. Or, so he claims. And I believe you called forth your power like this. Persona. Love me.
In order to understand Marky, his powers, and where his historic desires came from, we need to back it up a little bit to where we first met him. We need to remember all the way back to when he was first hired at Shujin on May 13th to counsel our students. <laughs> Our first impression of Marky isn't someone who has a gumption to become reality's new benevolent overlord. Rather, Marky comes off as someone who means well, but is still a bit of an idiot. You can even call me Doc if that would help you feel more comfortable. Any assistance you need, I'll be... Oh. I guess I'm not really any good for helping with money problems. <laughs> This not only reflects poorly on Marky, but upon the school staff as well. Shujin hiring Marky as his new therapist was not to soothe the souls of his students after Kamashita ran roughshod over the entire volleyball team, but purely for optics and PR reasons. Of course, it says a lot that while trying to hide Kamashita's crimes from the public, instead of fixing the culture of the school, they've hired a therapist to do all the caring for them. It's deeply troubling, and for Kamashita's primary victims being the Shujin trio of Ryuji, On, and Joker, are, of course, extremely skeptical of the efficacy of his therapy. You ever expect this place to actually give a shit about our mental health? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ryuji. While On might give Marky the benefit of the doubt, Ryuji thinks that he's an incompetent buffoon. Just another half assed attempt by the school's rotten adults to just do the bare minimum to keep up the appearance of, well, giving a shit. Yeah, wasn't that guy just basically clowning it up on stage? Do you really think he'll do us any good? Our skepticism is even more warranted when Marky directly tells us that the school's already profiled us and ordered Marky to give us some counseling due to our close relationship with Kamoshida. To be frank, I've been explicitly ordered to provide counseling to the students directly involved with Mr. Kamoshida. Of course, Ryuji would however refuse Marky's counseling, but underneath it all, Marky doesn't really seem to enjoy this new aspect of his job. While we might be tempted to get all cynical about Marky's presence at Shujin, he is the first and really only adult here whose priorities aren't completely messed up. Offers of free snacks aside, he levels with a fan and thinks about why he's even there. He might be a bit of an idiot sometimes, but that just adds to his authenticity and charm. He's a real person in a sea of people that would backstab, gossip, and undermine each other. For the first time since coming to Tokyo, we might have met an actually genuine person. I know that asking you to be open with a complete stranger like myself is a lot. Making this mandatory wouldn't do you any good either. He's keenly aware that even though he's here to essentially quell the discontent within the school's delinquent trio, Marky sees an opportunity to assist and guide us to make the best of a bad situation. And thus, we form the Counselor Arcana with Marky, with this notion being reflected within the Terracotta Arcana he's assigned to as well. Much like Sumeria's Arcana, Marky's Arcana, the Counselor Arcana, also has a bit of a double meaning here, which mostly lies with how Atlas localizes French and Spanish names to Japanese and then to English. Firstly, if we take the original French translation of this Arcana from the Italia Tarot card deck, where it's called Le Questionnant, meaning the questioner in English, it would directly correspond to the Higher Fence Arcana in the Tarot de Marcello deck. Within tarot readings, the Hierophant is a symbol of education, authority, conservatism, obedience to rules, and symbolizes a relationship with the divine. The definition of a Hierophant is a person who interprets sacred mysteries or esoteric principles, and the term was originally used to name ancient Greek priests who did so. Characters of the Hierophant's Arcana are often older than the protagonists, such as Ryotaro Dojima and Coffee Dad himself from Persona 5, with both these characters being typically quite wise and logical. Usually male and gruff, they care for the protagonist like a parrot does to a child. The most defining feature about them is the tragedy of their past that often makes them jaded to the present. The loss of a loved one leaves them struggling or unwilling to move on with their lives, even at the expense of the ones they left behind. Their bond with the protagonist helps them make peace with the past and enjoy what they have in the present. This will become very important with Maraki as we continue on, but for now, there's something else we need to discuss here involving the Council Arcana. A similar theme of losing loved ones is also found within how Atlas localizes Arcana from Spanish to English as the El Consulte Arcana. This Arcana is from an alternative Spanish tarot card deck called the El Gran Terra Esoterico or the Great Esoterico deck. This deck features many of the standard Arcana cards being either renamed or changed somewhat, but for the sake of this video and for brevity, the Council Arcana is comparable to the Magician Arcana within the standard deck. In tarot readings, those associated with the Magician Arcana are commonly associated with action, initiative, self-confidence, immaturity, manipulation, and power. Within previous Persona games, the Magician often suffers a running theme of immense tragedy upon the romantic interest that often involves feelings of unrequited or immature romantic affections. We see as much within Persona 3's Junpei Iori's relationship with Chidori, Persona 4's Yosuke Hanamura's relationship with Sake Konishi, and even in Persona 5 with Morgana's continuous simping for On. Regardless, all these characters were normally bright and ambitious, but lack a purpose or a dream, which they normally find through the help of their friendship with their respective protagonists. 
Extrapolating all of that, while Samiri's association with the Faith Arcana was rather dichotomous in the most literal of meanings, Marquis and the Council Arcana has a bit more going on with it here, given how it was localized by Atlas to have very different yet intersecting meanings. Both the Hierophant and Magician Arcana, as represented by the Counselor, share a common thread of personal loss and emotional struggles. There's an emphasis on the University of Human Experiences here, such as the searching for meaning, dealing with personal loss, and finding solace through connections with others. However, when we add the true meaning of what the Counselor Arcana means when upright, it denotes diplomacy, possibilities of choice, creativity, skills to persuade, vitality, and power over mental illness. Of course, we already know some of these things about Marky to be already be true. He is literally a counselor, a therapist, which you would think gives an inherent power over mental illness itself. He's wise to the acts of mindfulness, lessons that he aims to impart to Joker and the rest of the Phantom Thieves. He also chooses to be diplomatic and not force the Phantom to see him for mental counseling. Instead, he chooses to persuade them based on the benefits of speaking with him in private. After all, part of our deal with Marky here is to literally teach Joker how to practice mindfulness. Over the course of his confidant arc, he will teach Joker various coping mechanisms where Marky encourages Joker to be intensely aware of what he's sensing and feeling within that particular moment, without interpretation or judgment. Of course, this utter power and domination over mental illness itself but extend to his ideal yet false reality that would eventually concoct and to the manner in which he met up with Samira's cognition to spare her from the trauma of her sister's death. Speaking of that, the reverse nature of this card can represent indecisiveness, insecurity, lack of virginality, or exploitation of the innocent and or the sick. Marky did create an entire reality and force everyone into it without anyone's consent, and while we aren't clear about how he managed to do it, Marky did exploit Samira's mental vulnerabilities and betray the fan of these confidence in him by ignoring all the growth he literally told about him in their own therapy sessions with him. Nevertheless, the card seems to showcase both these aspects of its nature, and this is what makes the design of the card and Marky's place within Persona 5 role as this anti-villain so interesting. Before beginning each confidant arc, the card for each confidant is reversed, but when Joker forms that confidant, the card becomes operate once more. In this case, Joker helps Marky sort through his own issues with this reality and create a fundamental solution to everyone's woes. Though Marky's methods in order to create his false reality might be questionable, especially what he deems to be a quote unquote healthy life for Samiri as he deludes her into becoming literally someone else entirely, his ends are mostly benevolent. This is reflected in the card as well. The design of the card depicts a gray bearded and thus seemingly wise son being praised or even worshipped by three shadowy figures. I say this due to the color of their eyes. These aren't true people. Their repressed desires of someone or something paying tribute to Marky himself for his guidance, be it the actual shadows of the general public, or this being representative of the latent issues the Fantasy still struggle with after their Persona Awakenings, the illusion of him being a guiding and helpful force is still present here regardless of the context. Of course, this notion stands in direct contrast with the people who seem to be falling from the sky, from heaven itself, of whom seem to be entirely unhappy with doing so. This, of course, alludes to the ethical quandaries Marky faces within creating his own reality and contending with the way that the old, painful one would, at random, inflict undue suffering upon others and essentially kill people. His solution, as we've seen, was to resurrect people for the sake of the happiness of others. From Shiho to Haru's father to any number of deceased parental figures of the fan of these, he either has to literally resurrect these people or the member of these people in order to guide those who consult him. Given Given all that, it's rather ironic that Joker seems to be the guiding influence upon Marky himself. As we sit down for his rank 2 confidant arc, bumming into Samire outside the nurse's office, Marky levels with Joker once more that he got the general gist of our criminal record. However, unlike Sojiro, Marky doesn't berate Joker for having one. Instead, he seems more fascinated and even impressed that Joker's managed to not let all these events discourage or even break him. To use Marky's words as he psychoanalyzes us based on what the staff has told him, Marky then pulls on Freud to ascertain how we imagine make peace with our particular situation, or in his words, our particular realities. As Freud defines it, our internal reality corresponds to a collection of processes, representations, and effects that are essentially, but not only, unconscious, which Freud terms the, the psycho reality. It is the representation of the world the subject has formed within their own minds, and for an analyst like Marky, as an existence and efficacy that are comparable to physical reality, even though Marky, as the analyst, cannot see what Joker perceives about this reality. For his interpretations of the opposite, the material reality, the subsummation of all the objects of our physical environment, such as the subject's body and the subject's inscribed place within society, doesn't exactly exist in the dichotomous space here. Rather paradoxically, what the analyst aims to accomplish isn't about prioritizing the subject to, to conform to the external world, but instead, the counselor seeks to understand how a material reality becomes internalized and how such a reality that is initially completely subjective is gradually constituted as external. In other words, your ego is a principle of your own internal reality, which is then subverted and changed by other internal forces, such as the id or your superego, as well as your unconscious desires, which we all perceive as external parts of reality, when in fact, it is actually ourselves that become our greatest oppressors. 
to quote Freud, what is bad, what is alien to the ego, and what is external are, to begin with, identical. External reality always remains unknowable. Within each individual, there only exists a mental reality and not an external one. As a matter of fact, we've even seen as much with Samiri thus far. Freud makes several points about how those who suffer from neuroses involving paranoia and severe delusions are merely reflection of one's own internal mental reality moving around. Hallucinations or the cognitive distortions Samiri's depression imparts to her, including the crushing weight of worthlessness she feels from time to time, are not expressions of any kind of external reality upon her, but merely the movements of her own internal reality. Her condition doesn't allow her to think or perceive reality in the same way that other people do, which causes Sumira to act, behave, and interpret reality in an inherently persecutory way, falsely, erratically, and rashly so. However, with Joker, he has quite literally made it so the current existential nature of the dog eat dog world he came into at the start of the year doesn't affect the way that he interacts with the world. He still maintains his rebellious outlook and aims to impart that which drives him to enact justice upon the world. Again, Marky is impressed with Joker's comparative maturity here, as he says that not even most adults can reliably manage what he's done. It's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, and as we've seen with some of our party members, sometimes existing or even surviving with a particular external reality requires sacrificing some of their own ideals. Everyone has an internal image of themselves that they're constantly striving for, but for Joker, he has no comparative issues coming close to that ideal person. However, there is one thing that Marky adds in this dialogue that Freud brings up within his own works. Well, Freud acknowledges that in order to bring inner peace to one's own psyche, requires one to often be aware of your own repressed desires, Marky points out that reconciling and bridging the gap between your own internal and external perceptions of reality often causes people a lot of internal turmoil and anguish and pain. As Marky says, not everybody can play the role of the hero, but for Joker, he has had no issues being labeled a delinquent and a violent criminal. This reality is painful and tough, but standing fast to your own beliefs is an aspect of Joker's worldview that Marky finds extremely admirable, even more so when Joker is able to do this without any sarcastic self-deprecation. <laughs> Joker takes himself and his place within the world very seriously, and with ease at that. It is here where Morky asks us, being the strong and willful person that we are, to help him with his own research. He intends to invent a new therapeutic approach that seeks to understand the metaphorical nature of the hearts of others. We exchange contact information with Morky, a strange thing for a teacher asking ask of a student, but we tentatively agree to this on grounds of Morky actually being another decent human being in this messed up world, one that seems to have the goal of helping anyone that he can. It's a noble goal, and if Joker can help him achieve it, then it might be worth humoring him for now as we move on to rank 3. All right. As we sit down with Marky once more in the nurse's office, he begins to tell us about his tenure after a week of seeing students for counseling. Marky seems to be enjoying homeless students here after Kamashita ran roughshod over most of the volleyball team, but as it turns out, the trauma he inflicted upon the school wasn't what everyone was talking about here. Turns out, most of them were just concerned with normal teenager stuff, like test anxiety, college entrance exams, and relationship problems. Some did open up about some major issues, but that wasn't the norm, and this is something that Marky finds somewhat strange and troubling. The big bad is gone, and life has resumed to something more normal, but still, a majority of the students haven't taken the time to tell Marky about what's hindering their own internal reality from becoming their own true external one. He hasn't gotten a sense of every student's emotional state, but as the conversation continues, Marky effectively asks Joker what if he could bridge each student's internal and external realities for them, with pinpoint accuracy at that. Marky explains that the pain or anguish an individual feels has some rather ambiguous meanings rather than objective ones. To be a bit more clear here, physical pain is more objectively ascertained and easily treatable. You burn your hand on something, your body reflexively orders you to pull your hand away in hundreds of milliseconds. You break your arm, the symptoms and the type of breakage of said broken limb will be blatantly obvious to any onlooker, medically trained or not. Conversely, psychological pain such as trauma or stress is defined by abstract concepts that are often brought upon by external forces interfering with their own internal reality. This makes it difficult to diagnose and treat these conditions due to the often invisible nature of such pain and perhaps within that notion lies the reason why so few Shujin's populace can to explore their deepest traumas with Maruki. This is what Maruki aims to contend with as well with his own research. If we, or even he, can make psychological trauma something more tangible and visible, something to be sent within a cast like an orthopedic surgery might do to a broken limb, it would be beneficial for all. Rather than therapy being a collective group effort between both parties as something that is inherently intended to guide someone towards mental well-being, a therapist like Maruki could reach in and reassemble the broken hearts of all his patients for them. Maruki then turns to Joker and asks us when we truly do feel pain within our hearts. We can answer Marcus' question in several ways, but in this particular situation, we can actually answer how we please. We don't gain any social link points here regardless of how we answer, but given what Joker's experienced here before coming to Tokyo, it would probably be the most appropriate to say that he feels the most pain when someone betrays him. Strangely enough, Marky seems to be somewhat familiar with this kind of pain and how intense affection can turn into intense yet untreatable anguish. Moreover, he states that having the stain of betrayal and pain upon someone's heart doesn't weigh easily upon it either. Ever taking a second upon the very notion, Marky entertains the idea of literally healing a broken heart, thinking about how, in some circumstances, that pain validates that love that came before it. Joker says that he'd prefer experiencing that kind of pain instead of avoiding it entirely, an incredibly Joker-esque answer and one that is cognizant of the human experience. However, Joker's answer to Marky's question is the most interesting part of this exchange. Rather, it's Marky's 
reaction to Joker's outlook, that is. Dr. Snacks himself says that Joker's answer is very fitting coming from him and only him. While Moriki agrees that pain is part of the human condition, he says that from his own personal experience, that if such pain is to be avoided or blunted in some way, it would be sensible or even ethical to do so. Within his mind, psychological anguish should not exist at all. The implications of this are indeed worrying given what Moriki's end goals are here, but it's really here where he begins to realize his purpose within the world once again. He wants to save people from the wounds of their hearts, their internal pain that Marquis thinks is holding them back from living healthy lives. The question is, if such a method can exist, how would Marquis go about saving people? We send Marquis gratitude and head home for the day. All right. Rank 4 has us meet Marky outside for a change of pace, and it's here where we learn more about the man himself being somewhat of a kind-hearted fool. Marky tells us that on his way to work, he attempted to rescue a cat from a tree. He tells us that he could have kept walking, but because he felt bad for it, and only for that reason, he tried to help the poor fluffer. He succeeded, but as a consequence, the cat scratched him up real bad. Joker cracks a joke about this being his reward, with Marky matching Joker's sense of humor. However, the interesting thing to note here is that Marky's own ends justify the means to rescue the cat. If we apply this to his whole end game plan here, then we can easily take this as a bit of foreshadowing to how he looks at the world. So that's why you meddled with her cognition? For her own wishes. That's right. Limited as it was, I already had the power at the time to actualize her wish. Put yourselves in her shoes for a moment. Sumire-san's older sister died from protecting her. Imagine surviving such a dismal tragedy. Who would be able to cope with that survivor's guilt, let alone heal from the emotional scarring that she suffered? If Sumire-san can live a healthy, positive life by becoming Kasumi-san, then I believe that reality is what would make her happy. He doesn't stop to consider that the cat felt perfectly fine up in the tree, or if it was capable of getting down upon its own. It could have been perfectly happy up there, and perhaps it didn't need or want Marky's help, hence the scratching. We'll put a pin to this and come back to this later, as Marky explains how he intended to heal his patients, like putting antibiotics on a scratch wound. For now, all we need to know is that Marky rather correctly identifies that one's own emotional anguish is something that oneself can holistically understand, but often needs outside help to alleviate it. The trick is to, well, trick his patients into believing that he is the only person who can alleviate these issues for them. All this and more will be elaborated upon the next rank of his confident arc at rank 5. All right. At rank 5, Marky decides to surprise us with the hard work we put in as a confidence to him with the spread of desserts. He's thankful for Joker managed to sit through all this talk of pain and tragedy, which is interesting for Marky to say that as well. Marky has directly stated that he desires to avoid talking about pain at all, so in order to ease Joker's apparent suffering, he offers him some sweets. It's super telling on Marky's character and outlook, but as if to hammer this whole thing home, Marky loses her particular psychological experience involving two cookie jars. More specifically, Marky is referencing a study published in the journal Personality and Social Psychology back in 1975, called Effective Supply and Demand on Writing of Object Value. In practice, the study was about how scarcity affects the way people value certain commodities and how such rarity may invoke greater feelings of pleasure upon the consumption of those rare commodities. In short, Marky is explaining the psychology behind commodity and scarcity theory here, but of course, he's coming at this from a psychoanalytical standpoint and not from a marketing one. Nevertheless, both are worth explaining. Marky explains the experiment and its results rather well within the game. Two jars contain the exact same type of cookie, but one only had one cookie within the jar, and the other jar was filled with 10 cookies. Each participant was asked to try each cookie from each container, and then to compare the taste of each cookie. As strange as it might sound, the cookie that came from the jar that only housed a singular cookie tasted better, despite all the cookies being exactly the same. This is a key part of a long-standing psychological marketing theory that has held up, and is part of the reason why many companies, and subsequently scalpers, engage in the practice of selling or buying exclusive merchandise. They're weaponizing everyone's inherent fear of missing out to then make more money. However, in Marky's interest in the study as a trained psychiatrist with the goal of doling everyone's pain is not to sell everyone overly salted miso soup. It's the fact that the study imparts us to the notion that objective reality doesn't really exist. And if it didn't, those cookies would taste exactly the same. The fact that a commodity becoming scarce, such as a cookie even, can evoke such a drastic change within one's own perception of reality has opened the door for Marky to begin to think that such a conclusion can be used for therapeutic purposes. Reality itself can be morphed and changed by one's own preconceptions of it all, and the weird part of it is that most people won't even notice. Marky then elaborates and ties everything back to this one cookie study back to his own musings about trauma and pain. If the human heart can falter and be unreliable at times, but it also be so easily manipulated into thinking that something is better than it actually is, then a simple preconception about the world might be enough to override that pain and bring about a more joyous and pleasurable experience. 
Marky poses Joker a hypothetical. If he never told Joker about the cookie study and had Joker partaken his own variant with similar stakes, that one cookie being of seemingly better quality would be the subjective and factual truth of Joker's reality. People may disagree with Joker, but outside of his own feelings and preconceptions about the world, nobody can objectively state how Joker feels on the inside. Obviously, Joker disagrees with this very notion. This experiment is kind of unethical as it does involve deceiving the participants into feeling a certain way to achieve a specific result. If Marky didn't debrief Joker after the fact of this experiment, then that lie could be seen as hard enough to cause cognitive distance with the rest of the external world. Incidentally, Marky even acknowledges this as a lie as well, but he hand waves it away to the potential benefits such lies might create. He even goes as far as to state that even trying the study out under the people without debriefing them would help people more than his counseling ever could, which is a huge ethical problem for a counselor like Marky. We start to see where Samira comes into play here as well. Instead of helping others as a counselor should, he's instead entertaining and encouraging them to indulge in the world's delusions, while Marky himself is effectively using lies of omission to heal them. We know in retrospect how he tends to enact this upon the entire world, but as we hand home for the blonde, we know something about him as well. What appears to be incredible work ethic and a dedication to his field is actually just a mask that conceals an extreme hyperfixation upon his research, and then, of course, how to help others the only way he knows how. All right. Rank 6 of Marcus Confident Arc finds us when the man himself at LeBlanc chatting over a cup of coffee. After commenting upon her immaculate barista skills, Marky tells us that he's hit another wall with his research. It's not that he's got writer's block or anything, but he's realized that his methods to help other people are only limited by those he can physically interact with. And a normal person, like say the leader of the fan of these, recognizes that helping just one person becoming fully self-actualized tends to have a ripple effect upon the rest of society. Good deeds beget more deeds, but for Marky, helping a handful of people isn't enough for him. In fact, his entire line of thinking has gone from that of a therapist to something different entirely. Instead of using the word help or counsel to describe his intentions, he's now using words like save to describe his intent to help others. He says that his work as a counselor has only made the particular limitations of his research more glaring. And if we did have a poultice for every single psychological ailment in existence and an intensive understanding of the human heart, it would not be enough to literally raise the effects of trauma for one's own psyche. Mark is getting more and more scary as time passes here, and this is further highlighted by how he wishes to bypass the act of counseling itself for a more accurate and expedient solution. Of course, as Jorga Mind flashes back to her first time in Mementos, we have the means to do exactly what Mark he desires, but we don't dare to tell Marky about such things. However, we do let it slip that all human hearts have some kind of common denominator within Jungian psychological theory. The answers to Marcus' questions lie within the collective unconscious of the human psyche. Despite reality being different for everyone, everyone's reality seems to share a few similarities to where Marcus might be able to apply these same notions to therapy and counseling sessions at a baseline level. What he has to say next time truly gives us perspective on his intentions. All right. Marky gives us a call, and as we head down to the nurse's office, he bluntly asks us what our opinions on the fan of these of hearts are. We can already see where this is going based on what we managed to include from last time, but to be more specific, Marky has got to thinking that the message of the fan of these and his own goals are rooted in the same principles. They both help people, sure, but the manner in which the fan of these tackle their targets with the calling cards alludes to their desires being a tangible physical thing that the thieves manage to steal. Marky supposes that if we were to create a similar proxy, he'd then be able to apply his research and moss in a similar way to the fan of these managed to change people's hearts. Marky brings up the cookie experiment once more and how the participants' cognition changed based on which cookie they chose from a particular jar. Marky proposes, correctly mind you, if someone manages to steal that part of their cognition, then their own reality turns to normal. Marky calls this the theft of desire and posits that if there was indeed a world where someone could do just that, he would jump at the chance. Of course, what Marky poses is indeed possible. He is literally defining what Mementos is, but what he's also found to consider is that he's robbing people their own subjective experiences. If the cookie did taste good for somebody and was perfect within their own mind, within their own subjective reality, then it would be wrong to rob them of that pleasurable and subjective experience. Of course, the practice of intent changes when we're purely talking about negative emotions, but still, you can't go around changing people's mind on a whim. You might say that the fan of these do the same, but we're held back by others requesting help on an individual level and a pseudo democracy where we all have to unanimously vote to tackle a target. Morky is acting on his own and within his own hyperfixations, driving him not to save a handful of people, but to desire a more permanent and holistic solution, makes his own line thinking extremely dangerous to the very idea of independent thought. Though Morky's drive to help as many people as he can is admirable, we've yet to divulge why he drives himself so hard. There's no way he's doing this for research and to just scratch another notch in the proverbial belt of academia. There's more to the story and we'll find out within the next two ranks of Marky's Colin Arc. But first, we need to back it up all the way to July 16th.
Today is July 16th, and we're stuck in the middle of exams. Well, most of us are. As we leave school for the day, we find out that the jealousy in spite towards Yoshizawa's position as a school's honor student has only gotten worse. Probably could have managed if I had an extra week, too. An extra week, huh? The only people who get that kind of cushy treatment are the honor students. Oh, you mean like Yoshizawa-san? I heard the school moved her exam period. It must be nice getting perks like that. This is nothing out of the ordinary for Shujin, but it has gotten to the point where Maruki, the school's recently hired therapist, has gotten concerned with the school's atmosphere and the way it's now targeting Yoshizawa. Though Maruki is supposed to stay impartial within these matters, but given Shujin's history and school culture, I would say it's actually good he's becoming concerned for the mental health and safety of one of its students. Though, I would be remiss to omit the fact that he was Yoshizawa's personal therapist before coming to Shujin. We learn as much on May 15th, as Yoshizawa is seen at the entrance of the counseling office with Maruki, talking about how everything's been going since she's enrolled to Shujin, with Kasumi recommending to protect Kun to take Maruki's counseling. He does have a more personal stake in her well-being than others, but he can't help himself but be concerned for her well-being. He confides in us that he's not entirely sure how to deal with this negativity towards Yoshizawa, given the fact that Maruki was also hired to counsel Shujin's student body after Kamoshida's confession. With the likes of the staff not being very helpful, empathetic, understanding, or as authentic as Maruki seems to be, Joker decides to indulge him by heading down to the nurse's office with him as we end up counseling the counselor. Well, I suppose that's actually accurate. I've had something on my mind lately, and I want to hear your take on it. Okay, here goes. Oh, this is all hypothetical, mind you, but imagine there's somebody for whom you have high expectations. They're... Now, this... This person receives an awful lot of special treatment from people so they can perform to the best of their abilities. So... What do you think those people will do if the expectations leveled on this person aren't met? Maruki is obviously talking about Kasumi here, but we can also extend this notion to almost all the other confidants within the game as well. Aunt's peers proliferate the rumors that would then lead Shiho to her near death as they assume that Shiho and Aunt were trading sexual favors with Kamoshida to keep Shiho in the starting lineup for the volleyball team. Ryuji earning the name of Track Trader, then spread to the staff of the school who are unwilling to at least hear Ryuji's story out and ask why a dude three times Ryuji's size, an adult nonetheless, thought it appropriate to completely bot at Ryuji and permanently injure his leg. With Makoto, she was ultimately very lonely due to her trading away her social life to make it to college, and her reward for doing so was all the adults and even her peers constantly weaponizing all those sacrifices she made for her own future as they then gaslit her into oblivion, completely destroying her own self-esteem in the process. You're saying their expectations will turn into anger and scorn, right? Yep, that's definitely true. When you work as a counselor, you always think, I have to help this person so their heart doesn't break. But that's easier said than done. Just a bit of influence from their peers can easily mess with their heads. Every time I'm confronted with such a situation, I can't help but grasp the limitations of therapy as a profession. As Moriki continues, he's identifying a fundamental and systemic issue with Shujin's culture. Individual therapy sessions aren't enough to fix society and prevent tragedies from happening. Therapy alone cannot prevent the strong from preying upon the weak. It also cannot prevent people from being jealous assholes. To answer Moriki's quandary, Joker responds by saying that reality is inherently unfair. And he's right. The world is unfair, but life is what you make it, and perhaps if one persists long enough, you'll be able to find meaning. I see. You're approaching reality from a rational point of view. No, it could actually be that you understand reality's unfairness, yet you're willing to stand up to it. That may be the reason you're at this academy now. In other words, Maruki is trying to say that Joker is the exception, not the rule. Maruki wants a more holistic and fundamental solution that benefits everybody here. He's somewhat inspired by the fan of these efforts to try and instill change within society by targeting the people who are causing harm within it. The fan of these cause a bit of a ripple effect within the world, but Marky wants to know what would happen if the fan of these changed everyone's hearts and not just that of criminals. Maybe have them shift our feelings so we won't lose to this unfair reality. It would ultimately be for the positive. Indeed, what if we could change our hearts to make reality a bit less unfair? What if we could affect the hearts of others to make malice itself taboo? Then there would be no more victims for people to direct their ire towards. Joker wouldn't be in Tokyo on probation, Shiho would be fine, and Kasumi would be able to go about her business as an honor student without jealous morons talking behind her back. However, all of our other targets were evil and required us to intervene on another's behalf. We wouldn't go after them otherwise. Changing one's heart already has some ethical implications for the fan of these, but changing the heart of an innocent bystander who's already content with the life can't be called a true change of heart. 
good point. You're right. This is all academic and hypothetical after all. Nevertheless, helping Marky deal with the implications of his ability to help people as a therapist has left him feeling satisfied. Our conversation has been very enlightening. Thank you. And enjoy your vacation. After we get back from our summer vacation, as another means to thank us, Mark invites us out to go eat the Wilton Buffet. As another means to thank us, Mark invites us out to go eat the Wilton Buffet. As it so happens, we run into Shibasawa, an old college colleague of Marky's. Mark explains that Shibasawa was the one who pushed Marky to pursue counseling after his own plans to complete his own research fell through. Through the prospect of Marky picking it back up again, Shibasawa takes it upon himself to publish a paper on Marky's behalf. When Marky is thrilled by that prospect, and we celebrate by packing on a few pounds, Shibasawa makes an offhand comment saying that he's going to get an earful from his fiance for eating too much. It's here that we see a divide between Marky and the rest of his old friends in academia. All his old pals are moving along their lives and getting married to the high school sweethearts, yet Marky is still here languishing alone about saving people. Marky had someone at this point named Broomy, but things sort of fell apart there. We get the sense that it's a touchy subject, so we choose to drop it and head home for the day. All right. Rank 9 has us back at school, but this time, the atmosphere seems a bit more somber and serious this time around. Marky levels with us about something deeply personal to him. He tells us about his high school sweetheart, Rumi, of whom he was due to be married to. He tells us that they were both engaged and that she was the best thing that ever happened to him. Just before they were about to be wed and to live happily ever after, tragedy struck Rumi and her family. They were victims of a home invasion, and after witnessing this burglar murder her parents, this burglar in particular then attacked Rumi herself. It is unclear if Marky tried to stop the perpetrator or stood there frozen in fear, doing nothing to stop at all, but Marky expresses that he felt utterly powerless in that situation to help the ones that he loved. While Rumi's parents were dead, Brumi survived, physically at least. The mental trauma from witnessing such a traumatic event caused her to have a mental breakdown, and she would never recover. Marky lost himself in that pain for a while too, as his mind began to race. The utter random chaos of the whole thing. None of these innocent people did anything wrong. None of them deserved this, but it happened anyway for no discernible reason at all. Marky would still visit Rumi from time to time, but one day he made a vow to his former fiance. He would continue his research and apply it to such an extent that nobody would be able to suffer as she did once. That pain Marky felt birthed his new ambitions here. He swears that he'll make his dream come true, not just for Rumi sake, but strange enough, for Joker's sake as well. Why he would be concerned with fulfilling Joker's dream on his behalf or equate it with the importance of honoring the tragedy of his fiance experience is unclear, but the man's on a bit of a mission here and we've seen the end result. Marky even hopes that Joker will find his heart to forgive him before quickly backtracking. Within that, Marky seems to be somewhat aware of what he has to do in order to see his wishes realized and that it appears we're too late to dissuade him. Of course, as we leave the nurse's office, Joker has no idea what he's just enabled and we'll find out until later. For now, Marky has one last meeting with Joker before where they become enemies fighting for what they believe in. All this and more in Rank 10 of his Confidant arc. All right. Rank 10 of Marky's Confidant arc happens on a scheduled day. On November 18th, the same day that was due to see Osai's heart, Marky calls us in the hallways at school. Ah. Good morning. I know this is last minute, but if it's possible, could you come and see me during lunch today? Glad to hear it. I wanted to discuss something with you, since it'll be our last chance to do so here. Oh, that's right. In the paper. Yes, my time here at Shujin is coming to an end today. It's quite the sad affair. I agree. There will be no more snacks at Shujin. No! I do have a farewell speech to give the school at morning assembly, but I'd also like to speak with you individually. Considering the occasion, lunch is on me. I'll have something special waiting for you. So you look forward to that. Well... Dr. Mark, he's really leaving. It's already been half a year, huh? That sure went by fast. Dr. Maruki to share a few last words with the student body. Well, Doctor, if you will. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. As the Vice Principal has mentioned, today marks the end of my tenure at Shujin Academy. Over the past several months, I have come to learn about all sorts of conflicts that you students have faced this year. Troubles with romance, with studies. In fact, some of you have financial issues that are awfully similar to my own. <laughs> but before I leave here, I want to offer you a final piece of counseling. If 
if your situation ever becomes too painful to endure, remember, it's okay for you to escape your problem. I don't want a single one of you to think that an unfair reality you've been forced into is the only one that you have to live. It's okay. Um, uh, what I'm trying to say is, even if your life is full of worries, it's best for you not to obsess over them. Your existence in this world is an amazing miracle. You deserve to spend your days in happiness. I'll keep on rooting for all of you to have the best lives possible, even after I'm long gone. <laughs> I guess things don't always pan out like you expect. Well, that's it. Thank you for having me here this year. Good luck to you all. I can think of no better way for Marky to exit Shujin, but of course, there's something going on here with Marky as we go to meet with him. Well, now that we've finished our food, let's get down to business. First off, I have quite big news. My paper's done. I've mentioned this before, but still, this is truly thanks to you. Had you not shared your experience and insights with me, this paper never would have been completed. Please, allow me to express my gratitude to you once more as a most helpful student of Shujin. And as a phantom thief as well. As is the case with most of our confidence, Marky has figured out that we're a phantom thief, but this time the stakes are different. We've had a direct influence upon Marky's research paper and the field of cognitive science itself. Its title is Interpreting Cognitive Science and the Alteration of Reality via External Influence. As Marky says, it's solely based around how the phantom thieves manage to change the hearts of others. You know, the phantom thieves act of changing hearts is rather reminiscent of cognitive science in practice. They infiltrate a reality that exists solely for their target, a reality wholly separated from the one that the public recognizes. By accessing that world, they gain the means of permanently altering their target's cognition. That is what I hypothesize as being the change of heart you induce in your targets. Well, I did pour my heart and soul into this research for a number of years. To be entirely honest, it was all the way back in April. When I first came to speak with the principal here about providing counseling to you students, I actually witnessed the moment when you came out of an individual's reality like I'd mentioned. You suddenly appeared in the back alley near the school. I believe Sakamoto-kun and Takamaki-san were with you? Takamaki-san appeared to be extremely exhausted. Mm. Thanks. Thanks. It wasn't long after that scene that Mr. Kamoshida had his change of heart. Before he even got to start everything with Marky, he caught us extra training from Kamoshida's palace directly after Onawick into our persona. He's been playing dumb with us this entire time and picking our brain for how best he can implement his research on a wider scale. Once more, Joker has no idea what he's just enabled, and even as Marky challenges us to steal his heart, Joker declines. If you don't believe what I'm saying, you're free to change my heart as you like. Of course he does. Morky has been one of our biggest sponsors all along. He's counseled all of our teammates and was some amount of help in helping them sort through the remaining issues. For years, I've been attempting to directly interact with an individual's cognition so I can help address their pain and despair. He listened to On explain to him how she saw red when she learned about what Kamashita did to Shiho. Listened to Ryuji feeling down about disappointing his mother. Makoto with her rocket relationship with Sai, as well as her feeling like she has too many responsibilities forced upon her. Along with Haru ultimately feeling lonely as her father's business will often interfere with her truly connecting with the rest of her family. This was the case with Yusuke as well, as he talked with Maruki about his relationship with Madarame, giving her favorite weirdo artist block via trauma. He also discussed with Futaba her interest in cognitive science and her mother's death. All are objectively good things for the thieves to speak about. He's gotten to know us extremely well, but we haven't gotten the chance to know him past of what he's admitted to Joker. Marky has indeed rejected all of our own external realities and substituted his own. There was some deception involved here, and while Joker might be cool with it to help his friend, we're going to need to ascertain his true intentions here with such stakes. We need to ask, is Marky a genuine, benevolent, and kind person who truly does want the best for the world? Well, there's only one way to find out. 
by infiltrating his palace and personally examining his own cognition and internal reality. Upon our first infiltration of the palace, we find Marky's view of the average person to be relatively undistorted like Sai's palace is. Additionally, the cognitive people here seem to express a genuine want to Marky's desire to heal people. The first floor is a clean white reception area where all his patients make idle chat about their mental health, as White does fly across the cavernous room leaving feathers fall to the ground like snow. On the outside though, we can see that this palace is a genuine beacon set against a black night sky. This facility is the only safe haven that people flock to for treatment, to numb themselves to the world that they don't necessarily want to live with it anymore. Then, of course, we come upon the area where Sumire figured out who she truly was. Sumire was likely patient zero for Maraki's methods, so it makes sense that this part of his cognition will reflect this. It's no coincidence that this room is called Test Track. It's nothing of the ordinary, but considering how spacious the room itself is, it would seem that Maraki's desire to see Sumire succeed was likely as large as the room itself. Continuing on, we come upon a giant surveillance room where we learn that Marky has been keeping tabs on the collective unconscious itself. Somehow, Marky has managed to set up a network of surveillance cameras in Mementos. In the interest of healing people, Marky likely uses this as a means to cure the shadows that pop up here every once in a while. With this method, no palaces will ever be generated, nobody will ever be able to suffer under their yoke, and most importantly, nobody's desires will ever become distorted ever again. It's not a perfect method because we still get requests for once in a while to help some people, but by and large, this seems to be very effective. More effective than pursuing individual targets like the Phantom Thieves holistically do. If you recall, this was the main issue of going after Shido's inner circle after we changed Shido's heart. As was the case then, we only managed to decapitate the main head of the Hydra, and then began to panic when others began to grow in its place. We only succeeded because, well, we ran out of options. We had to throw ourselves in the Desperate Mementos to hope to find at least something that would help our cause. Having to go after Yaldabaoth in the end of all things, and persuade the public to believe in our brain of justice instead of that of Yaldabaoth's. Comparatively speaking, Marky has seemed to holistically annihilate the beast itself. Maraki's method keeps the cognitive world from having an adverse effect in everyone's external realities. Everyone's minds are finally thinking on the same playing field here, and no one has any dreams left unfulfilled or crushed. Once we go down to the bottommost level of Mementos, to the path of Iweth, the entrance to the death of Mementos, we see how Marky has managed to achieve this. The first thing we notice is that all the trains that will be carrying the shadows of the masses to the prison cells have completely stopped running. There are no more passengers disembarking from the trains. The panopticon prison that once held Yadabal's head in place has been replaced with some kind of machinery. Morgana says it best. Somehow, Marky has managed to fill the power vacuum left by the malevolent previous ruler and co-opt the cognition of the masses to create something more benevolent in its place. As we examine this cabling more, we notice that all the prison cells around the room are empty as well. Not a single inmate remains here within the prison of regression, as Marky has seemingly improved upon what we were unable to do without cheating at Yaldabaoth's game. He has not only promised emancipation for all the inmates here, but he has granted it to the masses. The masses aren't empowering mementos as much as Marky is doing it on their behalf. Even as we go through the new layers of mementos he created to mimic the old platforms, there are no trains left here to run because there are no shadows left to imprison and sap of their own free will. Though we can't really argue with the results of enacting changes of heart within the public's cognition, at least in the way that Marky does it, we need to ascertain the true nature of his moral compass, and fortunately, Marky's cognition is here to provide. As the white color of the treatment room begins to trade itself for shades of black and gray, so does Marky's thoughts begin to blacken in tandem. As we traverse the monitoring room, we come upon our first will scene, and if we take a minute to listen, we hear the most distorted thoughts of Marky's cognition. Emanating from the will seeds, we hear Marky's lamentation about how Joker can't agree to this reality. Marky does truly want to fix this world. He's finally going to make it so that no one suffers as his fiance once did, and so that everyone finally gets what they deserve. There will be no more suffering and random acts of violence. From here, we have to question if these truly are the most distorted thoughts for our favorite counselor. They're all well-meaning and spoke without a hint of spite. While the palace world doesn't necessarily have to be evil to have these will seeds spawn, there was always a dash of self-loathing within it. Within Marky's will seeds, there's just pure sorrow and a resolve to do better. 
And as a matter of fact, Marcus Wolf's seeds are actually called sorrow seeds. But to say that the sorrow he feels is distorted or unrealistic would be off the mark. These are all real tragedies that Marky experienced, and as we press onward, we find more reason to believe that Marky's solution might be for the best. After poking around some more, we find our answer in a special room behind a ventilation shaft. We come upon a fairly messy room that's locked from the inside. By all means, this has to be part of Marky's cognition that he doesn't necessarily want the outside world to see, judging by the state of the place. There's upturned chairs, tables, and papers scattered all over the place. But the interesting thing here to note is a CRT TV on a nearby desk. Do you think we should try whacking it? It has a VCR player attached to it, and on the back side of the TV sits a tape. Joker decides to play the video itself, which, as we will see, contains all the information we need to proceed and more about Marky's past. The video itself is about Marky's memories, but it's not shot from his POV like Samira's video is. Instead, what we find is Marky in a hospital visiting Rumi herself after the accident, but she remains totally unresponsive. As a result of the trauma of seeing her parents murdered in front of her, she's fallen into a catatonic state. Despite Marky's best efforts to get through to her, telling her about the near completion of his research, reminiscing about a particular wildflower field she and Marky used to frolic through back when they were still in high school, and finally telling Rumi that the man who murdered her family has been caught, none of these manages to wake her up. However, as part of Rumi's silence, we find the reason why Marky would later become so enamored with the fan of these changing of hearts. Marky's true motives after the murders, at least, was to use his research to not just to stop suffering itself, but to prevent all crime from ever occurring ever again. My goal is to find a way to stop crime by putting my research into action. Many of the criminals in this world are deluded to the point of seeing everything through a distorted lens. If I could change their cognitions, it would stop them from committing crimes before they even considered them. And if I were to succeed, the things that happened to you would never happen to anyone else again. Given the circumstances behind Marky's thought process here, to have some amount of control over seemingly random acts of violence and sorrow is understandable given what he's experienced. He even echoes the same sentiments that the fan of these do. All the palace rulers ranging from Kamashita to Shido view the world through such a distorted lens that affects the way that they literally engage within reality. For Kamashita, everyone was either his whipping boy or an object to feed his lust. And for Shido, his pride would entail the suffering of the entire country of Japan to ensure his vision of the world came true. Given that this was the default state of society for many, many years, with the cognitive world existing at least as far back as Maruki and Wakaba were in college, and Shido was still a rising star dining and dashing on random working girls, his wish to entirely stop all these distorted people from committing crimes is totally reasonable. Squirrely due to Shido, shit rolled downhill for everyone involved, which would explain why Marky has such an extensive surveillance network within Mementos. Because nobody bothered to stop Shido before, he was able to get away with almost all of his crimes as a protected criminal, which would then quite literally lead to the death of Akechi's mother, Akechi himself growing to become a homicidal misanthrope, the death of Wakaba Ishiki, Futaba's mother, which then through a series of more circumstances will lead to Futaba becoming Hikikomori, too traumatized to leave her own house. As for the man who killed Rumi's parents, Marky seems to understand that something happened within their own life that made the killer of Rumi's parents resort to burglary and murder. Something or somebody turned this man into a misanthropic murderer and now Marky has a chance to change this murderer's outlook to be more positive for everyone else's safety. This is Marky's mission, but upon reminding Rumi of the state of her family, something horrific happens. I want to save you. No, not just you. I want to save the whole world with my cognitive science. Well, at least I know your family would appreciate it. Tak, to... Rumi, it's me. Are you alright? Tak, to... Family... <sighs> My family... Dad... Mom... No... Please... Please don't go! <sighs> Rumi... Rumi... It's okay. Calm down. Give me my mom and dad! We want power. These migraines are... Damn it! Don't worry, someone's coming to help. I believe it was most likely a post-traumatic episode. Memories of the incident must have resurfaced due to some sort of stimuli, like certain imagery or phrasing.
Maruki unwittingly triggered a PTSD episode within his fiance. The very recollection of either Maruki or her family triggers these sorts of episodes, which also means that Maruki, as a practicing therapist, can't exactly invoke his counseling training to help his girlfriend. Recalling the very recollection of the events or even her fiance causes her intense psychological pain. As Maruki collects himself, he realizes that Rumi doesn't need therapy. She and the rest of the world need utter salvation. Luckily for Maruki, he has the means to save people, but of course, everything has a price. Must seek me. Uh, what? What was that? Nagato, please stop this. I want to forget. Forget? I wish I could do something to. Oh, but wait. By altering a subject's cognition, by changing their heart, any related trauma is eliminated. You must seek me. So, by that logic, all that pain, Rumi's trauma and everyone else's, it can be undone. Seek me. I am that who manifests thought itself. I shall echo your blasphemous fury with reality, so that we may together change the world. Now, call me forth. Yes. I'll do it. I don't care who you may be. Lend me your strength. Please, help me save Rumi's life. What was that? Rumi, are you okay? Who... Who are you? Rumi, it's me! Um, I'm really sorry, but I don't know who you are. Rumi, what do you mean? I've just gone through surgery. Ever since I was born, I've been unwell. I lost my parents when I was young. So I live with my grandparents in the countryside now. When you were... young? You can't. It's me, Rumi. Don't you remember me? Um, I really am sorry, but I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, I'm going to be discharged from here pretty soon, now that I've finished my last round of surgery. I can't wait to see my grandparents again, and show them how well I've recovered. This is... were her memories actually revised? Indeed, Marky. Her memories have changed. In exchange for Marky's latent powers, Rumi's memories have been completely altered. Instead of suffering from a catatonic PTSD episodes, Rumi now believes that she's always lived with her grandparents and was always a sickly child ever since she was born. Whatever Marky did to her, he essentially completely rewrote Rumi's entire childhood just so she would never remember the traumas of her parents' death. Of course, this also means that within her own mind, she never met her childhood sweetheart. And more importantly, Marky and her never fell in love as high school sweethearts, nor were they ever engaged. We were wrong to consider Sumira to be patient zero, and as tragic as it is, Marky's first patient was inadvertently his own fiance. As he later rejoined the thieves, Sumeria mentions that from what she can remember, this is exactly how Marky manipulated her cognition to make her think that she was her sister. The way that woman was acting at the end, that's just how it went for me too. She shares many of the same delusional symptoms as Rumi does as well. The utter refusal to acknowledge past events or people, but still having some residual memories of those events and people she cared about. Um, so I know this might sound odd, but if you'd like to meet again sometime... Thank you for the offer, but... I'm sorry. Even after Maruki deluded her, Rumi still has this strange desire to hang out with Maruki to get to know him more. Of course, as Morgie's glasses fog up in sorrow, he knows that whatever just happened effectively made his girlfriend into a completely different person. Even if he were to take advantage of her deluded cognition and restart his relationship with Rumi free of the pain she's now oblivious of, to Marky, the person in front of him is now dead. But what about your girlfriend? She's... passed away. That's why I won't be coming here anymore. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um... I hope you feel better soon, and I know the people who care about you wish the same. This is where Marcus Sorrow began, and it's where he completely threw himself into his research as well. He now has nothing left. 
In exchange for the power to rewrite anyone's cognition, it cost Maruki his life with the one that he loved. Samire recalls that before this location was become a stadium in Odaiba, judging from the keywords we used to enter the palace, it was to become a research facility. We can also presume who this facility would belong to as we're literally traversing it right now. Everything we've seen thus far was Marky's conception of what this place will look like with his own cognition, a place of goodness and of healing. As we proceed along, we come upon a research ward of this facility and another one of those messy rooms with another CRT VCR combo set. We can start the tape to find Marky and his friend Chibosawa talking over a few drinks about some recent bullshit events. Damn it! Just hearing it from you's pissing me off. You've come so far. What problem could they possibly have now? I tried negotiating in person with the professor and the investors, but they simply wouldn't listen. Due to the lack of concrete evidence, all further research and funding in the field of cognitive science will cease. They told me it's already over and done with. But why now of all times? When they first saw my paper, they were positively beaming with excitement. In the research lab in Odaiba? They're not going through with that anymore? Yep. Damn it. To hell with their concrete evidence. How are we supposed to get any evidence if we can't perform the research first? If we can change the cognition of trauma victims, their suffering can be eliminated. Who knows how many people could be saved with this research? So, do you really think the lack of evidence is the reason they shut it all down? <sighs> it makes absolutely no sense to me. After all the time and money spent, to just cut off my research because it wasn't all proven sound immediately. Even if that was the result of some kind of conspiracy, what could I do about it? It's not like I have any proof. I see. So... What are you going to do now? Sponsors have backed out, so I doubt the college is going to let you keep using their labs. I'm done with that college. They have nothing for me at this point. I'll look for work elsewhere while I keep fleshing out that research paper. Eventually, I'll prove the existence of the cognitive world. Once I've done that, no one will be able to complain. Rumi... I swear, I'm going to do it. I have the power now. It cost me my life with you. So I'm going to rescue everyone from their pain. I don't care how long it takes me. It's going to happen. With the funding for his own research cut off and the verifications of Rumi's cognition being changed, we see that Marky is much more than a man with a mission. He's instead an incredibly broken and sorrowful man. Losing his girlfriend stung, but he did, in a roundabout way, help her at the cost of his own relationship. Rumi was unsalvageable, but he still had his purpose in the world until that got inexplicably yoinked as well. Now all Marky can do is drown his sorrows as he continues to try and help people the only way he knows how. Provide the evidence his college claims he never even attempted to produce. As we exit the research ward, we come into the actual exam room of the facility. The shadows here aren't inherently hostile, and and instead occupy a more administrative role. They refuse to tackle us on sight, and as we can guess, this is the part of the palace that reflects Marky's pacifist nature and outward attitude that, indeed, everyone can be rehabilitated into accepting his reality. Of course, the shadows here define this differently. The goal of this floor is to conduct psychological tests to ensure the Marky can offer each of his patients the happiest and most ideal of realities. We are forced to partake in these tests in order to proceed to the topmost floor, as Marcus finds potential issues within each patient's heart that he deems superfluous and outright harmful to their health. Of course, everyone here is Persona user, who has long since passed the point of wavering with their own spirit's rebellion. Our hearts are set, and psychologically speaking, we are indeed very much self-actualized. Even Marcus' former patient, Sumira Yoshizawa, is in our company with the intent of undoing this false reality. Regardless, we have to press onward. How this examination functions is that we are to answer a few different questions based on a set of hypothetical circumstances that totally aren't biased whatsoever. Our first question is as follows. One day at school, we see that one of our friends is being led away by some scary people. We have two choices. Go after your friend and chance getting hurt or go get further help. With the implication of your friend getting help while you're absent still being there as well. This eerily reflects some of Jorgu's instances and experiences with helping people in the past. But as we continue, Maruki seems to promote avoidance type behavior. He wants people to be self-possessed, but simply to ditch any struggle that one may come across. Ideally, there would be no wrong answers here, but if we choose A, a shadow will attack us as a means of treating Joker and the rest of the party. In doing so, we realize that this whole test is an expression of Marky's own moral values. It directly reflects his desire to spare yourself from any amount of pain regardless of the consequences. A catcher rightfully asserts that Marky is mainly concerned with the risk factor of both oneself and another becoming mentally scarred here. 
Well, spring into action by yourself is an objectively laudable and heroic action that would be something that the fan of these would do. Marky is convinced that limiting the potential harm via strength in numbers is the most healthy outcome for all. On recalls what Marky said in his last day of school. He believes that sometimes it's okay to escape or in practice run from your problems if they become too painful this will remain a common theme throughout all the tests that we have to take and as we proceed to the next examination we now have three options to choose from this time along with a new question we have a personal dream that you really want to make come true to make the dream come to fruition we have to choose between keeping up the hard work doing whatever it takes or giving it up for a new dream of course this directly mirrors samira's own experiences with how her depression made it suddenly impossible for her to perform in her sport of choice and to carry on her sister's dream answers a and b are also remarkably similar as they both entail that if one works hard to achieve their goals they will eventually succeed however if we pick either a or b we will be attacked by shadows in addition to reflecting Marky's own personal moral values, it seems that this test is also a reflection of his personal history as well. He did give up his life with Rumi for a new dream, and even when that was stolen from him, he nevertheless had something new to work on. He also gave up his dreams for something more attainable and useful to society as well. He decided to become a counselor to help other people when his research paper was unable to be completed. As we continue on, we find some parallels between Marky and the fan of these here about how he would go about changing hearts. While their ideologies share the baseline understanding of the dispensing of justice, the fan of these are more concerned with exposing the sort of desires of criminals to then enact social reform on an individual level, while Marky, rather understandably, doesn't have any faith in the common man not to cave their own worst behaviors. These simulators are then built upon in the next exam, where we have five choices here now. We have gained the power to steal hearts. Access to a plethora of information is now at our disposal, and we can alter the emotional state of people at will without fear of getting caught. The question is, how will we best utilize this power? Would you A, steal something valuable, B, never steal anything, C, steal my own desire to heal myself, D, steal evil hearts to fix society, or E, steal the hearts of the one I love. All these directly mirror some of the experiences of our party members. Akechi would align with A as Akechi's entire reasoning of using his powers was for malevolent and anti-heroic means of exposing Shido via public humiliation. Though he has gotten better, there was a time where Ryuji became obsessed with the status, fame, and women he can garner by being a phantom thief. Consequently, Futaba requested that we steal her own heart as a means to heal herself. But before that though, we were concerned about the legality of interfering with the ability to essentially brainwash our targets, and this is the reason why Sumeri was so hesitant to join us before. We essentially have D left to choose, and as it so happens, our ideology, as presented by Ryuji's wholesome insistence of crushing the bad guys, is proven to be similar to Maruki's. D is the correct answer for this particular test, which tells us a lot about our justice and that of Maruki's. Despite all of our personal disagreements, we want the same thing. As we continue on through the palace, we find more examples of Maruki's new sorrowful resolve to save people. We come across another one of those messy rooms and another VCR CRT combo set. After inserting the tape, the party finally becomes privy to Sumire and Maruki's own personal counseling sessions. By the looks and sounds of things though, this has to take place shortly after Kasumi's death. So, you're Sumire Yoshizawa, huh? I'm Dr. Maruki. I'll be your counselor. First of all, thank you for coming to see me. Yes. Thank you for seeing me. Um, I'm sorry. I'm not sure what to discuss. I only came here today because my parents wanted me to. Sumeri is at her lowest here. Her voice is all raspy and her inflection is extremely flat. Knowing that Sumeri was already probably severely depressed and knowing that the accident exasperated her feelings of suicidal ideation, it is good that her family first saw fit to send her to a counseling for help. Barring Sumeri having inherent value in doing as her family bids her due to her believing that, now more than ever, any agency she exerts over her life will have dire consequences for those that she loves, I have to give props to both Maruki and the Yoshizawa family here. When compared to the rest of the generalized notions of Japanese culture regarding mental health and seeking mental counseling in the first place, they're arguably more progressive in understanding of mental health issues than the rest of Japanese society. As we discussed in the previous episode in the series, where we covered Ryuji Sakamoto's family history with respect to Ryuji's father being an abusive alcoholic, substance abuse and mental illness in general are heavily stigmatized in Japan. Japanese culture also imports a low competency rate of mental health conditions as well, which is to say, there is a large portion of people out there who seem to fundamentally misunderstand how and why people become afflicted with mental health issues and how one will go about seeking treatment. Taking more in depth of the same study we used in the Ryuji episode all the way back when, out of the 493 people surveyed, which was then divided into two groups of 247 men and 246 women, to then determine their outlooks towards people suffering with depression, 65.2% of men said that the condition was very severe, as did 58.5% of women. So then, by and large, Japanese people seem to recognize that depression is indeed a severe problem. Additionally, 96.8% of men surveyed and 98.4% of women said that depression almost certainly stems from a general stress, and with that, 40 to 45% seem to be aware of the notion that depression may also come from 
a chemical imbalance of dopamine within one's brain. This is all well and good, but it's very troubling when 50% were surveyed to think that depression generally comes from the way that one was raised, with 25 to 26% thinking that it was a genetic or inherited problem. Now, of course, in some cases, these conditions would invoke someone to become depressed, but when we look more into the stats of what the surveys have found, a significant portion of those that were surveyed think that a person being depressed was either the will of God, sitting at a rather laughable 6.5 to 5.7%. That seems pretty pitiful, but as if that wasn't cynical enough, an even greater amount of people surveyed at 21 to 22.8% that a person being depressed was just a cause of plain bad luck. There seems to be a lot of victim blaming here, and no one seems to have a fundamental solution to these issues. We might also be able to guess that the cultural attitude towards these issues was the reason that Samira never got proper treatment for her condition before Kasumi died. She plainly thought that she was cursed or something of the like, with Japanese society conditioning Samiri to view her crushing sadness she felt as the weakness of personal willpower as Kasumi perpetually ran circles around her in gymnastics. I should also mention that having a mental health issue, such as clinical depression, that in of itself within Japanese society, carries within a certain kind of stigma that comes from the etymology for the word of depression being that of Itsubio. When this word is translated, it means mood disorder, instead of meaning something similar to clinical depression. This word also imparts to the masses that depression can only take form as the melancholic kind of mood disorder. Within that, we begin to understand that the apathy and indifference toward depressed people, as most feel like it describes an ill-tempered melancholic person, rather than someone who suffers from a more existential issue with their health. Until around the 1990s, this was the outward attitude towards depression until Japanese pharmaceutical companies coined the term the cold of the soul, or in Japanese, kokono no kaze, to refer to depression as a means to raise awareness and overall competency of the disease. This was extremely effective, but of course, the optics of such a disease mongering then equated clinical depression to that of a pesky cold, which then of course, had its own set of problems with over and under medication of patients. Society comparing Sumeria's condition to something like a pesky cold is an incredibly ignorant sentiment to hold, but nevertheless, Japanese society is going to perpetuate the stigma nonetheless. Knowing this and more about Sumeria's ideation towards suicide, Marky likes to delude Sumeria into becoming her sister. Much like with Rumi, it comes at a great cost, but again, as was the case with Rumi as well, it's a choice between living the rest of your days as a catatonic vegetable, or being able to live your life somewhat normally. It's a choice between Sumeria allowing the guilt and shame to crush her for the rest of her life, or until she decides to off herself. Marky's methods prevent the potential chain reaction of suffering. It was enough for Sumeria's father to lose one daughter, but it wouldn't be acceptable for him to lose another, or for Sumeria to feel like she deserves to die as penance for what she did. Alright, I'm not sure how to put it, but I feel like I've been reborn all over again. As a fan of these, and more importantly, Samira reflect upon what they just saw, they guess that Marky held on to this memory because he truly wanted Samira to live a happy and healthy life. Cynical members would point to the unethical means of giving Samira that kind of happiness, but regardless, Samira has some interesting thoughts about that moment and how she feels now. I admit, I really did feel saved in that moment when I became Kasumi. But at the same time, I ran from my life as Sumire. I'm genuinely grateful for what Dr. Maruki did for me, but I'm done running. By all means, she seems to be generally grateful about what Marky did to her, which might seem odd at first, but again, if we consider Marky's methods of healing to be a stopgap measure to prevent Samira from attempting suicide, we might see where she's coming from here. Despite finding the resolve to stand on her own two feet now, Marky's therapy did in fact help Samira at least for a little while. Now that Marky seems to have gotten a handle on his powers for therapeutic purposes, we just need to figure out how he's managed to impart his healing to the rest of the world. Ascending to the final room of the palace, we come upon a room bathed in golden light. The first thing that Samiri notices is that people are downright floating away with smiles on their faces. After considering that this is what happens with the patients that pass all of Marky's tests, Akechi asserts that Marky has a bit of a Jehovah complex. He truly believes that he is a benevolent god of his own reality, and that the salvation that he offers will have everyone feeling downright rapturous. We also see gigantic statues of Rumi scattered about the place, some which seem to be offering apples to those who reside in Marky's version of heaven itself. It's telling Marky's temperament here that if we follow the myth of the forbidden fruit, and the fact that throughout this entire floor, these various statues of Rumi are offering Marky's patients entire bowls worth of apples, Marky himself sees no issue with bestowing forbidden knowledge upon those he has saved. As we attempt to solve what is easily the most annoying puzzle in Persona 5 Royal, with Marky's knowledge of cognitive science and his reverence of Rumi being noted on this very floor, we can guess what the context of the next tape will hold. Hmm. So, what brings you back here after all these years? That's a comprehensive study on the research you tried to shut down all these years ago. I know how to read. What I meant was, why are you bringing this to me now? Oh, this is just a quick visit out of spite. I wanted to show you in person that I found the concrete evidence you had discontinued my research over. 
so it appears. I'll admit you've impressed me on that point, at least. But such praise does nothing now. All this discussion is in the past. Why can't you just let it stay there and move on? Ah, uh, no can do, Professor. Cognitive science has made too great an impact on this world to be abandoned like that. W what are you saying? The psychotic breakdown incidents. The sudden changes of heart in adults that the Phantom Thieves claim to make. I'm nearly willing to call these events concrete evidence of cognitive science in action. How about you? Uh. And the one person pulling the strings in the background of this. Congressman Masayo Shishido. He seems to be confessing to all sorts of crimes now that the Phantom Thieves have changed his heart. There's really no escaping Shido and his complete disregard for the consequences of his own actions. He claimed another victim here, but instead of ordering Akechi to kill Maruki, like it did with Wakaba, Maruki was plainly discredited and his reputation tarnished in academia. Pulling some strings, he was able to steal some aspects of Maruki's research and combine it with Wakaba's to then enable the psychotic breakdowns. This was the biggest betrayal for Maruki to see his own medicine turn into a deadly poison, but as to why he's here, he's not exactly here to say I've told you so. Due to Joker helping him, he now has the means to actualize his dream for everyone in the rest of the world, but the method for distributing a cure for all suffering remains absent from Maruki's grasp. Little does Maruki know that on this Christmas Eve, the means and the answers to his problems will be delivered onto him by his own rebellious heart, and by the hearts of the Phantom Thieves. What is this? Hmm? What's your problem now? Huh? You... You don't see this? The sky just... The time has come. This voice... Uh... The time is finally at hand. I am the other you, dwelling in the realm of mankind's hearts. The other... Me? Wait, the realm of mankind's hearts? Are you telling me that this realm is... You may have no knowledge of it, but I have been at your side for much longer than our current meeting. Finally, your reality and the sea of hearts from which I came have truly become one in this moment. Now, the time for your unjustly persecuted ideology is at hand. I am thou. Thou art I. That's it. I finally get it. To think it'd be so... <laughs> hey, what are you mumbling about? I told you to get out! Yes, I'll be on my way, finally. Now I can finally. Maruki is a Persona user, an incredibly powerful one at that. Maruki had already partially awakened her spirit rebellion before, and within that, Maruki always had the latent desire to change the cognition of all he encountered. Had anyone else had this power, we would be in for a world of pain. Probably quite literally. Though Maruki has managed to stay his hand and remain somewhat benevolent thus far, we have to ask, what manner of power will we encounter upon the Day of Fates? When augments with the power of Mementos, we have a few more answers as to how Maruki managed to conjure up this false reality as well. Immediately after we defeated Yaldabaoth, we became the public's new saviors. A position that we almost immediately bequeathed to Maruki. We unwittingly chosen to become the new overlord of the cognitive world because, subconsciously, the public and the fan of these still wish for salvation. The reason why Sai asked Joker and then Akechi to turn themselves in was to stop society from becoming distorted once again. A wish that Maruki then immediately granted with a white Christmas Eve and a cute Christmas cake date with her favorite girl. It's a massive betrayal of our confidence from a supposed friend, but once more, we cannot knock Maruki for granting our wishes, nor can we argue with the results. Under Maruki's yoke, cognitive distortions literally cannot exist anymore. And if they are indeed still possible, Maruki has ways of dealing with it. This again comes back to our fundamental disagreement with the sorrowful therapist himself. The fan of these trust in the general will of the public now free from the mental enslavement in Aldabaoth, to then start making some benevolent choices of their own volition. We simply believe in changing society at an individual level, Maruki seems to be deathly afraid of the circumstances he cannot control, such as Rumi's own mental condition. In his reality, and not the one the fan of these desire, there will be no more crime, violence, or pain in general. As he comes to the blind to make his final plea for Joker to accept his reality, he has a good answer to the main differences with their disagreement with his ideology, within asking how Sumire is doing now. Sorry for the last minute visit. How's Yoshizawa-san holding up? I've been concerned about a potential relapse. 
considering her difficulties with accepting this reality. There's one tough girl. You know, I would love for that to be the truth. But people can't maintain their strength forever. You know what? It's actually a good point. While Samiri has managed to bring herself around, Margie poses an interesting alternative. What happens if she relapses and becomes incredibly depressed once more? Not purely speaking of her delusions here, but if Samiri's depression and ideation towards suicide increases, it is entirely possible that she could experience a relapse. Her thoughts could block him once more, and despite resolving to work on herself as hard as she possibly can to become an international and gymnastic superstar, getting discouraged and then spiraling back downwards is more likely than I think Samiri would care to admit. The thing with depression is that for someone like Samiri, it's a constant battle. As her own greatest oppressor, a facet of her own personality that we've had on multiple times throughout this entire video, she has to be in a state of constant warfare with herself. She has to practice constant mindfulness to catch and correct every single negative stray thought and then stop it in its tracks. She needs to effectively tell herself that she's not worthless at all times, at every single point within her own life. It's a monumental task for someone like Samiri, and as far as Marky is concerned, everyone's willpower has to run out eventually. While Samiri is indeed one tough lady, we've seen as much thus far, we cannot say with absolute certainty that she'll be okay for the literal rest of her life. So when given the choice to stay alive and to never feel that ever-present crushing sorrow ever again at the cost of Samiri's own identity, we have to consider the uncertainty of the old reality versus the terminally happy one that Marky aims to give to all of us. If the goal is a total avoidance of sorrow, tragedy, and death, then just as Marky has decided on Rumi's behalf, we have an ethical obligation to accept Marky's reality. For the sake of Yoshizawa-san, and the rest of your friends, I ask you to give me your answer. Oh, what a relief. You'll accept this world? No. Please tell me you're not serious. Really? I'm just so happy that you've come to see things my way. You don't need to worry about anything anymore. Just leave the rest to me. In agreeing to Maraki's deal, we're immediately moved to the next day where all the thieves and Sojo are gathered at LeBlanc together. Sojo claims that this whole gathering was Joker's idea, which is basically true as we immediately see the effect of Maraki's actualization having taken effect. For starters, we have to look back at the date. In Japan, February 3rd is the day before the beginning of spring on the Japanese lunar calendar. This traditional holiday is known as Setsuban, and when translated to literal English, it means seasonal division. There are multiple rituals held on this day to drive away evil spirits and welcome good fortune, such as seeing a homaki, a giant sushi roll which one is to eat in total silence when facing a specific direction where Toshiro Kujin, the god of good fortune, resides. This tradition varies from year to year, along with the direction as well, but this time Maraki has made this holiday take on a more literal meaning, through having Ryuji eat the whole thing in a single go. Just gotta make a wish, then eat this whole thing in one shot. Don't say a word to me until I'm done, got it? I gotta eat the whole thing without talking for the wish to come true. Watch this! Mm -hmm. Besides that ominous appropriation of Japanese cultural tradition, Morgana is obviously no longer a cat. That's right, we're cheering you on. We've got your back no matter what. After all, this is where you belong. Besides that, the other elephants in the room have shown most more of a drastic change. Barring the notion of Futaba and Haru seeming unusually cool with throwing a party with a catchy present, the temperament of the former Black Mask has changed drastically. It says that's north-northwest of here, and a bit to the right, so... roughly that way. All the bloodthirsty resentment is gone, and Akechi seems closer to the affable detective he once masqueraded as. Of course, we move on to Samire, or should I say Kasumi. You know, something hit me a while back. We're the same age. You don't have to be so polite to me. Oh. You're right. <laughs> but, Futaba-senpai, I still think of you that way. Her vocal inflection has changed along with her gloomy temperament. Whatever depressive symptoms were present are now gone, at the cost of herself. Moreover, Kasumi seems to be grateful for all her senpai for supporting her, but there's no mention of gymnastics here, or Joker in particular for supporting her either. It's everyone collectively supporting her. But I really do appreciate all of my senpai cheering me on. That's right, we're cheering you on. We've got your back no matter what. After all, this is where you belong. Yeah, we'll always be together. And that goes for all of you. Without a doubt, Kasumi is serving as Marky's mouthpiece here. He has altered her cognition into that of a dog whistle to thank Joker for accepting Marky's reality. Seemingly cheering on Ryuji, the words of her friends take on a more ominous meaning as Ryuji tries to gulp down his Ehomaki. So, we'll always be together, huh? I sure hope so. Joker realizes that we were in a tough spot, but is unsure if he made the right decision. But as the hours tick by, he slowly forgets about all his concerns as Sojo presents him with a proposition. Hmm? What do you mean? Hey, can I ask you something? 
So, um... I've been thinking for a while now, if it's good with you. And I'll make sure to talk to your parents about it too, okay? But at least until you're done with high school and all. Would you maybe like to keep staying at the cafe? And, and maybe even after graduation, you could... Sojiro and Marky's Yoke has offered an apprenticeship at the Blonde with the potential to take it over after we graduate from high school. Moreover, we never have to leave Tokyo or leave the attic to live on our own. We can stay here forever surrounded by our friends and happiness. We obviously agree to do so, but as we do, we moved along to another happy moment within our lives. Today is March 15th, and today is the day where our senior classmates graduate from high school. Our tearful on graduates Makoto and Haru for making it all the way to the end. Makoto apparently gave quite the grad speech that made the heart and soul of our team so emotional. Makoto's last big speech as council president got me all teared up. <sighs> that was such a nice ceremony. While it might suck not to see these two at school anymore, that's not important, and neither is the fact that Futaba and Morgana are going to become students at Shujin when school starts again once more. Yusuke, who attended Kosei High for his art abilities, is now considering transferring to Shujin to seemingly for the opportunity to stay close to his friends. In other words, he's giving up on his art dream just to stay closer to everybody. As if to articulate this disturbing notion, Kasumi runs up to congratulate our graduates, with Akechi showing up, expressing the idea of taking a year off and then becoming a freelance detective. As we continue on here, Makoto defines with certainty that they all have no memories of the events that precipitated within the old reality. We haven't seen you since the pep rally. The fan of these never existed in this reality, and here, Akechi only attended the school festival. He never threatened to reveal our identities, nor do we end up going after Sai in all the events thereafter. Within all of their minds, it was just a pleasant pep rally where Akechi spoke some niceties and then subsequently just left. Of course, there's the obvious pleasant change in attitude with Akechi as well, but as Akechi offers to take a picture with us, a man offers to literally reinsert the deceased yet reform Prince Detective back into the frame. Would you rather I take that for you? You're all friends, right? Okay, ready? Say cheese. Kasumi gives the man a deep and grateful bow as he walks down the street. Without looking back, he waves his cap at us. The actualization is finally complete. As the credits roll, we see all of our friends finally achieving their dreams. Ryuji wins his first track meet in a while after injuring his leg. Morgana is able to step for on as much as he pleases. Shiho and On are left to enjoy the last year in high school together, with Shiho finally gaining the recognition as a star athlete. Indeed, Jennifer never lost the war here. Yusuke is able to finally have a proper father figure and sensei to look up to that's striving to mold him into becoming the artist of his dreams. Makoto and Sai are finally able to enjoy a happy dinner with their father under his protection instead of thrusting themselves into a lonely and dangerous future. Wakuma and Sojo are finally able to see Futaba grow up and attend high school. Haru and her father are finally able to be just normal father and daughter together without the pesky concerns of their company getting in the way. Joker and Akechi are finally able to enjoy each other's company and be true friends without any animosity or hostility. Lastly, and finally, Kasumi is able to achieve her dream of becoming an international champion on behalf of her deceased sister, Sumira Yoshizawa. It's the perfect fairy tale ending, not just for the fan of these, but for its soot cover princess. Her fairy godfather has made her dreams come true at last. At last, she was able to become something more splendid. No longer bound to the limitations or burdens of the garbage that she was before, she's now able to overcome herself in the most literal of senses. As they all hang out together in the blonde together to witness everyone laughing at the sight of Futaba and Yusuke fighting over some snacks, we pan over to Akechi and Joker, and in doing so, we are given a sudden feeling of panic discontent. They're staring at us, pierced in the fourth wall. They know what we did. And what exactly did we do in accepting Marquis's reality? Well, firstly, congratulations! You and your arrogance and selfishness have just murdered Sumire. All of that character growth Sumire had experienced up until now has been utterly meaningless. All that effort Joker put in to help Sumire over the course of a year is all for naught. 
and Jerk was selfish enough to do it after he helped her finally realize her new dream. He had to backstab Sumire. All the talk of encouraging Sumire to be the best person that she could possibly be and giving her the confidence in order to do just that is now meaningless because Joker effectively just second guessed everything that he taught Sumire over the course of the game, all because of the mere potential that Sumire might relapse into a depressive state once again. No growth occurred here, only stagnation, and the damnable thing of it all is that even in this utopian reality, the real Kasumi is still moldering in her own grave. Margie cannot afford to resurrect Kasumi because it will meddle with Sumire's own perceptions of reality. Her death is unironically a canon event, and Kasumi is now bestowed with the privilege of rolling in her grave as her sister becomes a perfect copy of her. It's totally unsettling, but it becomes even more so when we consider that Samira's cognition, her understanding of who and what Kasumi is, were totally wrong. In her confident arc, we learned that, yes, Kasumi was kind and extroverted, but that was only surface level analysis made by a clinically depressed gymnast. After much trial and tribulation, Sumire learned that Kasumi had a bit of a competitive streak to her and it contributed to the strife between both of them. It was through this that Sumire learned that her understanding of her sister was almost entirely wrong and now she has to live out the rest of her days as a shallow copy of Kasumi. This annihilation of Sumire's own identity is utterly horrific as she becomes a primitive within Maruki's palm. This was clearly the wrong choice, and while this ending was presented to be as valid as a choice as the true ending, there's boatloads of evidence suggests that Maruki and his Jehovah complex was unilaterally the wrong decision. All we need to do now is to go back through his palace and look beyond the superficial. Marky's cognition doesn't quite match the kind of benevolent person he outwardly appears to be. While Marky is absolutely a gentle soul, he is indeed an abhorrent madman. We need to ascertain the true consequences of his actions, as well as why this severely broken man is the wrong choice to lead humanity as his benevolent overlord. For the fan of these and everyone else stuck within this false reality, a painless death awaits those who can no longer bear the sorrows of this life. If death is welcome, let him seek it there. The ambition of Caesar and of Napoleon pales before that which cannot rest until it sees the minds of men and control their unborn thoughts. For I now knew that the king in yellow had opened his tattered mantle, and there was only God to cry to now. And I believe you called forth your power like this. Persona. In order to ascertain how Mark uses his sorrow as practice for stifling the growth of all within his world, including that of the Fanathese and Samire, we need to back it up once more to Samira's false persona awakening. As we know, the shadows reflect the mental attitude of the palace ruler itself, and by referring to Maruki as their lord, all the shadows appear to have a rather insidiously cultish outlook, and all those who reject the mercy of this false reality. Accept yourself. Our lord laments the foolishness birthed from your pain. The language of a shadow is a hint into its ruler's ideology. This one sounds rather cultish, for example. I catch is right. Every single shadow within here is basically a cult member of Maruki's. Moreover, Maruki's methods of wanting Sumeri to avoid the pain of her sister's death to Maruki often means re-traumatizing Sumeri herself. As a therapist, and given his experiences with Rumi, you would think that Maruki wouldn't do anything of the sort, but yet, we have multiple instances of Maruki himself dredging up Sumeri's tragic past as a means to try and shoo her away. We see Maruki's shadows literally messing with her cognitive mask, and when that cognitive dissonance of the truth becomes too much for Sumeri to handle, she is beset by intense headaches. You must... Kasumi... This of course happens again as we infiltrate the palace after the new year. Each time the royal Churro delves deeper and deeper into Marky's palace, he turns up the heat to directly harm Sumire, hence all of her headaches. Why? But how was this video? <sighs> I'm sorry. I don't know what's been wrong with me lately. I've been getting this feeling like... Like I need to remember something, but at the same time, I oughtn't remember it. Oh, there she is! Sumire! <laughs> Both of us have the same dream, to be international champions! Stop. Let's make it come true, Sumire! Together! Stop it! What makes this even worse is that Marky knows that this will happen to Samiri every single time she is confronted by the truth of her deluded cognition. He literally says as much to Joker when we first meet him as Palace, but nevertheless, in the lead up to this particular meeting, he still tries to use the pain of Samiri's memories as leverage to try and keep her away. The truth is, Yoshizawa-san suffers immense pain each and every time she taps into her forgotten past. My... past? Dr. Maruki, 
What do you mean? What's happened to me? While living as Kasumi, his cognition conjures up an image of Samiri, much to her own confusion, before one of his shadows shortly slays it. You must. Hurry, Yoshizawa's in trouble. Heresy. You dare to spurn our Lord's mercy! On top of that, we have to consider the monstrous way that Marquis uses his knowledge of Samiri's pain to accommodate her delusions too. He also ensured two simultaneous things, that Samiri still believes that she is indeed Kasumi, while simultaneously saddling Samiri wholly with the blame of her sister's death, reinforcing Samiri's own feelings of worthlessness, in both deluded context of that event, and to essentially weaponize Samiri's guilt to prevent her from venturing further into his own palace. I... It's my fault. What? When we were able to escape his actualization of reality, and Samiri was able to make peace with her past actions, we learned that Marquis' methods involve screwing with other people's perceptions of reality go further than just messing with Samiri's own cognition. Our first example of this was when he held Samiri hostage for a week. He then proceeded to manipulate the cognition of her family to make them think that Samiri had gone to a training camp for a week, a day after the new year. It's scary stuff, but it doesn't stop there. On the 14th, we get a text from Yusuke explaining that one of his colleagues within Marquis' reality no longer works in the ending artistic medium anymore. Instead, here, he's an archer, but of course, he didn't quit art or take up archery of his own volition. This person's entire history as a painter is gone, and as Akechi surmises, Marky likely concluded on this person's behalf that painting was just another form of suffering for this person. So he then changed his profession and something less painful and offensive. Putting a pin in that for a second, I think that this, more than anything, is indicative of Marky's outlook upon the world. Artists often need to draw from their own inner darkness to create. As a matter of fact, Yusuke's common arc dealt with this exact thing. The first painting Yusuke makes is inspired by the viscera of the upper floors of Mementos, but it's not until later where he's advised to add some light to complement the bleak hopelessness of the work. The whole point of Yusuke's confident arc and the lesson that he pulls away from it is that the human heart is composed of both darkness and light, but one should not override the other. The thing that makes the human heart so special is its capacity to feel and deal with such a vast range of emotions. It is what makes the human experience so valuable and unique, especially when one such human decides to depict it within a painting. Marky's complete disregard for the agency of the fan these is worth discussing here as well. As we get to the third semester, we find that Marky immediately betrayed all of their confidence and immediately ignored how they managed to grow past their problems. In each and every one of their counseling sessions, each thief expresses that they managed to grow from all the trauma they've experienced on account of their personal persona awakenings. Despite society giving all of them a raw deal, they've all decided to go to war with the armies they have, and so far, it's worked out for them. Sure, they have a few residual problems that need to be dealt with, but to them, they're not all that big of a deal. However, to Maruki, having this lasting anguish isn't good enough for them, and uses it as praxis to actualize all their latent wishes. Despite reality itself, their external reality, urging them to forcefully change their own internal perceptions about said reality, none of the fantasies have caved to the distorted desires of the public. They all literally tell him that they're better off now, and while they do wish that things could have played out slightly differently, they deem these issues to be small potatoes. While I do think that it's kind of hilarious that Marky thought Kamashita's crimes be so abhorrent that he deemed it necessary to literally delete him from his reality for Shihou and Ryuji's sake, the growth that On and Ryuji experienced as a result of experiencing that pain cannot be denied. Within Marky's reality, none of this was ever allowed to happen because at his core, Marky believes that all pain and confrontation is to be avoided, no matter what the subject can learn from it all. Then there are instances where Marky needlessly inserted himself into of his life and change their own cognition based on his own incorrect perceptions about them. Never mind the ethics of Marky using Joker as a means to finish his college research paper or effectively stalking Sumire by getting a job at Sujin as a means to monitor her condition. What needs to be discussed here is Marky's total disregard for boundaries as he arrogantly thinks that he doesn't need to recognize them because he believes himself to be good and benevolent. The best example of this is when he chooses to abuse his teacher-student relationship with Joker to find out that he lives at the blonde, and then subsequently goes to investigate the place. Granted, it's unusual for Joker to be living in the attic of a coffee shop, but within that, Marky has managed to figure out that Futaba hangs out here too. He specifically takes advantage of this knowledge and the manner in which the Fanathies have absconded to Hawaii for the school trip to ascertain Futaba's wish when Futaba herself was alone at the cafe. He brings along a book on cognitive science to the cafe as well, implying that he already knows about Futaba's interest in cognitive science too. Surprised that her mother is dead, Marky believes that Futaba's wish is for her mother to be resurrected, when in fact, Futaba never mentions anything of the sort of missing her mother within this conversation. If anything, as Futaba flies around the cafe when we're gone in tow, she is one happy gremlin. All in all, Futaba seems to move past the trauma of her mother's death all by herself, and we've seen her do as such. Pigeonholing Futaba and the likes of Haru into this false reality invalidates all the personal growth they went through over the course of the game, even more so when the crux of Futaba's palace was her essentially practicing mindfulness. 
Actually, thinking about that some more, Futaba's change of heart might look very familiar to anyone who has gone through cognitive therapy, especially with the heist itself. Her shattered sits her down and talks her through the root of her issues with her, forcing Futaba herself to confront her past instead of hiding it. Shadow Futaba carefully unpacks all of Futaba's thought processes regarding her mother's suicide. This makes Futaba think through her distorted thoughts and realize that she is seeing things completely incorrectly, causing Futaba herself to change her own heart. Even better, her treasure is herself, or rather, her own undistorted view of her life and personality. She's able to see her true self again and recover. How arrogant do you have to be to rob Futaba of such a victory? It's incredibly irresponsible and unbecoming a Marky, as a counselor of all things, to deny his clients the agency to solve their own problems, especially when those issues have already been solved or otherwise treated. Again, we find ourselves back with Sumeri here. Marky revoking Sumeri's cognitive overlay as it means to prove why he needs to essentially brainwash everybody is, of course, extremely irresponsible, but in doing so, he also fails to consider Samir's own suicidal ideation as well. If Morky's actualization is anything like antidepressant drugs, ripping off Samira's cognitive overlay could have dire consequences for her own health and put her in immediate danger. There have been multiple studies about this that indicate that from a clinical standpoint and rather paradoxically, most people who attempt suicide often do it close to immediately after starting their meds. In 2004, the United States Food and Drug Administration issued a requirement for the labels of SSRI type antidepressants to require black box warnings be placed upon the medication that warns users of a potential increase in suicidality in the same manner that you'll find warning labels placed upon cigarette boxes about the usage and consumption of cigarettes leading to various health complications after extended usage. SSRIs, as for use as antidepressants, are meant to give users more energy and boost their mood, but what the FDA was concerned about was that there was a possible correlation between the sudden burst of energy the SSRIs were giving users and an increase in suicide attempts. This is also why your psychiatrist might desire for you to meet more regularly with them for the first few weeks after starting your first run of SSRI to antidepressant meds. Your suicidal ideation will improve over time, but initially, your meds will generally first tackle your overall lack of energy and motivation first, before tackling your overall depressive symptoms. These meds make some, especially adolescents at or near Samira's age, more motivated to attempt suicide. Now, I'm hesitant to call Marky's brainwashing medicine, but the sudden burst of energy Samira's mind has been changed to perceive cannot be ignored here. As we discussed previously, Samira's depression imparts her both things of autoerthesis, and makes her incredibly lethargic. The thing is, most antidepressant drugs, the first thing that they do for most people is give them a sudden boost of energy, and thus gets them more mentally motivated to engage in certain tasks. In Samira's case, and in adolescents like her, it would directly tackle the symptoms of her psychomotor retardation. She would have more energy to perform all the tasks that would become inexplicably impossible for her to do due to her condition. It would also give her the potential to become a better gymnast and a better student because she's not so tired and mentally taxed all the time. Of course, with that sudden increase in motivation, coupled with that suicidal ideation Samira might feel from time to time, there's a high likelihood that she could make an attempt after Marky chooses to re-traumatize her. Thinking about this in another way, though it might sound paradoxical, the crushing lack of energy and motivation Samira might feel might actually actually be the thing that keeps her from offing herself. As weird as it might sound, it is possibly too depressed to commit suicide with her own depression actually serving as a protective mechanism of sorts. Granted, Marky's treatment isn't anything of the sort, but the risk still remains here. By forcing Sumerian to live in a state of constant bliss only to then immediately revoke her happiness can't feel very good for her. With that notion, there is also another question to consider here. How does one make the decision to commit suicide and how quickly or often does someone make that decision? If we look at more research, we see that regardless if a person is depressed or not, their overall mood towards suicidal ideation and other correlating depressed moods can vary from hour to hour. In other words, it's a myth that a severely depressed person's feelings on suicide stays constant throughout their lives, or that depression itself is one of the key factors in suicidality. As weird as it might sound, Sumeria's suicidality is actually a symptom of her depression, but not the cause. Taking a look at the study again, the color lines here on all these various charts represent the extreme moods of the participants in the study, which measures these person's mood from a period between four to eight hours, measured over a course of 80 hours total. The positive values on the y-axis of each graph represent high feelings of ideation towards a particular mood, with zero and below denoting an absence of the behavior or low ideation. Looking at the negative moods that contribute to the suicidality of risk factor, there are long periods in which a person doesn't feel particularly lonely, hopeless, or burdensome with those feelings randomly spiking upwards and downwards over time. This is even more prevalent when we consider the components of suicidal ideation such as the intention to kill oneself, the desire to kill oneself, and the ability to resist the urge to kill oneself. It remains completely sporadic, with all these factors leaving us a total ideation score being equally as sporadic as well. This then leads us to the final findings of the study. While suicidal ideation, planning, and even mulling over the choice to kill themselves occurred a year or even months over the course of a measured time period between a year to several months, this data suggests that it is a myth that suicide is meticulously planned after lots of deliberation. While some may have a loose plan about how they wish to die, 86.5% of the attempter's proximal planning steps, the full manifestation of that plan to kill oneself takes place within one week of the attempt, with two-thirds of those planning steps occurring within 12 hours of the attempt. Those who decide to and attempt suicide make the decision not within months, weeks, or days, but inside 60 seconds. 
even inside those 60 seconds, the decision to walk away is still there. In other words, a suicidal person may have their intent planned out for a long period of time and thus are still able to resist the call of the void as it were for an incredible amount of time as well until their mood experiences a wholly erratic negative change. The decision and desire to die is almost an instantaneous split second decision. To back up what this particular study presents, I present you all with a different one concerning suicidality. There was a study done in 2017 that aimed to evaluate the effectiveness of different suicide prevention measures implemented on bridges and other high structures in Switzerland. At 11 suicidal hotspots evaluated within the study and the prevention measures taken therein, the research concluded that the more barriers erected between the person and said person experiencing utter oblivion were mostly effective at discouraging suicide attempts. In essence, the more barriers you put between a suicidal person and making the attempt at committing suicide, the more effective it is at preventing such an attempt from occurring. Stepping back into Persona 5 to contextualize all this data back to Sumeria's condition, she was already at high risk for suicide before Kasumi's death, which then was augmented by it, and then once again as Maruki re-traumatized her via ripping off her cognitive mask. While Maruki using his persona to put Sumeria into a deep sleep as Darker pokes her own Tokyo could be interpreted as a stopgap measure to stop Sumeria from offing herself, the suicidal thoughts do not stop as a result of the slumber. He merely delays it and immediately as Sumeria wakes up, she is seemingly willing, or perhaps the right word to use here, would be desperate enough to kill Joker to make her dream come true. Don't try to stop me. If you do, then I'll... To make matters worse, Marky also sees nothing wrong with seeing Joker and Samiri duke it out as he watches from a distance, as he effectively uses Samiri, a former patient of his, as a pawn for his own ends. When Sumiri ends up losing to Joker on account of her inexperience, she will keep casting blessed and physical attacks at Joker regardless if he has a persona that is immune or repels that damage type or not. Morgi decides to intervene further by using his persona to ensnare, incapacitate, and then co-opt Sumiri's own spirits of rebellion to then summon Sandrion. Of course, he could just augment Sandrion's powers, but instead, judging by what Sandrion says, Morgi is using his own power to stimulate Sumiri's darkest and most delusional thoughts. He's literally driving her own persona berserk. Sadly, she has lost sight of herself. She's in pain. Now, be her guide, and together, escape from the nightmare! <sighs> no, I... I can't! I don't want to go back to my life in Cinders ever again! I refuse to go back! I'm happy here. This is where I belong! This so-called kindness of his disgusts me. This is even more damning when we recall that Maruki is the one who exposes all the information about Sumeria's true identity to us and the severity of her survivor's guilt. Maruki is, quite literally, weaponizing Sumeria's own trauma to drive her own heart utterly insane for his own ends. Hence, Sandra's mechanical movements as Maruki puppets another's persona. There's also something he said about he's seemingly feeding into Sumeria's berserk and destructive bloodlust by ordering Sandra to eat all the shadows Maruki summons in the fight for sustenance. Maruki's behavior and the manner in which she desires to treat Sumiri is completely unethical and actively dangerous to her client's well-being, regardless of his endgame here. Though overriding Sumiri's cognition was to her overall benefit, burping off the proverbial cognitive bandage and the way he uses her to subsequently attack Akechi and Joker is utterly sickening due to how susceptible she is to suicide. Certainly, all these statistics make the likelihood of Sumiri surviving past January 10th extremely unlikely, though if we assume that, we are doing a disservice to Sumiri in the same way that Maruki's treatment of her is. We're missing out on a massive social factor here that has paradoxically kept Sumiri alive, her relationship with Joker. Though she may think herself to be utterly worthless, even more so for lashing out at anguish at her beloved senpai, we come to know Sumiri to value her relationship with her loved ones especially dearly. It's why she deferred to Kasumi as they grew up together. It's why she went to therapy at her family's request and why she deferred to Joker during both parts of her confident arc. Be it a perceived slump or overcoming herself, the first thing that Sumeri did after realizing that the past few months she's been essentially living in a lie was her sitting down and talking about it with Joker. And more specifically, how she felt before and after Kasumi died, with Joker offering support and advice whenever she needed it. Compared to Maruki, instead of encouraging Sumeri's own delusions, Joker himself validated Sumeri's feelings but wasn't afraid to be firmly harsh with her. Senpai. What should I do? <sighs> you can be awfully firm sometimes, Senpai. But you're absolutely correct. Of course, Samira's prioritization of On and Giri was a double-edged sword as Japanese society did somewhat cow Samira into suffering in silence all alone, but we can also say the same about her depression as well. Samira's love of cooking. This hobby is one that she almost certainly engaged with him for the, both the benefit of her sister and herself for their own athletic benefit as well. 
Samira was always the one in charge of monitoring her own weight, and it wouldn't be too far of a stretch to assume that Kasumi leaned on her for this too. Of course, we have to point out how monstrous it was for Maruki to rob Samira of this minor joy. And by all means, it was probably the only joy Samira seemed to have in her life that wasn't completely eclipsed by Kasumi's prowess in literally everything. Samira's knowledge of cooking was the only thing that she was objectively better than Kasumi at. In her own therapy session with Maruki, even while she's suicidally depressed, Samira is still able to remember the nutritional benefits of apples and how to creatively use them all in all sorts of dishes. Apples do make for good ingredients though. If you grate them, you can make a surprisingly versatile sauce. I use it in plenty of my food. It's pretty nutritious and good for digestion. You cook Yoshizawa-san? I'm impressed that you care so much about nutrition. You must be really on top of things. <sighs> However, when Marky overwrites her cognition to mimic her sister, Sumeria can no longer cook worth anything. Of all the things that Marky wanted to change for Sumeria's benefit, this is the one thing that really burns me up. It's a direct attack on Sumeria's very identity, all for the sake of avoiding pain. Hmm. Something the matter? Now that I think about it, I'm not any good at cooking. I don't know why I said those things earlier. My younger sister's the one who was really great at it. Hmm, <laughs> that's right. Kasumi Yoshizawa. Maruki stole a part of Samira's own individuality from her, the one thing that made her unique. However, this is not the only thing he steals from Samira, as he deludes her into thinking that she's Kasumi. As we've come to know, Samira's perceptions of her own sister are based on false pretenses that were affected by her own depressed view of the world. Within that, we learn that Maruki has merely gotten her to mimic all the positive aspects of her sister without truly understanding Kasumi herself. Maruki effectively turned Samira into a cheap copy that didn't possess Kasumi's athletic prowess and energy levels while also taking away her aptitude for cooking. He merely made her to be a more extroverted and pleasant person, which is to say that his methods for asking Samira to mimic the target person, being that of Kasumi, weren't even effective in the first place. Coming back to what I said earlier, it is good that the Yoshizawa clan thought it prudent to seek out counseling considering how taboo doing such is within Japanese culture, but unfortunately, they landed on Maruki, the sole therapist in Japan with a personal and extremely vindictive agenda against society itself. Maruki isn't helping or treating Sumeria's inferiority complex, depression, or her PTSD. He's actually making Sumeria think about what choices her deceased sister would make in all situations as opposed to coaching her on how to make those same choices for herself, as Joker would later do within her own confidant arc. If you aspire to be more like another person, it's actually possible. Thought exercises like, would that person do this? Or realizations like, that person wouldn't do that. These sorts of thoughts can lead people to change themselves in ways that more closely mirror the target person. Moreover, Marky doesn't comment on something else that's disturbing about Sumeria's condition here. Sumeria seems to have this strange keepsake thing going on with Kasumi's stuff. The fact that Sumeria is holding on to the personal effects of her recently deceased sister, such as her ribbon, wearing her clothes, and using her broken smartphone that is still damaged in the accident, is very disturbing, and to be completely honest, really creeped me out when it went to Sumire reach into her bag to then mimic her dead sister like that. However creepy that was to me at the time, that's not the point here. It's the fact that Margi isn't the slightest bit concerned that Sumire is carrying around these personal effects of her dead sister on her person. As to why Sumire is doing such a thing, this is either a coping mechanism for her loss or as a means to perpetuate her own negative thoughts and cognitive distortions on herself. Regardless though, Margi doesn't even bother to treat this or recognize this in any way in this conversation. Instead, Marky seems to be reveling in the fact that he successfully offered Samiri salvation. Yes, I feel like a weight's been lifted off of me. You're amazing, Doctor. <laughs> it's no big deal. Still, it seems like my counseling approach does some good after all. In the end, Marky didn't solve anything involving Samiri's condition here. He doesn't change anything about Samiri's guilt or various complexes. If anything, he's denied her the chance to grow, to move past the trauma of her sister's death. And being the man who was supposed to help Samiri out, only to betray her confidence multiple times over throughout the runtime of the game, to then do the same thing with Joker and the rest of the fan of these, Maruki has proven that he's not the benevolent person that he claims to be. By inserting himself into Samiri's life for his own ends, he has revealed himself to be objectively evil indeed. If that's so hard for you to believe, we have to consider what happens to Samira and Maruki if we don't max out both their confidence arcs before November 18th. If we fail to complete either of them, the third semester will be locked off, which is also to say that Maruki never enacts his plans for a painless reality. Now, this is all well and good as the public remains unbrainwashed, but for Samiri, for Joker to not put in the time to help her will have adverse consequences for her later in life. Of course, Samiri will remain deluded into thinking that she is Kasumi, but the truly horrific thing to consider is that Marky's actualization is just a temporary solution that is expected to wear off eventually. We see evidence of this in the game as well. We saw Samiri's cognitive mass start to slip after her dad came to get her after a visit to Meiji Shrine in the new year. Well, shall we get going? What? 
We know that any recollection of her past causes her immense discomfort, and as we've seen in Marcus Palace, if the cognitive distance becomes too much for her to bear, Sumeria will experience intense pain and thus remember everything. This is why Marky felt it necessary to tell her to Shujin or to monitor her condition, and why her father calls to check on her ever so often in the game as well. Hello, Dad? What was that? Uh, sorry, my phone's been acting up lately. It's okay. Thanks. Mm-hmm. I'll see you later. Sorry about that. He asked if I needed a ride since it's raining. A bit overprotective, don't you think? The fear is that the cognitive dissonance between her own internal reality and the external one that she's experiencing will become too much, and that she'll likely try to end her life then and there. Considering that, we have an obligation not just to help Samiri by putting her through the ringer here, but to also prove to Marky that his solution is downright evil, conceited, and utterly malicious. All in all, taking care of Samiri's condition is an utter failure on Marky's part, but considering how he's manipulated Samiri, we have to ask how he plans to, or has already manipulated reality to suit his grand designs. He isn't about modifying events or changing people's cognition to align with his goals, such as making Samiri's parents believe that she wasn't indeed being held hostage by her therapist, or by manipulating certain events or holidays to get certain people to meet up at the same location on a specific date, as was the case with the thieves meeting up at a remarkably desolate Meiji Shrine on New Year's Day. Though, upon further investigation and recollection of certain events, we find that Marky is able to manipulate much more than that. When he first fought Yao's mouth, the God of Control once tried to erase us from the public consciousness, dropping the public support to 0% on the fan site as he posed the question to the fan if these really exist. After running at Yao's mouth again and shooting him in the face, Of course, the rating of this value is at 100% when we defeated him on Christmas Eve. However, if we take a look at the rating on the fan site as we wake up on Christmas Day, that value is seemingly half to 50% overnight. Half of our supporters have forgotten about us. Of course, some anomalies within Marky's rally were immediately present after a victory over Yeld's mouth, and we have evidence of Marky immediately filling in the power vacuum after we left. I catch her turning himself into the police to prosecute Shido, Sai having an unusually easy time prosecuting and convicting Shido, the overturning of Joker's false criminal record, and the joy our Christmas date felt during one white Christmas Eve. It was all Marky's doing. I don't know if I've ever been this happy in my life. <laughs> it feels like I found my fairy tale ending. It would then be extremely obvious that this drop in her influence and her staying power within public's cognition is undoubtedly Marky's handiwork too, but after a New Year's night, support drops from about 50% to almost 15%. Around this time as well, Joker manages to notice that Marky has somehow managed to change the questionnaire on the fan site as well. Instead of questioning if the Phantom Thieves truly exist, the question now is, would you join the Phantom Thieves? Within that, if we keep an eye on the fan site, we notice that support starts around 15% or so, but then languages to about 11% over the course of January into the start of February. Marky's grip on this reality is utterly insidious. Effectively, he's changed the public's cognition so drastically that they no longer feel the need to rebel against society as they all have chosen to lead towards apathy and stagnation once again. We're right back where we were as Yaldabel tried to kick us out of mementos and then subsequently tried to erase us from the public's cognition. What were the Phantom Thieves all about anyway? Oh man, hearing that brings back memories. I feel so dumb for even believing they existed. It was fun news though. Well, I doubt anyone believes they're around anymore. Why isn't anyone noticing this abnormality? It's probably because they don't feel that it's odd. Marky has effectively fulfilled all the wishes, so the fan of these are no longer needed. Speaking of fulfilling wishes and holistically changing people's entire personalities, we find out that within Marky's reality, almost everyone serves as a mouthpiece to promote his ideal world and utopia. We see this mostly through all our classroom lectures. Almost all of our teachers are teaching us about what utopias are and how certain words have both positive and negative meanings while imploring their students to look on the bright side of life and completely ignore all the negative aspects about certain topics. Let's start with the small stuff first. On the 17th, while in the class, we get a series of texts in the group chat from Ryuji concerning our graduate old social studies teacher, Mr. Ushimaru. This is the same guy that would once throw chocolate at Joker's head when he wasn't paying attention in class, but now his temperament seems a lot more chill, which is freaking Ryuji out. With a snap of Marky's fingers, he's become something what a first year like Samiri would dread having as a teacher in the future, to being the school's own Buddha to use Ryuji's words. This more or less confirms that Marky has the power not just to change Samiri's personality, but to change the personality of everyone he deems to be antagonistic towards society as necessary. The Thieves theorized that at one point in his life, he was once a kind man who likely had something bad happen to him that jaded him beyond all repair. This notion is further capitalized upon as he learned from our other classes with Mr. Anui about the original meaning of the word awful. The word once meant something extremely positive in the English vernacular, but that has since changed over time as the world, supposedly in Marky's eyes, has become a lot more jaded. 
according to Mr. Anui as well, we see the market is also able to manipulate people's perceptions of Japan's economy, or at least delude people into thinking that it's doing extremely well. If we listen in on some of the conversations around the city and around school, we find that something is wrong here. We are not the only people experiencing extreme levels of cognitive dissonance, with some of the citizens of Tokyo discovering things about Marky's reality that are incongruent with their own feelings and memories of the past. Some students who have previously been injured or weren't as students before the new year have suddenly have all those afflictions done away with, much of the confusion of everyone else. Marky also has seemingly done away with all the bullying at Chujin, but when we ask at what cost, we cannot say that the ends justify the means here. At school, we hear some of the star athletes, who are the starting lineup, mind you, bench themselves of their own volition for the sake of cheering his teammates on. Additionally, we find another student who has suddenly decided to go on a week-long vacation with her parents during exam week. When questioned about all the hard work she put in her entrance exams up until this point, she claims that she was always going to work at her dad's company after high school. No plans for college were ever made. Some of the students have subconsciously noticed that everyone has been in high spirits since the start of the new year as well and find it immensely off-putting, but can't determine why. Additionally, if we stop for a second and take a look at the faces of some of our peers, most, if not all of them, have this creepy smile plastered on their faces. Once we leave Shujin and head out to explore the city, we'll overhear some people in the subway talking about estranged friends getting back together, sour relationships becoming healed once more, and workers' relocations being cancelled. It would seem that Marky desires potential pain that these people might have felt from becoming estranged is slowly but surely becoming totally erased. This notion also carries over to Shinjuku's Red Light District as well. As we listen in, we find that those who worked in the host or hostess clubs Certainly don't remember working in any of those establishments or have any recollection of why they have fancy clothes suited for a sketchy night job. This is in contrast to the customers who swore they worked there the year before. When we come around to Kichijochi, we hear some people enjoying the new lease on life Mark has gave them, but one common we do over here is that a store was closed and the old reality is still open within Marquis. Much of the confusion of most who pass by it. This is all very disconcerting, of course, but if we remember back to the week where we were running around the city to find our teammates enjoying Marquis' reality, we find something absolutely abhorrent. There is a homeless man hanging around Central Station, the very same homeless man who advised Joker not to get involved with the Mafia, as Makoto was blackmailing us, and the very same homeless man who was part of the killer who cleans up trash for Mentos request. Within that request, we find out that this man is an ex-mercenary turned assassin who, according to him, is in actuality a vigilante who kills only untouchable criminals. We deem this unnecessary and morally reprehensible. Murdering people is wrong, no matter the reason, so we decide to change his heart and mementos and reform him to give it all up. While living in Marky's reality, he seems aware that something is wrong about the world and remains suspicious of it all from January 2nd through the 12th. I say through the 12th here because the next time we see him in the underground, he tells Joker that instead of looking at all the negative aspects of being homeless, the man actually tells Joker that he enjoys the freedom of it all, of being homeless. Needs to say that this is incredibly fucked up. Marky looked at this guy's past and his current situation, knew that he'd been reformed by the fan of these, but decided to do nothing to help him within this reality. Marky likely deemed him to be too dangerous to be out and about, thus dooming this individual to live a blissful life in squalor for the rest of his life. This is very telling of Marky's outlook at the world and how much he intends to change about it as well. As seen with some of peers at school and with the homeless man himself, his actualization is a slow yet gradual and insidious process. One day you'll interpret the world one way, and on another, you'll forget it all. Every Everyone in Tokyo will eventually reach a state of constant bliss. Morgi has his hands in everyone's cognitive pies, and it's gotten to the point where we can guess that every single event we see unfold within his reality is an attempt to nudge the fan of these into accepting his reality as well. Coming back to our lectures at school here, Kawakami gives us a lecture about a book called The Restaurant of Many Orders by Kenji Miyazawa, which Kawakami coincidentally found as she was cleaning house, which we can't really deem to be a coincidence at all given the stakes of this reality. The fiction world Miyazawa creates within the novel is based in Iwate, the very same Japanese rural prefecture known for its scenic and beautiful rugged coastlines, greenery, and soft pink cherry blossom trees. This was a template for the author's own personal utopia, with such a thing being easily drawn back to Marky's desire for a dreamlike paradise. As for how Marky managed to create this utopia, we need to only examine the insides of his palace and what he's done to Mementos. Coming back to Marky's surveillance network, he invented to actualize his reality within Mementos itself, he inadvertently actualized Yalabelt's desire to rob humanity of the ability to think for themselves. Sure, there's no more prisoners left in cells, but that is because Marky, instead of rounding all their shadows up, has changed all their hearts to fit in with the new world he's pre-approved to be safe and secure. The iron of all this is very palpable here. Marky's using the same mechanism as Yalabelt to enslave humanity of their own soulful desires, but instead of it being more malevolent, Marky chooses to coat everything, which shades the sorrowful benevolence. More shades of contrasting irony and foreshadowing in regards to Marky's assorted temperament lie within the lectures he gives with us in class over the course of his time at Shujin as well. Every single one of Marky's lectures tells us two things. For one, Mark is not bullshitting when he says that he's knowledgeable about psychology, and more specifically, as a grad student looking to become the first cognitive scientist in the world, he reveals within all of his lectures to us that he possesses great knowledge of how to manipulate the cognition of others. However, the scary thing here is that most of the things that Marky educates us about in class exist as actual psychological phenomena in the real world. 
While we might mistake Mark for ending every one of his lectures with a certain degree of passion and enthusiasm for the field he's dedicated his life to, after knowing his insidious end game, his fascination with everything he covers in class takes on a whole new horrific meaning. The first lecture he gives us is about how believing the power of treatment itself can be enough to cure one's condition. It's all about the placebo effect here. Mark himself clarifies and states that even if the medicine doesn't heal or chemically cure you of your, all your ailments, it will at least alter your perception and help you feel better. This is also a callback to the cookie experiment he told Joker about during his confident arc as well. He's outright saying that it's possible to heal people by feeding them lies of omission, which has some implications upon his reality as well. Our next lecture with Marky happens on the 4th of June and it concerns something called the halo effect. Marky tells us that, effectively enough, the halo effect is a type of cognitive bias in which your overall impression of a person influences how we feel and think about their character. The implication of this is rather obvious, both as a bit of foreshadowing for Marky's temperament, masking him as the last ruler of the game, and serves as more dramatic irony as Marky himself urges us not to make snap judgments about other people, as he someone thinks he will do the same thing later in the game with his own reality. Skipping over the lecture that happens four days later, we're going to fast forward to July 11th. This lecture concerning the dichotomy of long versus short-term memory. Marky tells us that short-term memory is limited in its capacity and functions in a mostly contextual manner. But in comparison, long-term memories tend to stick with us for far longer. After stopballing some answers with Morgana, Marky says that information encoded into your long-term memories never really fully goes away. While it is comforting that even in my head filled with bees, I'm able to remember some things, but the choice of words Marky uses, such as encoding, to describe how these memories are processed and recorded is rather disturbing given his end goals. Especially when Marky goes on about how short-term memories become long-term memories through reiteration of the same thought processes. When applied to Marky's reality, he's literally describing how to ensure false memories proliferate within one's mind. Which is also to say, if you repeat a concept for long enough, the person in question will eventually say that there are five lights instead of four, or indeed, that two plus two equals five. The next lecture with Marky is on the 6th of September, and it concerns how our brains process time and then subsequently reality itself. It is as much of a JoJo reference as it is Marky referencing the phenomenon of chronostasis. Marky's question is about the phenomenon where if you stare at the hand of a clock for long enough, you'll often perceive the second hand stopping for more than a clockable second. When a person changes the viewpoint about a particular subject for a second, there's an unaccountable moment there's an unaccountable amount of time that one can sometimes perceive. In order to fill this gap in what we perceive as time, your brain experiences a fictional moment in your perception of reality itself. While other parts of Marky's lectures have dealt with manipulating one's memory, this time, Marky is talking about how to alter one's perception of time itself, and in the interest of avoiding pain, Marky will likely alter one's perception of time to ensure the subject stays happy consistently. Our last and final lecture with Marky happens on the 24th, and it concerns memory bias, as he then regales the class with a story about him meeting up with Shibasawa to talk about all the trouble they got into in college. Marky couldn't believe they did all those things, as he believes them now to be incompatible with the person he is today. But he makes the point that cognitive bias itself can change or impair one's own memories. According to Marky, there are even instances where the brain may create false memories as a defense mechanism due to trauma, as was the case with Samira's inferiority complex and the persecutory way she would engage with reality and with Kasumi. The implications of this very idea are staggering for Marky's reality, as they all seem to be based not just on the powers his persona has given him, but on the actual quirks of human cognitive behavior. He knows the psychology well and how to apply it to cognitive science itself. But when we consider what he asks us about totalitarianism in the lecture he gives on the 8th of June, we truly see where Marcus headspace is at here. He understands that it's a governmental structure that houses all of its people under a single ideology, which is then used as an authoritarian means to control the masses. Theoretically, it's supposed to promote societal harmony by bringing people under one political ideal. The definition itself is correct, but Marky's reaction to the very idea itself and the way that it brings it up in class is incredibly weird and disturbing. While he seems to recognize the ethical issues with how totalitarianism calls for the simulation of the unwilling into a single ideology, Marky outright says that there are logistical benefits to totalitarianism. To Marky, uniting people under a single ideology removes the logistical problems of controlling the culture, morals, and even the thoughts of its social deviants. We know Marky to have a latent desire to change the cognition of criminals as a preventative measure to stop all crime, which would also entail the curtailing of free will itself. So really, it shouldn't be any surprise to us that he believes in the benefits of being the head of his own totalitarian regime. I'll save every other person in the world currently suffering. In fact, it's my responsibility to do so. You can see how this world's bestowed the duty upon me. While Marky fancies himself to be a great and benevolent man with a duty to rule over all mankind, there have been hundreds of thousands of dictators throughout history who thought the same way and ended up harming people through their ideological outlook. Stalin, Mao, Hitler, Pol Pot, Gaddafi, and Kim Jong-il all strove to create the perfect society for their people, but end up killing or harming hundreds of thousands of people in the process of creating their ideal world. Marky is willing to wax on about the benefits of totalitarianism while promoting the idea of a strong sense of self and seemingly being aware of the pseudo-oppressive echo chamber his rally would create, but of course, Marky would see to that. In order to guarantee that nobody gets hurt, he will remove the ability for all strife to occur in the first place. 
he will directly move the ability to disagree with everyone else, causing another pain. Marky seems to be fully aware of what he has to do to achieve his dream. As we delve back into mementos, we see that the ends don't necessarily justify the means. Considering what Marky has done in mementos, where he literally is able to survey everyone's shadows and drastically change their own thought process, the manner in which he's managed to do this, the method would make Ink Sock and Big Brother very jealous. Despite Mark having the best of intentions here, him taking over as the new warden and overlord of the collective unconscious has irreparably harmed and changed the way that people think. And it's all done on purpose. As a matter of fact, we can see the extent to which his distortions and visions for his new reality have made everything worse. Before he took over in Yada the Best Plays, with every new layer of mementos came a different music track to accompany it. As we move along the new path that Marky himself created, all the musical tracks and all the different layers of the collective unconscious are thrown together in a giant hodgepodge mix. The end result is just a loud cacophony of attitude instruments and noise as Marky forces all the instruments and then by extension, every single mind that exists within the collective unconscious to try and play in the same key, even in instances where it just doesn't play and work. That's weird enough and indicative of just what this layer of mementos represents. The various smashing of all the floors of mementos combined into a singular one, but if we listen to the track, we hear a collection of trumpets playing out of key amidst all the noise buried deep within the mix before it's swiftly crushed by the main marching motif of the mementos itself. This is no accident that this type of instrument is played in place within this new layer of mementos in this way. If you listen intently, we'll notice that despite it being played at a tune, the notes played follow a specific melody we've heard at least in two other tracks on the game before. Mementos New Layer shares a light motif with Sword on My Bones. You recall that this track plays upon each thief awakening to their second persona after the end of their particular confident arcs, which is also to say that it plays after Joker helps them grow and change as people. Extrapolating the usage of the song's light motif in Marcus New Layer Mementos and the manner in which it's reduced to an utter cacophony of noise, the intent is clear here. Despite all the growth the fan of these and society have experienced as a result of their actions, he intends to override all the personal victories in this reality. Now I say society, because the very same Sword of My Bones motif is used during the track Our Beginning. The very same song that plays when the masses fully give their strength to the Fanathies, that then gives Joker the ability to summon Satanayal to defeat Yaldabaoth. This track and the very moment it plays in Persona 5 is representative of not just the Fanathy's victory over false ignorant god, but the very triumph over the idea of sloth itself. In that moment, we proved to Yaldabaoth that when not stifled by malicious forces, humanity will naturally always choose to grow and change on their own volition. The music in the sequence reflects this too. Now acting on the behalf of the collective unconscious of all of humanity, Joker steals Yaldabaoth's theme song, smashes it together with a few light motifs from Sword of My Bones, and appropriates it for himself before shooting Yaldabaoth in the face.
Joker managed to transform Galadriel's theme from one of artificial terror and control to one of heroic triumph. It's a great moment, but if we tie these various motifs back to Maraki, we find that he's actively trying to quash the legacy of the Phantom Thieves. To be more specific, he's trying to erase, or perhaps the right word would be to drown out, this section from our beginning as the new warden and ruler of Mementos. Notice the difference in structure here. As Joker collects himself before shooting Yaldabaoth, the God of Control's theme cuts back in, but its potency is subdued by the changing key and the utilization of new instruments that undercut it all in the mix. In Maraki's replication of Mementos, the positions of these motifs are reversed. Instead of allowing for that trumpet solely section to ring out, the very fabric of Mementos seems to clamp back down on it and stop the motif from ringing out in its tracks. As indicated by his appropriation of our victory and the manner in which Marky took over Mementos, Marky is literally utilizing the same mechanism to suppress the thoughts and free will of everyone within this reality, including trying to expunge the fan that justice from the minds of the collective unconscious to promote his own agenda. He's literally doing the exact same thing as Yaldabaoth in real time. It's utterly vile, but we can rest assured that amidst all the noise of Marky's cognitive assimilation, our justice can and still be heard by those who choose to listen well. However, the sound of our justice won't be able to be heard forever. No matter which way you look at it, one thing remains true. There can be no deviance to the new social order for those stuck in Marky's yoke. For his perfect utopia to exist, he has to pursue and enforce the very control of thought itself, erasing or changing certain events to fit the narrative. However, we have yet to ask why someone will go to such terrible lengths to ensure that pain or tragedy itself doesn't exist. All that to say, we need to ascertain the nature of Marky's moral compass, and fortunately, Marky's cognition, as demonstrated within his palace, provides once more. As we return back to the exam room once more and take a look around, we notice another facet of this room we failed to consider before. In Marky's exam room, we see some Rorschach test exams upon the walls. It might seem like an extraneous detail, but it's extremely important to how Marky's tests are actually incredibly biased and based on his own musings about what is acceptable behavior or not. Stepping out of Persona 5 for a second, Rorschach tests are forms of evaluating projected psychological behavior and one's paradolic perceptions of objects. In plain English, based on what images your brain constructs for you amidst these random ink blots spilled on parchment paper, these tests are supposed to be a loose evaluation of your own personality, character, and emotional functioning. To some, these images may look like a light in the darkness, a bearded man, a mushroom cloud, or two bears high-fiving. Ideally, everyone would have a different answer to what is essentially a personality test, but as we've seen, Marky wants everyone to be healed, or rather assimilated, into a single thought process and ideology. So, we have to ask, in the interest of avoiding all pain, strife, and violence, what behaviors does Marky deem to be acceptable to society? While we managed to ascertain the answers Marky would prefer his patients to answer, we haven't looked at the type of behavior Marky would find reprehensible and outright dangerous to his world. Starting with the first exam once more and picking A, when someone requires their help, our first instinct is to spring into action. Marky's distorted cognition believes that while doing such a thing is very admirable, it could lead to yourself or another getting hurt. Within Marky's reality, all types of pain, especially injuries, are not permitted in this ideal reality. The shadow that masquerades as a therapist here asks us to go to the counseling room to, quote, change our way of thinking, end quote, so that we may live in his paradise. We know that Marky believes all pain is to be avoided, but to see the people who have the gumption to step in and help others, those who are willing to risk hurting themselves in order to potentially help others, others should be essentially brainwashed and being afraid of doing just that is utterly insane. Mark is robbing people of their agency, good or bad, to make their own choices. And as we ascend to the next floor, we get more insight as to why. This time, when we speak to the cognitive people here, we learn that the man who would pick C to ditch his current dream doesn't really have a dream at all. He is called Dispassion Student for a reason, after all, and he tells Joker that if he had a dream he actually cared about, he might have answered differently here. But for now, it would seem he's hedging his best for Marky to give him a purpose in life. This, of course, is the desirable answer that Marky wants and the behavior that Marky desires. But the attitude of this passion on the student is grating to the ears. If we retake this test to pick the wrong answer of A, we find that Marky also desires to crush the dreams of those who relentlessly worked hard to achieve them. If we ask the cognitive person who would pick such an answer, we we'll learn that she's a musician but is stuck in the busking stage. 
She works a part-time job, so she can afford lessons in her spare time, but is always recording demos or practicing, and then sending her workout to potential auditions. She's got nothing back yet, and she's a bit hard on herself for coming up so short, until Samira reminds her that working hard to be your ideal self is extremely admirable. A very fitting bout of encouragement coming from Samira here too. She would know what that feels like. Anyway, we find that her main concern is anxiety about an uncertain future, which causes her to break down. But even though she has these feelings, she still believes in herself. She loves music so much, and the idea of quitting is downright counterintuitive to who she is. If we follow her upwards, we of course encounter Shadow. Granted, in this reality, Marky believes pursuing your own dreams is admirable, but only if victory and success itself is assured. If this woman's dream breaks her heart and causes her any amount of anguish, that would not be a dream worth pursuing. It's an absurd notion that the woman with an actual dream and someone who's working hard to achieve it is subject to Marky's brainwashing, while the guy with absolutely no dream is basically gifted one despite being dispassionately interested in everything. It's utter bullshit. If something causes one pain, then they should immediately just give up on the dream no matter how noble the pursuit is. As we move towards the last test, we talk with one of the NPCs here. Upon speaking with the man who would choose B, we find that he desires not to steal any kind of heart despite having the power to do so without any consequences. Within that, we find that he has a wife and kid. On the corporate ladder, he exists as a low-level employee. He's in a position very high, and as such, his family isn't very wealthy. He's passed in numerous promotions seemingly out of his own cowardice to use his own words, but nevertheless, he feels content with his own life. As we inquire some more, we find that he's always been like this, desiring a more simple life, but one where he can watch his kid grow up and grow old with his wife. He never wanted for much, and now that he has a family that he loves dearly, he isn't going to do anything to jeopardize his happy life with them. He would think that because this man's desires don't do anyone else or himself harm, Marky would be totally cool with this kind of behavior but as we follow him up we find another shadow it tells the man that choosing not to improve his standing within society and by leaving all potential future happiness on the table he's forgoing his right to happiness itself the shadow itself is deeming his patient to be sacrificing their potential for a mediocre existence he feels like it's his duty to intervene and improve their lives he does this in spite of this man outright stating that he doesn't really want an exciting life he is content with the one that he has once again we see more outright stating that self-determination is bad he must always interject on another's behalf to improve their lives regardless of what they think about the matter. Even more hypocritically, this guy who doesn't want to jeopardize his content life with his family is in actuality unhappy is absolutely a heinous insinuation. It would seem that it isn't enough to be content in Marky's world. One must be downright euphoric at all times. To discover how hypocritical Marky's definition of happiness is here, we discover that after we infiltrate the control rooms through one of the vents upstairs, he deems that stealing your own heart, much in the way that we stole Futaba's heart on her own behalf all the way back when, is deemed not to be true happiness at all. The patient in question wants to steal her own heart so that she can love her husband again and thus causing a cycle of her own self-hatred extrapolating all of this we learn that Marky's ideal reality is one where every single person is happy but said happiness cannot be gained at the expense of someone else's Marky cannot seem to reconcile the fact that happiness can be derived not only through personal pain and suffering but that indeed some people's happiness can be derived from the suffering of others this is why when we peer through another one of the observation rooms at the patient who desires to steal the hearts of the one she loves for her own personal gain so the object of her desire loves nobody but her this patient is of course very selfish and envious but given the hypocritical state of the question and the degree of heartbreak she feels, we would think Marky would allow this attitude to exist within his reality given his own experiences. Instead, we find that Marky still thinks that stealing one's heart in such a manner to make the bad guys repent for the crimes is the unquestionably right thing to do. Never mind the ethical implications that the fan of these were once concerned about. If he feels like someone needs fixing or needs to repent for their crimes, he will steal their heart without their consent. Thinking anything less or anything different would be outright dangerous to the world he wishes to create. With this exam room, he wants everyone to be pigeonholed to a single personality type that is simultaneously incapable of doing harm to others and to oneself. He wants everyone to become something akin to an avoidant person, where they will do everything to avoid any kind of stress or pain. Marky, for all his training as a therapist, seems to want to promote avoidance type behavior instead of encouraging his patients to become self-actualized themselves. He wants people to be self-possessed, but when confronted with any kind of hardship, he simply wants them to ditch any struggle in pursuit of their dreams. As for those who cannot conform to the standard Marky is set, they're sent to the council room to be treated. Of course, the treatment room Marky calls for doesn't have any kind of snacks. Rather, it involves striving these golden brain-like headset helmets to the heads of the mentally discontent, the undesirables of his society, and utterly brainwashing them into thinking positive thoughts. This gets more and more horrifying as we continue onward on this floor and through the rest of his palace. So Marky's patients are really strapped down and bound to tables as their minds are actually being overwritten. Right in the middle of the therapy room is a small space infested with red shadows. In that room, we can hear people screaming. We come across another entry from Marky's diary here that puts another dent in the horrors that we witnessed. Marky seems to be aware of just how dangerous cognitive science is, but yet is willing to ignore the dangers of it all. He laments that his current limitation isn't just funding, but a lack of willing test subjects. It's clear that this is where he seemingly lost his mind. We'll have a quite the eerie feeling as we move towards the final level's palace. 
the corridor of twilight as we traverse this floor we find a note dated march 25th and reading more into it it's about marcus counseling session with samire his jehovah complex is on full display here and comes into play as he reveals his true intent behind what brainwashing samire instead of pulling out his training as a therapist Marky arrogantly uses his powers to alter samire's cognition so greatly he's totally willing to ignore samire's wishes for healing and ignore all notions of therapeutic processes to see her in the right direction just to prove that his method of treatment would work on her it's utterly monstrous and while the implications of everything we've been over are disturbing enough we can see that Marky's cognition doesn't just manifest its sorrow itself. Instead, there's an air of spite mixed in with his distorted sadness that has turned him into a tyrannical madman that intends to punish all those who defy him. As we detailed earlier, this palace is supposed to be a place of healing, but of course, that's only a surface level interpretation. In the background, and when the darker recesses of Marky's mind, there exists a much more insidious motivation for making the world a happier place, by force if necessary. All we need to do is merely examine the movesets, dispositions, and origin of the various shadows we encounter within this palace. First of all, the shadows here and within Marcus' new version of Mementos are incredibly disturbing. They're all secret monsters who appear to be humanoid at first, but if they detect the party failing to sneak about, they'll all chase after us at erratically alarming fast speeds. While the shadows that we encounter on the first couple floors seem to be somewhat humanoid and kind of normal, the ones in the warehouse are the worst of this, with one variant scrolling towards you on all fours with its limbs flailing about. <laughs> true form. Well, another variant of this type of shadow, which looks like a humanoid version of a woman in a dress, spawns a giant maw with sharp teeth to gnaw at you as it ambushes you. I'll reveal your true form. This would give any bog standard resident evil enemy a run for its money, but the horror doesn't stop there. Almost all the shadows we encounter in battle have spells and attacks that drain HP or SP and inflict status ailments or negative stat changes such as fear, despair, debilitate, and brainwash. <laughs> Shit, they brainwashed me. Let's oh, destroy my, my enemies. enemies. No, I am not brainwashed. The fact that so many of the shadows we encounter in this palace concern themselves with attacking or modifying the very emotions the party feels tells us much about the deeper recesses of Marky's cognition. All of them seem to indicate that he's actually not interested in healing people as much as Marky is interested in causing mental discontent among everyone he encounters, all in an effort to force us to submit to his false reality. The types of elemental attacks that the shadows utilize as well are disturbing too, ranging from side attacks like Saladine to instant curse skills like Ghastly Whale to some of the shadows being able to learn variants of almighty skills like Megadolion. This is not bode well for the state of Marky's cognition. Even more so when we consider that despite the clean white appearance of his palace and how Marky faces himself to be humanity's savior, none of the shadows we encounter utilize blessed attacks. In fact, out of the 15 shadows we encounter in Marky's palace, four of them are weak to blessed attacks, one of them is resistant to them, and two completely nullify the damage. If we compare this to curse attacks, six shadows nullify this damage type, one is resistant against it, and two are weak against it. Dark forces are at work in Marky's palace, and if we look specifically at these shadows, we can see why. Firstly, some of the shadows here are a bit on the nose, such as Chimera, but we need not concern ourselves with the beast itself. We only need to concern ourselves with the manner in which the monster is an imaginary one composed of various parts, and depending on who you ask, in the English vernacular, Chimera is a noun that means an unrealizable dream, illusion, or fabrication of the mind. Fitting for Marky's palace for the double meaning of this monster, but along with a seemingly harmless shadow, within Marky's palace, we find several demons in charge of Hell's legions, such as Nibodos, the Inspector General and Fear Marshal of the Armies of Hell. It's bad enough to find actual demons mustering the strength for a hostile takeover of the world, but the other shadows we encounter give a much clearer idea of Marky's headspace here too. We encounter shadows like Bugbear, a type of goblin from Welsh folklore that eats children who don't listen to the parents, the Haitian spirit Loa, which can resurrect and zombify people with dark voodoo magic, and Belial, the same demon that led Jesus to his death, caused the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and often takes pleasure in deceiving others by taking the form of a kindly angel. In more esoteric religious texts, such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, Belial is said to be the opposite of God, with his mere presence around humans bringing guilt and wickedness upon them. Setting those aside for a minute, the first shadow, Joker, Morgana, and Sumir encounter on October 3rd takes its form as Biaki. Before Joker adds us to his arsenal and his true name is revealed, its name is Evil Synthetic Organism. It's pretty overt, but considering this persona finds its place within the Cthulhu mythos, as a messenger of agent of Hastur, the Yellow King and half-brother of Cthulhu, it makes its presence as Marquis Palace even more ominous. Marky's palace literally incorporates aspects of Lovecraftian horror within it. Within the Cthulhu mythos, it is said that a singular Bayaki will be able to take anybody within any kind of universe. 
with the cost, of course, being their own sanity. This, of course, leads us right to the next shadow of catching Jork and Kenner while fighting Marky to a stalemate over Samire, Hastur himself. Its depiction in the game matches how it's described in the mythos as a black, shriveled, flying monstrosity with tentacles tipped with rich and sharp talents. Hastur is also rumored able to take these talents to pierce the victim's skull and siphon out its brains to drive them utterly insane with forbidden knowledge as it steals their intellect in tandem. Of course, it knows spells that make this task easier like Evil Touch, Death Scythe, and Bloodbath, but this persona actually has an exclusive almighty attack called Abyssal Eye. It's essentially an upgraded version of Megadolion, but with some added cosmic horror implications. <laughs> As if that wasn't damning enough, Hauster, like the other shadows, is extremely hostile to all those who infiltrate Marky's palace. However, instead of calling intruders like Sumeria a heretic or attempting to dissuade her by warning her of pain outside the test track, Hester, after being summoned by Maraki, immediately tries to force the Joker and Akechi to forcibly submit as he moves to attack us. <laughs> well, I do apologize for the lack of footage here. Hester also says these things upon casting certain spells. Of course, it's very telling about Maraki's cognition when he tells Joker and Akechi to fear him when he uses evil touch and says no mercy when using abyssal eye and refers to Joker and Akechi as insects for afflicting him with a debuff. At the beginning and the end of this fight, Hustler will also say this to us. Stubborn rejecting our lord. No, such pathetic attempts will be enough. Within his heart of hearts and amidst all his sorrow, Marky deems all who reject a solution to all pain to be needlessly stubborn morons and insects barely worth noticing. These lines only occur during this fight and we rightfully assume that Marky's cognition in that moment determines how each shadow acts and behaves. Marky does want to submit to his false reality and while he might deny it, he will resort to tyrannical force if necessary. If we squint just a bit more, we merely find that this world and his palace are nothing more than a gilded cage. Indeed, this place is a prison much in the same way that the prison of regression was while Yao's mouth was his warden. The main difference here is that it's just a more pleasant prison. There's more to be said here about the way Marcus Palace takes his form as well, and how it contrasts the way that the Death's Mementos is arranged too. Within Gnostic theology, there exists two opposite concepts to deal with the viewpoints of strict asceticism and of cosmological dualism. Gnostic believe in material existence to be flawed or even evil, and instead of dealing with concepts such as repenting for one's sins, they believe that true enlightenment comes from dispelling illusions of the material world through knowledge of how materialism affects humanity. This theme of cosmic duality is representative of the tree of life and the human experience for all of its imperious and most chaste of qualities, of which are expressed through something called the Sephiroth and the Quiploth. Both forms be with the cognitive conscious and the levels of human emotion, but Gnostics argue that in order to understand the divine and being eligible for salvation, one must understand all these spiritual emotions to experience the spiritual world and then escape the material one. The Quipoth, represented by the matter of Mementos itself as arranged, means the Tree of Evil and acts as a shell for humanity to prevent them from accessing the knowledge the Tree of Life will bequeath to them in order to reach salvation, the Sephiroth's Enlightenment. The Quipoth is a sick and twisted parody of the mechanism that Gnostics use to achieve Gnosticism, knowledge and salvation to the light of God that is bequeathed through possessing certain knowledge. Comparing this to Christianity, in order for one to reach salvation as a Christian, you must gain the grace of God through pious action and through performing good works. In Gnostic theology though, merely possessing knowledge of the divine to be spiritual is enough to become equal with God and thus be saved. It's accurate to say that as the tree of life shines bright, it too will cast a shadow that represent the opposite of itself being that of the Quiploth. But ascending through mementos, we see how such a thing will manifest. The thieves are not ascending to heaven as we work to seek enlightenment. Rather, we are descending down a reverse of the tree of life to a prison that is ruled by a false god that seeks to rob humanity of all knowledge and potential growth as they give up the ability to think for themselves. As we descend further and further down mementos, each path and flow mementos represents certain parts of the quiploth that corresponds to the absence of certain human emotions and thought processes that exist within the human psyche. As a ruler of the palace of the public, Yaldabaoth has effectively hit the tree of light and the very concept of Nazi enlightenment from humanity, with each floor representing certain parts of their cognition and reasoning that he has stolen from them. Within the purview of this prison, they all give up free will and thus stagnate under the yoke of this false god, Yaldabaoth. Now, understanding where and how Yaldabaoth fits into Marquis' cognition is important as well. So, allow me to explain how Mementos and Yaldabaoth fashioning himself as the role of humanity's collective unconscious and his connection to Maruki is important. Within Gnostic scripture, Yaldabaoth's mother, Sophia, exiled from the spiritual divine panomer for desiring to create something out of the material world instead of that of the spiritual divine one, ended up creating a monstrosity of imperfections full of pride and malevolence. This creation was Yaldabaoth, and in her shame, Sophia created a great cloud around the Demiurge and built a throne. Having no knowledge of the spiritual reality outside of this cloud, 
Yadavoth concluded that there was nothing else beyond the material world and claimed that it was the creator of all things. Ignorant of the greater divinities outside this cloud, Sophia had made for him, Yadavoth exclaimed, I am a jealous god and no other god exists besides me. It was quite the claim and this is where Gnostic theology gets rather interesting when compared to that of the Christian or Jewish faith. Gnostics believe that the manner in which Yadavoth created the universe offers an explanation why the god of the Old Testament is so wrathful, harsh, and unforgiving. It offers an explanation as to why Yadavoth ordered Abraham to kill his son to prove his piety, and why God goes on a rampage in Egypt in an attempt to show his might via smiting all the non-believers. Yadavoth cannot fathom that there is any other divine being but himself, because, well, he's a jealous and ignorant moron, a being that perpetually remains uncognizant of the realm outside of the one that was created for him. God is the one who creates the world! It was all an attempt to make an order of the chaos of the cloud he was born within, as he intended to snare humanity forever with this cheaply made copy of the spiritual world. Funny that we mention this, Persona 5 actually depicts this fairly well with Yadabath fusing mementos with reality, thus creating the Quiploth world. All that to say, Yadabath's ignorant and shaky understanding of the universe is actively robbing humanity of the divine knowledge they need for true salvation, and in order to reach it, one must break free of Yadabath's cognitive prison and interpret reality very differently. In essence, you must seek knowledge about the divine spiritual world and not let some mechanical monstrosity think for you. This, more or less, is the general mission of the Phantom Thieves. This is where another deviation from the standard Christian creation myth occurs. We've known Joker and his various personas to fancy themselves as Dark Messiahs. Arson and Joker are gentlemen thieves who only steal from truly heinous criminals, but in Gnostic theology, the creation story paints Adam and Eve as eating from the tree of knowledge as a good thing. It enables them to see that the garden that they live within is totally fake, and of course, the person or being that encourages them to do so is the serpent, Satan, or should I say in this case, Satanio. The difference here lies in the suffix of his name as to denote his angelic status and to say that Satan, like other angels, is of God. Of course, the Seraphist serpent, Satan, is often painted as the bad guy in most theological versions of the tale of Genesis as a fallen angel, one who betrays God, but here in the Gnostic myth, he is the unequivocal good guy here in betraying God and thus giving humanity free will, the ability to think for themselves, and the ability to commune with the spiritual world, the world outside the material one that Yaldabaoth has created. The rest of the myth follows suit, but in this version, Yaldabaoth binds Adam and Eve's very souls to his own material world, with both of them being expelled from the Garden of Eden. Still though, despite being expelled and having the toil as mortals within a cold and uncaring world, they know within their own heart of hearts that it's fake, and while communing with the spiritual world outside of Yadavoth's reality will be difficult, it is still possible to accept Denial's actions. Through coaxing Adam and Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit, something growing from the tree of knowledge itself, the first humans gained the understanding that the god they've been shackled to was false, and they carried this knowledge with them even after their expulsion from the Garden of Eden. As for Satanile, he is the unsung hero of the story for calling bullshit on Yadavoth's jealous rule. Of course, Yadavoth cannot let this transgression stand, so he's deemed to be the fallen angel of the story. All that to say, this is why Joker, after harnessing the masses world to rebel against Yaldabaoth at the end of the vanilla content of the game, is able to summon Satanile himself to shoot Yaldabaoth in the head. It is no coincidence that humanity is given a new lease on life on Christmas Eve as well, after Joker stands in from the clutches of a malevolent god, but of course, we know how Marky to contend with. Immediately after Yaldabaoth was defeated, Marky managed to create an entirely new layer of mementos that for all intents and purposes, is made to be the juxtaposition of Mementos' own Quiploth world. Instead of stretching down, it stretches upwards, stretching all the way from the depths of Mementos into Marcus' palace itself, mimicking the tree of life itself, the Sephiroth. Knowing Marcus believes his methods to mean utter salvation itself, his cognition in the way his palace is formed as what is essentially a giant mechanical tree cannot be ignored here. This is especially the case when we consider that the name Marcus is a new section of Mementos, the Path of Da'at. When translated from Hebrew, it means knowledge and more specifically, the perfection of the understanding of divine knowledge. Within the Sephiroth, this is the point where all the conscious emotions of humans coalesce, be they from the light-bearing Sephiroth or its negative shadow, the Quiploth. It is all facets of human knowledge and emotions united into one single pot of knowledge to then be used for spiritual reflection and analysis. However, despite its presentation in Persona 5 as a more clean and hospitable section on the Quiploth part of Mementos, we can see that it can often take on a double meaning on both sides of the tree of life and death. Indeed, the Path of Da'ath is a door to both versions of the trees, but at times, if this part of the Kabbalah is misunderstood, it can block passages to other sections of the divine tree, blocking the very idea of Gnosis itself. Most who are trapped here in the search for Gnosis tend to think that the notion of knowledge is an end in of itself. When curiosity changes to greed for knowledge, one loses the actual intent of one's spiritual journey and then gets caught in the Ivory Tower of Secret Information. In Persona 5 Royal and within the Kabbalah, the path of Da'at is representative of knowledge that can't be brought about to be reunified with life. It merely exists in a vacuum by itself, and even the Quiploth of Da'at can take the opposite shape and present itself as the contempt and demise of knowledge itself. 
Ideally, this floor mementos is supposed to represent Marcus' knowledge of the spiritual world and of everyone's collective cognition. But in creating this pathway, representing both these concepts and tying them back to the same mechanisms that Yal is about to use to rule over humanity from the Quipoth world, we can see that he doesn't understand anything. Even if we do consider this path of mementos and his palace to be pathways to his cognitive version of the Tree of Life, with his connection to the Arma Mementos itself, and finally, to mark his abstraction the Garden of Eden in its topmost area, the presence of the surveillance network he created within this area indicates that he intends to use the knowledge he gained by taking over mementos, his ascension into the very idea of godhood, as a way to oppress humanity further. Furthermore, while his palace may resemble the tree of life is nonetheless still mechanical and artificial unlike nominal religious faiths here where no mortal may surpass or become equal with god gnosticism lets mortals become equal to god via the sephiroth's enlightenment symbolizing how its ruler is more or less a mortal who is descended into a god though the ten floors of the marcus palace are supposed to be indicative of the gnostic enlightenment humanity achieves when passing through the tree of life itself the man who faces himself a god is not a true god but one who stole power from the divine for his own means and intends to make humanity of one singular mind it is perfectly fitting for Marky to be a delusional savior when this context of his palace being filled. Especially when we consider that most of the shadows that we encounter here are straight out of the bowels of hell itself, and apart from that, consists of Lovecraftian abominations, heretical deities, and Nordic folk heroes. The salvation that Marky offers is driven by his own fear of pure existential nihilism too. He is so overcome with despair and desire for everything to stop hurting that he is conflating his own beliefs that a painless reality is the same thing as a happy one. The end result of Marky's reality is the exact same as Yalabas malevolent rule, but without all of the Viscera of Mementos. Apathy is death indeed. Marky believes that his sole purpose after taking great pains to understand how the human heart can be changed is to not push humanity as a whole towards enlightenment, but to selfishly use that enlightenment for his own game. So here's a question for you all. Do you still believe that Marky is a misunderstood and benevolent villain? Well, in the interest of stuffing on the memory of the fan of from the public's mind, allow me to present you with what happens if Joker fails to secure a patch of the treasure before the deadline. Isn't tomorrow when we meet with Dr. Maruki? We couldn't secure our route to the treasure in time. To think we'd have this much trouble. Not entirely certain, but I wonder if our problems that we really can't deny Dr. Maroki's reality. Mako chan. <sighs> hey, don't be all down like that. Come on, say something. <sighs> At any rate, tomorrow's the day, right? We'll be speaking with Dr. Maruki, regardless of the answer. She's right. We just have to reach a decision by tomorrow. Let's call it a day for now. Seems like you can't reach a decision. In all honesty, I really wanted you to accept my gift of your own free will, but I see that demanding a decision from you is only making you suffer. That was never my intention, so don't worry. There's no need to obsess over it anymore. I'll bring you your happiness. Pleasant dreams for as many days or years as you may have. Despite all the Marquis' musings about wanting to come to terms with Joker and being willing to let him steer his heart in a fair fight, Marquis would not only fight dirty, 
but will do insidious things to Joker if he fails to meet him in battle on time. Morgan uses his powers not to kill Joker, but to put him in a comatose state for the rest of his life. Or still, Marky, once again, wrongly interprets Joker's inability to make a decision as him as Joker's suffering. There are an inordinate amount of reasons why we failed to meet the deadline here, but for Marky to interject and force this reality upon Joker is not only downright evil, but also incredibly hypocritical of him too. He has such an aversion to dealing with conflict or harming anybody, that instead of mercy killing Joker, or having him arrested like all the other missed deadline endings, he robs Joker of the free will to think for himself, and puts Joker into an eternal sleep. It's a fate worse than death itself, and for humanity, the world is forever sealed off from the Velvet Room. These services of Lovenza and Igor are no longer required, as it's now impossible to nurture the human spirit. Within Marky's Lawful reality. That's just it too. His solution for humanity is the same as Yaldabaoth's. Morky's answer to pain and tragedy itself is indeed sloth. His reality is the very meaning of utter stagnation as his quest to control how people live their lives, striving to make everyone exist in a state of utter happiness on an even playing field, he's only concerned with an abstract definition of happiness. Not what an individual deems to be true happiness, but what Marky considers to be a happy life for them. In dooming everyone into this false reality, Marky has removed the very aspect of struggling itself. Everyone will stay trapped within his reality and fulfill the role he's predetermined for them to exist within society. They'll never be able to change themselves, leave or pursue a new dream, or learn from their mistakes. Society won't ever improve or change. It will just stay the same forever. It's the end of all stories, of all meaningful experiences. People will stay trapped in their predetermined roles and never experience anything new. Nothing will ever challenge them or their views. While Marky is indeed fighting for humanity's happiness, the Fanathies, consequently, choose to fight for the future of humanity, free of Marky's aims to suffer a collective growth through stagnation. Knowing the stakes of what happens if we either accept or lose to the screw stricken man, we have no choice but to fight him. As we scale his artificial tree of knowledge, we find the man at the top of the center of paradise itself. Within that, we discover Marky's sense rebellion along with the name and form of his persona. Thank you for coming. It looks like I have your answer. That's good to hear. Now. Let's begin. If you win, my heart will be changed. However, if I win, my reality becomes the true reality. I will overwrite all of existence with my own cognition. I'm not holding back anymore. W what the? Just as you have your own beliefs, I too have no intention of changing my plans for reality. No matter what happens to me in the end, I will fix this torturous world. That is my own rebellion. His apparel just... And I believe you called forth your power like this. Persona. He really does have a persona. I'd regret not pointing this out to you. You shouldn't mistake our powers as being equal. It's time, Azathoth. Our final battle has come. My persona guides me. Dr. Maruki. I have to do this. Incoming, guys. Get ready. Outside the ordered universe is that amorphous blight in nethermost confusion, which blasphemes and bubbles near the center of all infinity. The boundless daemon sultan, Azathoth, whose name no lips dare speak aloud, and who gnaws hungrily at the inconceivable, unlightened chambers beyond time and space amidst the muffled, maddening beating of vile drums and the thin, monotonous whine of accursed flutes. Enter Marky's persona, 
Azathoth. And indeed, this Azathoth is of Lovecraftian lore, which then would explain much about Marky's powers and his vice grip on this false reality. The most powerful god in Lovecraftian mythos, Azathoth is said to reside in the exact center of the universe where a court of lesser gods dance continuously around him in an effort to keep him asleep. Azathoth is said to be the creative god of the whole universe, but is a blind idiot and within most everything that it creates, including Earth and humanity, was created by him as a simple accident. Later authors that would then add to the HP Lovecraft mythos concerning Azathoth himself would then add that all of reality as we know it is actually Azathoth's dream, and should he ever awake, all the universe would end as a result. Of course, within that, we can see that as Marky's persona, he's able to engulf the entirety of reality and control all of its aspects in the cognitive world. In fact, we can actually see this firsthand. All the wires we saw running into Mementos and around Marky's palace are actually Azathoth's tentacle things. The entire palace, including the way that it resembles the Sephiroth and the Tree of Life, is literally made up of Azathoth's body. This, in turn, will lend us the notion that the Tree of Life that Azathoth has created is merely a cheap replication of the real thing. The salvation that Azathoth and Marky are offering the collective unconscious is totally fake. It's synthetic. Beyond that though, in Lovecraftian lore, Azathoth is often given the moniker of the blind idiot god. He is one with no sense or sight. In the stories it's featured in, Azathoth mindlessly creates things, which is to say, like Marky himself, he is both ignorant of the consequences of his actions and stupid enough not to attempt to understand them. But nevertheless, he persists in his creation of everything. Lavenza mentioned that Marky immediately took over Riala's power vacuum, and through corrupting the cognition of the masses, this is how Azathoth became another demiurge, or false god, much like the god of control once was. We've known Yaldabaoth to be an ignorant and jealous god, but we never had a blind idiot god before. But now we have to deal with the consequences of everyone living with Azathoth's dream. We're now fighting a Lovecraftian horror that, unlike Yaldabaoth, possesses the very powers to create, but is thoroughly disinterested in nurturing humanity or acting wise. While Yaldabaoth desires to manipulate the masses and accepting that chaos is the natural way of things, the mindless and oblivious Azathoth is chaos incarnate due to how it accidentally creates things. It simply exists and does what it wants with its power regardless of human morality. When taking everything we said into account about Marky using Azathoth's power to synthetically create the Tree of Life, we can now say that the Demiurge, who thinks himself to be a savior, that sits at the top of the tree, is unequivocally offering false divine knowledge. With Marky's help, the blind way he creates things and traps people in the yoke of his dream gives Marky the power to save people by driving them utterly insane. Of course, the manner in which Azathoth saves people is morally obtuse and unproductive. For example, instead of merely erasing the memory of Kasumi's death and the murder of Rumi's parents from Sumeri and Rumi, Azathoth chooses to completely erase the entire aspect of both of their memories and essentially change them into completely different people. It's the ultimate monkey's paw. Marky achieves the results that he wants, but his own persona and spirits of rebellion, being totally unconcerned with actual human morality and ethics, plows his way through properly treating them. As the thought that Marky are blind to the end results of their actions, but still persist in helping people the only way they know how. Any sane person would have immediately stopped tapping into Azathoth's power upon seeing the results of brainwashing the fiance into being a completely different person. But nevertheless, Marky persists. What a fitting persona for a well winning moron with a savior complex, but it doesn't stop there. As you fight him, we notice that Marky hasn't decided to go out just yet. Upon observing a few things about the design of his persona and a Marky's outfit, we can glean more information about Marky himself. We talked about how Azathoth's synthetic design basically envelops the entirety of the Tree of Knowledge, one that he created, mind you, but we can see here that it takes the form of a rotten tree like organism with a golden bone plating acting as its center body. This represents that it festers ignorance among humanity and makes it nothing more than metaphorical husks. Its tree like form foreshadows this to great effect. One interpretation is that knowing that each Persona user gives their own Personas its shape and form, Azathoth could be a more warped version of a Catechus, a symbol commonly associated with medical practitioners like Maruki. Despite all, Maruki's spiritual rebellion still goes off the veneer of a healer to such extent that his will of rebellion is able to warp a Lovecraftian monstrosity's appearance into something more tangible. We then, of course, come to Maruki's outfit. While it might be simplistic and evoke the image of a righteous savior or priest, I believe it's another Lovecraft reference here. More specifically, given Marky's place as a pseudo godlike being at the top of a tree of life with Azathoth augmenting his powers, it wouldn't be too far fetched to assume that Marky's outfit is a reference to the King in Yellow. The playbook that bears the same name, written by Robert W. Chambers, details how the King himself is almost certainly an eldritch horror. His nature, modus and modus operandi, are totally unclear, but he occasionally appears on Earth, animating dead bodies, possessing those already enthralled to him, and claiming or reclaiming those who previously eluded him. We already see some allusions to Marky here, but the main draw of the play is the urban legend that if you read the play itself, you are then exposed to the king and are able to fall under his influence, going mad in the meantime as you read it. The true malice of the king in yellow is how it seems to be both present within the reality inhabited by the characters of the story and of the fictional setting of the play itself. To read the play or participate in his showing is to open your mind to the king's influence. 
One part of the story called the yellow sign, the king comes to claim one of the characters, the narrator, Mr. Scott. The passage goes as follows. The gate below opened and shut and a crept shake into my door and bolted it. But I knew no bolts, no locks could keep the creature of who was coming for the yellow sign. And now I heard him moving very softly along the hall. Now he was at the door and the bolts rotted his touch. Now he had entered. With eyes starting from my head, I peered into the darkness, but when he came into the room, I did not see him. It was only when I felt him envelop me in this cold, soft grass that I cried out and struggled with deadly fury, but my hands were useless. I knew that the king in yellow had opened his tattered mantle and that there was only God to cry to now. Mr. Scott was unable to escape his fate. The king appears to him in the church and the last thing he hears is the king whisper, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Mr. Scott is then transported to Carcosa, which depending on how you interpret the place, is a desolate eldritch city, either on another planet or within another universe entirely. The passages that describe the city from the play are as follows. Along the shore, the cloud waves break. The twin suns sink behind the lake. The shadows lengthen in Carcosa. Strange is the night where black stars rise and strange moons circle through the skies. But stranger still is Las Carcosa. Songs that the Hades shall sing will flap the tatters of the king. Most die unheard in dim Carcosa. Song of my soul, my voice is dead. Die thou unsung as my tears unshed. Thou shall dry and die in Las Carcosa. Frightening stuff. An allusion to Marky acting as the king in yellow here, reanimating the dead, overriding their cognition, and becoming enthralled in his false reality, and forcing deviants like the Fanathies to accept his own version of Carcosa, his false reality, are there. Considering that we've also encountered Haster and Biaki as shadows of the Marquis Palace too, with the former being a reinterpretation of the king himself, and the latter being a messenger servant of the king in yellow, the creepy cosmic horror factor Marquis Palace just got maxed out too. However, even as we defeat Azathoth, Marquis isn't about to give up just yet. So, this is it. This place is collapsing! We'd better take our leave. For me. I'm sorry. I couldn't. No, I... I can still... Joker, look out! Damn it! We gotta book it! Guys, jump in! That was close. Dr. Marky. This has gone too far past changing someone's heart. Is he even still alive? Looks like that isn't a concern. Sorry, but I won't admit defeat just yet. I'm sorry. You know I can't do that. I've been chosen by the world itself. Granting this wish is my responsibility. The hell? Uh, he just... the treasure! his persona such strength of will if it is for everyone's happiness I don't care what happens to me 
Don't resist. Accept it. With my power. No. With mine and Adam Cadmon's together. Our reality is nigh! Persona guides me. Refuse to let it end like this. Adam Cadmon, guide us all to our ideal reality. You're wrong. Yeah, we refuse to let it end any other way, too. Persona! Enter the second evolution of Marquis Persona, Adam Cadmon. In Gnostic theology, Adam Cadmon was the earliest version, the primordial prototype of what man might be if he was untainted by earthly matter. It is a synthetic replication of the real version of Adam, and as a matter of fact, this version of Adam was created by Yaltabaoth himself. Indeed, the Persona the Marquis wields is an Adam of Eden, but an inauthentic one created from the combination of the stolen cognition of the masses, Marquis' will of rebellion, and Azathoth himself. In this context, in the Sephiroth itself, Adam Cadmon represents the divine will that motivated all creation to come into existence. He himself is the embodiment of Gnosis, and is the most pure form of divine knowledge, an immaterial template for salvation composed purely of divine energy. Yadabath would of course try to make the book of Genesis run its course within his own false reality, by then trying to make his own version of Adam, which would then lend us to the notion that Adam Cadmon is just another demiurge like Yadabath. This time though, it's a persona, but that's not the point of why Cadmon is Marky's persona. To Marky, his own role of rebellion and the power of what his treasure represents, has managed to manifest what he deems to symbolize to be the most perfect human, and most importantly, the first perfect human ever to exist within his own perfect reality. It, of course, is made from the synthetic parts of a man, blind, idiotic, Lovecraftian monstrosity, to form what is essentially a giant robot, a fake imitation of the real man. Despite Marcus's insistence upon Adam Cadmon guiding us all to his ideal reality, it is still a cheap imitation of the real thing, and moreover, is born from the heart of a man who wants to avoid all manner of pain, a fundamental part of the human experience. If Asathoth who Marky really was, an apparent mad god striking out on sorrowful blindness, Adam Cadmon is who he could have been. If his sense of altruism had been blinded by his own desires, Marky could have become an ideal person to lead others into enlightenment as well. Instead, Marky stands defeated once more, but once more, he digs deeper. I still can't do it. And my reality is right before my eyes. I'm sorry. I said I didn't care what happened to me. But I guess... I wasn't committed to my words. You too, huh? Cross-Senpai, what are you... Can you tell? You think the same thing, don't you? Of course you do. After all... No, you can't! We hesitate right now. We die. But I'm all yours. Use me however you want. Now, show us the reality. The reality we wish for. <laughs> I am thou, and...
has power as the source and the destination. I will be the light that guides mankind. But we are still not going to run. We're going to beat you and go back to our own reality. That's the spirit. Now let's finish this. In this final phase of our fight with Marky, we see quite a few things have happened here. Firstly, as Samira assures us that we want out of Marky's reality, every single thief that stands by her side is truly embodying the role of the Dark Messiah. Indeed, we are mirroring the way that Satanile enlightened all of humanity by rebuking y'all about synthetic creations and desire to enslave all mankind in his ignorance. We are doing the same thing here in our fight with Maruki and Adam Kadmon. We want out of this false sense of salvation he's trying to enforce upon us now. Secondly, we see the end result of Maruki's creation of his new layer of mementos here. In creating the path of Da'at and modeling his own palace after the Sephiroth, the Tree of Life, Maruki has revealed to us that the path of Da'at, his creation in mementos, this nexus point where all good and evil Gnostic knowledge coalesces, he has lost the plot as he brews within his own sorrow. The gaining of knowledge isn't an end to one's development and growth, but within Maruki's own contempt, his ignorant understanding that suffering can in fact bequeath knowledge to others beyond measure the salvation that he and adam cadmon is offering to the fan of these and the rest of the world cannot be considered true knowledge or salvation this power is the source and the destination i will be the light that guides mankind in this final phase of his boss fight we see just how desperate mark he is to exact his reality upon the world this time he fully cuts loose this is his wrathful and desperate side showing which has samiri feeling a certain kind of way this man is not who she thought he once was his heart is too twisted by grief and sorrow. As we desperately cling for life, we remember back to the day where we came to the center of paradise to fight for her beliefs. Upon Samira's request, we visited her room in her house to talk about how she, along with Joker's help, managed to overcome the trauma of her sister's death. Samira tells us that she has invited us here because she's made a decision. In this very room, she promised Kasumi that she'll become the very best of the gymnasts in the world. She knows that, in some aspects, her life hasn't changed all that much. Her room still shares the same arrangements as Kasumi's, but with everything that's happened, it's given her some perspective on her death as well. They used to do everything together, but now she's gone. However, Samir acknowledges two things. For one, she recognizes that she's now able to talk about Kasumi's death because of the distance she's managed to put between that event and who she is now. This is good, but strangely enough, for all that Marky has done to her, she doesn't hold an ounce of ill will towards him. In fact, Samira says that she's actually grateful for Marky showing her that it is possible to carry on the memory of her sister, even if he had a roundabout way of showing it. Becoming Kasumi led Samira into becoming a part of Joker's life, and through a series of circumstances, Samira would have never been able to reconcile with her survivor's guilt and trauma. She felt lost for a time, and while Marky gave her a false purpose, it then subsequently led to Joker, who slowly guided her back into becoming comfortable being Samiri once more. Samiri, now showing the same signs of grace her sister once did, wants to inspire Maruki now. She wants to show him that it is possible for someone as grief-stricken as her to get better, to face the painful reality that Maruki wanted her and everyone else to avoid. She thinks that if Maruki sees how far Samiri has come, then that very notion might give him the strength to stand up to the injustice he suffered and grow from that pain. We've touched on how Samira recently realized that Kasumi's boldness and competitive spirit were just a roundabout means to inspire Samira to become the best that she can be. Now, at the end of her own character arc, it would seem that now Samira is willing to expand upon Kasumi's lessons to then teach Marky about tenacity itself. Within this, we can say with absolute certainty that Samira is truly carrying on the spirits of her sister. If this is everything she's gotten out of this insane roller coaster of events, she has finally become what she's always desired. She has become the very model of graciousness and splendor. Words that Samira only thought could be ascribed to her sister. But now, she vows to be the strongest Samira Yoshizawa she'll ever be, regardless of the obstacles that stand in her way. In resolving to do just that, so does this new resolve cleanse Samira's heart of all its remaining shame and cinders. This is... All right. Enter the final persona of Samira Yoshizawa, Ella. As always, the last persona each thief awakens to within the game is the assimilation of the original notions of rebellion and their new vows and lessons they've experienced as part of their confident arc. Both of these personas fuse to create something that is both familiar yet new. And with Ella, this notion is very obvious. As we unite Sandron and Vanitas, we get a persona that closely resembles Sandron, which isn't an accident. I stated before that in the original Cinderella fairy tale, Cinderella was a malicious nickname given to her by her evil stepsisters as she was forced to sleep in the ashes and soot by the fire she constantly tended to. Ella was her true name all along, as Samira's name was Samira's. 
The princess has returned from the bowl, and despite becoming destitute once more, Samira has learned what it means to be gracious and benevolent. Characteristics which are then reflected within Ella's new design. It would appear that Ella has exchanged her shades of blood red and crystalline blue glass for a pale white wedding dress, denoting the point in the fairy tale where Cinderella is due to be wed. Not because she holds a higher social station, or because she's particularly beautiful, but because she possesses a gracious heart, one that's willing to persist through all adversity. After all that suffering and teasing by her evil stepsisters for being inferior and worthless, Cinderella is being rewarded for her virtue and perseverance through all that tragedy, much in the same way that Samiri is. In addition, there exists a small but very significant detail here. Sandra's body has often appeared to be made of glass in such a way as to likely indicate that Samiri's ego and self-esteem was extremely fragile, choosing to hide behind Kasumi's instead. However, upon awakening to Ella, we see that Ella's form is more solid. Unlike Sandra, it's also pure white, indicating that Samiri will never again surrender to her doubts and has successfully overcome her guilt of her sister's death, gaining her own identity in the process instead of pretending to be her sister. Gone are the days of cowering in sinners and hoping for a better life. Through trial and tribulation and multiple instances of cognitive fuckery, Samira has finally managed to become her own person. This is truly a wonderful ending to Samira's own fairy tale character arc here. We're given the option to remove all her pain and delude herself into thinking that she's someone else, Samira learns to muster her own strength and oppose that very notion. This is Samira's spiritual rebellion, and of course, she thanks us for guiding her to this conclusion. If it wasn't for Joker's trust and guidance, she would never made it this far. But then again, so would Namaraki. Though the true reality is painful, Samira not only wants to take all that in stride, but to change the heart of the man whose sorrow has driven into such an extreme solution. But then that promise to show Maraki the true meaning of faith. Belief in others and in oneself, Samira will do just more than free herself from this fake reality. Instead, she will strive to live her own life by her own strength and means. In doing so, Sumeria will then also show Marky that it is indeed possible to leverage one's pain to grow, and that it is wrong to rob others of the ability to do the same. I won't fail. I can't fail. Joshi's our son. That pain you're suffering, it must be impossible to move on. I want to save you from that awful life. I am myself. I'll never forget that again. And within that, it's time to take back reality. So sit back, relax, and pump that jam! We've come this far! We ain't gonna give up! Yeah! You gotta do way better than this! Don't underestimate our tenacity! It's just another threat! We'll overcome it like we always do! If I run now, I know I'll regret it! for ourselves what we want our lives to be i'm a bit occupied so do your goddamn job oracle how does it look perfect his head's defense level has dropped down to zero percent go for it finish this joker up everything else I dedicated all that I have to this but I still why I'm running from <laughs> you nailed it it's true that I turned my back on the original reality but where's the harm in that when it grows to be too much too painful! Every person deserves to escape that! <sighs> In all honesty, it's best for a person's growth when they tackle their own hardships. But reality doesn't always make that so feasible! No matter how much you try, or work for so long, the smallest injustice can wipe it all out, leave you with nothing! Don't you of all people understand that? Oh, 
You know, there probably are plenty of people who'd ultimately benefit from your reality. But what about the people who want to take on the world themselves? How is it right to rob them of their opportunities? I don't think what you're saying is wrong either, Dr. Maruki. Some people want to run from their pain and cling to some other version of reality, like I used to. But the knowledge I gained through that pain and my desire to move on, those are even more precious to me. And I won't let anyone take them from me again. <gasps> Yoshizawa-san. So you truly don't want it, huh? Looks like I'm totally finished. trapped as well huh? is there any way everyone get over here hurry <clears throat> Helicopter. If you could do this, then say so, damn it! Well, I didn't know! Now I'm downright priceless to the Phantom Thieves. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt your little moment of triumph, but couldn't you have made yourself just a bit larger? <laughs> hey, where'd Joker go? Don't worry. Sorry to cut your flight short like that. This place is done for, along with the entire reality I dreamed of. I... have lost. Even if I were to try that fight over, I'm sure I'd only lose again. So I know, this is going to sound pretty stupid. I've been holding this all in for so long just hiding it for myself. So, please, help me kill every last one of my regrets. You're the only one I can ask to help me with this. The disappearance of my palace, of the entire metaverse, is drawing near. Seems like neither of us can summon our personas anymore. Let's begin. I 
I gave up everything! Everything! So why? Reality where no one suffers. done. I get it now. All thanks to you. I'm done. Please, let go of my hand. Your eyes are as bright and honest as ever. You keep your head up no matter what. I must have always been afraid. Afraid you and I wouldn't wish for the same reality. With the defeat of Maraki, the painless reality he has crafted for the rest of the world and for the Phantom Thieves collapses, along with the events that Maraki has modified in order to attempt to guarantee the happiness of the Thieves and the rest of the world. As Stroker wakes up in the Velvet Room, Lavenza spells it out for us. Time itself cannot be rewound, but every past event will revert to the event that should have occurred instead. All the happy events Stroker and the Thieves have experienced post-Christmas Eve and after the defeat of Yaldsmouth were all fake events, created by Maraki for the sake of the Thieves' happiness. In this true reality, Akechi seems to have perished within Shido's palace, and thus, Joker had to cooperate with Sai in his stead in order to prove Shido's guilt. Under advice from Sai as well, he was to turn himself into the police not only to make sure that she could close the cases around Shido, but to also protect his teammates from the monstrous Hydra that is Shido's remaining inner circle, who might indeed turn to fabricated crime and move to arrest not only Joker, but his teammates. With Joker in prison, the metaverse gone, and Sai is still struggling to get a case for Shido due to the public still being somewhat apathetic, it all seems rather hopeless to prove Joker's innocence. Still though, it's not as if the fan of these are powerless. Though this reality is harsh and painful, everyone sitting here at LeBlanc realizes that they become better people as a result of experiencing that pain and rising above it. If Joker takes the fall for Shido after everything they've accomplished, then we truly fail in our promise to Maraki to live and die by our own power. We all decided to live our real lives and look to the future from here. But even so... I... I just can't accept Senpai being stuck behind bars. Why don't we try to help him somehow? Nice. I'm impressed with the idea. The fate of these convened for one last heist to see their justice through. This time, instead of stealing the hearts of evil doors with their personas within the metaverse, they like to lean on the power of the people the leader has inspired, Joker's confidants. 
to prove the leader's innocence through proving the strength of his character. This is the final act of justice for the fan of Thieves of Hearts. Life will change once again for the people of Japan, not through staff power their personas in the metaverse, but as a result of Thieves' own strength of character and the hardships they've experienced over the course of the game. Ever so eager to repay Joker's benevolence for teaching her how to be herself again and instructing her in the ways of justice, Samira tries to pull strings to free us as well. Please, he doesn't belong in juvenile detention at all. I swear I'll make up for the missed practice. Please, let me take just a short break. Uh, coach? No deal. But, I've got a few connections up my own sleeve that'll probably be more useful than simply doing your own legwork. I'll also try calling around to check if any of my other trainees have some useful info. But if I do this for you, it means you're continuing practice as scheduled, got it? I'm sure it's what he'd want for you too. Thank you so much, coach! Thanks to the efforts of Samiri, our friends, and our confidants, Joker's able to be freed from Juvie. We managed to harness the power of the masses to free someone from unjust persecution. This time, all without our personas. And as Sojo comes to pick us up from Juvie, the fan of Thieves are left to, unfortunately, grapple with the fact that in about a month, Joker's leaving back for his hometown. But nevertheless, the fan of Thieves and the resident depressed gymnast aim to make the best memories they possibly can with the remaining time. Come on, everyone's back together. It's time to celebrate. <laughs> I guess you really were hungry. Oh, and that wasn't you? Sorry about that. Oh, it was Sumire. Sojiro will be back soon. Just hang in there. Though spending time with our friends is great and all, there is someone among us who wants Joker's eyes to focus more on her specifically. Despite her schedule being busy with practice, she has to compete on the world stage after all. Siri makes a point to stop by the blonde on Valentine's Day. Good evening. I didn't know you were still working. Sorry for stopping by so late. Oh, uh, you should have just told me. Here, I'll leave the store to you. Enjoy yourselves. That's considerate of him. I hope I'm not imposing. I know I already saw you before, but I really wanted to have some time with you today. So I thought I'd stop by on the way home from practice. On this night, there's something different about Samiri, and upon closer inspection, it would seem that Samiri has become a bit more confident. Sure, her vocal inflection is still a bit blunted, but it's very much improved from when we first found out she was Samiri indeed. In addition, the way she carries herself and the way that Samiri has, has accessorized herself indicates that her depression has gotten a little bit better too. Instead of wearing that oversized homely coat and scarf combo, Samiri has finally summoned the energy for self-care and the ability to accessorize herself. Samiri now wears Kasumi's bold winter red coat and has managed to summon the energy to put her hair up in a bow. However, an important distinguishing change here is that Samiri wears a green and yellow plaid bow instead of Kasumi's red one. This is both super important and super cool. Samiri is indeed doing a lot better. Within that sentiment, she seemingly is also able to stand as confidently as her sister did. Granted, this is just Atlas recycling her animations as Kasumi, but the fact that Samiri herself went through this whole character arc where her body language changed only for Samiri to again arrive back here as a more outgoing and extroverted version of herself is no accident. This is character growth, pure and simple. And as Sojo leads us to it, we find that unlike her other romanceable characters, Samira is totally understanding of why we decided to turn ourselves in. She would be the one not to question our judgment or worry about us at all. That and the fact that over the course of the game, Samira has shown signs of being utterly infatuated with Joker. So much so that she suddenly lost the urge to worry about what could have happened. <laughs> Same here. I had so much I was going to say once I finally got to talk to you. But now that you're here and I can see your face for myself, None of it seems so important anymore. It's alright. I understand why you did what you did. Instead, she chooses to give us something special for Valentine's Day. I brought you something. It's chocolate, since it's Valentine's Day today. She gives Joker handmade chocolate and a teddy bear. Oh my god, it's so cute! It's adorable and a fitting gift from Okohai. But of course, smira has got a lot more in her mind than just that. Just checking, but we're back in the real world, right? Oh, I wanted to say, Senpai, I... Ever since that day, I've finally been living for myself, as myself. And from now on, I always will. Uh, so, um, 
May I sit next to you? You're going back to your hometown soon, yes? <laughs> it's sweet of you to ask. But I'm going to keep working hard. Wherever you are, I'll make sure you hear about me. She always said she performed best when thinking about someone she loved. I think I finally understand Kasumi, what she was trying to say. When I think about you, I get the feeling the competition's going to go just fine. I think you know what I mean. Next month, a few days before I leave Tokyo for good, we nearly forget it's White Day. With Sojo's help, we managed to scramble and arrange quite the surprise for our favorite Kohai, then have also tripped to an aquarium where we see that Samira is growing even more. She's no longer a scared girl, but rather something more confident. There are so many different kinds of fish. I'd never have realized just seeing them from a distance. They're all so beautiful. Come to think of it, I remember we had a family trip to an aquarium when I was younger. Kasumi was so excited to see the fish. But, apparently I was so scared I cried the whole time. Oh, I'm having fun now. As we continue on with a special day with Sumiri at the fancy restaurant Sojo booked for us, it's clear that she hasn't entirely escaped the clutches of her depression. Love is so strange. I feel so happy when I'm with my boyfriend, but even tiny failures get me so depressed. As long as I've got you, though, I feel like I can get through anything. Indeed, she still has the tendency to put herself down and agonize over her small failures, but with the support of the one she truly cares about, Samiri believes that she'll be able to persevere through anything. Joker, showing how much he cares, not only about his friends, but about Samiri in particular, chooses to surprise her with a sweet gift and a view to cap off the night. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us on this special day. We wish you all an unforgettable evening, with one last finishing touch from us. Huh? Looks like something's happening. Oh, it's gorgeous. What? Thank you so much. I never saw this coming, but I'm so, so happy. I've never been surprised like this. I keep falling in love with you all over again. I guess you put a lot of effort into this date, but I shouldn't have expected anything less, Senpai. You take care of everybody, and you always put their happiness before anything else. But I don't want this to be one-sided. One day, I want to take care of you like you do for me. Though, I guess that might not be for a while. Thank you. It'll definitely happen eventually, so please be patient. Okay, maybe I'm getting a little too worked up about it. Just as Joker has to return home soon, so does Samir have to put her dreams first before committing to anything serious with Joker. She's come a long way, and to separate now does suck indeed, but we have the hopes of seeing her once again. And that, ladies and gentlemen, it was the final bit of character growth for the one and only Sumira Yoshizawa. It promised to persevere in spite of all the pain and tragedy she's experienced thus far. Instead of getting to the pain of this hostile reality, Samira intends to incite a full-on rebellion, and instead chooses to carry that banner all the way to the top of the podium position. While the road ahead will be tough for her, I think it's safe to say that Samira, for the first time in a long while, can firmly tell herself that she's got this. As Samira moves to become an international champion on her own terms to inspire and change the hearts of others, we find that she's already managed to do just that. If you find yourself struggling in life, you can start over, like me. Remember that. So yeah, if that ends up saving you, then we're square. <laughs> we once made a promise to live by our own strength and by our own means, no matter what gets in our way. And that's why we must finally say goodbye to her, so that she may pursue her own dream unabated, at least for now. Meow. Oh. <laughs> you taught me to keep my head up, didn't you? <laughs> Told you I was coming with you. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> Take care. Huh? Mm. 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why Sumira Yoshizawa is ultimately an extremely compelling and well-written character worthy of the highest of praises. But that drive she has coming from within herself being what drew me and many others to her character. She's truly one for the history books here. And with that being said, I'm X Patch Night X, and I'd like to thank you all for watching all the way to the very end. I want to sincerely thank you all, especially my loyal patrons, for your loyalty and support for all these past few months as I've been quietly working on this video away from prying eyes. I really do mean that. This video was both a joy and a challenge to make, most of the latter. So if you guys want to see more of what you just saw here, please let me know down in the comment section down below. And if you haven't already, I'll attack that like and subscribe button. Please do so to stay updated on all my future projects. Speaking of future projects, we have one last video as part of the season of the economy of a character. That's right, Akechi is up next. As always, if you want to see this episode early and on a part-by-part -part basis, check out my Patreon down below for early access to the episode itself and for more goodies as well. Well, I think that's it. As always, guys, this has been Expatriant X, your favorite Phantom Thief and Longman, signing up for the Metaverse. As usual, I would say that there's something to be learned from the actions and beliefs of the Phantom Thieves. I encourage you all to wake up, get up, and get out there. Steal some hearts, swap those lies in the making, and don't let your anguish get the better of you. Harness it for good and make an impact upon society for your own sake and for the sake of others. I'll see you all next time. I'm out of here, and goodbye for now.